Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of The Obsession by Nora Roberts, performed by Shannon McManus. Exposure. For now we see through a glass, darkly. Corinthians 13.12 1. August 29, 1998 She didn't know what woke her. And no matter how many times she relived that night, no matter where the nightmare chased her, she never would. Summer turned the air into a wet, simmering stew, one smelling of sweat and drenching green. The humming fan on her dresser stirred it, but it was like sleeping in the steam pumping off the pot. Still, she was used to that to lying on top of the summer-moist sheets, with the windows open wide to the relentless chorus of cicadas, and the faint hope even a tiny breeze would slither through the sultry. The heat didn't wake her, nor did the soft rumble of thunder from a storm gathering in the distance. Naomi went from sleep to awake in an instant, as if someone had given her good shake or shouted her name in her ear. She sat straight up in bed, blinking at the dark, hearing nothing but the hum of the fan, the high pitch of the cicadas, and the lazy, repetitive hoo of an owl. All country summer sounds she knew as well as her own voice, and nothing to put that odd little click in her throat. But now, awake, she felt that heat, like gauze soaked in hot water and wrapped around every inch of her. She wished it were morning, so she could sneak out before anyone was up and cool off in the creek. Chores came first, that was the rule, but it was so hot. It felt like she'd have to part the air like a curtain just to take a step. And it was Saturday, or would be in the morning. And sometimes Mama let the rules slide a little on Saturdays, if Daddy was in a good mood. Then she heard the rumble of thunder. Delighted, she scrambled out of bed to rush to her window. She loved storms, the way they whirled and swung through the trees, the way the sky went spooky, the way lightning slashed and flashed. And maybe this storm would bring rain and wind and cooler air. Maybe. She knelt on the floor, her arms folded on the windowsill, her eyes on the bit of moon hazed by heat and clouds. Maybe. She wished for it. A girl who'd turned 12 in just two days and still believed in wishes. A big storm, she thought with lightning like pitchforks and thunder like cannon fire. And lots and lots of rain. She closed her eyes, tipped her face up, tried sniffing the air. Then, in her Sabrina the Teenage Witch t-shirt, she pillowed her head on her hands and studied the shadows. Again, she wished for morning. And since wishes were free, wished it were the morning of her birthday. She wanted a new bike so bad and she'd given out plenty of hints. She knelt, wanting mourning, a girl tall and gawky, who, though she checked daily, was not yet growing breasts. The heat had her hair sticking to her neck. Annoyed with it, she pushed it up, off, let it hang over her shoulder. She wanted to cut it, really short, like a pixie in the fairy tale book her grandparents had given her, before they weren't allowed to see one another anymore. But Daddy said girls were supposed to have long hair, and boys short. So her little brother got a crew cut, down at Vic's barbershop in town, and all she could do was pull her sort of blonde hair back in a ponytail. But then Mason got spoiled silly, in her opinion, being the boy. He'd gotten a basketball hoop and a backboard with an official Wilson basketball for his birthday. He got to play Little League Baseball, too something that by Daddy's rules was only for boys, something Mason never let her forget, and being younger by 23 months, something she didn't let him forget, he didn't have as many chores. It wasn't fair, but saying so only added on more chores and risked losing TV privileges. Besides, she wouldn't care about any of that if she got the new bike. She caught a dull flash, just a shimmer of lightning low in the sky. It would come, she told herself. The wish storm would come and bring the cool and wet. If it rained and rained and rained, 
she wouldn't have to weed the garden. The idea of that excited her enough that she nearly missed the next flash. Not lightning this time, but the beam from a flashlight. Her first thought was someone was poking around, maybe trying to break in. She started to stand up, run for her father. Then she saw that it was her father. Moving away from the house toward the tree line, moving quick and sure in the beam of the light. Maybe he was going to the creek to cool off. If she went too, how could he be mad? If he was in a good mood, he'd laugh. She didn't think twice. Just grabbed up her flip-flops, stuck her tiny flashlight in her pocket, and hurried out of the room, quiet as a mouse. She knew which steps creaked. Everybody did, and avoided them out of habit. Daddy didn't like it if she or Mason snuck downstairs for a drink after bedtime. She didn't put the flip-flops on until she reached the back door, then eased it open just enough before it could creak to squeeze out. For a minute, she thought she'd lost the trail of the flashlight, but she caught it again and darted after. She'd hang back until she gauged her father's mood. But he veered off from the shallow ribbon of the creek, moving deeper into the woods that edged that scrap of land. Where could he be going? Curiosity pushed her on, and the almost giddy excitement of sneaking through the woods in the dead of night. The rumbles and flashes from the sky only added to the adventure. She didn't know fear, though she'd never gone this deep into the woods. It was forbidden. Her mother would tan her hide if she got caught, so she wouldn't get caught. Her father moved quick and sure, so he knew where he was going. She could hear his boots crunching old, dried leaves on the skinny trail, so she kept back. It wouldn't do for him to hear her. Something screeched, made her jump a little. She had to slap her hand over her mouth to muffle the giggle. Just an old owl, out on the hunt. The clouds shifted, covered the moon. She nearly stumbled when she stubbed her bare toe on a rock, and again she covered her mouth to smother her hiss of pain. Her father stopped, making her heart pound like a drum. She went still as a statue, barely breathing. For the first time she wondered what she'd do if he turned around came back toward her. Couldn't run, she thought, for he'd surely hear that. Maybe she could creep off the path, hide in the brush, and just hope there weren't snakes sleeping. When he moved on, she continued to stand, telling herself to go back before she got into really big trouble. But the light was like a magnet and drew her on. It bobbled and shook for a moment. She heard something rattle and scrape, something creak, like the back door. Then the light vanished. She stood in the deep, dark woods, breath shallow, and cold prickling over her skin despite the hot, heavy air. She took a step back, then two, as the urge to run fell over her. The click came back to her throat, so sharp she could barely swallow. And the dark, all the dark seemed to wrap around her, too tight. Run home, run. Get back in bed, close your eyes. The voice in her head pitched high and shrill, like the cicadas. Scaredy cat, she whispered, clutching her own arms for courage. Don't be a scaredy cat. She crept forward, almost feeling her way now. Once again, the clouds shifted, and in the thin trickle of moonlight, she saw the silhouette of a ruined building. Like an old cabin, she thought, that had burned down so only the jags of foundation and an old chimney remained. The odd fear slid away into fascination with the shapes, the grays of it all, the way the thin moonlight played over the scorched bricks, the blackened wood. Again, she wished for morning, so she could explore. If she could sneak back in the light, it could be her place, a place where she could bring her books and read without her brother nagging at her and she could sit and draw, or just sit and dream. Someone had lived there once, so maybe there were ghosts. And that idea was a thrill. She'd just love to meet a ghost. But where had her father gone? She thought of the rattles and creak again. Maybe this was like another dimension, and he'd opened a door to it, gone through. 
He had secrets. She figured all adults did. Secrets they kept from everybody. Secrets that made their eyes go hard if you asked the wrong question. Maybe he was an explorer, one who went through a magic door to another world. He wouldn't like her thinking it because other worlds, like ghosts and teenage witches, weren't in the Bible. But maybe he wouldn't like her thinking it because it was true. She risked a few more steps forward, ears cocked for any sound, and heard only the thunder rolling closer. This time when she stubbed her toe, the quick cry of pain escaped, and she hopped on one foot until the sting eased. Stupid rock, she thought, and glanced down. In that pale moonlight, she saw not a rock, but a door. A door in the ground. A door that would creak when opened. Maybe a magic door. She got down on all fours, ran her hands over it, and got a splinter for her trouble. Magic doors didn't give you splinters. Just an old root cellar or storm cellar. But though disappointment dampened her spirits as she sucked her sore finger, it was still a door in the ground, in the woods, by an old burned-out cabin. And her father had gone down there. Her bike. Maybe he'd hidden her bike down there and was right now putting it together. Willing to risk another splinter, she put her ear to the old wood, squeezing her eyes tight to help her hear. She thought she heard him moving around, and he was making a kind of grunting noise. She imagined him assembling her bike, all shiny and new and red, his big hands picking the right tool while he whistled through his teeth the way he did when he worked on something. He was down there doing something special just for her. She wouldn't complain, in her head, about chores for a whole month. How long did it take to put a bike together? She should hurry back home so he didn't know she'd followed him. But she really, really, really wanted to see it. Just a peek. She eased back from the door, crept over to the burned-out cabin, and hunkered down behind the old chimney. It wouldn't take him long. He was good with tools. He could have his own repair shop if he wanted, and only worked for the cable company out of Morgantown to provide security for his family. He said so all the time. She glanced up at the snap of lightning, the first pitchfork of it, and the thunder that followed was more boom than mumble. She should have gone home. That was the truth, but she couldn't go back now. He could come out any time, and he'd catch her for sure. There'd be no shiny red bike for her birthday if he caught her now. If the storm broke, she'd just get wet, that's all. It would cool her off. She told herself he'd just be five more minutes. And when the minutes passed, he'd just be five more. And then she had to pee. She tried to hold it, ignore it, squeeze it back. But in the end, she gave up and crept her way farther back, back into the trees. She rolled her eyes, pulled down her shorts, and crouched, keeping her feet wide to avoid the stream. Then she shook and shook until she was as dry as she was going to get. Just as she started to pull her shorts back up, the door creaked open. She froze, shorts around her knees, bare butt inches off the ground, her lips pressed tight to hold back her breath. She saw him, in the next flash of lightning, and he looked wild to her, his close-cropped hair almost white in the storm light, his eyes so dark, and his teeth showing in a fierce grin. Seeing him, half expecting him to throw back his head and howl like a wolf, she felt her heart thudding with the first true fear she'd ever known. When he rubbed himself, down there, she felt her cheeks go hot as fire. Then he closed the door, the quick slam of it echoing. He shot the bolt home, a hard, scraping sound that made her shiver. Her legs trembled from holding the awkward position while he tossed layers of old leaves over the door. He stood a moment more, and oh, the lightning sizzled now, and played the beam of his light over the door. The backwash of it threw his face into relief, so she saw only the hard edges, and the light, close-cropped hair made it look like a skull, 
eyes dark, soulless hollows. He looked around, and for one terrible moment, she feared he looked right at her. This man, she knew into her bones, would hurt her, would use hands and fists on her, like the father who worked to provide security for his family never had. With a helpless whimper in her throat, she thought, Please, Daddy, please. But he turned away, and with long, sure strides went back the way he'd come. She didn't move a trembling muscle until she heard nothing but the night song and the first stirring of the wind. The storm was rolling in, but her father was gone. She hiked up her shorts and straightened, rubbing the pins and needles out of her legs. No moon now, and all sense of adventure had dropped into a terrible dread. But her eyes had adjusted enough for her to pick her way back to the leaf-covered door. She saw it only because she knew it was there. She could hear her own breath now, wisping away on the swirl of wind. Cool air, but now she wanted warm. Her bones felt cold, like winter cold, and her hand shook as she bent down to brush the thick layers of leaves away. She stared at the bolt, thick and rusted, barring the old wood door. Her fingers traced over it, but she didn't want to open it now. She wanted to be back in her own bed, safe. She didn't want that picture of her father, that wild picture. But her fingers tugged on the bolt, and then she used both hands as it resisted. She set her teeth when it scraped open. It was her bike, she told herself, even while a terrible weight settled in her chest. Her shiny red birthday bike. That was what she would find. Slowly, she lifted the door, looked down into the dark. She swallowed hard, took the little flashlight out of her pocket, and using its narrow beam, made her way down the ladder. She had a sudden fear of her father's face appearing in the opening, that wild and terrible look on his face, and that door slamming shut, closing her in. She nearly scrambled back up again, but she heard the whimper. She froze on the ladder. An animal was down here. Why would her daddy have an animal down? A puppy? Was that her birthday surprise? The puppy she'd always wanted but wasn't allowed to have? Even Mason couldn't beg them a puppy. Tears stung her eyes as she dropped down to the dirt floor. She'd have to pray for forgiveness for the awful thoughts. Thoughts were a sin as much as deeds she'd had about her father. She swung her light around, her heart full of wonder and joy. The last she would feel for far too long. But where she imagined a puppy whimpering in his crate was a woman. Her eyes were wide and shined like glass as tears streamed from them. She made terrible noises against the tape over her mouth. Scrapes and bruises left raw marks on her face and her throat. She wasn't wearing any clothes nothing at all, but didn't try to cover herself. Couldn't, couldn't cover herself. Her hands were tied with rope, bloodied from the raw wounds on her wrists, and the rope was tied to a metal post behind the old mattress she lay on. Her legs were tied too, at the ankles, and spread wide. Those terrible sounds kept coming, pounded on the ears, roiled in the belly. As in a dream, Naomi moved forward. There was a roaring in her ears now, as if she'd gone under the water too long, couldn't get back to the surface. Her mouth was so dry, the words scraped her throat. Don't yell. You can't yell, okay? He might hear and come back, okay? The woman nodded, and her swollen eyes pleaded. Naomi worked her fingernails under the edge of the tape. You have to be quiet, she said whispering as her fingers trembled, please be quiet, and pulled the tape away. It made an awful sound, left a raw red mark, but the woman didn't yell. Please, her voice sounded like a rusty hinge. Please, help me. Please, don't leave me here. You have to get away. You have to run. Naomi looked back toward the cellar door. What if he came back? 
Oh, God. What if the wild man who looked like her father came back? She tried to untie the rope, but the knots were too tight. She rubbed her fingers raw in frustration, then turned away, using her little light. She saw a bottle of liquor, forbidden by her father's law in their house, and more rope, coiled and waiting. An old blanket, a lantern, magazines with naked women on the covers, a camera, and, oh no, 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 photographs of women taped to the walls, like this woman, naked and tied up and bloody and afraid, and women who stared out with dead eyes. An old chair, cans and jars of food on a shelf nailed to the wall, a heap of rags, no, clothes, torn clothes, and the stains on them were blood. She could smell the blood. And there were knives, so many knives. Closing her mind, just closing her mind to everything else, Naomi grabbed one of the knives, began to saw the knot. You had to stay quiet, stay quiet. She nicked flesh, but the woman didn't cry out. Hurry, please hurry, please, please. She bit back a moan when her arms were free, and those arms shook as she tried to lower them. It hurts. Oh, God. God, it hurts. Don't think about it. Just don't think about it. It hurts more when you do. It hurt. Yes, it hurt to think. So she wouldn't think of the blood, the pictures, the heap of torn and terrible clothes. Naomi went to work on one of the ankle ropes. What's your name? I, Ashley, I'm Ashley. Who is he? Where is he? Couldn't say it. Wouldn't say it. Wouldn't think it. He's home now. The storm's come. Can you hear it? She was home too, Naomi told herself as she cut the other rope. Home in bed, and this was all a bad dream. There was no old root cellar that smelled of musk and pee and worse. No woman. No wild man. She would wake in her own bed, and the storm would have cooled everything. Everything would be clean and cool when she woke. You have to get up. Get out. You have to run. Run, run, run. Into the dark. Run away. Then this will never have happened. Sweat rolling down her battered face, Ashley tried to get up, but her legs wouldn't hold her. She fell to the dirt floor, her breath wheezing. I can't walk yet. My legs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You have to help me. Please help me get out of here. Your legs are asleep. That's all. Naomi grabbed the blanket, wrapped it around Ashley's shoulders. You have to try to get up. Working together, they managed to get Ashley to her feet. Lean on me. I'm going to push you up the ladder, but you have to try to climb. You have to try. I can do it. I can do it. Rain whipped in on the slow, sweaty climb up, and twice on that short journey, Ashley nearly slipped. Naomi's muscles twanged from the strain of holding the weight, of pushing. But on a last sobbing grunt, Ashley dragged herself out, lay panting on the ground. You have to run. I don't know where I am. I'm sorry. I don't know how long I've been down there. A day? Two? I haven't had any food, any water since he... I'm hurt. Tears streamed, but she didn't sob. Just stared at Naomi through the flood of them. He... He raped me, and he choked me, and he cut me and hit me. My ankle, something's wrong with it. I can't run on it. Can you get me out of here? To the police? Rain pounded, and the lightning lit the sky like morning. But Naomi didn't wake. Wait a minute. Don't go back in there. Just wait. She scrambled down, into the terrible place, and picked up the knife. Some of the blood on it wasn't fresh. Wasn't from the Nicks. No, some was old and dry and from more than Nick's. And though it sickened her, she pawed through the heap of clothes and found a tattered shirt, a torn pair of shorts. She took them with her as she climbed back out, seeing them 
Ashley nodded. Okay. You're smart. I didn't see shoes, but it'll be easier for you with a shirt and shorts. They're torn, but... It doesn't matter. Ashley bit down hard as Naomi helped her into the shorts, as she carefully lifted Ashley's arms into the shirt. Naomi paused when she saw that the movement opened thin slices on Ashley's torso, saw fresh red blood seeping. You have to lean on me. Because Ashley shivered, Naomi wrapped the blanket over her shoulders again. Just do, she told herself. Don't think. Just do. You have to walk, even if it hurts. We'll look for a good thick stick, but we have to go. I don't know what time it is, but they'll look for me in the morning. We have to get to the road. It's more than a mile into town after that. You have to walk. I'll crawl, if I have to. She got to her knees, levered herself up with Naomi's help. It was slow, and Naomi knew from Ashley's labored breathing that it was painful. She found a downed branch, and that helped a little, only a little, as the trail went to mud in the storm. They crossed the creek, running fast now, from the rain, and kept going. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know your name. Naomi. That's a nice name. Naomi, I have to stop for a minute. Okay, but just for a minute. Ashley braced against a tree, breathing hard, leaning heavily on the broken branch while sweat and rain ran down her face. Is that a dog? I hear a dog barking. It's probably King. The hardy place is right over that way. Can we go there? We can call the police, get help. It's too close. Mr. Hardy was a deacon at church with her father. He'd call her father before he called the police. Too close? It feels like we've walked miles. Not even one. Okay. Ashley closed her eyes a moment, bit down on her lip. Okay. Do you know the man? The one who took me? The one who hurt me? Yes. You know his name, where they can find him. Yes. We have to keep going now. We have to keep going. Tell me his name. Wincing, Ashley pushed off the tree, began her hobbling walk. It'll keep me going to know it. His name is Thomas Bowes. Thomas David Bowes. Thomas David Bowes. How old are you? Eleven. I'm going to be twelve on Monday. Happy birthday. You're really smart and strong and brave. You saved my life, Naomi. You saved a life before your twelfth birthday. Don't ever forget it. I won't. I won't forget. The storm's passing. She kept to the woods. It took longer that way than it would have if she'd gone out to the road. But she knew fear now and kept to the woods until the edge of the little town of Pine Meadows. She went to school there, and to church, and her mother shopped in the market. She'd never been inside the sheriff's office, but she knew where it was. As dawn lightened the sky to the east, and the first light glimmered on puddles, she walked past the church, over the narrow bridge that arched over the narrow stream. Her flip-flops made soggy flaps on the street, and Ashley limped, the branch clomping, her breath a raw pant with each step. What town is this? It's Pine Meadows. Where? I was in Morgantown. I go to college at WVU. It's about 12 miles from here. I was training. Running. I'm a long-distance runner, believe it or not. And I was training like I do every morning. He was parked on the side of the road with the hood up, like he'd had a breakdown. I had to slow a little, and he grabbed me. He hit me with something, and I woke up in that place. I'm going to have to stop again. No, no, no stopping. No thinking. Just doing. We're almost there. See right down the road, that white house? See the sign out front? 
Pine Meadows Sheriff's Department. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. Ashley began to weep then, racking sobs that shook them both, as Naomi tightened her arm around Ashley's waist, took more weight, and trudged the rest of the way. We're safe now. We're safe. When Ashley collapsed on the narrow porch, Naomi wrapped the blanket closer around her, then knocked hard on the door. Is someone going to be there? I didn't think. It's so early. I don't know. But Naomi knocked again. When the door opened, Naomi had a vague recognition of the young face, the tousled hair. What's all this? He began, and then his sleepy eyes shifted by her, landed on Ashley. Well, Jesus. He shot the door open, jumped out to crouch beside her. I'm going to get you inside. Help. Help us. You're all right. You're going to be all right. He looked scrawny to Naomi's eyes, but he hefted Ashley like she was nothing, and flushed a bit when the blanket slipped and the torn shirt exposed most of her left breast. Honey, he said to Naomi, hold the door open now. Y'all have an accident? No, Naomi said. She held the door open, had one instant to think whether she should run away, just run, or go inside. She went inside. I'm going to set you down right here, all right now? His eyes studied the bruising on Ashley's throat, and knowledge came into them. Sweetheart, you see that water fountain over there? How about you get, what's your name now? Ashley. Ashley McLean. You get Ashley some water, would you? He turned as he spoke, then spotted the knife Naomi held at her side. In that same easy tone, he said, Why don't you give that to me, all right? There you go. He took the knife from Naomi's limp hand, set it up on a shelf out of reach. I need to make some calls, and one to the doctor who'll come and examine you. But we're going to have to take some pictures. Do you understand? Yes. And I'm calling the sheriff in. And there'll be questions. You up to that? Yes. All right now, drink a little water. That's a good girl, he said to Naomi, running a gentle hand over her wet hair as she brought the paper cup to Ashley. He grabbed a phone from a desk, punched in numbers. Sheriff, it's Wayne. Yeah, I know what time it is. We got a woman here who's hurt. No, sir, not an accident. She's been assaulted, and she's going to need a full exam. He turned away, spoke quietly, but Naomi heard the words, rape kit. Kid brought her in. I think it's Tom and Sue Bow's girl. Ashley lowered the cup, stared into Naomi's eyes. Bose. Yes, I'm Naomi Bose. You need to drink. So do you, baby. But Ashley set the cup aside and drew Naomi to her. So do you. When she broke, when everything finally broke inside her, Naomi laid her head on Ashley's shoulder and wept. Ashley met Wayne's eyes over Naomi's head. It was her father who did this to me. It was Thomas David Bowes who did this. And it was Naomi who saved me. Wayne let out a breath. Sheriff, you better get in here right quick. Two. When the sheriff came, Wayne took Naomi into another room, bought her a candy bar and a Coke. She'd never been allowed such indulgences, but she didn't argue it. He got a first aid kit and began to doctor the cuts and scratches she hadn't realized she'd inflicted on herself on that long hike through the woods. He smelled of juicy fruit gum. She saw the yellow pack of it sticking out of his breast pocket. And she would always, from that morning on, associate the gum with simple kindness. Honey, you got a favorite teacher? Um, I don't know. I guess Miss Blanchard, maybe? If you want, I could call her, ask her to come in, be with you. No, 
No, that's okay. She's going to know. Everybody's going to know. It made her chest hurt, so she looked away. But I don't want to be there when they do. All right. We got a nice nurse coming in to be with Ashley, to go with her when she goes to the hospital. Do you want somebody like that? Maybe who doesn't know you? I don't want anybody. What's going to happen? Well, the sheriff's talking to Ashley right now for a little bit, and then they'll take her into the hospital in Morgantown and fix her up. She hurt her ankle. They'll fix it. Don't you worry. You want a different kind of candy bar? Naomi looked down at the Snickers she hadn't opened. No, sir. I just never had candy first thing in the morning. How about Easter? Smiling, he put a Band-Aid on a small, deep scratch. That's a holy day. It's for praying, not for candy rabbits. Even as she echoed her father's words, she saw the pity in the deputy's eyes. But he only patted her legs. Well, we'll get you a hot breakfast as soon as we can. You be all right here for just a minute? Am I under arrest? Not pity now, but that juicy fruit kindness again as he laid a hand on her cheek, gentle as a mother. For what, honey? I don't know. You're going to arrest my daddy. Don't you worry about that right now. I saw him. I saw him when he came out of that cellar in the woods. And he looked wrong. I was afraid. You don't have to be afraid anymore. What about my mama and my brother? They're going to be fine. He glanced over as the door opened. She knew Miss Letty. She went to their church, but she'd forgotten she worked in the sheriff's office. Letty Harbaugh came in with a red tote bag and a sad smile on her plump face. Hey there, Naomi. I got some dry clothes for you here. They're my girls, and she's not as tall as you and not so slim, but they'll be clean and dry. Thank you, Miss Letty. You're more than welcome. Wayne, the sheriff, wants you. Naomi and I'll be fine. You can change right out in the washroom, all right? Yes, ma'am. The clothes were too big, but there was a belt so she could cinch the jeans. When she came out, Letty sat at the tiny table sipping coffee out of a big blue mug. I've got a brush here. Would it be all right if I brushed your hair out? You got it all tangled. Thank you. Naomi made herself sit though she wasn't sure she wanted to be touched. Still, after the first few strokes of the brush, she relaxed. Such pretty hair. It's dishwater. No, indeed. It's like deer hide. All the tones of blonde mixed up, and all sun streaked now from summer. Nice and thick, too. I'm going to ask you a couple of things. Maybe hard things, sweetie but they're important things. Where's Ashley? They're taking her to the hospital now. She asked after you, asked if we could bring you in to see her. Would you want to? Yes, ma'am. Please, I want to. All right. But now I have to ask you if your father ever hurt you. I know that's a hard thing to ask. He's never laid a hand on me. Or Mason. My mama gives out the hidings if we need it, and they don't count for much. She doesn't have the heart for a real hiding, so we pretend, all three of us, because Daddy says, spare the rod, spoil the child. I never liked that one myself. The harder one is asking if he ever touched you in a bad sort of way. Naomi stared straight ahead, while Letty ran the brush through her hair. You mean like he did to Ashley? He raped her. I know what rape is, ma'am. They raped the Sabine women in the Bible. He never did that to me. He never touched me wrong. All right, then. Did he ever hurt your mama? I don't think so. Sometimes... 
it's all right. In practiced moves, Letty used a little band to pull Naomi's hair back into a tail. All you have to do is tell me the truth. Sometimes he looked like maybe he wanted to hurt her, but he didn't. If he got really mad, he'd just go off for a day or two. Cooling off, Mama said. A man needs to cool off on his own time. She didn't know, Miss Letty. Mama didn't know he hurt people, or she'd have been afraid. More afraid. People. When Letty came back around to sit again, Naomi stared straight ahead. Ashley said she thought she'd been down there for a day or two. There was more rope down there, and pictures. There were pictures on the wall of other women, tied up like she was, worse than she was. I think some of them were dead. I think they were dead. I'm going to be sick. Letty tended to her, holding her hair back as she hugged the toilet, bathing her face with a cool cloth when she was done. She gave Naomi something minty to rinse out her mouth, brushed a kiss over her forehead. You've had enough. Maybe you want to rest a while. I can't go home, can I? Not right now. I'm sorry, honey. But I can take you to my house, and you can use the guest bed, try to sleep. Can I just stay here until Mama and Mason come? If that's what you want. How about I get you some toast? We see how that settles. You save that Snickers bar for later. Thank you. Letty rose. What you did, Naomi. It was right. And more, it was brave. I'm awful proud of you. I'm only going to be a couple minutes. How about some tea with honey to go with a toast? That'd be nice. Thank you. Alone, Naomi laid her head on the table, but she couldn't rest. She sipped at the Coke, but it was too sweet. She wanted water, just cold and clear. She thought of the water fountain, Rose, she stepped outside the little room, started to call out, ask if it was all right. She saw the deputy hauling her father across the room toward a big metal door. His hands were in cuffs behind his back. A raw bruise bloomed on his right cheek. He didn't look wild now, or upset, or sorry. He had a sneer on his face, the sort he got when somebody said maybe he was wrong about something. He saw her and she braced for his fury, his hate, his wrath. All she got was an instant of indifference before he walked to the metal door and through, and away. The room was crowded with people, noise, and something that sparked darkly on the air. She felt she floated in it, as if her legs had just gone somewhere else and her body hung suspended. She heard words, disjointed, Tinny to her ear. FBI. Serial killer. Forensics. Victims. Nothing made sense. No one noticed her. A gangly girl with eyes too wide, too bright, and a face pale as a ghost, swimming in two big clothes and shock. No one glanced her way, and she wondered if they did, would their eyes pass over her, through her, just as her father's had. Maybe none of it was real. Maybe she wasn't real. But the pressure on her chest, that felt real. As if she'd fallen from the high limb in the old oak tree out back and knocked away her breath, so far away she couldn't get it back. The room took a slow, sick spin, and the light faded. A cloud over the moon. With bows secure, Wayne came out in time to see Naomi's eyes roll back in her head. He shouted, and he leaped toward her. He was fast, but not fast enough to catch her before she hit the floor. Get some water. Where's a damn doctor? What the hell's she doing out here? He gathered her up, cradled her, gently tapped cheeks he thought looked pale enough for his hand to pass through. I'm sorry. Ah, oh, merciful God. She needed food. I just came out to see about getting her something. Letty crouched down with a cup of water. Did she see him? Did she see me bring that bastard in? Letty only shook her head. 
I wasn't gone for more than three minutes. She's coming around. There you are, baby. Now, me honey, just breathe easy now. You just had a faint. I want you to sip some water. Have I been sick? You're all right now. Take a sip. It came back to her. All of it. Her eyes, what her mother called medicine bottle green, closed. Why isn't he mad at me? Why doesn't he care? They urged water on her. Wayne carried her into the back again. They brought her sick food, the tea and toast. She ate what she could and found it made the worst of that floating feeling go away. The rest passed in a blur. Dr. Holling came in and looked her over. Somebody stayed with her all the time, and Wayne snuck her in another Coke. The sheriff came in. She knew him, Sheriff Joe Franks, because she went to school with Joe Jr. He had wide shoulders on a sturdy body and a tough face on a thick neck. She always thought of a bulldog when she saw him. He sat across from her. How you doing, Naomi? His voice was like a gravel road. I don't know. Um, okay, sir. I know you had a hard night, and you're having a hard day on top of it. Do you know what's going on here? Yes, sir. My daddy hurt Ashley. He tied her up down in that old cellar in the woods by this burned-out cabin place. He hurt her really bad. And he hurt other people, too. There were pictures of them down there. I don't know why he did those things. I don't know why anybody would do what he did. Did you ever go out there to that cellar before last night? I didn't know it was there. We're not supposed to go into the woods that far. Just to the creek, and only when we have permission. What made you go out there last night? I... I woke up, and it was so hot. I was sitting by my window, and I saw Daddy go out. I thought maybe he was going to the creek to cool off, and I wanted to go too. I got my flashlight and my flip-flops, and I snuck out. I'm not supposed to. That's all right. So you followed him. I thought maybe he'd think it was funny. I could tell if he did before I let him know I was there. But he didn't go to the creek. And I just wanted to know where he was going. And I thought, when I saw the old place and the cellar, maybe he was putting a bike together for my birthday. Is it your birthday, honey? Monday is. And I asked for a bike, so I waited. I was just going to take a peek. I hid and I waited until he came out, but... What? For a moment, she thought it would be easier if she floated again. Just kept floating. But the sheriff had kind eyes. Patient ones. He'd keep those kind eyes on her, even if she floated away. And she had to tell somebody. He didn't look right, Sheriff, sir. He didn't look right when he came out, and it scared me. But I waited until he was gone, and I just wanted to see what was down there. How long do you wait? I don't know. It felt long. She flushed a little. She wasn't going to tell him she'd peed in the woods. Some things were private. There was a bolt on the door, and I had to work some to push it. And when I opened the door, I heard something like whimpering. I thought maybe it was a puppy. We weren't allowed to have a dog, but I thought maybe. But then I saw Ashley. What did you see, honey? It's hard, but if you can tell me exactly, it's going to help. So she told him, exactly, and sipped at the Coke, even though her stomach jittered with the retelling. He asked more questions, and she did her best. When he was done, he patted her hand. You did real good. I'm going to bring your mama back. Is she here? She's here. And Mason? He's over at the Huffman's place. Mrs. Huffman's keeping an eye on him, and he's playing with Jerry. That's good. He and Jerry like to play together. Sheriff Franks? 
Is my mom all right? Something shut her down over his eyes. She's had a hard day, too. He said nothing for a moment. You're a steady girl, Naomi. I don't feel so steady. I got sick, and I had a faint. Trust me, honey. I'm an officer of the law. He smiled a little. You're a steady girl. So I'm going to tell you there are going to be other people asking questions. The FBI. You know what that is? Yes, sir. Sort of. They're going to have questions. And there's going to be reporters wanting to talk to you. You're going to have to talk to the FBI. But you don't have to talk to any reporters. He hitched up a hip, took a card out of his pocket. This is my phone number. The number here, and the one at home I wrote on the back. You can call me anytime. Doesn't matter what the time. You need to talk to me, you call. All right? Yes, sir. Put that away safe. I'm going to go get your mama now. Sheriff Franks? He paused at the door, turned back to her. Yes, honey? Is my daddy going to jail? Yes, honey. He is. Does he know? I expect so. She looked down at her coke, nodded. Okay. Her daddy was going to jail. How could she go back to school or church or to the market with her mother? It was worse than when Carrie Potter's daddy went to jail for two months for getting in a fight at the pool hall. Even worse than when Buster Kravitz's uncle went to jail for selling drugs. She'd be going into seventh grade in just another week, and everyone would know what happened. What her daddy did. What she did. She didn't see how she could... Then the door opened, and there was her mother. She looked sick, like she'd been sick for days, and bad sick, so it had eaten away at her. She looked thinner than she had when Naomi had gone to bed the night before, and her eyes were all red, swollen, and tears still stood in them. Her hair was every which way, like she hadn't taken a brush to it, and she wore the baggy, faded pink dress she mostly wore for garden chores. Naomi got shakily to her feet, wanting nothing more at that moment than to press her face to her mother's breast, find comfort there, find promises she'd pretend to believe there. But the tears just rolled out of her mother's eyes, driven by guttural sobs. She sank right down to the floor, covered her face with her hands. So the child went to the mother, gathered her in, stroked and soothed. It'll be all right, Mama. We'll be all right. Naomi, Naomi, they're saying terrible things about your daddy. They're saying you're saying them. We'll be all right. They can't be true. This can't be true. Susan pulled back, grabbed Naomi's face in her hands and spoke fiercely. You imagined it. You had a bad dream. Mama, I saw. No, you didn't. You have to tell them you made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake. Ashley, the girl he had, she's in the hospital. She's lying. She has to be lying. Naomi, he's your daddy. He's your blood. He's my husband. The police, they're going all over our house. They put your daddy in handcuffs and took him away. I cut the ropes off her myself. No, you didn't. You're going to stop this lying right now and tell everybody how you made it all up. A dull throb filled Naomi's head, so her own voice sounded flat and hollow through it. I pulled the tape off her mouth. I helped her get out of the cellar. She could hardly walk. She didn't have any clothes. No. He raped her. Don't you say such a thing! Her voice pitching high, Susan shook Naomi. Don't you dare! There were pictures on the wall. A lot of pictures. Of other girls, Mama. There were knives, with blood dried on them, and rope. And... I don't want to hear this. Susan clamped her hands over her ears. How can you say all this? How can I believe all this? He's my husband. I lived with him for 14 years. I bore him two children. 
I slept in the same bed night after night. The fierceness shattered like glass. Susan dropped her head on Naomi's shoulder again. Oh, what are we going to do? What's to become of us? We'll be all right, Naomi said again, helplessly. We'll be all right, Mama. They couldn't go home. Not until the police and now the FBI cleared it so they could. But Letty brought them all clothes and their own toothbrushes and so on and made her guest room theirs, hers and her mother's, with Mason bunking in with her son. The doctor gave her mother something to make her sleep, and that was good. Naomi took a shower, put her own clothes on, tied her hair back, and felt more herself. When she walked across the hall from the bathroom and cracked open the door to check on her mother, she saw her little brother sitting on the bed. Don't wake her, Naomi hissed, then felt bad for the sharp order when he turned his head to look at her. He'd been crying, too, and his face was splotchy from it, his eyes red-rimmed on the outside, lost on the inside. I'm just watching her. Come on out, Mason. If she wakes up, she'll start crying again. He did what she said without arguing, a rare thing, and then walked straight into her, wrapped his arms tight. They didn't hug much anymore, but it felt good to have somebody to hold on to, so she hugged back. They came right into the house, and we were still sleeping. I heard Daddy yelling and other people, and I ran out. I saw Daddy fighting with a deputy, and they pushed him against the wall. Mama was screaming and crying, and they put handcuffs on Daddy, just like on the TV. Did he rob a bank? Nobody will tell me. No, he didn't rob a bank. If they went downstairs, Miss Letty would be there, so instead, she sat down with her brother on the floor. He hurt people, Mason. Ladies, why? I don't know, but he did. Maybe it was their fault. No, it wasn't. He took them to a place in the woods and locked them up and hurt them. What place? A bad place. They have to put him in jail for it. I don't want Daddy to go to jail. The tears started up again. All she could do was wrap an arm around his shoulders. He did bad things to people, Mason. He has to go to jail. Does Mama have to go to jail? No, she didn't hurt anybody. She didn't know he was hurting people. Don't go pestering her about it, and don't go fighting either. People are going to say things about Daddy, and you're going to want to fight about it, but you can't, because what they're going to say... Is true. His face went belligerent. How do you know what's true? Because I saw. Because I know. I don't want to talk about it anymore right now. I talked about it enough today. I wish it was over. I wish we were someplace else. I want to go home. She didn't. She didn't ever want to go back to that house again, knowing what was back in the deep woods knowing what had lived in those same rooms, eaten at the same table. Miss Letty says they've got Nintendo down in their family room. Belligerence changed to a look of hope, mixed with doubt. Can we play it? She said we could. Do they have Donkey Kong? We can find out. They didn't have video games at home, or a computer, but they both had enough friends who did to know the basics, and she knew Mason dearly loved video games. It was simple to set him up in the family room with Miss Letty's help, and better yet when she hard-eyed her teenage son into playing with Mason. I'm going to make some lemonade. Why don't you come in the kitchen with me, Naomi? Give me a hand with that. The house was so nice, clean and pretty, with lots of colors on the walls and in the furniture. She knew Mr. Harbaugh taught English and literature at the high school, and Miss Letty worked for the sheriff, but the house looked rich to her. And the kitchen had a dishwasher, which was her name at home, and a counter of snowy white in the middle with a second sink right in it. Your house is so nice, Miss Letty. Why, thank you. It makes me happy. 
I want you to be comfortable while you're here. How long will we be here, do you think? A day or two, that's all. Letty put sugar and water in a pot to boil. You ever made lemonade from scratch? No, ma'am. It's a treat. Takes a while, but it's worth it. Letty puttered around. Naomi noted she didn't wear an apron, but just tucked a dish towel in the waist of her pants. Daddy didn't like Mama to wear pants. Women were supposed to wear skirts and dresses. Thinking of it, of her father, hearing his voice in her head, made her stomach tie itself up again. So she made herself think of something else. Miss Letty, what do you do at the sheriff's office? Why, honey, I'm the first woman deputy in Pine Meadows, and still the only one after six years. Like Deputy Wayne. That's right. So you know what happens next. Will you tell me what happens next? I can't say for certain, as the FBI is in charge now. We assist them. They're going to gather up evidence and take statements, and your daddy will have a lawyer. A lot of the next depends on the evidence and the statements and what your daddy says and does. I know it's hard, but it'd be best if you try not to worry about all that just yet. I can't worry about daddy. She'd already figured that out, but... I have to take care of my mama and Mason. Oh, baby girl, Letty sighed, and after giving the pot a stir, she came around the counter. Somebody's got to take care of you. Mama won't know what to do without Daddy telling her. And Mason won't understand what Daddy did. He doesn't know what rape is. On another sigh, Letty pulled Naomi into a hug. It's not for you to hold everybody else up. Where's your mother's brother now? Where's your Uncle Seth? In Washington, D.C. But we're not allowed to have anything to do with him because he's a homosexual. Daddy says he's an abomination. I knew your Uncle Seth. He was a couple years behind me in school. He didn't seem like an abomination to me. The Bible says... It made her head and her heart hurt what the Bible said, or what Daddy said it said. No, she couldn't worry about that now. He was always so nice to us. He has a nice laugh, I remember. But Daddy said he couldn't come visit anymore and Mama wasn't to talk to him on the phone. Would you like him to come? Just that. Just those words made Naomi's throat slam shut so she could only nod. All right, then. When I take the syrup off the stove to cool, I'll see about getting in touch with him. Then I'm going to show you how to squeeze lemons. That's the fun part. She learned how to make lemonade from scratch and ate a grilled cheese sandwich, a combination that would forever become her comfort food of choice. As her mother slept through the day, Naomi, for the first time in her life, begged for chores. Letty let her weed the flower garden out back, and the vegetable patch, and put fresh seed in the bird feeders. When she was done, Naomi gave in to fatigue, stretched out on the grass in the shade, and slept. She woke with a start, just as she had in the night. Something. There was something. She sat up fast, heart pounding, half expecting her father to be standing over her with a rope in one hand, a knife in the other. But the man who sat in the shade with her on a summer chair wasn't her father. He wore khaki pants and loafer shoes without any socks. And as her gaze traveled up, a bright blue shirt with a little man on a horse where a pocket might have been, he had her eyes, that medicine bottle green, in a face smooth and handsome as a movie star, all topped with waving brown hair under a Panama hat. I fell asleep. Nothing better than a nap in the shade on a summer afternoon. Do you remember me, Naomi? Uncle Seth. Her heart hurt, but not a bad kind of hurt. She feared she might faint again, though it didn't feel the same as before, but everything felt light and bright. You came. You came, she said again, and crawled right into his lap, weeping and grasping. Don't leave us. 
Please don't leave us, Uncle Seth. Please, please. I won't. I won't leave you, baby girl. I promise you. You stop worrying right now, because I'm here, and I'll take care of you. You gave me a pink party dress. He laughed, and the sound eased the ache in her heart, even as he pulled a snowy white handkerchief out of the pocket of his khakis and dabbed at her tears. You remember that? You weren't more than six. It was so pretty, so fancy and fine. Mama's sleeping. She just keeps sleeping. It's what she needs right now. Look how tall you are, those long legs. Got them scratched up some. It was dark in the woods. His arms tightened around her. He smelled so good, like lime sherbet. It's not dark now, and I'm here. As soon as we can, you're coming home with me. You, Mason, your mama. We're going to Washington, D.C.? To stay with you? That's right. With me and my friend Harry. You'll like Harry. He's in playing Donkey Kong with Mason. Getting acquainted. Is he a homosexual? Something rumbled in Seth's chest. Why, yes. He is. But a nice one like you. I think so. But you'll judge for yourself. I'm supposed to start back to school soon. Mason, too. You'll go to school in D.C. Is that all right with you? Relief nearly made her faint again, so she only nodded. I don't want to be here anymore. Miss Letty, she's been real nice. And Deputy Wayne, and the sheriff, too. He gave me his number so I could call if I needed. But I don't want to be here anymore. As soon as we can, we won't be. I don't want to see Daddy. I don't want to see him. I know that's bad, but... He drew her back. It's not bad, and don't ever think that. You don't have to see him if you don't want to. Will you tell Mama? She's going to want me to. Me and Mason. I don't want to see him. He didn't see me. Can we go to Washington, D.C. now? He cradled her again. I'm working on it. It took more than a week, though they didn't spend even one night at Miss Letty's. The reporters came. The sheriff was right on that. And they came in herds and packs with big vans and TV cameras. They shouted questions and swarmed any time someone went outside. No one remembered her birthday, but she didn't care. She wanted to forget it herself. They ended up in a house, not nearly so nice as Miss Letty's, outside Morgantown. And FBI people stayed there, too, because of the reporters and because there had already been threats. She heard one of the FBI people talking about it and how they were moving her father, too, to somewhere else. She heard a lot because she listened. Mama arguing with Uncle Seth about going to D.C., about not taking the children to see their father. But her uncle kept his promise. When her mother went to see her father, she went with the FBI lady. The second time she went, she came back and took the pills and slept more than 12 hours. She heard her uncle talking to Harry about how they'd change things around so three more people could live in their house in Georgetown. She did like Harry. Harrison, like Indiana Jones, Dobbs. Though it had surprised and puzzled her that he wasn't white. Not exactly black either. He was like the caramel she liked so much on ice cream when she'd earned a special treat. He was really tall and had blue eyes that seemed so special against the caramel. He was a chef, which he told her with a wink was a fancy cook. Though she'd never known a man who knew his way around a kitchen, Harry made dinner every night. Food she'd never heard of, much less tasted. It was like a movie again, such pretty food. They bought a Nintendo for Mason and got her and Mama some new clothes. She thought she could stay right there in the not-so-nice house if Harry and Seth stayed too. But one night, late, on a day her mother had gone to visit Daddy, she heard the argument. She hated when her uncle and her mother argued. It stirred fear that they'd make him go away again. I can't just pick up and leave, take the children away. They're Tom's children. 
He's never getting out of prison, Susie. Are you going to drag those kids to visiting days? Are you going to put them through that? He's their father. He's a fucking monster. Don't use that language. A fucking monster. Deal with it. Those kids need you, Susie, so stand up for them. He doesn't deserve a minute of your time. I took vows. Love, honor, obey. So did he, but he broke them. Jesus Christ. He raped, tortured, killed over 20 women. And that's what he's confessed to, bragged about for God's sake. Over 20 young girls. He'd come to your bed after he was done with them. Stop it! Stop it! Do you want me to say he did those things? He did those terrible things? How can I live with it, Seth? How can I live with it? Because you have two children who need you. I'm going to help you, Susie. We're going to get away from here, where you and the kids feel safe. You and they are going to get counseling. They're going to go to good schools. Don't put me in the position of telling you what to do, the way he did. I will for now, if I have to, to protect you and the kids. But I'm asking you to remember who you used to be before him. You had a spine and plans and a light. Don't you understand? That terrible plea in her mother's voice, that awful rawness, like a cut that wouldn't heal. If I go, I'm saying it all happened. It did happen. He's admitted it. They made him. Stop it. Just stop it. Your own daughter, your own baby saw what he did. She imagined. Stop. Susie, stop. I can't just... How could I not have known? How could I have lived with him nearly half my life and not known? The reporters, they shout that at me. Screw the reporters. We're leaving tomorrow. God, where's your anger, Suze? Where's your anger for what he did? What he is? What he put you and your kids through? What Naomi went through? I hope to hell you find it. But until you do, you're going to have to trust me. This is the best thing. We can go tomorrow, and you can start building a life for yourself and the kids. I don't know where to start. Pack, and we'll take it a step at a time from there. She heard her mother crying when Seth left the room. But after a while, Naomi heard doors opening, closing. Packing sounds, she thought. They were leaving in the morning, leaving all of this. Closing her eyes, she said a special prayer of thanks for her uncle. She understood that she'd saved Ashley's life. Now she thought Uncle Seth was saving hers. 3. Naomi lived in D.C. for five months, two weeks, and five days. That narrow slice of time brought so many highs and lows, so many jolts and joys she couldn't keep track. She loved the house in Georgetown, with its high ceilings and deep, rich colors, with its pretty backyard patio and little fountain with its own tiny pool. She'd never lived in a city before. I could spend hours sitting at the window in her room, watching the cars and cabs and people— and her room was so beautiful. The old cherrywood dresser, an antique, not a hand-me-down, because there was a difference, had a big oval mirror framed in the same wood with little curlicues. She had a double bed, a luxury that had her rolling around in it or stretching her arms wide just because she could. The sheets were so soft and smooth, she'd stroke her fingers over the pillowcase to lull herself to sleep. The walls were sunset gold, and had pictures of flowers grouped together in their own little garden. She liked her room even better than Mama's, which was fancier, with a pale green canopy draped over the big bed and a chair with strange and beautiful birds flying over it. Mason slept on a pull-out sofa in what her uncle called the upstairs parlor, but most nights in the first few weeks, he'd end up crawling into bed with her or curling up on her rug like a puppy. Harry took them to his restaurant, with its tablecloths and candles and flowers, and gave them a tour of the big kitchen that was all noise and rush and heat. Starting school brought nerves and excitement. A new school, a new place, where no one knew her. That was both scary 
and wonderful. She got to use a new name, too. Here she'd be Naomi Carson, the new girl. And some made fun of her accent, but none of the other kids knew her daddy was in prison. She didn't much like going to the therapist. Dr. Osgood was nice, young and pretty, and she always smelled really good. But it felt wrong, at least at first, to say things to a stranger about her parents and her brother, and more than anything about what had happened that night in the woods. Mason went to another doctor, a man, and liked it fine because his doctor let him talk about video games and basketball. At least Mason said he did. And after a few weeks of talking about video games and basketball, he stopped coming in to sleep in Naomi's bed. Her mother went to another doctor altogether. When she went. A lot of times she said she wasn't feeling up to it and went to bed with one of her headaches. Once a week, she borrowed Uncle Seth's car and drove to the prison. United States Penitentiary, Hazleton. On visiting day. It took nearly eight hours for the trip up and back, for the little bit of time she had to visit through the glass. And she always came back looking beaten up and with one of her headaches. But she wouldn't stop going. Still, everything settled into a kind of routine. With school for her and Mason, the restaurant for Harry the office where Seth worked on investing other people's money, and her mother working part-time as a waitress. Then Seth came home from work one night, with a tabloid paper in his hand, and there was hell to pay. Naomi cringed. She'd never seen her uncle angry, never heard him raise his voice. Now she didn't know what to do. As she was making chicken and rice like Harry had shown her on the big gas cooktop, while Mason sat at the eating counter, dawdling over his homework, and Mama sat staring off into space and pretending to help. Her mother jumped up to stand when Seth slapped the paper down on the counter, and Naomi saw that the front of it had a picture of her father and, oh God, one of her from picture day back at Pine Meadows Middle School. How could you? How could you do this to your children, to yourself? Susan clutched at the little gold cross around her neck. Don't yell at me. I didn't say hardly anything. You said enough. Did you give them this picture of Naomi? Did you tell them you were living here in D.C.? Now her shoulders hunched together. The way, Naomi thought, they used to when Daddy gave her a mean look. They paid me $5,000. I've got to earn my way, don't I? Like this? Selling your daughter's picture to the tabloids? He could have gotten it without me. You know it. And they've been writing about all this for weeks now. It never stops. They didn't have her picture, Susan. As if weary, Seth pulled the knot of his red tie loose. They didn't know y'all were living here. When the phone rang, he held up a hand to stop Naomi. Don't answer it. Let it go to the machine. I had six calls in my office already. It wouldn't take long to dig up an unlisted number. Unlisted to protect you and the children, Suze, from what's going to happen now. They're always at the prison, pestering at me. With her shoulders still hunched, Susan pressed her lips together. There were lines deep around her mouth, Naomi noted. Lines that hadn't been there before that hot summer night. And Tom said we could make some good money. He can't do it himself. It's the law. But you can funnel it to him. Susan flushed deeply, the way she did when deeply embarrassed or angry. I've got a duty to my husband, Seth. They got him locked up, and in what they call the special area. He said how he needs money to pay the lawyer to work out getting him in general population. Ah, oh, Christ, Suze. That's just bullshit. Don't you know bullshit when you hear it? Don't use that language. The language bothers you, but this doesn't. He slapped a hand on the tabloid as the phone began to ring again. Did you read it? No. No, I didn't read it. I don't want to read it. They... They kept pestering me. And Tom said he'd start getting more respect if he could tell his story and I could back him up. Nobody respects tabloids. Even he'd know. He paused, and Naomi snuck a look, though he seemed more sick than angry now. Who else pestered you? Who else have you talked to? I talked to Simon Vance, the writer. True crime. He's a professional. 
His publisher's going to pay me $25,000. It says so right in the contract. You signed a contract. It's professional. Eyes glazed, lips trembling. Susan threw her arms out as if to ward off an attack. And there'll be more when they make the movie deal, he said. Susan. Naomi knew despair now and heard it in her uncle's voice. What have you done? I can't get by waiting tables. And that doctor you make me go to, she said how I need to work on my self-confidence. I need to get a place closer to the prison so I don't have to take your car and drive so far. Tom wants me and the kids closer. I'm not going there. Susan spun around at Naomi's voice, and the heat of anger seared through the tears. Don't sass me. I'm not sassing. I'm saying, I won't go. If you take me, I'll run off. You'll do what your daddy and I tell you. Hysterics. Naomi had heard them often enough in the last four months to recognize them, spiked into Susan's voice. We can't stay here. Why is that, Susan? Seth spoke quietly. Why can't you stay here? You live with a man, Seth. You live in sin with a man, a black man. Naomi, honey? Seth's voice stayed quiet, but his eyes, full of noise, stayed on Susan's face. You and Mason go on upstairs for a bit, will you? I got dinner on. Smells good, too. Just take it off the heat for a bit, all right? You go on up. Help Mason finish his homework. Mason slid off the stool, wrapped his arms around Seth. Don't make us go away. Don't let her take us away, please. I want to stay with you. Don't you worry now. Go on upstairs with your sister. Come on, Mason. We're not going anywhere but upstairs. Naomi looked back as she gathered up Mason's books and papers. Harry's not a sin, but I think it's one for you to say so. You don't understand, Susan began. I understand. I started understanding that night in the woods. It's you who doesn't understand, Mama. Come on, Mason. Seth said nothing as Susan began to cry. Just opened the wine fridge, chose a bottle. He let her stand, hands over her face while he opened it, poured himself a glass. He turned off the ringer on the phone that hadn't stopped. While she wept, he took two careful sips. You've known I was gay since I was 14. Probably longer. But that's when I got up the nerve to tell you. It took me a little longer to come out to Mom and Dad. And they took it pretty well, all things considered. But I told my big sister first. Do you remember what you said? Well, after you asked if I was sure. When she just kept crying, he took another sip of wine. You said, well, don't go putting the moves on anybody I've got my eye on. Where is that girl, Suze? The one who could say just the right thing to me when I was so scared I had jelly in my knees. The girl who made me laugh when I'd be trying not to cry. The one who accepted me for what I am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's fine, Susan. But I'm going to say this to you and you hear me. You hear me, Susan. Don't ever talk about the man I love that way again. You understand me? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Harry's been everything kind and good to me and the kids, and I can see how good he is for you. I'm sorry. But we're still an abomination. Is that what you really think? Is that what your heart tells you? She sat again. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Fourteen years. He wasn't so strict at first. It all came on so gradual, I didn't notice. He didn't want me to work anymore. And I was just pregnant with Naomi, so I thought that would be fine. Being able to make a real nest and stay home with my baby. Then he didn't want to go see Mom and Dad had excuses. Then he didn't want me going. We were a family, and he was head of the house. Then he didn't like them coming to our place either. Holidays, maybe, at first. He was cutting you off from everyone who loved you. 
He said how we were what was important. We needed to make our own lives. And then Mason came along, and he was so strict about how things had to be. But he worked hard and paid the bills. He never laid a hand on me, I swear it, or on the children. How he thought, what he wanted, what he said, it just seeped in. I missed Mom and Dad. I missed you so much, but... He got out another glass, poured wine, set it in front of her. I haven't had anything but church wine since I was carrying Naomi. I used to be like her, didn't I? Strong and brave and a little bit fierce. You were. Yeah. I lost that, Seth. I lost all that. You can find it again. She shook her head. I'm so tired. If I could just sleep. Just sleep until it all went away. She meant what she said, Naomi did. She wouldn't go with me. Or if I made her, she'd run off. Take Mason with her. She wouldn't leave him. Not like I left you. She'd make me choose between my children and my husband. You chose him over your family once before. A woman cleaves to her husband. On a sigh, she picked up the glass, drank. Oh, that's good. I'd forgotten. I did take vows, Seth. I know he broke them. I know he did unspeakable things. At least... Sometimes, I know. But it's hard for me to break those promises, to accept that the person I made them to is the man in prison now. I'm just so tired, all the time. If I could, I'd sleep the rest of my life. It's depression, honey. You have to give the therapy and the medication time. You have to give yourself time. It feels like years already. Seth, every time I drive up to Hazleton, I tell myself it's the last time. I don't want to see those walls, to go through those guards, sit there, talk to him through the glass, to have those reporters and the others who wait for me to come try to talk to me. They yell out things. You don't know. Then stop being their target. She only shook her head. But then, Tom's got a way of turning me around of making me doubt myself. I'll end up doing just what he says to do. I knew talking to those reporters was wrong. I knew signing that contract was wrong. But I'm not strong and brave and fierce, so I did just what he told me. He said, take that money, sign those papers. I was to put money on his prison account and get a house close by. I was to keep coming every week, and bringing the children once a month to start. I'd fight you on that. I might lose, but I'd fight you on taking those kids there. She'd fight me. My girl. On a half sob, Susan knuckled a fresh tear away. She wouldn't go, and she'd fight me like a tiger to keep Mason away. I've got to do better by them. I know it. Don't go back. He laid a hand over hers, felt hers stiffen. Get stronger. Take a few weeks, then see. Talk to the therapist about it. I'll try. I swear. I'm so grateful to you and Harry. I'm so sorry I did what Tom told me, after all you've done for us. We'll get through it. I'm going to go up, talk to the kids for a minute. Then we'll come down, finish making dinner. That's a good start. I love you, Suze. God knows you must. She rose, reached for him. I love you. Don't give up on me. Never happen. She gave him a hard squeeze, then walked out, walked up the stairs. The hardest walk of her life, she thought even harder than that horrible walk through the prison to the visiting area. 
She stepped to Naomi's door and looked at her children, sitting on the floor with Mason frowning over his pencil and worksheet. He'd been crying, and that broke her heart because she'd brought those tears on. But not Naomi. Her eyes were dry and hot when they lifted, met hers. I want to say first I was wrong. What I said down there about your uncle and Harry, it was a wrong and ugly thing to say. I hope you'll forgive me. And I want to say you were right. Both of you were right. We won't be moving away from Seth and Harry. I was wrong about talking to those people. The paper and the magazine and the book writer. I can't go back and not do it, but I'll never do it again. I'm so sorry, Naomi, for letting them have your picture. I don't know how to make it up to you, but I'm going to try to do better. I promise. I'm going to try. It's easy to say that. What I have to do is show you. You need to give me a chance to show you I'll do better. I'll give you a chance, Mama. Mason sprang up, ran into her arms. I love you so much, my little man. She kissed the top of his head, then looked at Naomi. I understand it's going to take longer for you. Naomi only shook her head and ran to her mother. She did better, though there were dips, and some of them deep. She'd opened a door her brother had tried to close by giving the interviews, selling the photographs. It engendered more, with side stories on the serial killer's gay brother-in-law and with reporters stalking him to and from his office. Paparazzi captured photos of Naomi leaving school for the day, one of Mason on the playground. TV talk shows fueled the machine with discussion with experts, and the tabloids were relentless. Word leaked that Pulitzer Prize-winning author Simon Vance had a book deal in cooperation with Thomas David Bowes and his wife, and the media circus began anew. As the new year began, they all sat together in the front parlor, with the fire snapping and the glittering holiday trees shining like hope in the window. Harry made hot chocolate, and Mason sat on the floor with his fondest wish, a puppy that had greeted him on Christmas morning. He'd named the pup Kong after his favorite game. It should have felt good, Naomi thought. The puppy, the hot chocolate, and the tree Harry said would stay up until Twelfth Night. But something was wrong, and she felt it deep inside. So her chocolate sat, going cold in the tall mug. Harry and I have some news, Seth began and Naomi's stomach nodded. They'd be sent away. Too much trouble. All the reporters, and the people who walked or drove by to stare. Someone had egged the house on Halloween, and worse, written on Seth's car. Killer's fag kin. Mama lost her job at the cafe because they found out where she worked, and the manager let her go. It's big news, he continued, taking Harry's hand. Naomi couldn't look up, couldn't stand to see his face when he said they had to live somewhere else. Harry and I are opening a restaurant. She looked up then, stunned, felt the knots begin to uncoil. We found a great space and figured it was time to have our own, Harry winked. We've even got the name, The Spot. Spot's a dog, Mason said, and wrestled with the deliriously happy puppy. Not this spot. It's the spot, because that's just what it's going to be. The spot everyone wants to go. Where is it? As delirious as the puppy, Naomi picked up her chocolate. Can we go see it? You bet. The thing is, it's in New York. You're moving away. We're all moving. To New York City, the West Village. New place, new house, new start. Naomi looked at her mother, who only sat with her fingers twisted together. But you have this house. This is your house. The one in New York will be our house. All of us. Still smiling, Seth patted Harry's leg. Wait until you see it. It's fabulous. You're moving because of us. Because of the people who won't leave us alone. Before Seth could speak, Harry shook his head. That's not altogether wrong. Not altogether right. I've wanted my own restaurant for a long time, 
and this feels like the right time, the right place. The fact is, it's been hard for Seth to work while being bothered, and we both feel the house here, it's closed in now. We've talked it all out. Harry, me, your mama. This is best for all of us. If you don't object to it, we'll have your names changed legally to Carson. I've given my notice at work, and so is Harry. I'm not pretending when I say I'm pretty excited about this. I know you'll have to change schools again. It doesn't matter. Naomi sent Mason a sharp look, in case he said different. And therapists, Seth continued. But we have good recommendations there. I don't need to go anymore. I don't, Naomi insisted. I'd say if I did. If this is a new place and all that, I can be new too. I want to cut my hair. Oh, Naomi, Susan said. I want to. I don't want to look like the girl they've been taking pictures of. I can do it myself. Oh, no, you don't. Seth gave his good laugh. I draw that line. We'll take you to the salon and get it done right. She's heading toward 13, Suze. It should be up to her. They can still find us. But maybe they won't if I don't look the same. Mason already looks some different than he did, because he's bigger and his hair's longer now, and it's darker than it was. I don't care what my name is, as long as it's not Bose. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, Mama. Susan said nothing, only continued to stare down at her hands, fingers twisting in her lap. Can Kong go to New York? I can't leave him. Mason, my man? Harry snatched the puppy up from where it waggled. This here is one urban canine to be. Of course he's going. I know this is uprooting everyone, and it's my doing. No, Susie. I think they would have run us to ground sooner or later anyway. We didn't take enough precautions. Now we will. New place, new start. Seth grinned at Naomi. New look. When? Naomi asked. The house goes on the market tomorrow, and the agent is champing at the bit. One way or the other, we move over your spring break. It's a four-bedroom, so, Mason, you'll have your own room. How about that? Me and Kong? You and Kong. Can we have bunk beds? Bunk beds it is. Naomi, you okay with this? I'm fine with it. You can have friends over again. You'll have to make some new ones, but you can have parties again. You couldn't have your annual Christmas party this year or go out on New Year's like you always do. Harry gave the wiggling dog to Seth. Do you hear everything? Mostly I do. And Mama won't go to prison from New York. I know you've only been a few times since... since you signed those papers, but when you did, you came back sad. New York's farther away. The farther away, the better. I'm trying, Naomi. Mama, you're doing so much better, just like you said. Out of love and out of duty, Naomi got up to squeeze into the chair with her mother, wrapped around her. This'll be even better. I just know it. New York, here we come, Seth said. New York, here we come! Mason shook his fist in the air. Can we go see the Knicks, can we? Nick who, Seth said, and made Mason laugh and laugh. The house sold within two weeks, and for 10000 over asking price, they stayed busy packing up, and Naomi heard how Seth paid the movers extra to come at night, take things off in small trucks, a bit at a time. In March, when spring break came with sweeping winds and some spitting snow, they left Georgetown in the middle of the night, like thieves. She watched the house recede through the windows, felt a hard tug, but then she faced forward, flipped her fingers through the hair Seth had dubbed Naomi, the short and sassy. A new look, she thought. A new place, a new start. She wouldn't look back. Four, New York, 2002. At 16, Naomi Carson lived a life Naomi Bowes could never have imagined. She had a pretty room in a lovely old brownstone in a city full of color and movement. Seth and Harry spoiled her with a generous allowance, shopping trips, tickets to concerts, and most of all, with trust that gave her freedom. She did her best to earn the indulgences. She studied hard, got exceptional grades, with an eye focused on Providence College in Rhode Island, and a degree in photography. 
They'd given her a little point-and-shoot Fuji for her first Christmas in New York, and her love affair began. Her interest blossomed, her skill improved, and netted her a serious Nikon for her 16th birthday. With it, she'd joined the yearbook committee and newspaper at her high school as official photographer and racked up experience and an impressive portfolio she hoped to use to get into the college of her choice. She'd worked hard to lose her accent, wanting more than anything to be just like the other girls, to have nothing left of those first 12 years. Hints of it could slip through, but by the time she'd started high school, the slips were rare. She had friends, dated now and again, though unlike most of her contemporaries, she didn't want a steady boyfriend. Too much drama from what she'd observed. And while she liked kissing, if the boy was any good at it, she wasn't ready to be touched. Thought maybe she never would be. She had let Mark Ryder touch her breast. She'd finally grown some, but accepted that they were never going to amount to much. She'd wanted to see what it felt like. But instead of making her excited, it just made her nervous and uncomfortable. Mark hadn't been happy that was all she let him do, and not much of that. Naomi figured that was his damage and ignored him when he accused her of being a tease, being frigid, being a freak. At 16, she hit 5'10", most of it leg, and was willow slim and pretty enough that boys wanted to touch her breasts. She'd let her hair grow to shoulder length, mostly so she could tie it back when she took pictures. When she won a photography competition, Seth rewarded her with a trip to the salon for highlights and lowlights in her dark blonde hair. Mason hit a growth spurt around 12 and was first string center of his school's basketball team. Sometimes it irritated her to know that her little brother was smarter than she was. Sometimes it made her proud. Either way, he was whip-smart, good-looking, and affable. So he enjoyed the attention and admiration of the girls who fluttered around him, and he had a core circle of guys to hang with. Days could go by without her giving Pine Meadows and all that had happened there a thought. For days, she was just a regular teenager, worrying about her grades, her wardrobe, listening to music, meeting friends for pizza. She kept in touch with Ashley, mostly through email. Ashley had never gone back to Morgantown and lost a whole year before she'd transferred to Penn State. When she'd graduated, Naomi sent her a card and a framed photo she'd taken herself of a cherry tree full of pink blooms and promise. On her 21st birthday, in the first spring of the new century, Ashley gave herself a gift. She took the train to New York to spend a whole day with Naomi. Whenever she looked back at that day, Naomi remembered her own nerves. What should she wear? What should she say? And the speechless pleasure of seeing Ashley waiting, as promised, on the observation deck of the Empire State Building. So pretty, Naomi thought, with long, long blonde hair dancing in the crazy spring breeze. All the nerves, the sudden shyness, vanished the instant Ashley saw her, rushed to her arms wide. You're so tall. You're taller than me. Half of everybody is, but I... Naomi. She held tight, swayed back and forth, back and forth. You came. It's the most special birthday there is, and you came here. I'm having the most special birthday there is because of you. I wanted to spend it with you. I wanted to meet you here, even though it's awesome corny, because I wanted to say that everything I can see from here is because of you. And I wanted to give you this. Ashley took a small wrapped box out of her purse. But it's your birthday. I have a present for you. Let's save mine for later, over lunch maybe. I really want you to have this now, and here, high in the sky. You brought me out of the ground, Naomi. And now we're standing high in the sky. Open it, okay? Overwhelmed, Naomi opened the box and stared at the pendant. Three thin silver chains held an oval with a purple iris suspended in its center. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. I had to say it was my mom's idea. She said how flowers have meanings. This one, the iris, it has a couple of them. One of the meanings is valor, and another is friendship. You qualify for both. I hope you like it. I do. I love it, Ashley. Let's not cry. I want to cry too, but let's not cry today. Let's put the necklace on, and then you have to show me some of the city. I've never been to New York. Okay. Okay. 
It was as hard, she learned, to hold back happy tears as tears of misery. Where do you want to go first? It's your special day. I'm a girl. I want to go shopping, Ashley laughed as she helped Naomi fasten the necklace. And I want to go someplace where I can have a glass of champagne at lunch. I'm legal. I love you, Naomi blurted out, then flushed. That sounds weird. I... No. No, it doesn't. We've got something between us nobody else does. We're the only ones who really understand what it took for both of us to get right here, right now. I love you back. We're going to be friends forever. The therapist. She had gone back for nearly a year after her mother hit one of those deep dips. Asked Naomi how she felt when she saw Ashley. Naomi said it made her remember the light. Her mother worked as a waitress in Harry's restaurant. She did all right, except when she didn't. Her mother sometimes went into the dark and forgot to remember the light. But she had a job, and when she went into the dark, Harry held the job for her. Her doctor called it depression. But Naomi knew that as bad as depression could be, the dark times were worse. In the dark times, her mother took too many pills. Once, when she'd taken too many, she'd had to go to the hospital. She'd taken the too many pills right after Simon Vance's book came out, and there were big ads for it all over the city. He'd titled it Blood in the Ground, The Legacy of Thomas David Bowes, and all the bookstores had big displays. Vance, a serious man with a polished academic style, hyped it all over the talk shows, did in-depth interviews in magazines and newspapers. In those interviews, on those talk shows, Naomi's name came up as often as her father's. That tie, that blood and bloody tie, brought back the nightmares. Whenever Naomi saw those ads, those displays, she knew a terrible part of her life beat inside them. It made her afraid, and it made her ashamed. So she understood her mother's fear, her mother's shame, and trod carefully. But when her mother remembered the light, things were good even simple. Her favorite picture was one she'd taken of her mother dancing with her uncle at a party in the summer. The light had been good, inside and out, and her mother had looked so pretty, laughing into her brother's face. She'd given it to Susan, and one she'd taken with a timer of her mother, her brother, and herself, sitting on the patio of the brownstone in the springtime. When the dark came back, and her mother needed to stay in bed with the curtains tight shut, Naomi would take her food on a tray. She'd know how deep the dark was if she saw those pictures lying face down, as if her mother couldn't bear the sight of her own happiness. Still, weeks would go by, sometimes even months, when everything seemed as normal as normal could be. When it was all about studying, or fretting over a test, bickering with Mason, who could be the bane of her existence, or wondering what she should wear to a movie date. She was at the movies, not on a date, but with a big group of friends, and Mason with a group of his, getting ready to see Spider-Man. She had popcorn and an orange soda and settled down to enjoy the previews when the house lights dimmed. Her friend Jamie immediately started making out with her boyfriend of the moment, but Naomi ignored them and the smacking noises Mason's group made in the row behind her. She loved movies, and truth be told, she liked movies like Spider-Man or The Lord of the Rings more than the love stories her girlfriends sighed over. She liked movies where people had to do something, overcome something, even if it meant getting bitten by a radioactive spider to do and overcome. The screen filled with the point of view of someone driving a truck. She knew about point of view from studying photography. A man's point of view, she noted, one wearing a wedding ring. She liked noticing the details. Then others began to catch her eye, catch her by the throat. She knew those roads. She knew that truck. When he veered off into the woods, bumping over a rough trail, she felt that crushing weight in her chest. Scenes flashed, the root cellar, the photographs, a woman bound on a mattress, eyes full of terror. She couldn't breathe. Flashed to a house near the edge of the woods, and it was their house. God. God, their house. A long-legged girl, thin with long hair, looking out the window on a hot, storm-waiting night. Quick splice to the family in church. Father, 
mother, gangly girl, little boy, and the next of the girl reaching for the lock on a rough wood door. She couldn't watch. The popcorn fell out of her hand, spilled everywhere. The soda landed with a wet slap as she jumped up. Her friends called out, Hey, watch it! What the hell, Naomi? But she was bolting for the doors. She heard the announcer blare behind her, A story of depravity, a story of courage, daughter of evil, coming November. Her knees buckled as she stumbled into the lobby. She fell on all fours while the room spun and her chest burned. She heard Mason's voice miles away as he shook her. Get up. Come on, Naomi. You have to get up. He pulled her up and half dragged, half carried her out into the hot, heavy air of September, the two bright lights of Times Square. Look at me. Look at me. He was nearly as tall as she was, and he had their father's eyes, a deep golden brown. They held both worry and shock. Can't breathe. Yes, you can. You are. Just take it slow. It was... Don't say it. Don't say it here. Anybody asks, you got sick. You felt sick, and we went home. Let's walk. Come on. She managed two shaky steps, then had to stop, brace her hands on her knees, and lean over, afraid she would be sick. But the queasiness passed. The dizziness eased. Did you know? Did you? He took her hand in a firm grip, pulled her down Broadway. I knew they were making it. I didn't know they'd finished everything or that they'd show the damn preview during Spider-Man. That was our house. They filmed a lot of it on location. How do you know? I look stuff up sometimes. I just thought it would take longer to get out. But it's already getting, you know, buzz from the critics and online. Why didn't you tell me? He stopped, shot her a cool look of disdain only a sibling can manage. Because you don't want to hear it. Nobody talks about it. Nobody tells me anything. So I look shit up for myself. I read Simon Vance's book. Now she felt hot and sick all over again. We have to put it behind us. It's been four years. Have you? Have you put it behind you? Yes. Most of the time? A lot of the time? Mama hasn't. Remember when she said she was going for a weekend with that friend of hers? To some spa deal? She didn't. She took the bus and went to see him. In prison. How do you know that? He shrugged, then pulled her inside a coffee shop, wound through to a table. She's done it before. When the rest of us went to Hilton Head for a week, and she said she had a stomach virus, she went to see him then, too. I found the bus tickets in her purse, both those times. And one other. You went through her purse? That's right. He didn't miss a beat. Two Cokes, please, he said, with remarkable ease to the waitress. And I go through her room, so that's how I know she's been writing to him. She has letters from him that come to a P.O. box. You can't disrespect her privacy, Naomi began, then covered her face with her hands. Why is she doing this? She's submissive and dependent. He's dominated her the whole time. It's like emotional abuse and battering. Where do you get that? I look shit up, like I said. He's a psychopath, for Christ's sake, Gnome. You should know. And he's a narcissist. That's why he gives the cops another name and location every couple of years. Another victim and where he buried her. It keeps him in the news. Keeps him getting attention. He's a liar. And he manipulates Mama. He twists her up because he can. Remember when she OD'd? Don't say it like that, Mason. It's what happened. Thanks. He sent the waitress a quick smile when she set their drinks down. He talked her into giving more interviews to Vance, the writer. I don't know how he got in touch with her right off, but he talked her into that, and when the book came out, she couldn't handle it. He knows where we are. I don't know, but he sure as hell knows we're in New York. Then Mason shrugged. He doesn't care about us, and never did. Mama's his target. He cared about you. I don't think so. Do you think I wanted a buzz cut every freaking month? If he made it to one of my Little League games, I could feel his eyes on my back when I came up to bat. I knew if I struck out, fouled out, he'd give me that sneer. That I'm raising a pussy sneer. But he watched me for signs of 
Carson blood. That's how he put it. When I was eight, he told me if I ever showed any fag tendencies, he'd beat the fag out of me. Shocked, she grabbed Mason's hand. You never told me. Some shit you don't tell your sister. At least when you're eight. He scared the crap out of me. You too. We just got used to being scared of him. Like that was normal. Yes. She let it out on a shaky breath. Yes. What kind of mood will he be in? Will he be in a good mood? Everything circled around him. I've gotten some of that out of therapy. I just didn't know you felt that too. Same house, same father. I thought... I thought it was different for you. Because he wanted a son. It was so clear he wanted a son more than a daughter. More than me. He wanted himself. And I wasn't. I'm sorry, Naomi murmured. For what? I was jealous. Because I thought he loved you more. And it's horrible to think that, feel that, because he's... A psychopath? A sexual sadist? A serial killer? Each almost flippant term made Naomi wince. He's all that gnome. But he's still our father. That's just fact. So forget it. I guess I was jealous some because he let you be more. You were Mama's deal. I was his. Anyway, Mama talked to the movie people, too. He pushed her into it, just kept asking and making it like it was the best thing for us, Hugh and me. They kept their hands linked, leaned toward each other over the table now. Why would he want it? The attention, the fame. He's right up there with Bundy, Dahmer, Ramirez. Serial killers, Naomi. Pay attention. I don't want to pay attention. Why do they want to make a movie about him? Why do people want to see it? It's as much about you as him. Maybe more. He turned his hand over, gripped hers harder. The title's you, not him. How many 11-year-old kids stop a serial killer? I don't want... True or false. He'd have killed Ashley if you hadn't gotten her out. Saying nothing, she reached for the pendant Ashley had given her on top of the world, nodded. And when he'd finished with her, he'd have gotten another. Who knows how many he'd have killed. I look like him a little. No, you don't. Your eyes are the same color, that's all. I look like him some. You're not like him. No, I'm not like him. And the determination... The bright intelligence in those eyes spoke as truly as the words, I'm never going to be like him. Don't you be like Mama. Don't let him twist you up. He tried to do that to us all our lives, just like with her. It's praise and punish. It's how they get you to do what they want, how they train you. She understood it, or some of it. And yet, he never hit us. He'd take things away promise something. Then if we didn't do something just the way he said, he'd say how we couldn't go or couldn't have. Then he'd show up with presents, remember? He put up the basketball hoop for me, brought you that American Girl doll. I got that brand new catcher's mitt. You got that little heart locket. Stuff like that. Then if we did anything even a little out of line, he'd take what he'd given us away. Or we couldn't go to a party we'd been counting on or the movies. He said we were going to King's Dominion, and we were so excited. I didn't get my room picked up all the way, so he said we weren't going because I didn't respect what I had. You were so mad at me. I was seven. I didn't get it wasn't you. He didn't want me to get it wasn't you. Maybe we'd give Mama a little sass when he wasn't around because we knew she wouldn't tell him, but we never bucked him, never. We lived by his moods just like you said, and that's how he liked it. She'd never left so much as a pair of socks out of place in her room after that, she remembered. Yes, he'd trained her. What are you reading to come up with all this? A lot of books in the library, on psychiatry and psychology. A lot of stuff online, too. I'm going to study to be a psychiatrist. From her vast advantage of 23 months, she smiled a little. I thought you were going to be a pro basketball player. 
It's what Seth and Harry and Mama need to hear now. And I like basketball. I'll play my ass off if it helps me get into Harvard. Harvard? Are you serious? They don't have scholarships, but they have, like, incentive programs. I'm going to get into Harvard, study medicine, get my degree. And maybe I'll use it to get into the FBI, into behavior analysis. God, Mason, you're 14. You were three years younger when you saved a life. He leaned forward, those golden brown eyes intense. I'm never going to be like him. I'm going to be somebody who helps stop people like him, who learns to understand so they can. You stopped him, Naomi, but he's not the only one. If you do all that, you'll never put it behind you. You put something behind you, Noam? It's got its eyes on your back. I'd rather keep it in front of me, so I can see where it's going. It scared her, what he'd said, and more the cool-headed logic behind it. He was her baby brother, often a pain in her butt, regularly goofy, and a slave to Marvel Comics. And he not only had aspirations, he had lofty ones he spoke of as if he'd already checked them off a list. He'd spied on their mother. Naomi could admit to watching her mother, and closely. Living with Susan was like carrying around something delicate. You watched every step so you didn't stumble, dropped the delicate so it shattered. She could admit to herself, and now to Mason, a huge sense of disappointment with their mother. Mixed in with the sincere effort to make some sort of a life had been lies and deception. And over a man who'd taken lives, ruined others. Was it love that drove her? Naomi wondered. If it was, she didn't want any part of it. She'd try sex because whatever the books and songs and movies said, she knew one didn't have to walk arm in arm with the other. She considered the best way to go about it, knew there was no way she'd discuss birth control with her mother, and as much as she loved Seth and Harry, such a conversation would be mortifying. So the next time she went to the doctor, she'd ask. Then, when she decided to have sex, she'd be prepared. Maybe Mason was right, and if she put it, or tried to put it, all behind her, it meant the whole ugly business could rush up to nip at her heels any time it wanted. Like with a movie. So as fall came to New York, she set it aside. She didn't like the idea of keeping it straight in front of her. Can you just trip over it then? But setting aside seemed like a good compromise. And for right now, her mother got out of bed every day, got dressed, went to work. Naomi kept busy with school, her yearbook, and school paper assignments, and considering which boy it made the most sense to have sex with when the time came. But she made it a point to get her uncle alone and speak to him about the movie. It's coming out in just a few weeks now. Honey, I know. Harry and I plan to talk to you and Mason about it. But not Mama. I'll talk with her. I hate having to. She's doing so well right now. But the movie doesn't change anything. Your lives are here now. That part of your lives is over. Not for her. You need to talk with Mason. Why? You need to talk with him. It's his to tell. Naomi didn't know what her uncle said to her mother, but after a couple of dark days, Susan came out again. She took Naomi shopping for a new dress for homecoming, insisted on making a day of it, a rare thing. Anything looks good on you, honey. You're so tall and slim, but don't you want something with some color? Naomi turned in the dressing room, checked front and back on the short black dress with its cinched waist and square-necked bodice. I'll be taking pictures more than dancing. The black's better for that than the pink. You ought to have a date, Susan insisted. Why aren't you going out with that nice boy anymore, Mark? Oh, Naomi just shrugged. Her mother wasn't the type you told a boy hadn't been satisfied just touching your breast. He's all right, but I didn't want a date for homecoming. Well, when I was your age, having a date for homecoming was the most important thing in the world. So maybe you're smarter than I was. But I just love the pink, and it has that sparkle on the skirt. I don't know if I'm a sparkle pink girl. Every girl deserves some sparkle pink. You want the black, that's fine. Gosh, you're so grown up it takes my breath. But we're getting the pink, too. 
Mama, you can't buy both. I can. You can wear the black since you'll be taking pictures and save the pink for something special. I haven't given you and Mason enough special. Sure you have. Not nearly enough, but I'm going to. We're going to buy those dresses and have a fancy lunch. Then we're going to hunt up the perfect accessories. Naomi laughed, happy to see some sparkle, not on the pink, but in her mother's eyes. My camera is my accessory. Not this time. You'd probably be better off with Seth and Harry there, but we'll find just the right things. Shoes and a bag and earrings. I know you wanted to go shopping with your girlfriends today, but... Mama, I love doing this with you. It all went so fast. I see that now. It seemed so slow. And some days and nights lasted forever. But I see now, looking at you, so grown up, how fast it all went. I wasn't with you. No, no, the sparkle was dying out. You always were. No, Susan laid her hands on Naomi's cheeks. I wasn't. I'm really going to try to be. I... I'm sorry about the movie. It doesn't matter. Don't worry. I love you so much. I love you back. I'm going to take the pink dress out to the sales lady. Have her get started. You go on a change. Then we'll have lunch. They bought the dresses and shoes and a pretty bag that sparkled and made her mother smile again. At Naomi's urging, Susan bought herself a red sweater and suede boots. They came home flushed and exhausted, modeled everything all over again. When Naomi dropped into bed that night, she thought she'd had the best day of her life. October turned brisk, and the light Naomi loved best slanted gold over the burnished trees of the parks. To please her mother, she wore the pink instead of the black to homecoming, and though it wasn't a date, she asked Anton Chaffins, a friend, and the editor of the school paper, to pick her up, and saw the glimmer of tears in her mother's eyes, from joy instead of sorrow, when she and Anson dutifully posed for pictures before she could get out of the house. On Halloween, Susan dressed up as a flapper, coordinating with Seth and Harry in their zoot suits to hand out candy to the ghosts, goblins, princesses, and Jedi knights. As it was the first time Susan had dressed up for the holiday, Naomi browbeat Mason into spending part of the evening at home, instead of out with his friends doing God knew what. It's like she's turned a corner, and she's really moving forward now. Mason, who'd made himself into a vampire hobo, shrugged. I hope you're right. Naomi gave him an elbow in the ribs. Try to be happy, because I am right. But she wasn't. The third week of January. In a quick cold snap that blew in some thin snow, she rushed home at lunch. Anson came with her. You didn't have to come, she said, as she dug out her keys. Hey, any excuse to get out of school for a half hour? Anson Chaffins was a senior, gawky, and on the geeky side, but he was, to Naomi's mind, a good editor and a really good writer. Plus, he'd done her a favor at homecoming. He'd put what she thought of as half-assed clumsy moves on her that night, but hadn't pushed anything. As a result, they got along just fine. She let him in, turned to the alarm pad to key in the code. I'll go up, get my camera bag, which I'd have had with me if you'd told me you wanted shots of the drama club rehearsing. Maybe I forgot, so we could get out for 30. He grinned at her, shoved up his dark-framed glasses. He shoved them up constantly, as if his eagle beak nose served as their sliding board. Behind them, his eyes were pale, quiet blue. He glanced around. Maybe you've got, like, a Coke or whatever? No point leaving empty-handed. Sure, we've always got Cokes. Do you remember where the kitchen is? Yeah, this house is totally cool. You want a Coke while I'm at it? Grab two. She yanked off her gloves, stuffed them in the pocket of her coat. He gave her that half-smirking grin, the one that curled the side of his mouth. Maybe you got chips? She rolled her eyes, plucked off her cap. Probably. Get whatever. I won't be long. Take your time. We've got 25 left on our pass. Hey, this yours? He walked up to a black-and-white photo study of an old man dozing on a park bench with a floppy-eared mutt curled beside him. Yeah, I gave it to Harry for his birthday a couple weeks ago, and he put it right up in the foyer. 
Excelente work, Carson. Thanks, Chaffins. Amused, he called everyone by their last name, insisted everyone use his. She started upstairs. It surprised her to see Kong sitting outside her mother's bedroom door. His habit was to wait in Mason's room, or, in better weather, belly out through the dog door to sun on the patio, or do what he had to do in the corner designated for it. Hey, boy. She gave him a quick rub as she passed, glanced back when he whined. No time, just passing through. But he whined again, scratched at her mother's door, and Naomi felt something flutter and drop in her belly. Is Mama home? Had the good stretch come to a dip? Her mother should be at work, with Harry and Seth. There was, she knew, a party of 22 coming in for retirement lunch, so it was all hands on deck. Naomi eased the door open, saw that the curtains had been drawn closed, a bad sign, and saw in the dim light her mother lying on top of the bed. Mama? She wore the red sweater they'd bought on their shopping spree, rather than her white work shirt and black vest. Kong jumped on the bed, something he was only allowed to do in Mason's room, licked her mother's hand, and whimpered. Her mother lay so still. Mama, Naomi said again, and switched on the bedside lamp. So still, so pale. And her eyes weren't quite shut. Mama, Mama, Naomi gripped Susan's shoulder, shook, took her hand, found it cold. Mama, wake up, wake up. The pills were right there, there by the lamp. No, not the pills, the bottle, the empty bottle. Wake up! Gripping her mother's hands, she pulled. Susan's head lolled, fell forward. Stop it, stop it! She tried to get her arms around Susan, pull her off the bed. On her feet, on her feet, make her walk. Hey, Carson, what the hell are you shouting about? You need to chill. What? Call an ambulance. Call 911. Hurry. Hurry. He stood frozen for a moment, staring as Susan's limp body fell back on the bed and her eyelids opened like shades to show the staring eyes behind them. Wow. Is that your mom? Call 911. Naomi laid an ear to her mother's heart, then began to press on it. She's not breathing. Tell them to hurry. Tell them she took Ellaville. Overdosed on Ellaville. Staring, he fumbled out his phone, punching in 911 with one hand, shoving up his glasses with the other, while Naomi did CPR, puffing out her breath as she worked. Yeah, yeah, we need an ambulance. She overdosed on Elderville? Ellaville! Sorry, Ellaville. Crap, Carson, I don't know the address. She called it out while tears ran down her cheeks, mixed with sweat. Mama, Mama, please. No, she's not awake. She's not moving. Her daughter's doing CPR. I, I, I don't know. Maybe, um, like 40? She's 37, Naomi shouted. Just hurry. They're coming. Anson dropped down beside her, hesitated, then patted Naomi's shoulder. She, the operator, she said they were on their way. They're coming. He swallowed, moistened his lips, then touched his fingers to Susan's hand. It felt soft and cold. Soft, like he could push his fingers through it. Cold, like it had lain outside in the winter air. Um, oh, geez, Carson. Ah, uh, man. Look, hey. He kept one hand on Susan's, put his other on Naomi's shoulder again. She's cold, man. I think... I think she's dead. No, 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 no. Naomi laid her mouth on her mother's, blew in her breath, willed her to breathe back. But there was nothing there. Like the pictures of the women in her father's cellar, there was nothing left in the eyes but death. She sat back. She didn't weep. Not yet, but smoothed back her mother's hair. There was no weight pressing on her chest, no churning in her belly. There was, as in her mother's eyes, nothing. She remembered the feeling, the same as when she'd swum through the air toward the sheriff's office on that hot summer dawn. In shock, she thought. She was in shock, and her mother was dead. She heard the bell. 
got slowly to her feet. I need to go let them in. Don't leave her alone. Okay, I'll, um... Okay. She walked out, sort of like sleepwalking to Anson's eyes. He looked back at the dead woman. They wouldn't get back to school in 30. Five. She wore the black dress to her mother's funeral. She'd never been to a funeral before, and this was more a memorial as there would be no burial. Seth sat down with her and Mason to talk about that. Did they want to take their mother back to Pine Meadows to bury her? No, no, no. Did they want to find a cemetery in New York? It surprised her how firm Mason had been. No cemetery here either. If she'd been happy in New York, she'd still be alive. So they'd had her cremated, and in the spring, they'd rent a boat and send her ashes to the air and the sea. There were tears, of course, but for Naomi, they came from rage as much as grief. She had to talk to the police. For the second time in her life, the police came to her home, went through her home, asked questions. I'm Detective Rossini. I'm so sorry for your loss. I know this is a very difficult time, but I have some questions. Can I come in, talk to you? Naomi knew that some cops on TV and in the movies were female and pretty, but she'd assumed that was mostly made up. But Rosini looked like she could play a detective on TV. Okay. She'd gone to her room because she didn't know what else to do, not with all the police, with Seth and Harry talking to them, and with her mother. Rosini came in, sat on the side of the bed, facing Naomi, who sat in her desk chair with her knees folded up to her chin. Can you tell me why you came home today? Why you and your friend weren't in school? We got a pass to come home. Get my camera. We work on the school newspaper. I'm supposed to take pictures of rehearsal. The drama club. Is he still here? Is Chaffins? Anson? Here? My partner already talked to him. We had him taken back to school. He'll tell everybody. Naomi pressed her face to her knees. He'll tell everybody about my mother. I'm sorry, Naomi. Can you tell me what happened when you got home? Chaffins wanted a Coke. So I told him to go get a couple of them while I went up for my camera. And Kong, our dog. Kong was outside my mother's room. He kept whining. He usually stays in Mason's room or in the courtyard when we're at school, but... Her door was closed, and I opened it. I thought... I thought she was sleeping or not feeling well. I couldn't wake her up. And I saw the pills. I mean, the empty bottle. Chaffins came upstairs, and I told him to call 911. I tried CPR. We took a class, and I knew how. I tried. But I couldn't make her breathe. She was on the bed when you went in. I tried to get her up, to wake her up enough to walk. If she'd taken too many pills, I could make her walk and get her to the hospital. She'd done that before? Taken too many pills? Naomi just nodded, with her face pressed against her knees. When did you see her last, before you came home from school? This morning, Harry fixed breakfast, but she didn't come down for it. I went upstairs, and she was just getting up. She seemed fine. She said she had some errands to run before she went to work, and she'd get breakfast later. She said, have a good day at school. She looked up then. My brother. My brother Mason. Your uncle's gone to the school to get him. Don't worry. Do you know who my father is? Yes, Naomi, I do. And I know that for the second time in your life, you had to face something no one should ever have to. Will everyone know now? Even though we changed our names, will everyone know? We're going to do the best we can to keep that out of the press. Rossini waited a moment. Do you know how often your mother and your father communicated? She wrote to him and went to see him a few times, too, since we moved to New York. Mason found out, and he told me. She pretended she wasn't, but she was. We didn't tell Uncle Seth or Harry. The movie... 
She talked in the movie People because he wanted her to. Mason found that out, too. But she'd been trying really hard, and for a couple months or more, she'd been doing good. She'd been happy. Happier? I don't guess she's ever been happy since that night I found. All right. Your uncle said he'd call your grandparents, and Mr. Dobbs is right downstairs. Do you want me to have him come up, stay with you? No. Not right now. Ma'am? You asked about them communicating. Did Mama talk to him today? This morning? I don't believe your mother and father spoke today. But there's something. He wrote something to her, didn't he? Something that had her coming home, after she'd been doing so well and taking those pills. We're asking questions so we can give you answers, Rosini said as she rose. You have some. I didn't see a note in her room. I wasn't looking. I was trying to... I didn't see a note, but she had to write one. She had to say goodbye. The sob wanted to rip out of her chest. However sad she was, she loved us. She did. She'd say goodbye. I'm sure she loved you. She did leave a note, addressed to all of you. It was in your uncle's room. She put it on his dresser. I want to see it. I have a right to read it. It was addressed to me. I want to read what she wrote before she took those pills and left us. Your uncle said you would. Wait here. What had he done? Naomi wondered. And the rage began to root. What had he done to make her mother so sad so fast, so fatally? She stood up when Rosini came back in. She wouldn't read this last thing her mother said to her, curled in a chair, but on her feet. You'll need to read it through the evidence bag. It still needs to be processed. It doesn't matter. Naomi took the bag, stepped to the window and the thin winter light. I'm so sorry. I made so many mistakes. So many bad choices. Told so many lies. I told lies to the people who deserved me to tell the truth. I told them because he said I should. No matter how many times I tried to break free, I just couldn't. Now he has. After all the mistakes I made, all the hurt I caused, because Tom said I should. He's divorcing me, so he can try to marry some other woman. One who's been riding him and coming to see him for more than two years. He sent me papers from a lawyer for a divorce, and a letter that said such cruel and awful things. But some of those things are true. I am weak and stupid. I am useless. I didn't protect my children when I had the chance. Seth, you did that. You did that, Harry. You gave us a home. And I know you'll look after Naomi and Mason. Do right by them as I never have. Mason. You're so smart, and you made me proud every day. I hope one day you'll understand why Mama had to go away. Naomi, I'm not strong and brave like you. It's so hard to try to be. I'm so tired, honey. I just want to go to sleep. You'll look after Mason, and both of you will listen to Seth and Harry. You'll have a better life now. One day, you'll know that's true. One day you'll forgive me. Why should I forgive her? She left us because he didn't want her anymore? She came home and took all those pills because she was tired? Naomi, no. No, don't make excuses. You're the police. You didn't know her. You don't know me or any of us. But you know what this is? She threw the bag on her bed fisted her hands as if she could fight something. It's what a coward does. He killed her. He killed her just like he killed all those other women, but they didn't have a choice. She did. She let it happen. She let him kill her when we were all right here. You're right. I think you're right. But there are other means of torture besides physical. I can't tell you how to feel, but I can tell you I think you have a right to be angry. You have a right to be mad as hell. When some of the mad wears off, I hope you'll talk to someone.
Another therapist? I'm done with that. Done. A lot of good it did her. You're not your mother. But if you don't want to talk to a therapist, to a friend, to a priest, to your uncle, she took a card out of her pocket. You can talk to me. You're the second cop who's given me a card and said that. Did you talk to the other cop? We moved away. Well. Rossini set the card on Naomi's dresser, then walked over and picked up the evidence bag. Cops are good listeners. Detective Angela Rossini. Anytime. So three days later, Naomi put on the black dress. She used the curling iron because her mother had liked it best when she wore her hair long, with some waves in it. She didn't give any of her angry words to Seth. He looked sickly and shaken. She didn't give them to Mason, not with a hollow look in his eyes. Or to Harry, who seemed to need to tend to all of them at once. She kept them inside, where they crawled through her like fiery ants, and went to the restaurant. They had closed for the day to hold the memorial. Harry had done most of the work, insisted on it, putting out flowers and photos, choosing music, preparing food. Her grandparents came. She and Mason saw them several times a year since they'd moved out of Pine Meadows, and it hadn't taken long to understand that all the hard things their father had said about their mother's parents had been more lies. They were kind and loving. Forgiving, she thought. They'd forgiven the daughter who'd cut them out of her life and kept their only grandchildren from them. They'd paid for all the therapy and never, at least not in her hearing, said an unkind word about their daughter. They never spoke of Thomas David Bowes. Everyone who worked at the restaurant came, and so many of Seth's and Harry's friends. Some of her teachers, some of Mason's came. Some parents brought some of their friends, at least for a short time. And Detective Rossini came. I didn't know the police came to funerals like this. I wanted to pay my respects. And to see how you were doing. I'm all right. It's hardest, I think, on my uncle. Even harder than it is on my grandparents. He thought he could save her. He thought he had. He tried, every day. Harry, he tried too. But right now, he's mostly worried about his Seth. About Mason and me, too, but mostly about his Seth. Harry worked hard to put all this together, to make it look so nice, to try to make it that celebration of life people talk about. But she didn't have much of a life to celebrate. I think you're wrong. She had you and Mason, and that's a celebration. That's a nice thing to say. It's a true thing. Did you take that picture? Naomi glanced at the photo of her mother dancing with Seth. How did you know? I'm the police. Rossini smiled a little. It's a happy moment, and you knew how to capture it. But that's my favorite. Rossini stepped over to the photo Naomi had taken with a timer, her mother flanked by her children. Harry had set it in front of a big vase of pink roses because her mother had favored pink. You can see she was proud of you and your brother. Is that what you see? Yes. Cops are good listeners, and they're trained observers. She was proud. Hold on to that. I have to get back to work. Thank you for coming, Naomi said, as she'd said to everyone. Surprised, she stood where she was as Mark Ryder came up to her. Hey, he said. Hey. He was tall. Great-looking with big brown eyes, glossy hair that curled just the right amount at the ends. I'm really sorry about your mom and all. Thanks. It's nice you came. It's nice. I'm sorry, you know. My mom died when I was a baby. But I met your mom. My dad married her when I was about three. She's great. And she's like, mom, but my, you know, mom died. I didn't know. I'm sorry, Mark. Yeah, well, it's hard, you know, and I wanted to say I'm sorry. Touched, she stepped closer, hugged him, realized the mistake when he hugged her back, with a hand sliding down to her butt. She pulled back. It's my mother's memorial. 
Yeah, yeah, sorry, I just thought... He shrugged, managed a half laugh. Whatever. Thanks for coming, she told him. You can get a soft drink at the bar if you want. Yeah, maybe. See you around. Alone, Naomi turned. She could sneak into the storeroom, get some quiet, get some time alone before anyone noticed she wasn't there. But she nearly walked into Anson Chaffin's. Um, hey. He shoved up his glasses, then stuck his hands in his pockets. I guess it's weird, but I was, like, you know, there, so I thought I should come and say... Whatever. Let's go sit over there. People won't bug me if I'm sitting down with somebody. I saw some of the guys from school, but I kind of hung back until they went off. It's weird, like I said. People want to know, you know, what it was like, and don't want to ask you. Well, plus, you haven't been back at school. Are you coming back? Yeah, next week. It'll be weird. She gave a half laugh. He wrote better than he talked, she thought. I need to keep up my grades. Mason, too. We have to think about getting into college. I'm heading to Columbia next fall. You got in? It looks good for it. I got a couple backups, but it looks good. I'm going to study journalism. You'll be good at it. Yeah. He shifted. So, I heard a couple of the cops talking. You know, they had to take my statement and all that. And I heard a couple of them talking about Bose. Your mother being his wife? Thomas David Bowes? Naomi clutched her hands together in her lap, said nothing. I knew the name because of the movie, and I read the book, too. You're that Naomi. Does everyone know? Like I said, I heard the cops talking, and I knew who they were talking about, and I'd read the book. I did some research. More, I mean. You're Naomi Bowes. Carson, that's my legal name. Yeah, I get that. Look, I didn't say anything to anybody. Don't. I just want to finish school. Mason needs to finish school. I haven't told anybody, but look. Other people can do research, especially now that the movie's such a big hit. Hell, lots of kids who don't read go to the movies. What are you going to do? I'm going to finish school. I'm going to go to college. I won't tell anybody, right? He shoved his glasses back up his nose. It's just between you and me, okay? I want you to tell me the story. Hold on. He held up a hand, edged closer, with his glasses sliding down again. He just took them off. From your point of view, your story, Carson. We can keep where you live and all that out of it. I won't tell anybody. And that's a lot, right? Because I want to be a journalist, and this is a really big story. But I'll hold back some details. He picked up his glasses, sat back, pushed them on. I don't have to do that. My mother just died. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put it together. I don't tell anybody, and you give me the whole story first person. We'll go out a few times, somewhere quiet, and I'll record your story. It's a big deal. And if I do it right, it could land me an internship at the Times. You've never talked to anybody. Not Simon Vance, not the scriptwriter, the director, the actors. Your father did. Your mom, too, but not you. I did my research. They were friends. She thought they were friends. He'd been with her when she'd found her mother. He'd called the ambulance. And now... Simon Vance and the screenwriter beat you to it, Chaffins. Nobody's going to care. Shit, are you kidding me? Everybody's going to care. Look, we'll meet up. You can come to my place during the day after school. My parents will be at work, and nobody has to know. I got a split. I'll text you when and where. When he rushed off, she sat a moment, a little stunned, a little sick. Why was she surprised, she wondered. Because she'd thought he was, at least a little bit, a friend. Should she be grateful he hadn't already published what he knew in the school paper? The hell with it, she thought. Just the hell with all of it. She got up, before someone could sit down and try to comfort her, and made her way back to the kitchen. She could slip into the storeroom from there for the belated alone. But Harry was right behind her. He pointed to a stool. Sit. And sat himself on a stack of boxes. Now tell me what that boy said to upset you. It wasn't anything. 
Don't lie to me. She jerked back. He never used that sharp, angry tone. Harry. We're going to stop lying to each other. I knew your mother was lying about going to the prison, about keeping in contact. I knew, and I kept it from Seth. I didn't tell him because it would upset him. And that's a lie. A mission is a lie. You knew? And maybe, if I'd said something. He rubbed his tired eyes. We'll never know. We knew. Mason found out and told me. We didn't say either. Well, where did all that get us, baby? Look where we are now. No more lies. No more omissions. He leaned forward, took her hands. His eyes, so blue against the caramel, held that innate kindness he showed her every day. When Seth asked me about taking you, your brother, your mother into the home in D.C., I said, of course. But I thought, it won't be for long. Of course we have to help. Seth needs to help his family. But they'll get on their feet and get their own in, oh, six months or a year. I could open our home for a year. I did it because I love Seth. I know you do. What I didn't count on was falling in love with you, with Mason, with your mother. That's what happened. When we talked about selling the house, moving to New York, I didn't do it just for Seth. I did it for all of us, because we'd become a family. You're my girl, Naomi. Same as if we were blood. I mean that. I love you, Harry. I do. So much. The tears came then, hot but clean. I know how much you've done for us, all you've given us. I don't want to hear about that. I could tell you what you've done for me, what you've given me. I bet it balances out pretty square. What I want and need, I think what we all want and need from today on, my baby, is truth. Let's start right there. What did Anson say to put that look on your face? He knows who we are. He heard some of the police talking, and he figured it out. He wants to be a journalist, and he wants the story. From me. I'll have a talk with him. No, sir. No, Harry. What's the point? He knows, and you can't make it so he doesn't. He said he wouldn't say where I... We are. Would leave out some details, but... You don't trust him. Why should you? She thought of Mark's hand sliding down to her butt of Chaffin's blind ambition. I don't trust anybody but you, Seth, and Mason. We can put you and Mason in private school. It'll just happen again. We can move again, and it'll happen again. Mama's gone, and it was hardest on her. We couldn't protect her from him or herself. Nobody's going to hurt my baby girl. I thought he was a friend. But nobody stays your friend when they find out who you are. If they don't, they weren't worth your friendship. But how do you know, ever, who is? She remembered the card the policewoman who looked like she could play one on TV had given her and took it out of her bag. Detective Rossini. What about her? I think maybe she's a friend. He smokes pot. Chaffins. Sells it a little, too. Harry sighed. Naomi, I understand peer pressure and the need for experimentation. And this isn't the time to... I don't do drugs. Neither does Mason. She frowned at the card as she spoke. He wants Harvard and the FBI. Mason won't take any chances with that. Chaffins wants Columbia and the New York Times. It wouldn't look good for him to get arrested for possession. Maybe suspended from school. Harry's eyebrows lifted. Blackmail? That's what he's doing. I'd be writing him out to the cops, and I'm not proud of it. But I think Detective Rossini would go have that talk with him, and it might work. Long enough for me to write the story. What? What story? I'm not as good a writer as Chaffins, but I can do this. It came to her, like a lightning flash on a hot summer night. If I write the story, as Naomi Bowes, and sell it, maybe even to the Times, he's got nothing. I just need some time, and Detective Rossini could get me that. I write the story, like Chaffin said, 
from my point of view. And then he can't. No one would care after that what some jerk writes about me. Mason, he won't care. Honey, are you sure? No one's going to do this to me. To us. I'm sure. Talk to the detective. If you decide this is really what you want to do, well, we're going to be behind you. She went back to school, forced herself to continue with the yearbook committee, the school paper. She ignored the furious stares from Chaffins and completed the crap assignments he handed her because whatever Rossini had said to him kept him quiet and she could comfort herself that in four months he'd graduate and be out of her life. After the Oscars, where the screenwriter for Daughter of Evil took home the gold, and the now 15-year-old actress who'd played Naomi Bowes walked the red carpet in Alexander McQueen, after the movie tie-in release of the book hung for 16 weeks on the bestseller list, the New York Times ran a three-part article on consecutive Sundays. She wasn't at all surprised to receive an angry email from Anson Chaffins. First you sick that cop on me, now this? You're a lying bitch. And I'll tell everybody who you are, where you are, what you are. I gave you the idea. You stole my article. She wrote back only once. My life, my story, and I never agreed to your deal. Tell anyone you want. But he didn't tell anyone. On her own, she sent Detective Rossini flowers as a thank you. She changed her email address, her phone number, and buckled down to focus on her schoolwork, her photography, and her family. She told herself she'd put the past in the past now, where it needed to stay, and she'd really begun her life as Naomi Carson. Depth of Field Ends and Beginnings There Are No Such Things There Are Only Middles Robert Frost 6. Sunrise Cove, Washington State, 2016 it hadn't been impulse. Naomi assured herself of that as she roamed the rambling old house on the bluff. A little rash, maybe. A gamble? Absolutely. She'd taken plenty of gambles. So what was one more? But holy shit, she'd bought a house. A house older than she was, about four times older. A house on the opposite side of the country from her family. A house, she admitted, that needed work. And furniture. And a serious cleaning. An investment, she told herself, wincing at the grimy kitchen with its dated appliances, surely older than she was, and cracked linoleum floor. So she'd clean it up, fix it up, paint it up. Then she could put it back on the market. Or rent it out. She didn't have to live there. That was a choice, something else she'd made plenty of before. It would be a project, something to keep her busy when she wasn't working. A home base, she considered, and tried the faucet of the chipped porcelain sink. It coughed, banged, and then spewed out fits of water. A home base with bad plumbing. So she'd make a list. Maybe it would have been smarter to have made a list before buying the house, but she'd make one. Plumber went straight to number one. Gingerly, she opened the cabinet under the sink. It smelled a little dank, looked dingy, and the ancient bottle of Drano didn't inspire confidence. Definitely find a plumber. And a whole bunch of cleaning supplies. She blew out a breath, pulled her phone out of a pocket of her cargo pants, opened an app. Hire plumber went on first. She added more as she wandered back out, through a dining room with a wonderful fireplace of carved black wood. A chimney sweep. Did people still become chimney sweeps? Somebody must inspect and clean chimneys. And since there were five fireplaces in the old house, chimney sweep definitely went on the list. Why had she bought a house with five fireplaces and ten bedrooms and six and a half baths? She wouldn't think about that now. Now she'd work on what to do about it. The floors were solid. They needed refinishing, but the real estate agent had really sold the wide-planked ponderosa pine. She could do some research, see if she could refinish them herself. Otherwise, flooring guy. And then there was tile guy. Would that be the same person? What she needed, Naomi thought as she started up the creaky stairs, 
was a contractor, and bids, and a plan. What she needed, she corrected, as she stood on the landing where the hallway shot left and right, was her head examined. How the hell could she manage a house this size and one in this shape? Why in God's name had she tied herself to this remote dot of land in Washington State? She liked to travel, new places, new views, new ideas. Just her and her equipment, free to go anywhere. And now she had this anchor of a dilapidated house weighing her down. No, it hadn't been impulse. It had been lunacy. She walked past dingy walls and, okay, gorgeous old doors, by far too many rooms for one solitary woman, and felt that old familiar pressure in her chest. She would not have an anxiety attack because she'd been an idiot. Breathing slowly, deliberately, she turned into what the real estate agent had billed as the master. It was big and bright, and yes, the floors needed work, and the walls were an awful faded blue that looked like cloudy pool water, and the old glass slider needed to go. But she pulled and tugged it open on its rusted runners and stepped out onto the wide, sturdy deck. And this was why, she thought, as all the pressure lifted into sheer bliss. This was why. The inlet, deep gleaming blue, curved and widened, split around knots of land, green with the earliest whispers of spring. Shorelines climbed up, upholstered with trees, as the water traveled out through a narrow channel into deeper blues. In the distance, just west, mountains rolled up against the sky to back a thick forest of green shadows. And straight out, beyond the inlet, the channel, the knots and knuckles of land spread the deeper blue of the sound. Her bluff wasn't particularly high, but it afforded a pure, unobstructed view of water and sky and land. And for her, an indescribable sense of peace. Her place. She leaned against the rail a moment, breathed it in. She'd known it was her place the moment she'd stepped out here on that breezy February afternoon. Whatever needed to be done to make the house habitable would be done. But no one could take this view, this sense of hers away. Since she'd left her equipment downstairs, she took her phone, switched to camera mode. She framed in a shot, Checked it. Took another. She sent it to Mason, Seth, Harry. What she listed in her contacts as, my guys, with a simple message. This is why. She tucked her phone away. Thought, the hell with lists. She was going into town and buying supplies. She'd figure out the rest as she went. The little town made most of its living off the water with its marina, dive shop, the kayak and canoe rentals, the fish market. On Water Street naturally. Gift shops, coffee shops, restaurants, and the Sunrise Hotel faced the curve of the marina with its bobbing boats. She spent a couple nights in the hotel when she'd followed her nose into Sunrise Cove. She'd wanted to add to her portfolio of stock photography, beef up her portfolio of fine photography, and had found plenty of studies for both. She'd caught sight of the house, just a piece of it, outside her hotel window, and found herself amused and intrigued by the way it angled away from the town, its people, toward the water and the wood. She'd wanted some photos of it, had asked for directions. Before she knew it, she was heading out to what the locals called Point Bluff with John James Mooney, realtor. Now it belonged to her, Naomi thought, and parked in front of the grocery store. A few hundred dollars later, she loaded up food, cleaning supplies, paper products, light bulbs, laundry detergent, which was stupid as she didn't know if the old washer worked, plus a basic set of pots and pans, a coffee maker, and a vacuum cleaner she'd purchased at the neighboring hardware store. She'd also gotten the name of a contractor from both places, the same name, so obviously a popular guy. Deciding there was no time like the present, she called him then and there, made an appointment to meet him for a walkthrough in an hour. She headed back, Pleased it took a solid ten minutes on winding roads to reach the house. Far enough away for privacy, close enough for convenience. Then she opened the back of her forerunner, looked at the hall, and swore the next trip in, she'd make a list. That list, she realized when she started unloading groceries, would have included cleaning the refrigerator before buying food to go in it. By the time she'd cleaned it, filled it, and started out for the next load, she saw the black truck winding up the road toward her. 
She slipped a hand in her pocket, closed it over her pocket knife. Just a precaution. The truck pulled up. A man in a ball cap and sunglasses leaned out one window. A big black dog with a polka dot bandana leaned out the other. Miss Carson? That's right. Kevin Banner. He said something to the dog that had its head retreating before he got out of the truck. She judged him early 30s, sandy hair curling out from under the cap, a good, strong jaw, a compact build. He held out a hand. It's nice to meet you. Working man's hand, she thought, and relaxed. Thanks for coming. I heard somebody from back east bought the place. It's something, isn't it? It's something. He grinned, shifted his weight. It's been sitting empty about ten years now. I guess Mr. Mooney told you. Since Mr. Parkerson died, and Mrs. Parkerson had to let it go. They ran it as a B&B &B for more than twenty years. She just couldn't keep it up, and ended up moving to Seattle to live with her daughter. Rented it out for a while here and there, but... A big place. A lot of maintenance. He hooked his thumbs in his front pockets, rocked back on his heels as his gaze traveled over the long rectangle of building. You got that. I threatened to buy it a while back. It's got history. And that view. But my wife threatened to divorce me. Now maybe I'll get my hands on it. And get to keep my wife. Let's take a look. Is your dog okay in the truck? She'll be fine. The dog rested her head on the dash, sent Naomi a soulful look. I like dogs. You can bring her if you want. Thanks. She's a good dog. Used to job sites. Come on, Molly. The dog leaped straight out of the window, landed neat as a gymnast, then pranced over to sniff Naomi's boots. Nice jump, pretty girl. When Naomi stroked Molly's head, the dog did a full-body wag. Maybe you can give me an idea what you're looking to do. Bring it into the 21st century. I don't mean the look, Naomi added. But the plumbing, the lighting, the kitchen, bathrooms. I'm hoping a lot of it's cosmetic, she said as they started inside. I can paint and handle simple DIY, but there's a lot of clunking and hissing when you use the water, and I don't know if it's safe to use any of the fireplaces. I considered tackling the floors myself, refinishing, but realized that would probably take me two or three years. Windows? What about them? Replacing them with double-paned, low-E glass. That's going to be more energy efficient, and while it costs now, it saves you in utility bills. It gets drafty in here during the winter. That can go on the list, and we'll see. I'm going to want to take a look at the wiring, make sure it's safe and up to code. We can look at the chimneys, make sure you're good there. You want to keep them wood burning? I hadn't thought about it. The dog wandered around, sniffing, exploring. It struck Naomi that Kevin did nearly the same. You've got some fireplaces upstairs, right? If you don't want to haul wood upstairs, you could think about gas logs on the second floor. That is a thought. Cleaner. You thinking of a B&B? &B? No, I'm not. Not right now. He nodded, made notes, muttered a little to himself as they toured the first floor. When they came to the kitchen, he took his cap off, scratched his head, fixed it back on again. I'm going to tell you straight. This kitchen's a pure gut job. If you'd said different... I'd wonder why everybody I asked recommended you. All right, then. Now, I'm betting the hardwood runs right on through, under this ugly-ass linoleum. Really? Do you think so? The idea balanced out against the notion of needing to replace a zillion windows. Can we check? If you don't mind me messing up a corner. You can't make ugly-ass more ugly. He chose a corner, pried it up with his own pocket knife. Oh, yeah. Got your ponderosa pine. Hot damn. Take this crap up, sand, refinish, seal, right? That's what I'd do. That's what I want. All right, then. With his sunglasses hooked on the breast pocket of his T-shirt, Kevin ran steady hazel eyes over the space. I can work up a couple designs for you in here. I'll take a stab at it. I haven't designed a kitchen, but I've shot plenty of them. Photography, she explained. For catalogs, websites, stock photos. Hands on hips, she walked the room, imagined it down to the bare walls and floor. It's roomy, and that's a plus. I'd want an island, good size, for prep and for eating. I don't want sleek, but I don't want country either. More contemporary rustic. So dark cabinets, glass-fronted, go light on the countertops, figure out an interesting backsplash, and 
Have fun with the lighting. There's room for double wall ovens there. I don't know what I'll do with double ovens, but my uncles swear by them. Gas cooktop and a snappy exhaust, like a focal point. Farm sink under that window, and that bathroom's awkward anyway. Take that out, make it a walk in pantry, and get rid of this pokey little back door. Open it up to that deck, that view. Big ass double doors, full glass, no panes. He'd been making notes, nodding, but looked up now. Miss Carson? Naomi. Naomi, I love my wife. She sent him a careful smile as she turned. That's good. I fell for her when I was 16 and didn't get up the courage to ask her out for nearly a year. I might still be thinking about kissing her for the first time if she hadn't taken that bull by the horns, so to speak. I was 23 when we got married. She took that over, too, or I'd be working up the nerve to ask her. We got two kids. Congratulations. I'm just saying, I love my wife, and I tend to move slow in some areas. But if you and I had a longer acquaintance, I'd kiss you right on the mouth. Should I anticipate that for later? He grinned again. It could happen, if you keep realizing my hopes and dreams. It was taking out that skinny door there that did it. It needs the view. Why have that view and keep it outside? If you let me take out that wall there, I'd give you open concept into the dining room. It would make it more of an entertaining space. Living room's at the other end of the house. But you'd have this area here so people could gather when you're cooking. It could go on the list. They went through, bottom to top, and then Kevin went out for his tape measure and went through it again. By the time he'd finished, she'd put her supplies away and poured them both Cokes. They drank them on the front porch, watching the sun burn its way down through the trees. I'll work up an estimate. You might want to be sitting down when you read it over. I already got that picture. Once you do, we can talk about priorities. What you want done right off, what can maybe wait some. I can give you the name of a good landscaper while you're reeling from estimates. I'll take it, but I'm going to tackle some of that myself. All right. Thanks for the Coke. He handed her the empty glass. I appreciate the chance to look the place over. If you give me the job, I'll do good work for you. I believe you would. I'll be in touch. Let's go, Molly. She watched him drive off, felt the silence fall just like the sun behind the trees. She'd do good work here, too, she thought, and went inside to make herself a temporary nest and workspace. She spent mornings taking pictures, sunrises, all those holy colors blending, the water, trees, birds. In the afternoons, she hunted up secondhand stores, flea markets. She bought a desk and chair, a couple of lamps, and the happy prize of an old metal glider and matching chair. Evenings, she'd put together a sandwich or a scramble some eggs, pour some wine, and work on the photos she'd taken that morning. She could and did sell some fine photography through her website and through a gallery in New York, but her real bread and butter came from the royalties on stock photos. She'd learned she could work anywhere, in her car, in a campground, in a motel room. But this, working in her own house, with the quiet everywhere and the light playing on the water, felt like a gift, one made possible by her grandparents and the trust funds they'd set up for her and Mason. Grateful, she sent them regular emails with photos. Since college, she'd call them every week, no matter where she'd been, what she'd been doing. They'd lost their daughter, twice, to Naomi's way of thinking. She made certain they never lost their granddaughter. She took before photos of the glider and chair, playing up the texture of the rust, the peeling paint, the square lines, and the pop from the bucket of purple pansies she'd planted and set on the deck with them. She'd take aftershots, too, send both home, but she'd play with the before shots on her computer, put them up on her website for sale. It took nearly a week for Kevin to bring the estimate. This time, he had his six-year-old son Tyler as well as Molly. The boy was a mini version of his father, and so cute, Naomi wished she had cookies. We're on our way to pick up a pizza, and figured we'd drop this off. You might want to have a stiff drink and sit down before you read it over. Uh-oh. Yeah, well, like I said, you can figure out priorities. I gave you my mind on that in there. And if you want to take on some DIY, we can save you some money. Take some time, think about it, just let me know. I got another name in there, too. You might want another bid, and I know that company does good work. 
They're out of Hoodsport. Thanks. Let's go, team. The boy raced back to the truck with the dog. Kevin paused. Don't forget that stiff drink. Naomi tapped the manila envelope on her palm, took it back inside to the kitchen. A glass of wine couldn't be wrong, she thought, and poured one. And since, other than her desk chair, it was her only option, she went out on the deck and sat in the half-sanded glider. She sat a moment, drinking wine, watching the water and the bright red kayak that slid along it toward the shore. She set the wine down on the drop cloth, opened the envelope. Holy shit. Oh, hello, six figures. She wished she'd gone for stronger than wine, like a few tequila shots. She hadn't bought any tequila as yet, but that would be rectified. She took another deeper drink of wine, blew out a breath, and read over the estimate. So much work. The kitchen? She'd expected that price tag. And in fact, he'd bid a little under what she'd been braced for. The windows. There were so many windows. And replacing them added up. She'd done some research there, and his price was, again, slightly under what she'd calculated. Contractor's discount, she mused. He was passing some of that on, and that was more than fair. She got up, walked up and down the deck, sat down, read on. The plumbing, the electrical, spray insulation in the attic, nothing sexy there but necessary. God, the floors, so much square footage. Why had she bought such a big house? To answer her own question, she looked up at the view. The sun hung low, sparkling over the blue. A bird, white and wide-winged, just sailed over it. She read through the estimate again. She could take on at least some of the painting. She wasn't afraid of hard work. There was bound to be something else she could handle, and corners she could cut. But she didn't want to cut corners. She leaned back, gliding slowly. She could get a lot of photos out of the demo, the rehab, Photos of workers, of broken tiles, of tools, and lumber. If she played it right, she could pull in some income even while coughing up the outlay. She had savings, she reminded herself. She'd lived carefully, didn't need a lot to live. Her biggest expenses before the house had been her Hasselblad and her forerunner. She could do this. She looked out over the water again. She needed to do this. She'd been to every state, working her way. She'd been to Europe twice, working her way. And nowhere had ever drawn her like this spot, this place. She took out her phone, called Kevin. Do you need an ambulance? He made her laugh. She didn't make friends easily, but he made her laugh. I wished for tequila shots, but I toughed it out. When can you start? What? Sorry, what? Let's go for it. When can you start? I might need an ambulance. Wow. Wow. Listen, I'm kicking myself as I say this, but don't you want to get that other bid? I bought this place because it spoke to me. It said words I needed. You get that. I'm going to try to do some of this, like the painting. I might be able to help with a demo or something to cut it down a little. But I'm going for it. When can you start? Monday. I'm going to draw up a contract, and I'll put in that you're taking on the painting. That doesn't work out, we'll sub it for you. I drew up the kitchen design you outlined, but... Yeah, I saw it. We'll go with it. And you can tell me where I look for the countertops, the cabinets, and all of that so I can figure out what I want. It's a lot to figure. Yeah, so let's get started. Naomi, I might have to kiss you on the mouth. My wife will understand. She hoped his wife was as, well, adorable as he was. We'll cross that bridge. I'll come by with the contract tomorrow. And I'll give you a check for materials, like it says here. I'd appreciate it. You got a favorite color? Sure, all of them. Good enough. See you tomorrow. And thanks, Naomi. She went inside, topped off her wine, and toasted herself in her soon-to-be-gutted kitchen. He brought the contract, along with his wife, the very pretty Jenny, Tyler and four-year-old Maddie, a sweet, toe-headed version of her father, and he handed her a pot of rainbow tulips along with the contract. You said all of them. Favorite color. They're great. Then he took her by the shoulders, kissed her. Tyler covered his eyes. Maddie giggled. Jenny just beamed. He's had ideas about what needed to be done to this place longer than I can remember. And he said yours ran right down the same lines. Kevin's the best. 
He's going to make it beautiful for you. Jenny's biased. Kevin wrapped an arm around her shoulders. But honest, I've got a dumpster coming first thing Monday morning. The crew will be here by 7.30. We're going to be loud. I'll deal. See you Monday, then. They piled into a minivan, and, like the dog, Kevin stuck his head out the window. We're going to rock this place! Naomi put the coffee maker in her bedroom on the desk, filled her cooler with soft drinks, lunch meats, some fruit. She could set her Coleman stove on the deck. She'd put meals together in much less cozy circumstances. Monday, she gave herself the day off and joined in gutting the kitchen and adjoining bathroom. She swung a sledgehammer, wielded a pry bar, helped haul out old counters, old cabinets, and exhausted, aching, fell dead asleep before the forest swallowed the sun. Every morning, the hammering started. She'd get coffee, a granola bar, her camera. The crew got used to her, stopped posing. She took pictures of calloused hands, hands bleeding at the knuckles, of sweaty torsos, steel-toed work boots. Evenings, in the blessed quiet, she ate sandwiches and worked. She cropped a study of the kitchen floor, the linoleum jagged against the exposed hardwood. She played with filtering, considering other compositions, spent time updating her site, punching up her marketing. She chose which studies belonged on her site, which should be exclusive to the gallery, which should be put up as stock. There were dozens of decisions to be made, and she would have sworn not as many hours in the day as there'd been a week before. She took more time off to look at slabs of granite and ended up spending more than an hour taking pictures, those raw edges, the graining, the dapples and colors. Tired of cold meals or soup over the Coleman, she stopped and picked up pizza in town on the way home. She'd sit on her pretty slate-blue glider, breathe in the quiet, and eat loaded pizza on her bedroom deck. Then, she'd treat herself to a movie on her laptop. No more work that day. And thank God, the king-size mattress she ordered would be delivered in the morning. She'd spent her last night on her air mattress. Twilight shimmered in the west as she followed the snaking ribbon of road. The deer leaped out of the trees. She had time to see that it was a massive buck before she cut the wheel to avoid the collision. She hit the brakes, fishtailed. She felt more than hurt or tire blow and cursed as she tried to fight the wheel back. She ended up thudding into the shallow ditch alongside the road with her heart pounding between her ears. The buck merely turned his head, gave her a regal stare, and then leaped into the shadows. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Okay, okay, nobody's hurt, including fricking Bambi. She shoved open the door to see the damage. Tire shot, she noted but she didn't think she'd damaged the wheel. She could change a stupid tire, but it was going to be tricky with the way she'd angled into the ditch, and dusk was falling fast now, with her on the curve of the switchback. She opened the back, pulled out the emergency kit, lit a flare, set it several feet behind the truck, set another several feet in front, eased into the car, turned on her flashers. Resigned to the annoyance, she hauled the jack out of the trunk. She caught the headlights, Worried they came too fast, but the truck, she made out the shape of a truck, slowed, then swerved gently to the shoulder between her car and the back flare. Naomi set down the jack and took a good grip on the tire iron. Got some trouble? Just a flat. I've got it, thanks. But he sauntered forward, in silhouette with the headlights glaring at his back. Got a spare? Deep voice, deeply male, tall, long legs and arms. Of course I have a spare. Good, I'll change it for you. I appreciate that. Her hand tightened on the tire iron, but I've got it. He just hunkered down to take a closer look. She could see him better now, a lot of dark, wind-blown hair, a sharp-boned profile under some scruff, a battered leather jacket, big hands on the knees of long legs. You're at a bad angle for the jack, but it's doable. I've got emergency lights in the truck. He looked up at her now, a hard and handsome face, a tough guy face, with a scruff, with a thick wind-blown hair, a firm, full, unsmiling mouth. She couldn't see the color of his eyes, but didn't detect any mean in them. Still, I've changed a tire before. Hey, me too. In fact, you can make a living. Xander Keaton. Keaton's Garage and Body Works. Name's on the side of my truck. 
I'm a mechanic. I didn't call a mechanic. Aren't you lucky one just came along? And I'd appreciate the hell out of it if you didn't smack me with that tire iron. He goose-stepped over, picked up the jack, got to work. Killed this tire good. You're going to need a new one. I can order one for you. He picked up the lug wrench. How to blow? It doesn't look worn. A deer. It jumped out in front of me. I overcompensated. That'll happen. Heading home? Just making conversation, he said when she remained silent. I can smell the pizza. You're coming from town, so you're not staying in town. I haven't seen you before, and given you're a serious looker, I'd remember if I had. Yes, I'm going home. New around here, because I know everybody. Heading home on this road, killer blonde. Are you Naomi? She stepped back. Settle down. He said it calmly as he got up to get the spare. Kevin Banner. He's rehabbing the old Parkerson place up on Point Bluff for you. Best pals, birth to earth. Well, earth's a ways off, unless you kill me with that tire iron. But we've known each other since before we could walk. You can call him. Get my bona fides if it'll loosen the grip you've got on that thing. He never mentioned you. But her grip did loosen, a little. Now that hurts. He was my wingman. I was his best man. I'm Tyler's godfather. His cousin Mark's doing your plumbing, and Macy Adams, who I was madly in love with for about six weeks in junior year, is one of your carpenters. Does that clear me? I'll know when I ask Kevin tomorrow. That's a cynical and suspicious nature you've got. I have to like it. He tightened the lug nuts on the spare, gave it a testing spin. That'll do. As he lowered the jack, he looked up at her again. How tall are you? Five ten. And a half. You know how to wear it. He rose, fitted the jack and the tools back in their compartments. Do you want me to take the tire with me, or do you another? I... Yes, actually, that would be great. Thanks. No problem. Hold on a minute. He took the tire to his truck, got out a bucket of sand, picked up the flare. Want to get the other one? You're prepared. Part of the job. He doused the flares in the sand, shook his head as Naomi dug in her pockets. You want to pay me? Give me a slice of that pizza. What? Seriously? That's Ronaldo's pizza. I've got a weakness. You want a slice of pizza? It doesn't seem like much to ask after I risked a concussion and possible brain damage to change your tire. She opened the door, opened the box. I don't have anything to put it on. Sander held out a hand. How about this? With a shrug, Naomi set the slice of pizza on his wide palm. Thanks for the assist. Thanks for the pizza. You drive safe now. She got in, strapped in, watched him saunter away. That was what he did, saunter. She eased out of the ditch, bumped back onto the road. He gave his horn a friendly honk as she drove away. He sat a moment, getting in a couple of bites of pizza so he could drive one-handed. He found it, as always, delicious. But it didn't hold a candle to the leggy blonde with suspicious eyes. 7. She'd come for peace, quiet, solitude and ended up with a house full of people and noise. There were days when even the view didn't balance it out. When she asked herself why she hadn't settled for just the basics, like reliable plumbing and a decent refrigerator, she couldn't quite remember the answer. The house was torn to pieces, full of dust, with the biggest dumpster known to man sitting in her front yard. After three solid days of rain that made heading out with her camera unappealing, Naomi was ready to throw her things in the car and run. She bought paint instead. On the first day of rain, she cleaned and primed the master bedroom walls. On the first night of rain, she studied paint chips, created palettes and schemes with her computer. On the second day, she convinced herself it was just paint, and if she didn't like it on the wall, she'd just paint it again. She bought the amount of color Kevin recommended, and semi-gloss white for the trim, along with rollers, brushes, pans. She forgot a stepladder next time, so again she borrowed one from the crew. Dressed in the sweatshirt, jeans, and Yankees fielder's cap already speckled with primer, she got to work cutting in. Since she couldn't block out the skill saw buzzing, 
the nail guns the whacking, and the headbanger rock pounding from the first floor, she plugged in her earbuds and painted to her own playlist. Sander drove up, thinking the old house looked like it was made to loom on the bluff on rain-washed days. The days sloshed along gloomily, so the lights glinting against some of the windows added to the atmosphere. Maybe the giant dumpster out front took some of that away, but he imagined Kevin and his crew were having a hell of a good time filling it. He got out, hunched against the wet, strolled up to the house. Inside, the noise was amazing, but you'd have that on job sites. He smelled sawdust, coffee, wet dog, which meant Molly'd been out running around. Drop cloths and cardboard paths covered the floor. The interior, as far as he could see, just looked sad. Dim, dingy, neglected. Maybe the high ceilings gave it some class, the natural stone fireplace some character, but he saw a lot of space to fix and fill. He thought of the long, tall blonde with his sexy pixie hair and the don't-make-me-kick-your-ass attitude. He couldn't see the connection. She said city to him, big city. It made her and her choice of living arrangements all the more interesting. He made his way back, following the noise. He saw stacks of lumber, tools, cords, wheels of wiring. He wondered what people did with all these rooms, what the sexy blonde meant to do with them. When he reached the kitchen, he had a partial answer. Here, at least, she meant to start from scratch. They'd gutted the place, taken it right down to the studs. We're now putting up new ones. A blue tarp shuddered from the windy rain over a big hole in the back wall. He knew enough about plumbing to read the rough ends, get a sense of where things would go, just as he could read that at one time there'd been a John in the far left corner. Hey, Kev, you planning on putting both kids through college on this place? Kevin, hunkered down with a plumber, glanced back. It's going to help, he called over the noise. He pushed up, crossed the tarped floor. What brings you out here? New tire for that forerunner. Right. I'd have picked it up for, saved you a trip. No problem. I wanted to see the place anyway. Satisfaction covering his face, Kevin looked around. It's coming along. Shoulder to shoulder, Xander looked around the same space. To what? You need vision, man. You just need vision. He crooked a finger, stepped over to the dining area and the plywood set on sawhorses. It's coming to this. Hands in pockets, Xander studied the blueprint of the projected kitchen. That's what the hole's for. What was there before? Standard door, total waste. I knew Naomi had that vision when she said to open it up. Vision and deep pockets. Lucky for both of us. Lucky for this place. She's got an eye. You know, photographer and all that. And she gets the feel of the place, the character. She's not looking to go all sleek and polished. This space here and the master bath, those are the biggest projects. You add in new windows, got them coming in tomorrow. Refinishing the floors, the plumbing, the wiring, trim. She wants crown molding here and there. And some of the original trim needs to be replicated. Painting, installing, it's all mostly cosmetic, but it's a lot of that. How many rooms in this place? 18, plus five and a half baths, now that we took the one out in here. Not counting a granddaddy of all basements. Unfinished. She's single, right? Lives alone? Some people like space. Some people like to live in three rooms over their garage. Some people drive a minivan. Kevin gave him a light punch. Wait till you have kids. Yeah, let's wait on that. Where is she anyway? She's up in the master, as far as I know. Painting. She's painting. Like walls or with an easel? Walls. She did all right on the prep and priming up there, but I expect we'll be calling Jimmy and Renee in to handle the rest. He could have handed Kevin the bill, put the tire in her car, and gone on his way. But since he was here anyway, I'm going to go on up. You can take the back stairs, Kevin wagged a thumb. Corner room, facing the inlet. Buy you a beer when you knock off? I wouldn't mind it. Yeah, I'll swing by. He went up the back way, and having Kevin for a friend all his life, he recognized good craftsmanship in the new stairs, the sturdy rail. The light looked like it had come out of someone's cabin in the 50s, but that was an easy fix. Then he reached the second floor and just stood, staring down the hallway. It looked like something out of The Shining, 
He half expected to see some kid on a big wheel pedaling along, or a decomposing corpse leaking its way under a doorway. He wondered how she slept in this place at night. He knocked on the door of the corner room, considering his options when no one answered. He went with the simplest and opened the door. She stood on a stepladder, in paint-splattered clothes and ancient Converse high tops, carefully cutting in the wall at ceiling height. She'd nearly finished, he noted, and couldn't fault her work. He started to wrap his knuckles on the open door, but as she dipped her brush, she picked up the chorus of, Shake it off. Cause the player's gonna play, 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 play. Decent voice, he thought, and noticed the earbuds. By the time she got to, Baby, I'm just gonna shake, 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 he had crossed over, tapped her shoulder. She spun around so fast, leading with a brush, he barely dodged the paint swipe across his face. He said, wow. And then, because she overbalanced, put a firm hand on her ass to keep her on the ladder. With that, he smiled. All smug male. Nice. Back off. Just keeping you and that bucket of paint off the floor. But he dropped his hand. I knocked, but you and Taylor were too busy shaking it off to hear. Very carefully, she set down her brush. When you knock and nobody answers, the logical and polite thing to do is go away. That's 50-50, don't you think? She had green eyes. He hadn't been able to tell in the dark on the side of the road, but she had incredibly deep green eyes, and they were pissed. A lot of people open the door. Take a look. What do you want? Nice to see you again, too. I dropped off your tire, the replacement. Oh, thank you. No problem. He took a folded invoice out of his back pocket, held it out. It cost more than a slice of pizza. I bet. Will you take a check? Sure. Cash, check, credit card. He took an electronic swipe out of his jacket pocket. Your choice. We'll use my card then. Isn't that high tech for a garage? I like tech. Plus, it's handy when people need roadside assistance. I can fix them up, swipe their card, send them on their way. She nodded, took a slim wallet out of her back pocket. Sander just cocked an eyebrow as she slid out a credit card. Every woman he knew carted around a purse the size of a Shetland pony, filled with a mysterious. I appreciate you bringing the tire all the way out here. It's not that all the way. I'll put it in the spare compartment when I leave. Kev's got it torn up down there. Yes, yes, he does. You've got a big hole in the wall. At the end of the day, it'll be a door. Please, God. He swiped her card. Nice color. The paint? Yeah, I think. She worried over it as she signed her name. Does it read warm to you? He handed her back her card and studied the soft, watery blue seriously. Yeah, it's warm and calm, right? You're picking up the tones of the water early morning, before it goes deep. That's it. I almost want a little more gray, more spa-like. Maybe I should have... It's just paint. It's walls, he corrected. You've got to live with them. Crap. You hit warm and calm, if that's what you were after. And whatever it is, you'll get used to it. I can email you a receipt. That's all right. I don't need one. Didn't want him to have her email, more likely. Xander pocketed the reader, the phone. That's a lot of wall to paint. You ought to open those doors, get some air in here. It's raining, and you're right. She stepped over, fought the slider open an inch. This stubborn, ugly bastard's going. Xander put a hand above hers, gave the slider one good shove, then looked out as she did. Walls don't mean dick when you look at that. I keep telling myself. In the rain, the world outside was dreamy, with gloom adding a fanciful edge, just touches of fog and mist floating like gossamer birds. Makes you forget this second floor looks like part of the Overlook Hotel. Well, thanks for that. I'm going to imagine red rum written in blood on that horrible wallpaper now. He grinned. Points for getting the reference. I gotta get going. Good luck with this. Thanks. She stood when he walked out, watching the cool spring rain. He'd scared her. She could admit that. The quick, firm tap on her shoulder when her mind had been on painting and music. The equally quick and firm hand on her butt. She'd have caught her balance. Probably. He'd backed off when she told him. Easily. Signaling he was harmless. 
but he wasn't harmless. Despite the easy talk about paint and wallpaper, he wasn't harmless. He had strong blue eyes, very direct, and something behind them warned that he wasn't a man to trifle with. She had no intention of trifling with Xander Keaton. He might have had a runner's build, but there was a toughness in there. She knew how to judge who might be an easy companion for a night or two, if she had the need. No question he was attractive, in a rough and sexy sort of way. And though she'd learned not to let it matter, it was a bonus that he had a good four inches over her in height. She wouldn't deny she'd felt a tug in the belly. But if and when she had that need, she'd steer clear of Keaton. Keep it simple, she thought, as she went back to the stepladder, because her life, her nature, would always be complicated. Instinct told her Xander Keaton was anything but simple. When the soaking rain finally moved off and the sun sparkled again, Naomi had the sheer delight of folding outswing doors off her kitchen. After they'd been installed and the crew left, she opened and closed them half a dozen times, just for the fun of it. With a turn of weather, she donned her boots and a light jacket and grabbed her camera. Stock photos of flowers always provided a decent revenue, and the burgeoning bulbs and wildflowers offered her a treasure trove. She could ramble the woods, looking for the interest of rough bark, nurse logs, the charm of a narrow stream running fast with snow melt, the surprise of a little waterfall running faster yet to a tumble of rocks below. And she got an unexpected shot of a bear when they encountered each other in the silvery quiet of dawn. After ten days of working for a living, the tedium of painting, the stress of selecting cabinet hardware and kitchen appliances, she sat on her new king-size mattress with her laptop. Hello from Construction Central, loves of my life. I did it. This room is painted, every square inch of wall, ceiling, and trim. I have wonderful atrium doors leading out to my deck and intend to sit out there, on the chair I sanded and repainted, in the morning, and wallow with coffee over my view. It'll be a short wallow, as the crew comes early, and the indescribable noise comes along with them. But I can see the kitchen coming together. I remember when you had the kitchen redone about, what, six years ago? I was home for a couple weeks, and it was chaos. This is chaos times infinity. But I think I like it. The process of it. I saw a bear this morning. Don't worry, I was more interested in him than he was in me. Picture attached. I couldn't get one of the whale. I'm sure it was a whale, sounding way out. By the time I got my camera, zoomed out, it was gone. I'm happy here. They're getting to know me in town. Enough to say hello when I'm at the market or hardware. My two favorite places right now. Oh, and the pizza place. It's not New York pizza, but it's not crap either. I'm happy here, despite the daily noise, the deluge of decisions. Kevin says I really have to decide on the tile for the master and the backsplash for the kitchen. Both terrify me more than a little. But that's for later. Write me back soon. And that goes for you too, Mason. With more than all's good, how's it going? I'm about to start picking color and designs out for the rooms I've earmarked as yours when you visit. Before pictures, also attached. Miss you. Love you, Naomi. Once she sent the email off, she ordered herself to work. She had to update her Facebook page, do the Tumblr thing, the Pinterest deal, and write something for the blog. All chores she'd have put off for the rest of her life if they weren't part of the job. An hour later, she took her laptop back to the desk to plug in the charger and saw the moon riding over the water. She grabbed her camera, filters, a second lens, and went out on her deck in the deep night chill. She caught the moon along with its reflection in the water. Mirror moon, she thought, already composing as she took more pictures, changed filters, angles. She'd make a series. Cards, which always sold well off her sight. If they turned out as well as she thought, she'd set up her mat cutter and board and start sending some art to the gallery. But she was doing one for herself. She rose, drew in the quiet, the light, the sense of lovely, lovely solitude. She'd hang the best of the best on the wall she'd painted herself. Her moon over her inlet. It didn't get better than that. Three weeks after demo, Kevin stayed late to finish installing the hardware on the kitchen cabinets. 
Overwhelmed, Naomi grabbed tools and worked with him while Molly napped by the doors. I can't believe how it looks. It's coming along. Coming along, Kevin, it's amazing. I didn't make a mistake, right? Changing up from that idea of the dark cherry cabinets for this sage green? They're classy, have character, and don't look like a showroom, in a good way. With the gray granite, those veins of green in it, you've got an eye, Naomi. The beveled glass front set it all off. I think so. I guess I'm going to need something better than paper plates and plastic cups to go in them. I've never bought a set of dishes in my life. Didn't you have, like, an apartment or something before? Oh, here and there, but mostly I stayed on the move. Have camera, will travel. And it was paper, or plastic, or secondhand. I never intended to settle. Overwhelmed, definitely, she thought, glancing up at her empty cabinets. It looks like I have, so I'd better think about dishes and glassware. I don't know where I'm going to find the room in my head for that, with faucets and light fixtures and tile. You should talk to Jenny. That woman loves playing with new dishes. Maybe I'll just go with Restaurant White, so I don't have to think about it. You should talk to her. You know what? He nudged back the bill of his ball cap. You should come on out tonight. Have a drink with us at Lou's. That's the bar, right? Off Water Street? Yeah. It's a nice place, though. Good food, friendly. Music tonight, too. Jenny and I have a sitter, so we're going for a while. Why don't you meet us? That sounds like date night to me, Kevin. Yeah, sort of. The thing is, Jenny's been after me to ask you over to dinner, and I figured you've had enough of all of us by the end of the day. Good instincts, she thought, because truer words. You come out tonight, have a drink, talk dishes with her some. It's a compromise. Seems like you could use a night off and out, too. Maybe. He didn't push, so they fell back to companionable silence as they worked. When it was done, they bumped fists. I'll see you at Lou's if you make it, he said, and she just waved him off. She didn't intend to leave her nearly finished wonderful kitchen with its empty cabinets and pale gray, hinting toward green, walls. She had dozens of things to keep her busy, including reading the owner's manuals on her new appliances. Settling in, she reminded herself. If she really meant to settle in, no matter how innately unsociable, it required a minimal doses of friendliness. Otherwise, she was that weird woman up on Point Bluff that just asked for talk and attention. Normal people had a drink with friends now and then. She didn't really know Jenny, but she definitely considered Kevin a friend. Harry would have deemed them simpatico. So why not? She threw on some halfway decent clothes, slap a little makeup on, and drive into town. Have a drink at the local bar. Talk with her friend's wife about tableware. She'd stay for one set, since there was music, and consider any and all social obligations met for at least a month. Good deal. She opted for black jeans, and because it ran cool at night, a sweater. Not black, she ordered herself, as that was her first choice. She chose the one Seth and Harry had given her for Christmas, worn only once, and in nearly the same shade as her kitchen cabinets. She considered changing her habitual silver studs for something more fun and frivolous, then decided that worrying about earrings was too much for a simple drink with a friend and his wife. She took some trouble with her makeup, mainly because those needs could come calling, and maybe there was a local boy who could meet them at some point. No reason to scare him off, whoever he might be. Night had fallen when she set out, so she left the porch light on, new fixture yet to come, and locked up. Alarm system, she thought, installed very soon. When she glanced back at the house, she nearly went back inside. It looked so appealing sitting there, so quiet. One drink, she ordered herself, and pushed herself to drive away from solitude. She'd never been into town this late, no reason to, and saw that Friday night hopped a bit. She imagined that those strolling along the boardwalk by the marina were tourists, but it was likely a mix with those on the street, poking into shops open late, sitting out with heaters at outdoor tables. She knew Luz sat a block off Water Street, tucked between a seafood restaurant and a snack shop. She spotted Kevin's truck, found a parking spot half a block down from it. She needed to come back at night with her camera, get night shots of the marina, the old character homes, the bold red door and the blue neon curl of Luz over it. 
Music pumped against the door before she opened it. She pictured a little bar, but it proved bigger. Even boasted a small dance floor, packed now as crowd-pleasing rock beat out. She smelled beer and fried food, perfume, sweat. The bar itself dominated one wall in dark, aged wood backed by more than a dozen taps. She heard the whirl of a blender and immediately decided on a foamy, frozen margarita. As she scanned, Kevin waved from a table near the dance floor. She wound her way through, found her hand caught in Jenny's. I'm so glad you came. Kevin didn't think you would. Couldn't resist. Sit, sit. Kevin, get Naomi a drink. What do you have? I hear the song of a frozen margarita, with salt. I'm going to get that going for you. It takes a while for them to get to the tables. Jenny? I'm still nursing this one. As Kevin moved off, Jenny swiveled in her chair. God, you're so beautiful. I... I'm on my second glass of wine. I get loose easy. It's just, I always wanted to be tall. And look what happened. I always wanted to be petite. What are you going to do? I looked up your website, your photos. They're wonderful, really. There's this one of a water lily, just one water lily with these ripples around it where it floats. I felt like I'd been on vacation just looking at it. And this one of an old gravestone in a cemetery, and you can see the shadow of the church. The dates? She was 102 when she died, and it still made me tear up. I can't remember the name on the stone. Mary Margaret Allen. That's right. Jenny's eyes, nearly the same soft dough brown as her hair, smiled. What I'm saying? I take a good snapshot. Slices of life, the kids and all, I mean. And it's important to have the record, those memories. But what you do, it just grabs emotions right out. Best compliment ever. It's a true one. Kevin said you needed dishes and glassware and such. I do. I was thinking white and clear and done. Well, going that way, you can jazz it up with napkins and so on. The thing is, he took some pictures of the kitchen with his phone and showed me. I just love the soft green of the cabinets and the pewter tones of the hardware, the gray of the walls. It's like you're pulling the tones and colors from outside in. I can't resist that either. Jenny sipped her wine, gave her long, loose hair a push back. I think it's just right, if that matters. And it struck me how, if you went deep, deep blue with the dishes, like cobalt blue, you'd have that pop behind the glass and keep with that scheme. Cobalt blue. It would look great. I think it would. Then you go for color in the glassware, softer, like blues and greens, a mix, just tie it in. I can give you sites to look at, and I've got a stack of catalogs. And before Kevin comes back, because I'll embarrass him, I'm going to ask you to ask me to come over and look at the place, at his work, and what you're up to. I know he said you took this old glider and chair and redid them. I love doing that kind of thing. Finding something someone's gotten rid of and making it new. Sure you can come by. Have a look. I swear I won't be a pest or take advantage. She beamed at Kevin when he came back with a jumbo margarita. I've talked her ear off. Stop me. He set the drink down, sat, kissed his wife's cheek. Shut up, Jenny. I will. Plus, I love when they do this number. I could take a bath in this, Naomi commented. She took a sip. But I'll drink it instead. She angled to look at the band as she recognized the Springsteen classic, and the voice lit the suggestive lyrics of I'm on fire like a slow-burning match. He wore black. Jeans and a t-shirt, worn motorcycle boots. He stood, the guitar slung low, his fingers working the frets and strings, while that voice wrung every drop of sex out of the words. She should have known. Xander and the band play here every few weeks, Kevin told her. They're the wreckers. She said, oh. And deep inside, as those bold blue eyes met hers, as that voice sent out lures and warnings, something inside her said, Oh, damn. She figured she'd need every drop of that margarita to cool off. Eight. He came over on the break with a bottle of water and an easy swagger. Jenny pointed a finger at him. You know what that song does to me. You can thank me later, Xander said to Kevin, and sat, slouched, with his long legs stretched out. 
So, he gave Naomi a slow smile. How you doing? Good. I'm good. She felt like someone had started a brush fire under her skin. You're good, too. My uncles are huge Springsteen fans. They'd have approved your cover. How many uncles? Just the two. They took my brother and me to the E Street Band's reunion tour at Madison Square. Have you ever seen him in concert? In Tacoma. Same tour. Blew the roof off. She relaxed enough to smile. Yeah, they did. A blonde in a tight pink shirt came up, circled Xander's neck from behind. Are you doing something for nothing? Last set. How about coming over, having a beer? Patty and I are right over there. Working, Marla. He wagged his water bottle. She wasted the sexy pout, in Naomi's opinion, as Xander couldn't see it with her chin resting on top of his head. You could come over anyway. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Kevin. Her gaze tracked over to Naomi. Who's your friend? Naomi, Kevin said. Marla. Visiting? Marla asked. No, I live here. And didn't that sound odd, Naomi realized. She lived here. Haven't seen you around before. You must... Hey, are you the one who bought the old place on the bluff? You're working there, right, Kevin? That's right. You must be rich or crazy. I'm not rich, Naomi said, adding a half smile because the pouty blonde's statement struck her as more baffled than needling. You know it's haunted, right? They should have told you it was haunted. I don't think anyone mentioned it. I'd be scared out of my mind staying there alone. You take pictures, right? Patty figures you're looking to open a photography studio. No, I don't do studio photography. What other kind is there? How much time do you have? What? I'll come over next break. Xander gave the hand currently stroking his clavicle a pat. Okay, then maybe. She leaned down, put her mouth on his ear, and whatever she whispered had Xander's lips curving. That's a hell of an offer, Marla, but I don't want Chip coming after me with a hammer. She did the pout again. We're divorced. And still. Well, you think about it. Hard not to, he murmured as she hip-swiveled back to her table. What was the offer? Kevin wanted to know. I'll tell you later. She just can't help it. Jenny glanced at Naomi, apology in her eyes. She doesn't mean any harm. She's just a little clueless. Did she do any harm? Xander wondered. Not to me. Naomi lifted her margarita, sipped. But then she didn't make me an offer. Ha, she's hoping Kevin will tell Chip she did. Which I wouldn't. No, but she's hoping you will. And that would rile Chip up enough he'd go by her place, and they'd fight about it, have pissed off sex, and she'd kick him out again after. That's about it, Kevin agreed. They have a strange relationship. He wouldn't come after you with a hammer because he knows you. And your bud. Add in Chip's sweet, Jenny claimed. I know he's punched a couple people over her, but she pushed him into it. He's a sweet man. She doesn't think she wants sweet. She'd be wrong about that, Xander added. But that's their problem. You guys want another round? I can let Lou know. Another glass of wine and I'll be a wild woman. What the hell, Jenny decided. It's Friday night and we've got a sitter. I'll keep up with her, Kevin said. Not for me. I'm driving, and I really should go. Stick around. Xander sent her a lazy look. Make a request. Something on your playlist. Come on, play Stump the Band. She considered. Hard to explain. A choice, maybe because it had played in her ear right after he'd walked out of her bedroom the other day. He grinned, pointed a finger at her, then walked off. I don't know that one, Jenny commented but I bet Xander does. He sent over another round, water for Naomi. And she didn't stump the band, who played the Strokes' old classic as if they'd rehearsed it that morning. She stayed for most of the second set, then realized if she didn't slip out, she'd end up staying until they closed. I've really got to go. Thanks for the drink, and for talking me into coming out. Anytime. See you Monday. I'm going to come by soon, Jenny told her. If you're busy, Kevin will show me around. She left with a slow, simmering cover of Clapton's Layla, following her into the night. She decided the sex dream with Xander with throbbing bass and mad guitar riffs while the house burned around them was inevitable.
Maybe it left her a little edgy. But she had plenty to do to work off the beginnings of sexual frustration. She wasn't ready to be sexually frustrated and far from ready to take care of it. A weekend of quiet, of work, of sun and soft evening rain polished the edges away. As promised, she took morning coffee out on the deck. She would buy a better coffee maker and soaked in the silence and solitude. When she FaceTimed New York on Sunday, her mood was high and light. There she is. Seth, sporting the trim goatee he decided he'd needed on his 45th birthday, beamed through her iPad screen. Hi, handsome. You talking to me? Harry moved into view, draping an arm over Seth's shoulders. The rings they had exchanged in Boston in the summer of 2004 glinted on their hands. Two scoops of handsome. Make it three. Guess who's here for Sunday dinner? Mason slid on screen just behind them and grinned at her. Why, it's Dr. Agent Carson. Just look at him, she thought. So tall and, yes, three scoops of handsome now. And best, happy. He was on his way to doing and being just what he'd set out to do and be. How's the FBI? That's classified. He just got back from upstate, Seth told her. He helped on a kidnapping, helped bring a 12-year-old girl back home safe. It's a living. What's going on with that crazy house you bought? Crazy. Take a look. She panned at the tablet, slowly circling the kitchen. Who's crazy? Naomi, it's beautiful. Look at that range hood, Seth. You went with the wolf. I listen. Forget the range hood, Seth said. The cabinets are fabulous. Why are they empty? Harry, we need to send her some dishes. No, no, I've got a line on that. I'll send you the link to what I'm looking at. I'm taking you upstairs. I want you to check out the master bedroom walls which I painted myself. You? Mason snorted. Every inch of them. I may never pick up a paint roller again in my life, but I did every inch of this room. And how many rooms in that place again? Shut up, Mason. Now be honest. Does the color work? Upstairs, she did another slow pan. Pretty and restful, Seth declared. Now, why don't you have an actual bed? It's on the list. The really long list. Really, I just finished the paint, and I finally set up a temporary mat room. I have a ton of stuff I've been processing and printing. You work too hard, too much, Seth objected. You worry too hard, too much. I went out with friends Friday night, had a drink, listened to a local band. Seeing anyone? Harry prompted. And behind him, Mason rolled his eyes, mouthed, better you than me. I see lots of people. The crew's here eight hours a day, five days a week. Any good-looking single men in that crew? Are you looking for one? Harry laughed. Got all I can handle. Me too, right now. I want to hear how you're all doing. How's the restaurant? What's for Sunday dinner? Is Mrs. Kablowski next door still entertaining gentlemen callers? She didn't distract them. She knew better. But they let it go. And for the next 15 minutes, they talked about easy things, funny things, homey things. When she said goodbye and turned off the tablet, she missed them like a limb. She worked in the mat room for an hour, tried to settle down at her laptop, but the contact with family left her restless and blue. Time to get out, she told herself. She'd yet to take real pictures in town, real studies of the marina. What better way to spend the rest of a Sunday afternoon? Then she'd come home and cook something besides scrambled eggs or grilled cheese sandwich in her gorgeous new kitchen. Pleased with herself, she drove into town, dumped her car, and just walked. No errands to run, no chores to deal with. Just walk and study and compose shots. The sailboat called Maggie May. Its paint white as a bridal gown and its sails lowered, its shining bright work. The cabin cruiser decked out with balloons for a party. The fishing boat of dull gray that made her think of a sturdy old workhorse. All the masts naked and swaying into blue sky and reflected blurrily in the water. And farther out, a couple zipping along on sea dews, their busy speed a perfect contrast to the dreamy waiting of the docked boats. She treated herself to an orange Fanta, a staple of her teen years, and climbed back in the car with plans to spend the evening working on the prints. She rounded a turn, slammed the brakes. It wasn't a deer this time, but a dog, not in the road, but limping on the shoulder. 
She started to drive on. Not her dog, not her deal. But it took another couple of steps, then just lay down, as if hurt or sick. Damn it. She couldn't just drive away, so she pulled over, even as she asked herself what the hell she was supposed to do. Maybe it was rabid or vicious or... It lifted its head when she got out of the car and gave her an exhausted, hopeful stare. Oh, well. Okay. Hey, boy. Nice dog. I hope to God. Because he was pretty big, she noted. But thin. She could nearly count his ribs. Big, thin, and filthy. A big, skinny, dirty brown dog with shocking blue eyes that looked so painfully sad. And damn it again, the blue against the brown made her think of Harry. She didn't see a collar, so no tags. Maybe he had a chip. Maybe she could contact the vet or the animal shelter. She could find the numbers on a quick search with her phone. Then he whimpered, bellied toward her. She didn't have the heart to leave him, so she walked closer, crouched, and gingerly held out her hand. He licked it, bellied closer. Are you hurt? Filthy, he, or she might have been, Naomi gently stroked his head. Are you lost? God, you look half-starved. I don't have anything to eat on me. How about I call somebody to help? He laid his head, all floppy-eared and dirty, on her leg. Didn't whimper so much as moan. She took out her phone, then heard the sound of an engine, motorcycle, heading out from the direction of town. She lifted the dog's head, set it gently back on the shoulder of the road, and stood to wave down the rider. The second she spotted him, long legs and jeans, lean torso and black leather, she thought, of course, it would be. Even with the smoked glass visor of the helmet, she recognized Xander Keaton. He cut the engine, swung a leg over the bike. Did you hit him? No. He was limping along the side of the road. Then he just lay there, and I... She broke off as he was already hunkered down, running those big guitar-playing hands over the dog as gently as a mother stroked her baby. Okay, boy, just take it easy. I don't see any blood, any wounds. Don't feel any breaks. I don't think he's been hit by car. He's so thin, and... There's some water in the saddlebag. Get it, will you? Thirsty? I bet you're thirsty. Plenty hungry. Been on the road a while, right? Been traveling? As he talked to the dog, stroked it, Naomi poked through the saddlebag of the bike, came out with a bottle of water. Let's see what we can do here. Xander took the bottle, gestured Naomi down. Cup your hands. I... Come on, come on. It won't kill you. She did as he asked, cupping them in front of the dog's muzzle. He lapped at the water Xander poured, panted, lapped, then laid his head down again. We need to get him off the road. I'll put him in the back of your car. Where should I take him? You should take him home. I can't take him home. She sprang up as Xander slid his arms under the dog, lifted him. She saw that the dog was definitely male, unneutered male. He belongs to somebody. With a bone-thin, tired, filthy dog in his arms, Xander stood, boots planted, and gave her a long look out of deep blue eyes. Does this dog look like it belongs to anybody? Open the back. He could have gotten lost. Somebody might be looking for him. We'll ask around, but I haven't heard about anybody losing a dog. He's full grown. Mutt. Maybe some husky or Australian shepherd in there with those eyes. Alice will know, the vet. If somebody lost a dog, she'll know. Meanwhile, she's closed on Sunday. There must be an emergency number. The only emergency I see is a dog who needs a decent meal, a good bath, and somewhere to rest. You take him home. On that? He jerked his head toward his bike. I'll wait. You found him. You'd have found him two minutes later. There you go. Look, take him home. And I'll go pick up some supplies for him. You get him to the vet tomorrow, I'll split the bill with you. You're not taking that dog to the shelter. If they don't find the owners, and I'm betting they're long gone, they'll probably put him down. Oh, don't say that. Turning a frustrated circle, she gripped fists in her hair. Don't say that so I feel guilty and obligated. Wait, wait. He's filthy, and he smells amazing. Naomi grabbed the old blanket she carried in the back, spread it out. There you go. You'll be all right. I'll run back, get what you need. I'll meet you back at your place. 
trapped, as Xander strode back to his bike, swung on, kick-started it to a roar, and zoomed away. She looked back at the dog. You just better not get carsick. She drove slowly, eyes flicking to the rear view, but didn't hear any sounds of sick dog. When she pulled up in front of her house, she wondered if the most excellent work she'd done that afternoon had been worth dealing with a stray, starving dog for a night. She got out, walked around to open the back. Yes, that's an amazing smell that will potentially take weeks to dissipate. Not entirely your fault, of course, but you smell disgusting. I don't guess you could just jump out on your own. He bellied over a little, tried to reach her hand with his tongue. Never mind. You're skinny enough I could pick you up and probably carry you a half mile without breaking a sweat. But you're just too dirty and smelly. We'll wait for Xander. Stay there. Just stay. She dashed into the house, filled a plastic cup with water, grabbed some flatbread crackers, best she could do. When she dashed out again, the dog was whining, sniffing at the edge of the back. No, no, just wait. A little refreshment, that's all. Here. Here's a cracker. He all but inhaled it, and six others, then slurped and lapped the water from the cup. That's a little better, isn't it? He's not going to be long. He really better not be long, because every minute you're in there is another week it's going to take to air out the smell. This time, when she broke down to pet him, the dog turned his head, nuzzled her hand. Yeah, I guess that's a little better. She went back into the car for the orange Fanta, then followed Impulse and pulled out her camera. We can make flyers for the vet, for the shelter, for whatever. She took several photos while he stared at her with those strange blue eyes, so strongly colored against the dirty brown, and felt ridiculous relief when she heard the sound of an engine. Xander, now in his truck, pulled up behind her. The dog's tail thumped. Fancy crackers? I didn't have kibble handy. We got some. Better feed him out here in case he sicks it up again. Good thinking. Sander, obviously not delicate about the dirt or smell, lifted the dog out. The dog stood this time, looked a little wobbly, while Xander hauled an already open 50-pound bag of dog food out of the truck. Think you got enough food? Xander only grunted and poured some into a big plastic blue bowl. Hey, she caught the red bowl he tossed. For water. Naomi went around the side, where she had a hose to water the so far imaginary garden. When she came back, the dog had wolfed down every morsel and appeared capable of doing it again. His tail swung back and forth with more energy. Water first, big guy. Xander took the bowl, set it down. The dog drank like a camel. I don't care if you think I'm heartless, but that dog's not coming in the house unless we can deal with that smell. Yeah, yeah, I can't blame you. Somewhere along the line, he rolled in something dead. I just love doing that. So we give him a bath. Probably a couple of them. Hose around there? Yeah, I've got dish soap inside. Don't need it. He went back to the truck and came back with a black dog collar and a bottle of dog shampoo. You did get supplies. You're going to have to hold him. I'll soak him down, suds him up, rinse him off. But he's not going to like it. If he bites me, I'm going to hurt you. He's not a biter. There's no mean in those eyes. You hold on to him, Slim. I've got him. The dog was stronger than he looked, but then so was she. When Xander ran the water over him, he balked, strained, barked, pulled. But he didn't snap, snarl, or bite. Xander pulled a massive dog biscuit out of his back pocket, and the dog settled down to eye it greedily. Yeah, you want this. Hold the hose, he told Naomi, then broke the biscuit in half. Half now, half when we're done. Got it? He gave the dog the half biscuit and poured green liquid from the bottle in his hands. Obviously, the dog enjoyed the rubbing and soaping and stood quietly while Xander scrubbed at him. He didn't care for the rinsing off, but the second round of soaping had his eyes half closing in bliss. By the end of it, he sat quietly. Maybe, Naomi thought, as delighted as she was that he didn't smell like dead skunk. Better stand back when I let him go. Let him go? What if he runs? He's not going anywhere. Stand back, or you'll get wetter than you already are. She released the collar, then danced back and out of range of the energetic shaking and storm of water. He isn't as ugly as I thought. Get some meat back on his bones? He'll be a good-looking dog. Might have some lab in him, 
shape of the head. Probably got a lot in him. Mutts make the best dogs. Now that he's clean, doesn't look like he's going to collapse, and you've got the truck, you can take him with you. Can't do it. You know the vet by name, and I can't. Look. He turned, went back to his truck for a rag of a towel, and began to rub the wet dog. I had to put my dog down last month. Had him nearly half my life. I just can't take this one. I'm not ready. The open bag of kibble, the shampoo, the bowls, the collar. She should have put it together. Okay. I know how it feels. We had a dog. My brother's dog, really. The uncles gave it to him for Christmas when he was ten. He was so sweet, so considerate. We didn't have to put him down. He just slipped away in his sleep when he was fourteen. The four of us cried like babies. The dog sniffed at Xander's pocket. This one's not stupid. Xander took the second half of the biscuit, offered it. This offering was taken politely. He's a good dog. It shows. Maybe. You get him to Alice tomorrow. I'll split the vet bill with you. I'll get the word out. All right. I've got a leash and a dog bed. It's a little worn, but he won't care. A couple of rawhide bones. I'll bring it in. Naomi looked at the dog, at Xander, at the enormous bag of dog food. Want a beer? I'd say you've earned it. Hang on. He pulled out his phone, punched in a number. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I texted I would be. Now I'm going to be later. Oh, if you've got a date, don't... Sander shifted his gaze, a deeper, bolder blue than the no-name dogs. Kevin and Jenny, Sunday dinner. Nomi found this dog. I'm just helping her get it cleaned up. Don't know. At least a couple years old. Golden brown now that six inches of filth are washed off. Mixed breed. I took pictures. I'll send them a picture in case they recognize him. Your boss here is going to send you a picture of the mutt. No, go ahead. Yeah, later. He put the phone away, hefted the bag of dog food over his shoulder. I could use that beer. They started toward the house, the dog between them. He's still limping. He's been on the road a while, I'd say. The pads of his paws are scraped up and sore. After unlocking the door, holding it open, she watched the dog limp inside, begin to explore. You don't think we're going to find his owners? I'd lay money against it. You want this back in the kitchen? Yeah. She'd keep him overnight, even for a few days while they tried to locate his owners or found someone who wanted a dog. She got out a beer, a bottle of wine, handed Xander the beer, poured wine into a plastic cup. Thanks. As he drank, Xander wandered around the kitchen. Looks good. Real good. I didn't see how he turned this one around, but he always does. I love it. Nowhere to sit yet. I have to find stools and a table and chairs. And according to my uncles, a divan or love seat for that space over there, fronted by a burl wood table for tension. Who are these mysterious uncles who take you to see Springsteen, buy you dogs, and advise you to buy divans? And why do they call it a divan instead of a couch? I think it's size or shape, or maybe geography, on the divan slash couch part. My mother's younger brother and his husband. They more or less raised me and my brother. You were raised by your gay uncles? Yes. Is that a problem? No. It's interesting. It's New York, right? He leaned back against the counter, as apparently at home as the dog who now stretched out on the floor and slept the sleep of the clean, content, and completely trusting. Yes, it's New York. Never been there. What do they do, the uncles? They own a restaurant. Harry's a chef. Seth is a man of numbers and business. So it works. My brother's with the FBI. No shit. He's got degrees in psychiatry, psychology, and criminology. He wants the behavioral analysis unit. Profiling? Yes, he's brilliant. You four sound tight, but you're 3,000 miles away. I didn't expect to be, but... She shrugged. Do you have family here? My parents moved to Sedona a few years ago. I've got a sister in Seattle and a brother in L.A. Not so tight, but we get along all right when we have to. You grew up here, with Kevin. Womb to tomb. And own a garage, 
Body shop place, half interest in a bar, Jenny mentioned it, and run a band. I don't run the band, but half interest in the bar means we get to play there. He set down the bottle. I'll get the dog bed. Down here or upstairs? She looked at the dog again, sighed. I guess up in the bedroom. I hope to Christ he's housebroken. Most likely. He hauled the brown corduroy dog bed up the stairs, set it in front of the fireplace, tossed a yellow tennis ball in it. Color works, he said. I really think so. So, I wouldn't feed him any more tonight. Maybe one of the milk bones, and maybe give him the rawhide to chew on. It better be all he chews on. She glanced over as the dog had followed them out, then back in, then up the stairs, and now had the yellow tennis ball in his mouth. I'd better get going or Jenny won't feed me. Uncle's a chef? A terrific chef. You cook? I was taught by a master. That's a good skill. He stepped up. She should have seen it coming. She was always, always aware of moods and moves. But he stepped up, pulled her in before she'd read the warning sign. He didn't go slow. He didn't ease in. It was one bright, hot explosion followed by shuddering dark. His mouth covered, conquered, while his hands ran straight up her body as if they had every right, then down again. She could have stopped it. He was bigger, certainly stronger, but she knew how to defend herself. She didn't want to stop. Not yet. Not quite yet. She didn't want to defend. She gripped the sides of his waist, fingers digging in, and let herself burn. It was he who eased back until she stared into those dangerous blue eyes. Just like you look. What? Potent, he said. You pack a punch. She saw the move this time, laid a hand firmly on his chest. So do you. But I'm not up for a bout right now. That's a damn shame. You know, right at the moment, I couldn't agree more. But. But. He nodded, stepped back. I'll be in touch. About the dog. About the dog. When he went out, the dog looked after him, looked at Naomi, whined. You're with me for now. She sat on the foot of the bed, such as it was, because her legs felt shaky. He's completely the wrong choice. I'm absolutely sure of it. The dog came over, laid his paw on her knee. And don't think you're going to charm me. I'm not getting tangled up with Xander, and I'm not keeping you. It's all temporary. A night or two for the dog, she promised herself, and absolutely not with Xander Keaton. Nine. The dog didn't like the leash. The minute Naomi snapped it on, he pulled, tugged, tried to turn around and bite it. She ended up dragging him out of the house, using a milk bone as a bribe. He also didn't like the vet's office. The minute she got him into the waiting room, he quivered, shook, strained to get back out the door. A grizzled old man sat in one of the plastic chairs, with a grizzled old mutt sprawled at his feet. The old mutt's lips curled as if in disdain. A cat in a carrier stared out with feral green eyes. It was hard to blame the dog for dropping down on the floor, refusing to budge. He trembled the whole time Naomi filled out the paperwork, even when the old man took the dog, who walked obediently even if he cast a look back, disdain again, as they went into the back. While they waited, and Naomi had to be grateful they'd squeezed her in, a woman came in with a red gold ball of fur and fluff. The fluff ball stopped dead when it spotted Naomi's stray, then went into a wild series of high-pitched yips punctuated by throaty little growls. The dog did his best to crawl into Naomi's lap. Sorry, Consuela's very high-strung. The woman plucked up Consuela and tried to quiet and soothe her while Naomi struggled to keep the dog's nose out of her crotch. When they called her name, the relief was so huge, she didn't mind being forced to half-drag, half-carry her charge into the exam room. He quivered in there, too, and looked at her with such abject terror that she crouched down to hug him. Come on now, pull yourself together. He whined, licked, then laid his head on her shoulder. Somebody's in love. Alice Patton. The vet, maybe five-two with a sturdy, compact build, had her gray-streaked brown hair pulled back in a short ponytail and black, square-framed glasses over eyes of soft, quiet brown. She came in briskly, 
wearing a short white lab coat over T-shirt and jeans, and crouched down. Naomi Carson. It's nice to meet you. And this is the handsome guy you picked up on the side of the road. I made up some flyers to help find his owner. Your receptionist took a few. We'll put them out, but I haven't seen this boy before. Let's get him on the scale first, then we'll see what's what. He didn't much care for the idea, but they weighed him in at 71 pounds. He could use another 10. Definitely undernourished. Clean, though. He wasn't. We bathed him. Twice. Xander helped you out with him, right? And to Naomi's astonishment, Alice hefted 71 pounds of trembling dog onto the exam table. Yes, he came along a couple minutes after I found the dog. Put Milo's collar on him, I see. Milo? Was that his dog? Mm-hmm. Like her eyes, her voice was soft and calm as she ran her hands over the dog. Great dog, Milo. Cancer came on fast and hard. We did everything we could, but... He had 15 good, happy years, and that's what counts. This one here, he's about two, and he's been on the road a while from the looks of his paws. She got out her light, slipped him a small treat before examining his ears. I'm going to give you some drops for his ears. Drops? He's got an infection brewing in the left one, and I've got some meds you'll need to give him for worms. Worms? Stool sample you brought in. He's got worms, but the meds should clear that up quick enough. I'm going to give him a test for hardworm, and I'd like to do a titer to gauge if he needs shots. Seeing as he's a stray, I'm going to discount all of this for you. I appreciate it. He's got to belong to somebody, right? Hasn't been neutered. Alice stepped away, got a syringe. As he's a mixed breed, it's not likely he has all his works because someone intends to breed him. He's seriously underweight. Go on and stroke his head. Distract him a little. He's got intestinal worms, Alice continued, as she drew blood. The pads of all four paws are raw. I'm going to be able to tell in about 20 minutes or so if he's had shots for rabies and distemper, if he has heartworm. But he's got a little mange, and takes some fleas have been at him. Fleas. Dead now, from the flea bath you gave him. I'm the only vet in town, and he hasn't been in here before. Wouldn't be the first time somebody dumped a dog they decided they didn't want. Oh. Naomi looked down to where, despite the needles, the tests, the dog stared into her eyes with absolute trust. I'll call the vets I know in the area, and we'll put up your flyer, contact the shelters. It's possible he got lost, and someone's been looking for him. Naomi clung to the possibility. It took more than an hour altogether, an unfortunate round of shots, though the dog handled them without more than a look of puzzlement. She left with a bag of pills, drops, pamphlets, written instructions, and a dog-sized hole in her credit card. Reeling, she hunted up Xander's garage. It was bigger than she'd imagined. Cars and trucks scattered around a lot, some of them, such as the hatchback with a crunched front fender, obviously waiting for repairs. One building about the size of a Quonset hut looked like it held offices. Another spread in a long backward L with the front bay doors open wide. The dog still didn't like the leash, but she was onto him now and shortened up her grip on it. She intended to try the offices, but the dog pulled and bowled his way toward the open doors and the noise. She heard the whoosh thump of an air compressor, a steady banging, and walk the moon advising everyone to shut up and dance. She'd spent a lot of time on the road, so she'd been in her share of garages. The sounds, the smells, grease, oil, the sights, tools, machines, car guts, seemed fairly usual, but they apparently fascinated the dog, who strained on the leash until he got inside. Then his tail wagged like a flag in the breeze. He'd obviously scented Xander over the motor oil, gas, lubes, and grease guns, and let out a happy greeting bark. Xander stood under a sedan on a lift, doing whatever mechanics do to underbellies, Naomi decided. He wore scarred motorcycle boots and faded jeans with a hole in the knee and a dirty red rag hanging out of the back pocket. She couldn't figure out how he made the look sexy. Hey, big guy. He stuck the tool he'd used in his other back pocket, then crouched to greet the delighted dog. You look better than you did yesterday. He glanced up at Naomi. You always look good. We just came from the vet. How'd he do? He tried to crawl inside me in the waiting room because he was terrified of a Pomeranian. 
but she did have attitude. He has an ear infection and worms, and I have a bag full of pills and drops and instructions. He had to have a half million tests, followed by shots as the whatever the hell it is was low, and he probably hasn't had the shots before. He doesn't have heartworm, so yay, and he needs to gain weight. I have dog vitamins, for God's sake. Plus. She dug in her purse, took out the vet bill, held it out. Xander said, ouch. And this is the discounted Good Samaritan rate. Well, it's his first, and he needed it. I'm good for half. It's not the money, though. Okay, yeah, ouch. It's the very strong sense I get that, in her opinion, nobody's looking for him. What am I supposed to do with him? Looks like you're doing it. A man in gray coveralls and a gray cap with the garage's logo wandered out and plugged coins into the soda machine along the wall. That Chevy's looking good as new, boss. Better. Will it be ready by four? She'll be ready. I'll tell Syl. The dog tugged on the leash, and as Naomi had loosened her grip, he slipped free to wag his way to the new guy. Hey, boy. Your dog's got a sweet face, ma'am. He's not mine. He's not mine, she said almost desperately to Xander, who only shrugged. Want another dog, Pete? You know I would, but Carol would skin me. Nice dog, he added, then walked off while the dog wandered around, sniffing at everything. How'd he sleep? What? The dog? Fine. I woke up at five because he was standing by the bed staring at me and scared the crap out of me. So he's housebroken. I guess. So far, anyway. But you live a ways from town, Xander continued. A dog's good security. I'm having an alarm system installed. A dog's good company, he shot back. I like solitude. You're a hard sell, Naomi. The dog walked back tail wagging, with a rag hanging out of his mouth, and happy eyes as he brought it to Naomi. He loves you. Because he brought me a filthy rag he found on the floor? Yeah, you'll get used to it. Meantime, I'll get you half that bill, and I'll keep asking around if anyone's missing him or interested in taking him. She dug into her purse again and came out with a flyer she'd printed. Put this up. Xander studied it. Nice shot of him. I have to go get some work done. I haven't done anything but dog all morning. You could ask me to dinner. Why would I? Then you'd have done something else, and I'll give him his evening meds. You said you can cook. She gave him a long, cool look. You're not after a meal. Man's gotta eat. I don't have dishes, or chairs, or a table. I'm not going to sleep with you, and I am not keeping this dog. Annoyed with him, with herself, she snatched the leash and began to pull the dog out of the bay. You like to gamble, Naomi? She looked over her shoulder, still dragging the dog. No. Too bad. Because I'd bet you every bit you just said's going to change. The hell it would, she told herself. She didn't realize until she got home that the dog still had the disgusting rag. When she tried to get it from him, he decided she wanted to play tug. In the end, she gave up and sat on the top step of her front porch, the dog with a disgusting rag beside her, and the noise of saws and hammers behind. What have I done? Why didn't I just pitch a tent in the woods? Why do I have a big house full of all these people? Why do I have a dog I have to medicate? Adoringly, he dropped the wet, greasy rag in her lap. Perfect. Just perfect. He went with her when she climbed down the steep, jumbled path to the shoreline. She'd been certain the dog would stay, hang out with the crew, but he'd insisted on going out when she did. Next time, she'd sneak out. Still, she found he didn't get in the way as she found her shots, even the one of the dark purple starfish shining in a tidal pool. In fact, after a brief exploration, the dog seemed content to doze in the sun as long as she stayed in sight just as he seemed content to curl up nearby when she sat at her desk working or worked in her mat room. If she went downstairs, the dog followed. If she went up, he climbed right up after. When the house was quiet again, she wondered if dogs could have abandonment issues. He didn't like the eardrops, and that was a battle, but she won. She knew from Kong the best way to get meds into a dog and disguised the pills in rolled slices of cheese. When she sat out on the deck eating her dinner of a grilled cheese sandwich, he ate his. 
and didn't bolt it down as if starved this time. And when she got into bed with her laptop to spend the last hour of her day looking for faucets and shower heads, the dog curled into his bed as if he'd done so all his life. At five in the morning, she woke with a start, the dog's eyes gleaming at her, his doggy breath in her face. Xander sent his half of the vet bill with Kevin, along with a message that he'd split the follow-up too. Two days later, he showed up himself with another bag of dog food, another rawhide bone, and the biggest box of milk bones she'd ever seen. She wondered if he'd timed it to arrive minutes after the crew left, or if it was just coincidence. But it made the dog happy, and he spent some time roughhousing with him. He's getting some energy back. Xander winged a tennis ball so the dog could chase it like it was gold. Nobody's responded to the flyers. Nothing from any of the vets or shelters. You're going to have to face it, Slim. You've got yourself a dog. What's his name? I'm not naming him. If she named him, she was finished. What do you call him? The dog? Xander winged the ball again when the dog retrieved it and shook his head. Have a heart. Having a heart's what got me into this. If I keep him any longer, I have to have him neutered. Xander gave the dog a pitying look. Yeah, sorry about that, pal. You should try out some names. I'm not going to... She broke off. Why argue? Alice said your dog was Milo. Where'd you get that name? Milo Minderbinder. Catch-22? Everybody gets a share? Yeah. I just read it. And the pup? He just looked like he'd have all the angles. Name's gotta fit. Are you going to ask me in? I am not. Nothing's changed. It's early days yet, he said, then turned as she did at the sound of an approaching vehicle. Expecting anybody? No. The dog barked, raced up to stand beside Naomi. You've got a guard dog there. I can guard myself just fine. And her hand went into her pocket, closed over the folding knife. The big truck lumbered up the hill, the big truck with New York plates. The driver, young, sharp-eyed, leaned out the window. Naomi Carson? Yes? Sorry we're so late in the day. We got a little turned around. I didn't order anything from New York. Did you drive cross-country? Yes, ma'am. Me and Chuck did it in 55 hours, 26 minutes. He hopped out of the truck and gave the dog a pat while his companion hopped out the other side. Why? Naomi asked. Sorry? I don't understand what you're doing here. Delivering your bed. I didn't order a bed. Shoot. All this way and we forgot. No, ma'am, you didn't order it. It's a gift sent by Seth Carson and Harry Dobbs. Weird to get it here. Put it where you want it and set it up. They paid for the full white glove delivery. When? A little more than 55 hours and 26 minutes ago, I guess you could say. He grinned again. There's a couple packages in the back, too, wrapped. It's a hell of a bed, ma'am. The one called Chuck handed her a clipboard with the order sheet. She recognized the name of the furniture store her uncles patronized. I guess we'll find out. Want some help with it? Xander asked. The driver gave his shoulders a roll, and Xander a look of pure gratitude. It's one big mama, so we could use it. As it was heavily wrapped for shipping, Naomi couldn't say if it was a hell of a bed, except in size. She carted the packages one at a time as the men began the more laborious effort of getting the bed inside and up the stairs. Since the dog stayed with the men, she got a box cutter and opened the first box. Four king-size pillows, down, in the second, more pillows, a gorgeously simple duvet several perfect shades deeper blue than her walls, with matching shams. In the third, two sets of lovely white-on-white -white Egyptian cotton sheets and the handwritten note. Our girl needs a bed, and one that gives her sweet dreams. We knew it was for you the minute we saw it. We love you. Seth and Harry. My men, she said with a sigh and carted the first box upstairs. Since her bedroom was currently chaos and full of other men and dog, she went back down, got soft drinks out of the fridge, and took them back up. Appreciate it. We'll haul all the wrapping and padding away with it. We've got specific instructions. It's going to take a while to get it put together. Okay. You want it where you got the mattresses, right? I, yes, that's fine. I need to make a call. She left them to it, 
called home, and spent the next 20 minutes with Seth as Harry was at the restaurant. His pleasure zipped over every mile. She didn't tell him she'd narrowed down her choices and styles of bed, had even planned a day trip to Seattle to look some over. Whatever they'd bought her would be treasured just for that. When she went back into the bedroom, she stopped short. They had her mattresses on the frame, had the headboard and footboard on, or heading that way. Oh, my God. Pretty, isn't it? She looked at the driver. She didn't know his name, then back at the bed. It's gorgeous. It's wonderful. It's perfect. Wait till we get the posts up. Mahogany, she thought, with satin wood cross-banding, Chippendale style. She hadn't been raised by Seth and Harry for nothing. The wood tones, rich and lovely, set off the soft colors of the walls, fretwork legs and posts high and turned. If a woman didn't have sweet dreams in a bed like that, she needed therapy. You okay, ma'am? She managed to nod. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Josh. Josh and Chuck. Josh, I'm fine. You were right, it's a hell of a bed. When they were done, she tipped them generously, the least she could do, and gave them more soft drinks for the road. When they left, she stood staring at the bed, at the way the early evening light gleamed on the wood, on the details. Some uncles you've got, Xander commented. Best ever. Need to cry it out? She shook her head, pressed fingers to her eyes. No, I hate to cry. So useless. I talked to them Sunday. They went right out and found this, then had it shipped all the way out here this way, along with sheets and pillows and bedding, and it's just right. Just exactly right. For me, for the room, for the house. She pushed the thread of tears away. I'm not going to cry. I'm going to cook. I still don't have dishes or a table, but you can eat what I fix on paper plates outside on the deck. That's your tip for helping set up the bed. I'll take it. What's for dinner? I don't know yet, but I'm having wine. I'm feeling sentimental and a little homesick. Got beer? Pretty sure. If you do, I'll go for that. Okay. She started out, glanced back at him. I'm still not sleeping with you. Yet. His smile was easy and dangerous. Beer and a dinner's a start. A finish, she thought as the dog trooped down with them. He watched her cook. He'd never seen anybody cook by grabbing things, throwing this thing in a pan, that thing in a skillet, chopping this up, stirring that in. The dog watched her too, and wasn't subtle about licking his muzzle when the scents started rising. What are you making there? We'll call it pasta on the fly. She laid olives, fat ones, on a cutting board, smacked them with the flat of the knife she'd been wielding, and popped out the pits, something he'd never seen anyone do. Don't those just come in jars without pits? These are Kalamata olives, friend, and they're worth the extra step. Anything I put in here you don't like, you eat around. I'm not fussy. Good thing. Now she took a hunk of cheese and worked it to a blur over a grater. He'd have asked why she didn't buy it already grated, but figured he knew the answer. She tossed little tomatoes in the pan, added some sort of herbs, and stirred, even while muttering how she wished the local produce ran to fresh basil. I need to get good cookware before Harry sends me that, too. What's wrong with what you've got? Looks like it's working fine to me. Hardware store special. He'd be appalled. I'm a little appalled myself, actually. And I definitely need good knives, something to add to the list. He liked watching her. Quick, sure movement— liked listening to her voice, a voice that held just the right amount of smoke. What else is on the list? Painting the guest rooms I have earmarked for my brother and for my uncles, the one for my grandparents. After that, I think I'll retire my roller and pan. I don't like painting. Have the painters paint. I need to buy decent cookware and knives. I can paint two more rooms in this ridiculously big house. And now I have to find furniture worthy of that bed. And so on. She drained the pasta, the little tube sort, then added it to the skillet, along with the olives, the cheese, tossed it all around. Plates are in that cupboard there, such as they are, as are paper napkins and a box of plastic forks. Got it. She tossed the stuff in the skillet a couple more times, then served it up on the paper plates and added wedges of Italian bread that she'd slathered with butter, sprinkled with herbs, and toasted. That looks amazing. 
It would look better on the plates I ordered, but it's good enough. She handed him a plate, took one for herself, and then led the way out. Then she handed him her plate. Hold this while I feed the dog. The dog looked at the kibble she dumped in his bowl, then back at Xander with the two aromatic plates of pasta. His tail drooped, and Xander swore the dog sighed in disappointment. She sat, eyeing the dog, who eyed her. This is mine, that's yours. That's how it goes. Hard ass. <laughs> Maybe. Xander sat down and sampled what she'd thrown together magically, and a little maniacally in about twenty minutes. This is really good. Seriously good. It's not bad. It'd be better with fresh herbs. I guess I'll have to plant some. It didn't feel as odd as she'd expected, to sit there, eating pasta with him while the dog, who'd polished off his own bowl, watched them mournfully. Maybe it was the view, the soft hand of dusk gliding pale and purple over water and the green. Maybe it was the wine. Either way, she needed to set the line. Do you want to know why I'm not going to sleep with you? Yet, he added. Is there a list? We can call it that. You live here, and right now, so do I. Right now. You've got pots and pans for the right now, but have better ones on your list. It seems to me you're looking at the down the road. Maybe. I've never lived in any one place for more than a few months since I left New York. I don't know if this will stick. Maybe, she said again, because it feels right, right now. But in any case, you live here and you're friends with Kevin and Jenny, long-term, serious friends. We start something, and I'm also not looking to start something, and it gets messed up, your friend and my contractor's in the middle of it. That's weak, Xander said, and went back to the pasta. Not from where I'm sitting, in the heart of a construction zone. Plus, you're the only local garage and mechanic, and I might need a mechanic. Thoughtfully, he crunched into the bread. Probably get the work done faster if we're having sex. She laughed, shook her head. Not if we stop having it, and you're pissed at me. There's work, of which I have to do a lot to pay for this house and everything that goes into it. I don't have time for sex. There's always time for sex. Next time, I'll bring pizza, and we can have sex in the time you spent making dinner. And thoughtfully, Naomi ate pasta. That doesn't speak very well of your... stamina. Just trying to work on your schedule. Consider it, but unnecessary as dinner tonight is a one-off. I don't know you. That's the only thing you said so far that makes sense. But we can go back up your list and I can remind you I'm friends, serious, long-term, with Kevin and Jenny. They'd warn you if I was a psychopath. She kept her eye on the view. People don't always know people close to them the way they think they do. There was a story, Xander thought. He could hear it murmuring under her words. Instead of pressing on that, he tried something else. He leaned over and took her face in his hand, her mouth with his, strong and hot and edging onto the fierce. He knew when a woman wanted, and she did. He knew it by the way her mouth responded, heard it in her throaty hum, felt it in the quick, sexy quiver. Another woman? All this heat, the mesh of needs, would lead them straight up and into that excellent new bed. But she drew back. Still, she kept her eyes, that deep, fascinating green, on his. You make an excellent point, she said. And I can't argue it, but... She looked directly into his eyes. Like I told the dog, that's how it goes. Tonight. For the moment, he contented himself with the food, the view, the mysteries of the woman beside him. Somebody handed him a puzzle, he thought. He just had to solve it. He'd figure her out, sooner or later. 10. She went back to work. Since work ranked high on her list of reasons not to sleep with Xander, she had to make her own point. When she went out to shoot in the morning, the dog tagged along. For a few days, if she headed into woods or along shorelines, she rigged the leash to her belt. They both disliked the solution intensely. After those few days, she realized the dog wasn't going anywhere and usually let him off the leash. He explored nearby, chased squirrels, barked at birds, sniffed at deer tracks, and scat, 
While she composed studies of wildflowers, trees, long channels of water in sunlight and in shadow, and she ended up with an entire series of dog shots. He snoozed by the fireplace, gas logs installed and fabulous for cool, gloomy days, while she worked at her computer. Now and again he'd go down, hang with the crew, or with Molly if she'd come to visit, but he always came back in, gave her a long look, as if checking if she'd finished. If she hadn't, he curled up again, usually with something in his mouth. Sometimes the something was a stray work glove, and once it was a hammer. Steady, focused work paid off. She received a satisfying check from the gallery in New York and watched her PayPal account blossom. People, it seemed, really liked pictures of dogs. Jenny stopped by, as promised, and took the tour. When they got to the master suite, Jenny sighed. I don't know which is more impressive, the view or the bed. I like having the view from the bed. It must be wonderful, waking up to that every morning. Xander said your uncles shipped the bed all the way across the country. They did. And if I don't find some pieces to go in here, they'll start finding them and shipping them. Come shopping with me. Bouncing on her toes, Jenny slapped her hands together. Let's go. What, now? It's my day off. Kids in school. I've got... She pulled out her phone to check the time. Five hours before I have to pick up Maddie, then Ty. I know it's a work day for you, but you have to have more furniture. And I know a couple of places, especially if you're not afraid of refinishing or having something refinished, that should have pieces that will really suit that bed. I really... She thought of the income she'd just banked, turned the automatic refusal on its ear. Should do that. Yes! Maybe we can find your dishes. I ordered them. Wait, I'll show you. They both studied her computer screen as she brought them up. They're recycled glass, which appealed, and I went with some white serving pieces for the bump. I think they're wonderful. Perfect. Oh, they're going to look fabulous in the kitchen and on the table once you get a table. The table can wait a while. Not planning any dinner parties, but I do need stools. Stools and a dresser. It'd be nice to put my clothes in drawers rather than cardboard boxes. Let's go bag one. The dog came. Naomi had no intention of taking him, but he followed them out, hopped right in her car, then crawled into the back to sit, tongue hanging out in anticipation. He's so sweet. A dog's a good thing to have living out here alone, and a sweet dog's a good thing anywhere. Kevin says he and Molly get along fine. What's his name? He doesn't have one. Oh, Naomi, you have to name him. His owners could still... How long since you brought him home? We're into week three. Naomi sighed, rubbed the back of her neck. He's going in for neutering tomorrow. If you're looking for a dog... We have one, thanks. We are thinking of a puppy, a friend for Molly, and we want the kids to have the experience. Besides, Naomi, that's your dog. Naomi looked in the rearview mirror, and the dog unquestionably smiled at her. He's just living here for now. Sure he is. Naomi narrowed her eyes, put on her sunglasses. Which way? Just head toward town and I'll guide you from there. She couldn't think of the last time she'd shopped with a friend, or allowed herself a friend. For the most part, she didn't go shopping so much as go, hunt up what she needed, buy it, and take it home, which baffled and disappointed her uncles. Plus, she could hunt up and buy almost everything she needed online. But since she was out and about, she'd stop by the hardware and buy the paint for Mason's room, a warm, mossy green, on the way back. And she liked Jenny. She decided it was impossible not to like Jenny, who was cheerful and funny and didn't ask probing questions. She decided she really liked Jenny when her new friend directed her to a huge barn a few miles inland. I should have brought my camera. But she opened the compartment between the seats and took out a case. What's that? Lens and filters for my camera phone. Really? I didn't know there were such things. Works well in a pinch. And that barn, the texture of the wood, the true barn red with a white trim, that old apple tree, the light, it's good. Don't you want to see what's in the barn? Absolutely. This won't take long. She intended to leave the dog in the car. He had other ideas. So against her better judgment, Naomi pulled out the spare leash she'd stowed in the glove compartment. If you go, you wear this. He tried to stare her down. Failed. 
I'll hold on to him while you take pictures. Thanks. He hates the leash. Wouldn't you? It's all right, sweetheart. We'll think of it as you leading me. Perversely, the dog behaved perfectly for Jenny, walked happily beside her, sniffed his way to an appealing spot to lift his leg, while Naomi composed shots, added lenses, adjusted filters. She'd come back with her equipment, she promised herself. She'd love a gloomy day, that barn under gloomy skies. She found more shots inside. The place went on forever, packed with everything under sun or gloom. Glassware, tinware, collectibles, mirrors, chairs, desks. In fact, she paused in front of one of the desks. She'd decided to go with New for a permanent desk, something that looked right with a bed, but had all the modern touches. Keyboard drawer, plugs, file drawers. But it was nearly black from years, probably decades of varnish, and the drawers stuck. It needed new hardware. It wasn't at all what she'd decided on. And it was perfect. The shape's perfect, Jenny said beside her. Just enough curve at the corners, plenty of drawers. It needs work. Lips pursed, Jenny checked the tag. And some bargaining. It's solid, sturdy, mahogany. It needs to be stripped down to the original finish. It's not what I was going for. And I really love it. Don't say you love it to Cecil, his place. Look doubtful when you ask him about it. You need a good chair. A new one. Ergonomic. Lumbar support. Kevin says you spend a lot of time at your desk. Kevin's right. The computer's the darkroom today. Though I want to put an actual darkroom in, I still get the urge to shoot film sometimes. Is that a mermaid floor lamp? It appears to be. A bronze mermaid floor lamp. Struck, she pulled out her phone again. I need that for my portfolio. No name and I are going to wonder. I'll catch up. She fell for the mermaid floor lamp, which she told herself was stupid. She wasn't looking for a floor lamp, much less a bronze mermaid with sly eyes and sleek breasts, but she wanted it. Don't tell Cecil, she reminded herself, and tried to find Jenny and the dog in the maze of fascinating things. Jenny found her. Don't hate me. Does anybody? Kevin's old high school girlfriend. Because she's a slut. Jenny beamed. I didn't realize you knew Candy. Candy? Definitely a slut. A pink-wearing slut. Actually, I have a cousin named Candy, and she's not. She's wonderful. But to circle back, don't hate me, but I think I found the dresser. Why would I hate you for that? It's expensive, but I think it's really perfect, and maybe we can team up and drive the price down, especially if you get the desk, too. And the mermaid lamp. Really? Jenny threw back her head and laughed. I love it. I figured you'd see it as a novelty just for photos, but I think it'd be fabulous in your house. So do I. Let's see this dresser. If I hate you, you have to walk home. There were advantages, Naomi discovered, to shopping with a friend. A friend with a sharp, creative, and discerning eye. It was more gentleman's chest than dresser, which really hit a note for her. Not female and fussy, but gorgeous and dignified without the stuffiness. In good condition, which surprised her, the finish glowing with that lovely reddish-gold undertone. She'd change the hardware, get rid of the ornate brass handles, and one of the drawer bottoms had a long diagonal crack, but that was it. The price made her hiss and shudder. We're going to talk him down. You wait and see. Jenny gave Naomi a bolstering pat. Cecil might have been a scrawny man in bib overalls, a straw hat, with a grizzled beard, and he wouldn't see 80 again, but he had a gimlet eye and a hard line. But so, Naomi discovered, did the sweet and cheerful Jenny. She poked her oar in a time or two, just to say she did, but it was primarily Jenny who did the bargaining, and, with tenacity and guile, shaved a full 20% off the dresser where Naomi had hoped for 10. The three of them managed to load the dresser in the forerunner. Cecil was old, but he proved ox strong. Kevin's going to pick up the other pieces, Jenny told Cecil. He is? Naomi wondered. Sure. He'll get him after work or in the morning. And remember, Cecil, Naomi has that big house to furnish, so we'll be back. And expect good prices. The dog sprawled out content enough beside the dresser, and Jenny settled in the passenger seat. That was fun. I'm dazzled by your Arabian marketplace skills. Thank you, really. I can come back and get the other pieces. Kevin doesn't have to come all the way out here. It's fine. 
Plus, if you hire me to refinish that desk, he'll just bring that home to my little workshop. You have a workshop? I refinish and reimagine furniture and decorative pieces on the side. I didn't want to say anything, make you feel obligated or awkward. But boy, I want to do that desk. I'm good, I promise. I'll make it gorgeous. I bet you will. And she could cross off the hours it would take her to do it. You're hired. Really? Yay! If you come over for dinner Sunday, Kevin said not to bother you, but I've been dying to have you to dinner. You could see the workshop. I've got a bench I'm working on that's perfect for the deck outside your bedroom. An old wire garden bench with a big curved back. And you can bring the dog. The kids would love him. Naomi started to make an excuse. Knee jerk. But curiosity won. I'd love to see your workshop. You don't have to feed me. Come to dinner. We eat a little early most Sundays. Come by any time after four. Time to see my shop for the kids to play with the dogs. I'll be there. I'll bring dessert. Bright and early, she took a long-sleeved T-shirt and leggings out of boxes. She refused to use the dresser until she had Kevin fix the drawer and she'd replace the hardware. When she walked casually out to the car, the dog followed, jumped right in, gave her that smug dog grin. He didn't know what he was in for. But he got at least part of the picture when she pulled into the parking lot of the vets. He quivered, shook, tried to glue his nicely heeled paws to the floorboards. This time you've got a reason but you don't know that. Come on. Grow a spine. She pulled, hauled, bribed, with a tennis ball, as food was off the table until after the surgery. You won't miss them, she told him, then shook her head. How do I know? I'd miss pretty much anything somebody snipped off me. But it has to be, okay? It's just how it goes. She got him through the waiting room, empty, as she'd arranged to be the first surgery or appointment of any kind of the day. Hey, boy. Alice greeted him with a good rub, relaxed him so he leaned on her. We'll take him from here. The procedure's routine, sometimes a little tougher on a grown dog, but still routine. We'll keep him a few hours after to make sure everything's good. Okay, I'll come get him when you call. She gave the dog a pat on the head. Good luck. When she turned to go, he howled, long and mournful, as he'd done a few times when he heard a siren. She glanced back, saw his blue eyes full of sorrow and fear. Shit. Just shit. Just let him know you're coming back, Alice advised. You're his alpha. Shit, she said again, and walked back to crouch in front of the dog. I'm coming back to get you, okay? She took his head in her hands, felt herself battered with a love his gaze sent out. Okay, all right. I'm coming back to get you, take you home. You just have to do this first. I'll go... Hell, I'll go buy you some good dog sans balls presents. The dog licked her cheek, laid his head on her shoulder. He'd hug you if he could, Alice commented. Sunk, Naomi hugged him instead. I'll be back. He whined when she rose, cried when she started out. He'll be fine, Alice called after her. And the heart Naomi hadn't wanted to give away broke a little when she heard the dog howl. She bought him a little stuffed cat, a ball that squeaked, telling herself she'd regret both purchases. She added a sturdy tug rope, a dog brush. She made herself go home, made herself work, and when she couldn't concentrate for more than ten minutes, she put on her paint clothes. She didn't have to be creative to paint a room. While she primed the walls, she imagined furnishing it. Maybe a sleigh bed, maybe dark gray. Mason would like it when he came to visit her. Or maybe old and iron. Gray again. Gray would work with the green tones she'd paint in here. Why didn't Alice call? Annoyed with herself, she broke one of her unwritten rules about poking into whatever the crew was doing unless it was for pictures and went downstairs. They'd primed the living room, mostly because she couldn't quite decide what color she wanted there. The fireplace mantle needed refinishing and made her think of Jenny. If Jenny did a decent job on the desk, she could do the mantle. She wandered the space, looked out the windows at the views. She wasn't ready to throw in the towel and hire a landscaper, but most of the outside rehab just had to wait until the bulk of the work was done inside, and men and women weren't tromping all over the place. She moved on, stopped at the odd jet of a room she'd decided could be a little library. 
Maybe she didn't often find or take the time to curl up with an actual book, but she'd imagined doing so there on a rainy day, or in the dead of winter, with the fire sparking. Now Kevin and the buxom Macy set the first of the flanking built-ins in place to the right of the hearth. Oh, Kevin. He glanced back, grinned as he shoved up the bill of his cap. Go ahead and say it. You were right. I was wrong. I didn't know you'd finish them. We figured we'd surprise you. You were right. I didn't see it. Little room like this. Take out that wall, I told you, and you'd have some space. But you stuck, and you had the eye. What you've got is cozy and good light. And what do you say, Macy? Charm. It's going to have charm, especially when we put up the crown molding. It's beautiful wood, the cherry, and beautiful work. That's what we do, right, Mace? Damn right. You were right about straight open, floor to ceiling, too. Gives a dimension, makes the room seem bigger. I'm going to have to send for my books. I usually read on my tablet, but I've got a couple boxes of books back home. If you need more, you can tab Xander. Why? He's got books everywhere, Macy told her. Oh, yeah. Kevin took a small level out of his tool belt, laid it on a shelf. Every now and then he'll box them up, donate them, but mostly he hoards them. If you need to fill some of these shelves, you should tap him about it. I'll see what... She jumped when her phone signaled, snatched it out of her pocket. It's the vet. Yes, this is Naomi. Okay. Okay. Really? As relief washed over her like a warm wave, she rubbed her hand over her face. That's great. I'll come now. No, I'll be there in a few minutes. Thanks. Blowing out of breath, she shoved the phone away again. The dog. He's out of recovery or whatever. Ready to come home. I'll be back. Oh, in case I don't see you, you made the papers. The what? She stopped dead. The papers, Kevin repeated. I got a copy in the kitchen. She kept her voice even. What happened? The Cove Chronicle. It comes out once a month. Just a few pages, local news and such. It's a nice story about the house, fixing it up. Oh. Local little paper. Nothing to worry about. Nobody but the locals would see it. I'll leave you the copy. Jenny's got more at home, as I got some ink, too. I'll read it when I get back. Thanks. I better go get the dog. She'd put off the reporter, editor, publisher. She thought the woman who'd wanted to talk to her wore all three hats, but it didn't matter. Naomi took every precaution to keep her name out of print, to keep her whereabouts out of print. Nobody beyond Sunrise Cove, or certainly no one outside the county, would read the article. And nobody would connect her with Thomas David Bowes. And she had more important things to worry about right at the moment. She dashed into the vet's muttered a thanks when the receptionist gestured her to go back. She found Alice, fitting the dog with a cone. He looked a little dazed and confused, but he let out a short, happy bark, and his tail wagged madly when he saw Naomi. He's okay? Came through like a champ. He has meds, and you have instructions. The cones to keep him from worrying the sight, the stitches. He'll probably sleep more than anything else. He may be a little sore, and not want to walk much for a day or two. Okay, that's okay. She got down, stroked his ears inside the cone. You're okay. She took the meds, the instructions, paid the bill, gave him a boost into the car. He didn't sleep. He had to sniff at everything in the front yard, though he walked a little stiffly. He had to sniff and wag at the crew. He and Molly had to sniff and wag at each other. And he bumped into everything. Walls, tools, her. She helped him upstairs, gave him the stuffed cat, a mistake, she noted, as the comb got in the way. One of the crew called up with a question. She went down, and in the 15 minutes she was gone, he'd managed to get out of the cone and was looking away where his balls had once been. How the hell did you get out of that? Pleased, he thumped his tail. You can't do that anymore. Those days are over. She fitted the cone back on him, an ordeal, as he seemed to hate it more than the leash. She got it back in place, gave him a rawhide, and considered the matter settled. It wasn't. Sander figured he'd given it some time, and he had the excuse of paying her for half the ball snipping. Maybe, if he played it right, he could get another dinner out of it. And with that, 
Maybe he could get her a few more steps closer to that big, beautiful bed. It was worth a drive out. He pulled up on his motorcycle, with a dog barking and wagging and greeting. The dog would have rushed over to finish the hello, but Naomi sat on the porch steps and had the dog in a death grip, holding him in place while she... Jesus Christ. Appalled, sincerely, Xander pulled off his helmet. What the hell are you doing? What the hell does it look like I'm doing? It looks like you're putting pants on that dog. Then that's what the hell I'm doing. She dragged them the rest of the way on, red shorts with a white side stripe, then let the dog go. She leaned back on the steps while the dog, looking like an idiot, hurried over for a rub. What kind of person puts pants on a dog? The kind who isn't going to keep fighting to keep the damn cone on him. He gets out of it. Kevin duct taped the thing, and he still got out of it if I took my eyes off him for five damn minutes. And when he was in it, he ran into everything, including me. I swear, on purpose. He hated it. Cone of shame? Yeah, the damn cone of shame. So now he's wearing the pants of humiliation. But the stupid dog seems to like them. Pants of humiliation? Xander had to grin. You cut a hole for his tail. Kevin had them in his truck, his old running shorts. I got creative. Maybe. But how do you expect him to do what he needs to do out here? Why the hell do you think I was dragging them back on him? She waved her arms, winced, rubbed her right biceps. I brought him out, took them off so he did what he needed to do. Now they're on, and he can't get to the incision site. In fact, he seems to forget about it when he's wearing them. Maybe you should buy him an outfit. Impressed with her inventiveness, Xander sat down beside her, rubbed the dog. I got my half of the deal. Alice said he did fine. Yeah, yeah, he's fine. I'm exhausted. I can order a pizza. No, thanks, but... Crap, just crap. Yes, please order. The backs of my calves are covered in cone bruises. My arms ache from painting and from struggling with this dog, who's putting on those pounds just fine, thanks. The dog brought Xander a ball he'd obviously stowed somewhere outside for easy access. Don't throw it. He really shouldn't run yet. Xander pushed up again. Anything you don't like on pizza? No anchovies, no pineapple. Anything else is fine. The dog dropped the ball between Naomi's feet, and when she didn't respond, he laid his head on her knee. What's the dog's name? She heaved a sigh. Tag. As in, you're it? No. As in, he tags along. Tag. The dog couldn't have recognized his name yet, but apparently he recognized humor as he looked over at Xander, gave a doggy grin. It works. Panorama. This visible world is but a picture of the invisible, wherein, as in a portrait, things are not truly, but in equivocal shapes. Sir Thomas Brown. 11. Once or twice a week, Xander and Kevin grabbed a beer after work. Sometimes they actually planned it and met up at Lou's, but for the most part, it just happened. It just happened that Kevin swung into Xander's garage after trips to the lumber yard and the tile distributor, and the half an hour huddled with his electrician. He knew how to juggle jobs. Naomi's was priority, but he had a couple others going, which meant he spent a lot of time traveling from site to site, and right now, he wanted a beer. The garage doors, lowered and locked, didn't mean Xander wasn't around, just as his truck sitting in the parking lot didn't mean he was. Taking his chances, Kevin got out of his own truck and headed around the back of the garage, where a zigzag of steps led to Xander's apartment. He heard the music, classic stones. He followed it around to the rear bay, Xander's personal bay, and found his friend tending to the love of his life, the 67 GTO convertible. Or, as Kevin thought of it, the date car. Who's the lucky lady? Kevin asked, pitching his voice to ride over Mix. Xander glanced up from polishing the chrome rocker panels. She is. She needed detailing. I'm just finishing it up. Xander had what he considered a damn fine crew of his own, but nobody, absolutely nobody, touched the GTO but himself. He loved her, from her chain mail grill to her eight taillights, and every square inch of her Coke bottle body between. 
He rose now to take a critical look at his own work. She shined, sparkling chrome against the red body. That was factory red, just as his grandfather had driven it off the showroom floor. Are you going to take her out for a spin? I'm up for it. Not today. We got rehearsal in. Xander checked the old schoolhouse-style clock on the wall. In about an hour. We got a wedding up in Port Townsend on Saturday. Lilo's cousin. Ride, ride, I remember. Got time for a beer? I can make time. Xander took one last look at his sweetheart and stepped out. Nice evening. How about we do this on the veranda? Kevin grinned. That works. They trooped up the steps into the apartment. The main space held the living room, kitchen, and, with the card table and folding chairs, the dining area. Bookshelves, loaded, rose and spread over an entire wall of the living room. Kevin had built them, and the bookshelves in the skinny second bedroom used as an office, and the bookcase in the bedroom, when Xander bought the property and the business. Xander opened the old fridge, a cast-off Harvest Gold number that had been the rage in the 70s, grabbed two bottles of St. Pauli Girl, popped the tops on the wall-mounted opener, a rust-colored naked woman holding the opener in upstretched arms, and tossed the caps in the trash. They went out the bedroom door onto a postage stamp porch and sat in two of the folding chairs that went with the card table and considered it fine. Big wedding? Yeah, I'll be glad when it's done. The bride texts me every five minutes the last few days. Screwing around with a playlist. Anyway, it's a living. Did you break your ban on the chicken dance? Never happened. I took an oath. Xander stretched out his legs. He positioned the chairs so he could just stretch them out with his feet dropping off the edge. It worked. I saw your built-ins in the big house. Library? And the tile work in the half bath. Nice. Kevin stretched out his legs as well and took his first end-of-the-workday pull. You were up there? Yeah. The dog was wearing your pants, man. I gotta say, he looked better in them than you. I got excellent manly legs. With bear pelts. Keeps me and my woman warm in the winter. It was a smart solution. I don't know how the hell that dog kept getting out of the cone. But once you got the idea for the shorts, and we got them on him, he left his no-balls alone. Kevin took a second pull on his beer. And you're still trying to move on that? The dog? When Kevin just snorted, Xander shrugged. I will move on that, in time. I've never known you to take time on a move. She's skittish. At least that word came to Xander's mind. Don't you wonder why that is? She doesn't act especially skittish, look skittish, but she is under there. I'm curious enough to take time. If I just like the look of her, and I do like the look of her, but if I just, I wouldn't bother with so much time. Either it's going to happen, or it isn't. I like that she's smart. I like the contrasts. Contrasts? Skittish, but ballsy enough to buy that old place, live out there on her own. She handles herself, and makes you think she's had to. I like what she's doing to the old place, or paying you to do. She's got ideas. Yeah, she's damn good at what she does. You gotta appreciate somebody with talent who knows how to use it. And then... Smiling, Xander took a long drink. She named the dog. He's a good dog. He loves her like you love that GTO. He stole Jerry's hammer the other day. A hammer? Naomi brought it, a sandpaper block, two work gloves, and a pipe fitting back down the other day. He takes them up to her like presents. They sat a moment, in companionable silence, looking out toward the road where a few cars passed, the scatter of houses beyond, and the field where they'd both played Little League what seemed like a million years before. Tyler's got a t-ball game on Saturday. I'm sorry I'll miss that. It'll probably be more entertaining than the wedding. I remember playing t-ball, right over in the field. You and me and Lilo, remember? Yeah, dim, but yeah. Now I've got a kid playing. Makes you think. It made Xander think, nostalgically, of Lilo, who'd been scarecrow scrawny with beaver teeth. He'd stayed scrawny, Xander considered, but had grown into the teeth. We sucked at t-ball, man, both of us. Got a groove on in Little League. 
Kids mostly suck at t-ball. That's part of the charm. Maddie starts kindergarten next fall. Xander turned his head, gave Kevin a long look. You're thinking about having another. The subject's come up a few times. Well, you do good work there. Yeah, we do. We always said two, and when we ended up with one of each, hey, that's a nice balance. Now Ty's playing t-ball, Maddie's going into kindergarten, and we're talking about starting another from scratch. Three's a magic number. You can look it up, Xander added, when Kevin just looked at him. It's looking like we're going for the magic number. Have fun with that. That's the plus side. It sure is fun working on making one. You're not looking for sex with Naomi. Are you crazy? I mean, not just sex. Xander contemplated his beer. Why do married guys think single guys are only after sex? Because they used to be single guys. And remember, case in point, what was her name? Shit. Uh, Ari, Ali, Annie, the redhead with the rack and the overbite, worked at Singler's last summer. Bonnie. Bonnie! Where'd I get all those A's from? That was just sex. She was built, so there's that. But all the work went into the face and body, none into the brain. It was the overbite. Even now, Xander could sigh over it. I've always been a sucker for an overbite. Naomi doesn't have one. It's a flaw I'm overlooking. Sometimes it's just sex. As Bonnie illustrates, and your memory serves... And sometimes, as you ought to remember, you want some conversation. Some meat along with a sizzle. Bonnie had the sizzle, but I knew it wasn't going to be enough, even for the summer, when she picked up a copy of East of Eden I had on the nightstand and said she didn't know I was religious. Religious? She figured Eden, so it must be a biblical story. She didn't even know who Steinbeck was. And he could still shake his head over that. Even an overbite. Can't make up for that. It's good to have standards. Oh, I've got standards. So far, Naomi's meeting them, so I can take some time. What if she's lousy in bed? That'd be both surprising and disappointing, but if so, we can still have conversations. Does she ever talk about her family with you? Her brother, her uncles, little bits and pieces here and there? Not much elaboration, now that you mention it. Exactly. It's interesting, what she doesn't say. It's interesting. He thought about that, late into the night, long after rehearsal and the cold-cut subs he and his bandmates chowed down on. In general, he liked the company of men more than the company of women. He understood what men didn't say, didn't need or want it all laid out in specific words, expressions, freaking tones of voice. Women, to his mind, were work. Often worth it, and he didn't mind work. But time spent with women, when it wasn't before, during, or after sex, was entirely different than hanging out with men or working with them. In general, he preferred the short, straightforward mating dance, and considered the extra steps and flourishes a waste of everyone's time. You wanted or didn't. There was heat or there wasn't. For some reason, he found himself willing to take those extra steps with Naomi. He didn't really mind them. In fact, he enjoyed them. All the stops and starts, the detours. And in his experience, once the mating dance was done, the first rush of sex slowed, interest faded. He liked being interested. He turned on the bedroom TV, with a sound low, as it was mostly to cover the silence, so he didn't miss Milo's snoring so keenly. He picked up his nightstand book, a worn paperback of Lord of the Flies. He never had a first read on the nightstand, not if he wanted to sleep, so he settled in with a familiar and fascinating. But he couldn't get Naomi off his mind. On the bluff, Naomi turned off the lights. Her brain was too tired for more work, too tired to pretend to read, even to stream a movie. The dog had already settled down, and it was time she did the same. Since her tired brain didn't want to turn off, she let it wander, circling around faucets, lighting fixtures, whether she should do that study of Douglas firs she'd taken that morning, the green eerie to the thin mists. It would make a solid cover for a horror novel. She worked on it in her head, 
played up shadows until she drifted off, drifted away. When she walked through that eerie green, the wind rolled through the tops of the trees, a whoosh and moan that laid a chill on her skin. She followed the path. She wanted to get to the water, to the blue, to the warm. Her footsteps were muffled on the thick cushion of pine needles, and those deep green shadows seemed to shift into shapes, and the shapes had eyes. She moved faster, heard her breath quicken, not with exertion, but with atavistic fear. Something was coming. Thunder mumbled overhead, over the rolling, muttering wind. The shimmer of lightning tossed all into an instant of relief and brought a sick heaviness to her belly. She had to run, had to find the light again. Then the shadow stepped from the shadow, a knife in one hand, a rope in the other. Time's up, it said in her father's voice. She tried to scream and woke with it trapped in her throat, with a weight crushing her chest. No air, no air. And she clutched at her own throat as if to fight away the hands that circled it. Her heart thudded, sharp, vicious hammer blows that rang in her ears. Red dots swam in front of her eyes. Somewhere deep, under the weight, the terror, she shouted at herself to breathe, to stop and breathe. But the air wheezed, barely squeezed through her windpipe, only burned her starving lungs. Something wet ran over her face. She saw it, felt it, as her own blood. She would die here in the woods of her own creation, in fear of a man she hadn't seen in seventeen years. Then the dog barked, hard and fierce, chased the shadows like rabbits. So she lay panting, breathing, breathing, with the terrible weight easing as the dog lapped at her face. He had his front legs braced on the bed. She could see his eyes now, gleaming in the dark, hear his pants along with her own. Struggling to steady, she raised a trembling hand, stroked his head. Okay. She rolled toward him, comforted, let her eyes close, focused on long, slow breaths. It's okay. We're okay. Just a dream. Bad dream. Bad memories. We're okay now. Still, she switched on the light. She needed it. Brought her knees up to rest her clammy forehead on them. Haven't had one that bad in a while. Working too hard, that's all. Just working too hard. Thinking too much. Since the dog remained braced on the bed, she shifted to wrap her arms around his neck, pressing her face into his fur until the trembling eased. I thought I didn't want a dog. I'd say the way you were wondering, you must have thought you didn't want a human. She eased back, rubbed his ears. And here we are. She picked out the bottle of water she always kept on her nightstand and drank half of it before rising to go into the bathroom and splash cold water on her face. Still shy of five, she noted, early for both of them, but she couldn't risk sleep, not now. She picked up the flashlight, also handy on her nightstand, and went downstairs. She'd gotten into the habit of just letting him out in the morning, but this time she delighted him by going out with him. For a while they just walked, around the house, around the quiet. Tag found one of his secreted balls and happily carried it around in his mouth. When she went back in, he watched her make coffee, let the ball drop when she filled his food bowl, picked it up. Let's take it upstairs. He raced halfway up the back stairs, stopped, looked back to make sure she was coming, and then raced the rest of the way. With the dog, with the coffee, she settled down, calm and content again, to wait for sunrise to bloom over her world. When Sunday rolled around, she thought of a dozen reasons not to go to Jenny's, and the excuses that would cover it. Why would she take one of her two days of quiet and solitude a week and spend it with people? Nice people, certainly, but people who wanted to talk and interact. She could drive to the National Forest, go hiking, alone. She could work on the yard or finish painting the first guest room. She could sit around and fat-ass all day. Really, she'd agreed to go in a weak moment, in the rush of mermaid lamps and bargains. She should... She'd agreed to go, Naomi reminded herself. What was a couple of hours? If she was going to live here, she needed to be moderately sociable. Hermits and recluses generated gossip and speculation. And she'd said she'd bring dessert. 
and had even shopped for what she needed to make the strawberry tort. It was spring, after all. Stubbornly cool, often rainy, but spring. She decided to compromise. She'd make the tort, then see how she felt. Tag cast suspicious looks at her new stand mixer, as he did the vacuum cleaner. But she loved it. Had actually done a little dance when it had arrived two days before. Cooking soothed her and gave her a chance to spend quality time in the kitchen with the pretty blue dishes behind the glass, her exceptional knives arranged on their magnetic strip. Tag changed his mind about the mixer when she skimmed her finger over the batter left in the bowl and let him have a lick. Damn right it's good. She slid the jelly roll pan into the oven, got to work on the strawberries. She put them in one of her blue bowls first, found the right spot, the right light. Ripe red berries in a blue glass bowl? Good stock photo. Considering, she added more props, new wine glasses, then put the bowl of berries and the wine glasses on the bamboo tray she'd bought and set it all out on her glider. She took another shot with a pot of pansies in frame. She wished she had a throw pillow. Hadn't bought any yet. Maybe she would then set up the shot again with a colorful pillow in the corner of the... No better. A woman's white silk slip or sexy nightgown draped over the arm of the glider. She didn't have that either, and had less use for a slip or a sexy nightgown. But the oven timer buzzed. Crap, I haven't done the berries. She went back to the kitchen work, composing other shots in her head. The finished tort looked so beautiful, the making of it so satisfying, she convinced herself she'd be fine for a couple of hours with people she actually liked. And how the hell am I going to get it from here to there? Didn't think of that. She didn't have a cake carrier, or a tort carrier, or any carrier. In the end, she lined a shipping box with foil, tented the tort on its white platter, secured it in the box, and, thinking of the dog, taped the lid shut. She packed it in the fridge, then went up to dress. Next problem, she realized, what did people wear to Sunday dinner? Sunday brunch had been the thing in New York. Seth and Harry hosted elaborate Sunday brunches. Dress code had been casual or colorful or whatever struck your fancy. She hated to think about clothes, so she didn't have any to worry about. Eventually, she'd send for what was still in New York, the cocktail dresses, the sharp business wear, the artist black. Meanwhile, she had what she had, the reliable black jeans, a white shirt. After a short debate, she went with the Converse high tops. Nobody would care. She added a red belt to prove she'd given some thought to the whole deal and remembered to do her makeup. Any time after four, she remembered, and as it was now 4.30, she should just go. A couple of hours, three tops, and she'd be home, in her pajamas, back at her computer. She loaded the boxed tort onto the floor of the passenger seat and let the dog in the back. Don't even think about it, she warned him when he eyed the box. Armed with the directions Kevin had given her, she set off. She made the turns, took a road she'd yet to explore, and found a little neighborhood built around a skinny inlet. Docks speared out with boats moored, sunfish, sloops, cabin cruisers. She saw a girl who couldn't have been more than 12, paddling a butter-yellow kayak toward the widening channel with such smooth skill she might have been born in one. Naomi pulled up behind Kevin's truck and gave Xander's motorcycle a beady-eyed stare. She should have known. She thought the house charming, and decided she should have known that too, given who lived there. Bold blue trim against weathered cedar shakes, wide windows to bring in the view of the inlet. It stood two stories, with dormers and the enchantment of a widow's walk. She immediately wanted one. Flowering bushes, trees, and bedding plants danced in cheerful profusion and made her think of her own scrabbly neglected yard. She'd get to it. Ordering herself to put on her be sociable suit, she got out, and circled around for the tort and the dog. Tag all but glued himself to her side as she walked the pavered path to the covered front porch. It's not the vet, so buck up. Before she could knock, Jenny opened the door, and Tag's tail wagged in relief and joy at the sight of her. I saw you pull up. Immediately, Jenny moved in to hug, hard. I'm so glad you came. Everyone's outside running around. It's almost like summer today. I didn't realize you lived on the water. And you have a widow's walk. I had instant house envy. Kevin built it, and half of everything else. Let me take that. Jenny reached for the box, 
As they stepped into an entranceway cleverly outfitted with a built-in bench and cupboards above, drawers below. Sorry about the delivery system. Dessert's inside. You made something? I thought you'd just get something from the bakery. You're so busy. I needed to try out my new mixer. I love your house. It's so you. Colorful, cheerful, the bold blue of the trim echoed in a big sink-into-me sofa loaded with patterned pillows, and those were echoed by boldly patterned chairs. Echoed, Naomi thought, but nothing matching, and everything complimenting. I like cluttered. It's not cluttered. It's clever and happy. I really like you. Come on back to the kitchen. I'm dying to see what's in this box. The kitchen showed Kevin's hand and Jenny's style. It followed the open floor plan with a lounge play area, more comfortable seating, and the man-sized flat wall screen. Jenny set the box on the long, wide white granite peninsula and tore at the tape. Naomi glanced toward the dining area, the painted blue table, the mix and match of green chairs with flowered cushions. I love the dining room. Did you paint the furniture? I did. I wanted color and easy maintenance. It's happy, again, and I really love the chandelier. Distressed iron strips formed a large ball with clear round bulbs inside. Me too, thanks. Kevin found it on one of his job sites. It was some sort of decoration. He brought it home. I fixed it up. He rewired it. Handy couple. And I'm getting so many ideas. I'm going to get you a glass of wine in just a minute, Jenny promised. But, oh my God, you made this? I can make a chandelier, but I can make a strawberry tort. Almost reverently, Jenny lifted the tort from the box. It looks like something out of Martha Stewart. I'd ask for the recipe, but I already know it's beyond me. And it's going to put my lasagna to shame. I love lasagna. Mostly with two kids and a part-time job, I toss meals together. So Sunday dinner is the day I actually try to cook, taking time with it. Shiraz all right? Yes, it's great. I almost talked myself out of coming. Jenny glanced away from the tort she'd set in the center of the prep counter, like a centerpiece. Why? I'm easier alone than with people. But I'm glad I came, even if just to see your house. With a humming sound, Jenny poured Naomi a glass of wine, then picked up her own. I should tell you then, I've decided we're going to be really good friends, and I'm just relentless. I haven't had a really good friend in a long time. I'm out of practice. Oh, that's all right. Jenny wrist flicked that away. I've got the skills. Why don't I show you my workshop? I've got your desk stripped down. They went through a laundry room and straight into a space full of tables, chairs, shelves, workbenches. Though both windows stood open, Naomi caught the scents of paint thinner, linseed oil, polish. I keep picking things up, Jenny explained. It's a sickness. Then I fix them up and talk my boss at treasures and trinkets into taking them on consignment. She'll use pieces for display, and if they don't sell, I haul them down to this co-op in Shelton. If they don't sell there, I haul them back. I'm getting some work from people who want a piece redone or fixed up, but most is dumpster diving, I guess. Naomi gestured to a three-tiered pie crust table. You didn't get that out of a dumpster. Job site again. The lady sold it to Kevin for $10. It was broken. The top tier snapped clean off. So he fixed it. You can't even tell it was broken. And I'm... I want it. When you've refinished it, I'll buy it. Thrown off rhythm, Jenny blinked. You think fast. It's just the sort of thing I want. I'm looking to mix a lot of old pieces, character pieces through the house. This is perfect. I should have you over more often. Will you barter for it? You've already got the tort. I mean, would you trade me a picture for it and the work on the desk? You've got this one on your website, and I keep seeing it over our little fireplace in the living room in a white, shabby chic white frame. It's sunset, and oh, the sky is just full of red and gold and going to indigo blue, and the trees are reflected on the water. And there's a white boat, sailboat, in the sound. It makes me think that's what heaven could be, sailing in a white boat on the water into the red and golds. I know the one you mean, but it doesn't seem fair. Two pieces for one? I know what your work goes for, and I know what mine goes for. I'm getting the better deal. Depends on where you're standing. Done. But I frame it. Tell me what size you want. Jenny pointed toward a frame, 
shabby chic white. About 24 by 18. I'll take the frame with me. Oh, boy. And what I really wanted you to see was that bench. It just seems right for your bedroom deck. Following the direction, Naomi stepped around a couple of projects in progress and saw the high-backed wire bench, done in a distressed forest green. No pressure, Jenny said quickly. If you don't like it... I do, and it would work there. Better, if I ever get the grounds cleared and decently landscaped. It would be wonderful as a garden seat, wouldn't it? In a shady nook, Jenny imagined, or in the sun by a weeping cherry. Absolutely, and it would make pretty seating on the bedroom deck in the meantime. Sold. Will you trade me the water lily print for it? You make it easy, Naomi agreed. I have this frame, distressed silver, and I can just see that print in it on my bedroom wall. It's fun helping decorate each other's houses. Let's see the frame. Uh, it's over there. With Jenny, Naomi started toward it, then stopped. Oh, my desk. At her tone, Tag stopped exploring and trotted over. Naomi all but cooed as she ran her hand over the smooth wood. I know it's just stripped and sanded, but it's already beautiful. Look at the hues, the grain. It's like somebody had dressed a gorgeous woman in a baggy black coat and you took it off. I think we just made a hell of a good deal, both sides. That's what good friends should do. Delighted, Jenny hugged an arm around Naomi's waist. I'm going to love seeing my work in your space, having your work in mine. And now, why don't we go out the door here so we can walk around outside? I bet Tag wants to see Molly. They're friends, too. He decided she wouldn't try to rip his throat out. Now he takes her the tug rope when he sees her. It's sweet. They stepped out into the side yard. It's awful quiet, Jenny commented as she turned to secure the door. Quiet worries me. She'd no more than said it before Naomi took a blast of cold water. Heart shot. Xander swung around the corner, leading with a huge water rifle. Naomi held her hands out to the sides, looked down at her soaked shirt, and looked up. Really? Hey, sorry. I thought you were Kevin. Do I look like Kevin? Can't say you do, but I figured him to double back from this way. Kids broke the treaty, and the three of them are ganging up on me. This would be the fog of war sort of situation. Fog of war, my ass. It's more your... He broke off when he took a volley of shots in the back. Xander's dead! Tyler did a war dance. Xander's dead! He wiggled his butt and shook his water gun at the sky. Traitors. You're living with traitors and backshooters, Xander told Jenny. You shot an unarmed woman. I'll get you a dry shirt, Naomi. Thanks. And thank you for killing him, Naomi said to Tyler. He ambushed a noncombatant. You're welcome. You're a really good shot. Could I? She took the gun and shot a stream into Xander's face. There. That's what we call a coup de grace. Maddie giggled, then started climbing up her father's leg. Xander's got cooties. <laughs> That's right. She gave Tyler back the gun, then narrowed her eyes at the gleam in Xander's. Don't even think about it she said, before walking away with Jenny. She ate in one of Jenny's T-shirts and enjoyed herself more than she'd thought possible. Good food and good company, two things she rarely took the time for or had the inclination for, proved the perfect end to the day, even when she found herself cornered into playing Xbox. You've got game, Xander commented, after she'd trounced everyone at the Lego movie game, twice. Everything is awesome when you have a brother who's still a video game maniac. And now that I remain undefeated, she added a finger in the belly for Tyler, I really have to go. Play one more. Practice, she advised, and I'll take you on next time. But Tag and I have to get home. Everything was great, Jenny. Thanks for having me. I can take those frames with me if you want. I really want. In her easy way, Jenny stepped up and hugged Naomi. Sunday dinner, open invitation. I mean it. Thanks. And thanks, Kevin. See you tomorrow. I'll get the frames. Meet you out front with them, Xander told her. She hadn't intended to stay so late, but the setting sun painted the sky in the west, and the air had cooled enough that she could have used a sweater. Still, she thought, as she walked the dog to the car, she could get some work in, plan out her agenda for the week, and have time to read herself to sleep. She opened the door to the back, 
The dog jumped agilely in. Then she sat on the back of the car, facing the water, and took pictures of the sunset over the inlet, the empty docks, the shimmering silence. Do you ever quit? Xander asked, as he carried the frames across the lawn. I get amazing sunrise shots from my place, but this little spit of water edges west, and that's one champion sunset. My place isn't on the water, but I get some worthy sunsets through the trees. You might want to check it out. I might. He propped the frames in the back, gave the dog a rub, and then managed to turn in a way that boxed her in. It's still early. That depends. Maddie was drooping. Maddie's four. Why don't we go into Luz? I'll buy you a drink. I had several glasses of wine. Over about four hours. Walk a straight line. She laughed, shook her head. I can walk a straight line. And since I want to continue to be able to, I'll pass on another drink. You have terrific friends, Xander. Seems like they're your friends, too. Jenny won't take no. Why say no? She shrugged, looked back to the sunset. Going to gold now, she thought. Soft, shimmering gold. General rule. You make it hard not to ask questions. I appreciate that you don't. I really have to go. He ran a hand down her arm, but stepped back. Didn't kiss her, Naomi realized, because she expected it. He had game, too. But he walked around, opened the door for her. Do you like eggplant parm? I do. Come to my place Wednesday for dinner. We'll have eggplant parm. Her eyebrows shot up. You're going to make eggplant parmesan? Hell no. I'll get takeout from Ronaldo's. They make good eggplant parm. Two social outings inside one week? I don't know if I can handle it. Try. Bring the dog. She blew out of breath as Tag shoved his face out her door and pushed his muzzle into Xander's big calloused hand. Just dinner. I can take no. You're going to have to. What time? About seven works best. I'm over the garage. You come around back and take the stairs up. All right. Wednesday. Probably. Still letting the dog nuzzle his hand, Xander grinned. You like keeping the door cracked open. Always. Good night. Why was that, he wondered, when she drove away. What was it she needed to be ready to run from? Yeah, she made it hard not to ask questions. Twelve. Creatively, her week sucked. She had to move her workstation from the bedroom into one of the guest rooms. At least she could try it out as her potential studio, as they wanted to demo her bathroom. And since they were doing that... Kevin opted to have them demo all but one of the other baths on the bedroom floor. The noise, even with earbuds in and music blaring, was horrendous. She considered moving downstairs, but the painters held court in the living room with the library next on the slate. She'd end up playing musical workstations, so she tried her best to stick it out. By midweek, she gave up and drove into the National Forest with the intent of hiking with camera and dog. Fresh air, a dry, sunny day, and lovely green-tinged light whipped annoyance away. She wished she'd brought her laptop, as she'd have found a handy stump, sat right down, and done her updates in the serenity of the forest. She walked, the leash fixed to her belt, as Tag tolerated it now, through a stand of trees that looked as if they'd stood since time began, towering columns with branches lifted to catch the sea of wind and send dapples and rays of filtered sun to the forest floor. Wildflowers danced there through fans of young ferns, around moss-carpeted rocks, snow-white trillium like fairy brides, and calypso orchids their colorful slippers. She thought about taking a few days, camping out. How would the dog deal with that, now that she had a dog to consider? Two or three days, on her own again, away from the noise she'd brought on herself? Maybe. No question Tag enjoyed the forest, puffing himself up by threatening squirrels or prancing along beside her. He even sat patiently enough when she paused to take pictures, no matter how long she took. It could be fun, just you and me, and all this. As they meandered, she began to think getting a dog, or being got by one, had been a fine idea after all. A couple of hikers came her way, leading a handsome little beagle, before she could give them the fellow hiker nod of greeting, Tag let out a yip of terror 
and literally leaped into her arms and knocked her flat. The hikers, a couple of guys up from Portland for a few days, rushed to her aid, but the friendly and harmless beagle only had Tag squirming on top of her as if he could worm his way straight through and under her where it would be safe. Since her camera was cushioned between her body and the dogs, no damage done, but she'd seen stars and felt their sharp little points in her ass. You're a disgrace, she told the dog as she walked stiffly back to the car. Definitely no camping for you. A teacup poodle might come along and try to rip you to pieces. Tag crawled into the back, hung his head, and said nothing. Since her butt ached, she tried the seat warmer on low and found that it soothed her considerably on the drive back. And with relief, she saw only Kevin's truck in front of the house. He walked out as she gingerly eased out of the car. Hey, I just left you a note. We made some good progress today. How was the hike? She watched Tag rush over to greet Molly like a long-lost friend. He's fine with her. Sure. If there's a cat or a palm or a Pekingese or whatever in the vet, he shakes like he's walking into the seventh circle of hell. He runs at squirrels or barks at them, but we ran into a couple of guys with a damn beagle on the trail, and he freaked, jumped on me, knocked me flat. You okay? Automatically, she rubbed her sore ass. It rang my bell, I'll tell you that, and he's all but clawing me open to climb inside, away from the terrifying beagle who licked at my limp hand in sympathy. To her shock, Kevin stepped straight up and started running his hands over her head. You've got a little bump. I can run you into the ER. It's just bumps and bruises, and extreme pissed off. He cupped her chin, looked hard into her eyes, and did something she thought no one could at that moment. He made her smile. Bumps and bruises only, Dr. Banner. Headache? No, ass ache. Ice bag, warm bath, a couple of Motrin. That'll be $200. Put it on my account, because that's exactly what I'm going to do. A good dinner you don't have to cook over at Xander should polish it off. I, it's Wednesday. All day, half the night. You take it easy, he added, giving her a gentle poke. And I know it looks torn up in there, but it's good progress. Tell Xander I'll see him tomorrow at Lou's. Right. Fuck, fuck, fuck. She started in as Kevin got into his truck, she had a perfect excuse. Reason, she corrected, to cancel dinner at Xander's. Sore, cranky, out of sorts. All for good reason, she thought, and headed straight back for that ice pack. Then she turned straight around and walked back to stand and stare at the living room. The painting wasn't finished, as the ladders and drop cloths attested, and she could see where a touch-up was needed. But all, oh, it was going to be just lovely. She'd gone back and forth, around and around on color, and had worried the soft taupe would come off as dull and boring. It didn't. Settled, she thought. For some reason, the tone said, settled, to her. I keep thinking I've made a mistake with this place. Sighing, she laid her hand on Tag's head as he leaned against her leg. Then I see the next step or stage, and I know I haven't. She looked down, smiled then narrowed her eyes. I'm mad at you, she reminded them both, and went back for the ice bag. She argued with herself as she soaked her aching butt in the ugly baby blue tub in the single bathroom left to her upstairs. She could call off dinner without a qualm. She'd had an incident. But calling it off tonight really equaled postponing. Better to do it. Get it done. And work on a way to shift whatever this was with Xander into the kind of friendship she had with Kevin the kind where being touched made her smile instead of tense. And that, she admitted, would never happen. Too much heat. She got out of the tub, pleased the ache had lessened, and displeased to see she had a palm-sized bruise on her posterior. She opted for leggings, softer on the ass, and a pale gray hooded sweater. She considered skipping makeup altogether, but deemed it too obvious, so she kept a very light hand with it. At quarter to seven, she started out, though she felt Tag didn't deserve a second outing. Then she walked back in and grabbed a ball of wine. It wasn't a strawberry tort, but she'd been raised too well to go empty-handed. She made the drive easily, then let the dog out, but gave him the cold shoulder. As instructed, she took the steps up and wrapped a knuckle on the door. Yeah, it's open. Come on in. 
Naomi pushed the door open to see Xander in the jut that formed a kitchen, opening a ball of wine. Jeans, a chambray work shirt with the sleeves rolled up to the elbow, at least a day's worth of scruff on that toughly handsome face. She'd break down, she thought, and ask him to pose for her. I could have been a trained assassin with her vicious hellhound. A locked door wouldn't stop a trained assassin or her vicious hellhound. He had a point. Tag strolled right in and wagged his way over to Xander, and Naomi stared, with wonder and delight, at the living room wall of books. Wow, the rumors of Book Lover are true. That's quite a collection. Part of it. Part. You're a serious man, Xander. About books, anyway. She glanced around. Very efficient space, and that is one of the best uses of a wall I've ever seen. Color, texture, dimension. Not to mention words. He walked over, offered her a glass of wine, took the bottle from her. Yeah, words. I like to read as much as the next guy, unless you're the next guy. That's the plan. She laughed, waving him off as she walked up and down the wall. But this is art. You're smart enough to know your furniture is absolute crap. You don't care about that. You've arranged your space for efficiency and highlighted a passion. And by highlighting it, created art. I want pictures of this. Sure, go ahead. I don't care. Not now. Not with my phone. I mean, serious pictures. I want to come back with my camera. And with Big Daddy Hasselblad. Whose daddy is he? She laughed, but continued to study the wall of books. Film camera, medium format. I could do a nice panorama, too, and... Bring your camera when you want. But why don't we sit outside and have this wine? You're having wine? It's not so bad now and again. You smell great. He cupped her chin, but not like Kevin had, and took her mouth. No, she thought. No, not like Kevin. Not in the least. Bath salts. It was medicinal. Yeah, I heard. Small dog fear. What? He took her hand, tugged her into the bedroom, felt her resist. I've got a deck through the door in here. And more books, she noted. A big screen TV crap furniture, and more books. He opened the door to the small square of deck with a half-rusted table and a couple of folding chairs. I can get you a pillow to sit on. You talk to Kevin. I was supposed to keep an eye on you, which I'd planned to do anyway. I'm fine, she sat, carefully. Mostly. But to the issue, there's no such thing as small dog fear. Microcinephobia. On a laugh, she sampled the wine. You're making that up. Cynophobia's fear of dogs. Add the micro. You can look it up. Though she had her doubts, considering his collection of books, she didn't argue the term. Why would he, and he's 85 pounds now, a lot of it muscle, I can attest, have microcynophobia? Can't say. Maybe he was traumatized at an early age by a chihuahua. He reached behind her head, gently tested. Ow. That's what I said once I got my breath back. My ass hit harder than my head. Want me to check it out for you? I've taken care of that, thanks. She studied his view. You can sit here and watch the ball game. And do, if I'm too lazy to walk over. Little League? T-ball, Little League, Pony League, and some sponsored adult leagues. Keaton's sponsored the Whales, currently battling their way out of the basement. Do you play? Not much anymore. Not a lot of time for it. You? No, I never did. What kind of feminist are you? The non-sport playing type. My brother played for a while, but basketball was his deal. Is that right? He played for Harvard. Huh. Crimson. What position? Point guard. I noticed you have a black top court and hoop out back. Shooting hoops clears the brain. Used to play back in high school. Mostly pickup games now. What position? Same as your brother. We'll have to go one-on-one -on -one if he ever gets out here. He will. She'd have her family here, she thought, including her grandparents, so they could see what they'd helped her have. Maybe by the fall, she'd have her family out. Are you any good? Because I can attest, he is. I hold my own. She suspected he did, in many ways. And he was right about the sunlight through the trees as it dropped toward the horizon. It seems like a good spot for a garage. Quick and easy access to the road, close to town, 
and a quick zip to 101? Is that why you picked it? The place was here already. It used to be Hobart's. He was looking to sell, getting up in age, and his wife took sick. We came to an agreement, and they moved to Walla Walla. Their daughter lives there. Was it having your own business or mechanics? It was both. Is. I like cars. If I wanted a car, and I did, I had to learn how to keep it running. I liked learning how to keep things running. I didn't mind working for Hobart. He was fair. But I like working for myself better. You must feel the same. True enough, she thought but she preferred being by herself as much as working for herself. Still. I worked as a photographer's assistant for about 14 months after college. I thought of it like an apprenticeship. He was not fair, by any measure. Arrogant, downright mean, demanding, and prone to toddler-scale tantrums. He was, and is, also brilliant. Sometimes the brilliant think they're entitled to tantrums. Unfortunately true, but I was raised by a chef, a brilliant one, and brains and talent weren't considered excuses for arrogance, for pettiness, but gifts. No throwing spatulas or frying pans. The idea made her smile. Not in Harry's kitchen, home or restaurant. In any case, I'd planned on two years with Julian, the photographer, but 14 months was all I could take. One of the happiest days of my life was punching him in the face and walking off the shoot. He glanced at her hand, slender fine-boned. That's an interesting way to give your two weeks' notice. Two weeks' notice, my ass. She shifted toward him. He wondered if she knew she rubbed her foot on Tag's back, keeping the dog in quiet bliss. Major shoot. Advertising. Shampoo. Shampoo is a major shoot? Let me tell you, friend, there's big money in ad photography. The model has a yard of glorious flame-red hair. She's a joy to shoot. This guy, he's a perfectionist, and I've got no problem with that. He's also a vicious little dick. I'm used to the verbal abuse at this point. The blame casting, the castigating, even the throwing of objects. All of which were present during this particular shoot. He actually had the makeup artist in tears at one point. Then he claimed I handed him the camera with the wrong lens. I'd had enough, and pointed out I'd given him what he'd asked for. He slapped me. Amusement faded. He hit you? slapped me like a little girl. So I punched him, just the way Seth, my uncle, taught me. Nothing in my life had ever felt that good. I think I actually said that while he's screaming, again like a little girl, and the other assistants are scrambling around. The model walked over, gave me a high five. He's holding his bloody nose. Did you break it? If you're actually going to punch somebody in the face, it's stupid to pull it. That's my philosophy. I broke his nose and he's screaming about having me arrested for assault. I told him to call the cops, go right ahead, because I had a studio full of witnesses who'd seen him assault me first. When I walked out, I promised myself I'd never work for a vicious little dick again. Another excellent philosophy. Had he thought her interesting? No, not interesting, he corrected. Fascinating. So you broke a guy's nose, then started your own business? Sort of. Seth and Harry were friends with the owner of a gallery in Soho, and they convinced him to take a couple of my pieces. They'd have supported me, in every way, while I tried to make a living in art photography. But I knew I could hold my own doing stock photography, getting some work doing book covers, album covers, food shoots, I already did them for the restaurant, and clip art. It can be fun and creative, and it can generate income. I needed to get beyond New York, so I took the leap. Car, camera, computer. She stopped, frowned down at her wine. That was a lot. A microcosm, he countered. Pleased she'd forgotten her reserve, distrust, whatever it was, long enough to tell the story. It tells me you've got guts and spine, but I already knew that. You do album covers? I have. Nobody major, unless you've heard of rocket science. Retro funk. You surprise me. I haven't even started. The band's working on another CD. Another? We did one a couple years ago. Mostly for tourists. Or when we do a wedding, that kind of thing. How about it? You're looking for a photographer? Jenny's cousin's friend did the last one. It wasn't bad. I figure you'd do better. Maybe. Let me know when you're ready and we'll see. How long have you been playing? 
With a band or at all? Both. With these guys about four years. All together since I was around 12. Kevin and I started a band. Lilo on bass, just like now. Obviously surprised, she lowered her wine glass. Kevin? Do not ask him to play his Pearl Jam tribute. Trust me. Does he play the guitar? You can't really call it playing. That's mean, she said with a laugh. It's truth. Let's eat. He took her hand again, this time tugging her inside. We did some local gigs, school dances, parties. After high school, we lost our drummer to the Marines. Kevin did the college thing. Lilo stayed stoned. And you? He pulled the takeout from the oven, where he'd kept it warm. I hit trade school, worked here, picked up some gigs. Some with Lilo when he realized he wasn't going to get the girls and couldn't play worth crap when he was stoned. She thought of the wall of books, looked over at it again. No college for you? Hated school. Trade school, that was different. But regular school? They tell you what to learn, what to read. So I opted out, learned from Hobart, learned from trade school, took some business classes. Business classes. If you're going to have your own, you have to know how to run a business. He divided the salad from the takeout box in the fridge into two bowls, transferred the eggplant parm to plates, and added the breadsticks the pizzeria was locally famous for. This actually looks great, she sat and smiled when Xander pulled a rawhide bone out of a cupboard. Smart. It'll keep him busy. What was your first picture? You had to have a first. We had a long weekend in the Hamptons, friends of my uncle's. I'd never seen the ocean. And oh, God, it was so amazing. Just amazing. Seth let me use his little point-and-shoot cannon, and I took rolls and rolls of film. And that was that. What was the first song you learned to play? You had to have a first. It's embarrassing. I'm a believer, the monkeys, he added. Oh, sure. Really? It's catchy, but doesn't seem your style. I like the riff, you know. He diddled it out. I wanted to figure out how to play it. Kevin's mom used to play old records all the time, and that one kept circling around. His dad had an old acoustic guitar, and I worked on it until I could more or less play it. Saved up, bought a second-hand Gibson. The one in the bedroom? Yeah, I keep it handy. I figured out by the time I was 15 that if you had a guitar and could even pretend to play it, you got the girls. How's the parm? You were right. It's really good. So you got the girls, being as you can more than pretend to play, but none of them stuck? Jenny might have. Jenny? She set down her fork. Jenny, Jenny? Jenny Walker, back then. And I saw her first. New girl in school, just moved up from Olympia, and pretty as a butterscotch Sunday. I asked her out before Kevin. Kissed her first, too. Is that so? It's Keaton Banner history. I was about half in love with her, but he was all the way in love with her. And there's bros before hoes. Grinning, he picked up a breadstick. You said it, I didn't. I ended up playing Cyrano to his Christian. Finally got his guts up to ask her out. And that, as we've said, is that. I'm still half in love with her. Me too, and the package along with it. They're like central casting called for a great-looking all-American family, dog included. If you're waiting for another Jenny, you're going to be out of luck. I'm pretty sure she's one of a kind. I've got my eye on a tall, complicated blonde. She knew it. Wished hearing it didn't set off those flutters low in the belly. It's not smart to aim for the complicated. Simples usually surface anyway, and wears off. Then the complications are annoying instead of interesting. You've got my interest, Naomi. I'm aware. She watched him as she ate. Nine times out of ten, I'd rather be alone than with anyone. You're here now. I'm 29, and I've managed to evade, avoid, and slip around any sort of serious relationship. Me too, except I've got three years on you. Since I left New York six years ago, I haven't stayed in any one place over three months. You've got me there. I've lived here all my life. But I have to repeat myself. You're here now. And right now, this feels like my place. Things start up with you, screw up with you. It affects that. 
I don't know how you manage life with that sunny, optimistic nature of yours. She smiled. It's a burden. Knowing the risk, he pushed a bit deeper. Ordinarily, I'd assume you had some crappy relationship or marriage behind you. That's not it. You've got a solid family under you, and that's foundation. She nudged her plate away. Think of it as internal wiring. No, I'm good with wiring. You've got enough self-confidence and sense of self-worth to punch an asshole, to head off on your own to go after what you wanted. You're complicated, Naomi, and that's interesting, but you're not wired wrong. She rose, took both their plates to the counter. There was a boy who loved me, or thought he did the way you can at 20. I slept with him, and studied with him, worked with him. When he told me he loved me, asked me to live with him, I broke it off, right then and there. It was hard for us both to get through the rest of college. Easier for me, no doubt, because I didn't have those feelings for him, so I could just walk away. But you remember him. I hurt him. I didn't have to. Maybe, Xander thought, but he doubted anybody got through the labyrinth of life without hurting someone, whether or not they had to. I guess you're counting on me falling in love with you and asking you to live with me? I'm pointing out the problems with relationships when they go south and people live and work in close proximity. Maybe you'll fall in love with me. Ask me to live with you in that big house on the bluff. I don't fall in love, and I like living alone. Sandra glanced at Tag and decided not to point out that she'd fallen for the mutt and lived with him. Then I know that going in. Unlike the college boy, I'll get those. I know how it works. Want some more wine? She turned away from the sink. Better not. Water's better since I have to drive. It's a nice night. Once I clean this up, we can take a walk, work off dinner, let the dog stretch his legs. He could probably use it. She took the water he offered, wandered back toward the wall of books. I really do want to take some shots here. Is there any time that works for you? Why don't you come over Friday? Any time. The door is open if I'm working down below. But if you came later in the day, you could go over to Lou's after. We could grab some dinner before we play. You're playing Friday? Nine to midnight. Ish. Kevin and Jenny can probably come, if you want. Not really a date so much as a get-together, with food and music. And she did like the music. More, she wanted to get back in here with her camera and... Everything went blank and cold as her gaze latched onto a single spine in the wall of books. Blood in the Ground, The Legacy of Thomas David Bowes by Simon Vance. They'd changed the title for the movie, the title and focus, as they'd wanted the drama focused on the young girl who'd discovered her father, who'd saved a woman's life, who'd stopped a murderer. After her mother's death, once she'd believed she could face it, Naomi read interviews by the director, the screenwriter, so she knew why they'd turn the book into Daughter of Evil. But this was where it had started. This held all the horror and the cold-blooded years of one man's murderous secrets. Naomi? Xander tossed the dishcloth aside and started for her. What's wrong? What? She turned, too sharply, and she'd gone pale so her eyes burned dark. Nothing. Nothing. I... A little headache. I probably shouldn't have had the wine after wrapping my head. She sidestepped, talking too fast. This was really great, Xander, but I should go pop a couple more Motrin, make it an early night. Before she could get to the door, he took her arm, felt it quivering. You're shaking. Just the headache. I really need to go. Afraid the shaking would turn into a panic attack, she laid a hand over his. Please, I'll come back Friday if I can. Thanks for everything. She bolted, barely waiting for the dog to catch up. Xander turned back, eyes narrowed on the books. Was he crazy, he wondered, or had something there put the fear of God into her? He walked over, scanned the titles, then adjusted, estimating where she'd been looking, her position, her height. Baffled, he shook his head. Just books, he thought, words and worlds on pages. He pulled one out at random, put it back, tried another. She'd been looking right about here when he'd glanced back, when he'd seen her freeze, as if he'd pointed a gun at her head. 
He frowned, drew out the nonfiction book. Serial killer, he remembered. Back east. It had fascinated him as a teen when it buzzed all over the news, so he'd bought the book when it came out. West Virginia, he remembered, looking at the grainy photo of the killer in the cover art. Couldn't have been this. She came from New York. He started to slide it back in, and then, as he often did with a book in his hand, opened it to skim the flyleaf. Yeah, West Virginia, some little podunk town. Thomas David Bowes, cable guy, family man, wife and two kids, deacon in his church. How many did he kill again? Curious enough, Xander kept skimming. Hot August night, summer storm, country dark, blah, blah. Eleven-year-old daughter finds his murder room and... Naomi Bowes. Naomi. He stared at the book, once again saw her pale, stricken face in his head. Son of a bitch. Thirteen. After considerable internal debate, Naomi pushed herself out of the house on Friday night. A compromise of sorts, she thought, as she couldn't and wouldn't push herself to go back to Xander's. Not yet. Tag wasn't thrilled with the idea of her going out at all, though she left him with his stuffed cat, a rawhide bone, and the promise that she'd be back. She couldn't take the dog into a bar. She'd nearly used him as an excuse, at least to herself, but going out was normal. And normal, after the disaster ending Wednesday night, was her current goal. One drink, she told herself. One drink, one set, easy Friday night conversation with Jenny and Kevin. And if Xander came over during the break, easy conversation with him. Normal. Maybe the thought of reaching for normal exhausted her, but she'd give it a solid attempt. Conversation posed no issue with Jenny, so she'd just let Jenny take the lead, ride that wave until it was time to go. Keeping it all light had to help throttle things back with Xander. She'd chosen the house, or it had chosen her, the small town, which meant that avoiding Xander struck the wrong note. So throttle it back to casual friendship. That was the answer. How could she have forgotten, allowed herself to forget, what she'd come from, and how easily normal could come crashing down? A book on a shelf, she thought now. It only took that to remind her. As before, she timed it so the band already rocked the small stage. She made her way to Jenny and Kevin, cozied up at the same table. Jenny immediately grabbed her hand. Great timing! Sitter was late, so we just got here. And they're hot tonight. Kevin's going to get us drinks. Then he's going to dance with me. My round, Naomi insisted. Sam Adams, red wine? You got it. Thanks. Come on, Kevin. Why don't we just... But Jenny dragged him to the dance floor while Naomi worked her way back to the bar. She felt Xander's eyes on her, the responsive flutter in her belly. She needed to acknowledge him, and she would. She would. She outlined it as she maneuvered. Get to the bar, order, then lean back on the bar, send Xander a smile. Two bartenders worked nonstop, so she figured she'd have a wait. But the hot brunette, sassy swing with, yes, that looked like magenta streaked through the brown, glanced her way. She had a face so sharp, cheekbones so keen, she might have been carved with a scalpel. Leggy blonde, short hair, long bangs, a boot in the ball's face. You're the photographer. I, uh, yes. The woman sized her up with more gray than blue in the dim light. All right, she said with a slow nod. You're with Jenny and Kev? Yes. Sam Adams' glass of Merlot. And what are you drinking? The Merlot's fine. It's not bad. The woman wore big silver hoop earrings, joined in the left lobe by a trio of red studs that matched her snug, low-necked T-shirt. I used to be married to the guy who pretended to take care of the lawn and yard work up at the old Parkinson place. Oh. Pretended? Turned out he was smoking more grass than he mowed. I ended up firing him as a husband before they fired him as a groundskeeper. Can't say he wasn't a good-natured sort. Do you want to run a tab? Uh, no, thanks. Naomi paid cash, digging bills out of the wallet in her pocket. I can have that brought out to you, the woman said. 
I've got it. Competently, Naomi used one hand to cup the two wine glasses, the other to lift the lager. You've done some waitressing. Yeah, I have. Thank you. They'd slowed it down with the stones and wild horses. As she worked her way back, she saw Kevin and Jenny, still on the dance floor, wrapped around each other and swaying. The sweetness of it struck her straight in the heart. Love could last, she thought. She'd seen it with Seth and Harry. For some, love could last. She set the drinks down, sat, and, since the bartender had distracted her from her outline, picked up her wine and looked toward the stage with a smile ready. Xander's gaze locked on hers. He sang as though he meant it, as if wild horses couldn't take him away. Talent. Showmanship, she told herself. And she wasn't looking for love, for promises, for devotion. Still, where Jenny and Kevin had struck her heart, he gripped it, just hard enough to make it ache. She wanted it to stop, just stop. Wanted to empty herself of what he made her feel, made her need. He'd been a mistake, she knew it. Had been a mistake since he'd hunkered down to change her tire on the dark side of the road. She made herself look away, told herself to watch the dancers. Her gaze brushed over the woman who'd whispered something in Xander's ear the last time she'd been here. Right now, the woman looked back at her with something between a sulk and dislike. Great, now she had the attention of some jealous groupie. She should have stayed home with a dog. The ache stayed lodged in her when they kicked it back up, and Kevin pulled Jenny back to the table. Two dances in a row. Bright-eyed, Jenny pumped fists in the air. That's the record. You don't like to dance, Kevin? Did you see me out there? She laughed and spoke absolute truth. I thought you looked adorable. He'd known the minute she'd come in. Not because he'd seen her, Xander thought, as he let Lilo take the lead, but because there had been a change in the air, the way there was before a storm. She had that inside her, that storm. He knew why now, but the why wasn't the whole story. He wanted the whole of it, as much as he wanted her. Should he tell her he knew? He'd asked himself that question a dozen times and more, since he'd picked that book off the shelf. Would telling her help her relax, or send her running? She remained too much of a mystery to be sure. If she trusted him... But she didn't. She didn't want to be here. She covered it well. He imagined she was used to covering but even in this light, he could see that the smile didn't reach her eyes and stay there. But she'd come, maybe to prove a point to herself, to him, to both. If he left her alone, just backed away. He suspected she'd be fine with it, and that was likely something else she was good at, making wherever she was, whatever she did, fine for the moment. She'd be used to that, and he was damn set on giving her something she wasn't used to. The hell with fine. They moved on to Clapton, and Xander ordered himself to concentrate, even as he watched Naomi and Jenny get up and join the others on the dance floor. She couldn't remember the last time she'd danced, but since Jenny had pleaded, Naomi thought dancing might help burn off some of the heat, the tension. It felt good to move, to let herself go with the music, let her hips clock the beat. She didn't think anything of it when someone bumped her hard from behind. It was all part of it. When it happened a second time, she glanced around. Am I on your way? Naomi asked the sulky blonde. You're damn right. She gave Naomi a pissy little shove. And you'd better get out of it. Cut it out, Marla, Jenny warned. You've had too much to drink. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the bitch in my way. You can't just come around here and try to take what's mine. I don't have anything of yours. Several of the dancers had stopped or slowed, eased back to stare. The attention had spiders crawling over Naomi's skin. To avoid any more, she held up her hands. But if you want the floor, it's yours. She started to back off, and the woman shoved her again, slapped out at the friend who said her name, grabbed at her arm. You'll be on the floor if you don't stay away from Xander. Eyes gleaming from too much fear, too much frustration, she shoved. Avoiding attention sidestepping confrontation. Those were hard-learned habits. But defending herself, standing up, those were ingrained. 
You don't want to touch me again. What are you going to do about it? Smirking, drunk sure of her ground, Marlo planted a hand on Naomi's chest and started to push. Naomi grabbed her wrist, twisted, and had Marla squealing as she dropped to her knees. Don't touch me again, Naomi repeated, then released her and walked away. Naomi, Naomi, wait, Jenny caught up with her. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. She's drunk and stupid. It's all right. It wasn't. It wasn't all right. She heard the buzzing, felt eyes following her, and she saw Kevin making his way through the crowd toward them, annoyance and concern clear on his face. I'm just going to go. Why ask for trouble? Oh, honey, let's just go outside, take a walk. You shouldn't... I'm fine. She gave Jenny's hand a squeeze. She's drunk enough to try something again, and I need to get home to the dog anyway. I'll see you later. She didn't run. She wanted to, but running made it too important. But by the time she got out to her car, she felt as if she'd run a mile in a sprint, and the shaking wanted to start, so she just braced herself against the door until she could gather herself to drive. She straightened quickly and dragged out her keys when she heard someone coming. Xander just closed a hand over hers before she could hit the lock release. Wait. I need to go. You need to wait until you stop shaking so you can drive without running off the road. He let go of her hand to put both of his on her shoulders, turned her around. Do you want an apology? You didn't do anything. No, I didn't. Unless you want to count that I had sex with Marla twice, when I was 17. That's about 14 years ago, so it shouldn't apply here. But I'm sorry she upset you and made a fool of herself. She's drunk. You know, like brilliance, I never find that a decent excuse for being an asshole. She let out a short laugh. Me either, but it's a fact she's drunk, and she's fixed on you, Xander. I haven't given her a reason to be in 14 years. Hints of frustration leaked out, but he kept his gaze calm and on hers. Plus, for nearly seven of those, she's been with or married to someone I consider a friend. I'm not interested. Maybe you should tell her that. He had, more times than he cared to remember, but given the current circumstances, he accepted that he'd have to do it again, and hurt someone he had a fondness for. No, you didn't get through life's labyrinth without it. I don't like scenes, she added. Well, they happen. You play in enough bars, at enough weddings, you see every kind of scene there is. More or less get used to it. You handled it, and that's all you can do. She nodded, hit the lock release. He turned her around again, pressed her back against the door. Not fair, not right, she thought, for him to take her over this way when her feelings were so raw, so unsettled. Not gentle, not soothing, but a struck match to dry timber, and his mouth, just his mouth taking hers, set it all raging. He took her face in his hands, not gentle there either, as if temper bubbled just under the surface. You walked in, and the air changed. I wasn't going to tell you that. It gives you an advantage, and you're enough of a challenge. I'm not trying to be a challenge. It's one of the things that makes you one. I want you. I want you under me and over me and around me. And you want. I'm a good reader, and I read that from you clear enough. I'm coming by your place when we wrap tonight. I don't. He took her mouth again. Just took it. If there's a light on, he continued, I'll knock. If there's not, I'll turn around and go home. You've got a couple hours to figure out what you'd rather. Text Jenny when you get home. She's worried about you. He opened the door for her, held it open as she yanked at the seatbelt. Leave the light on, Naomi, he said, and closed the door. She'd left a light on for herself and turned it off, very deliberately, while the dog danced around her in desperate, delirious welcome. Just you and me. Determined not to dwell on the disaster of the evening, and wasn't she racking them up, she went back to the kitchen. She'd make tea, take something for the stress headache banging in her skull, and let the dog out for a last round, she reminded herself, before she locked up and went to bed. Sleep's the great escape, she told Tag, who clung to her every word, every move. Since he wanted her close, 
and she wanted the air, she went out the back with him, sat watching the moon over the water, drinking soothing tea while he wandered. She didn't want scenes, she thought. She didn't want complications. This was what she wanted, this right here, the quiet, the piece of moonlight over the water. It calmed her, settled the jumps the altercation with a drunk, jealous woman had wound up inside her. She'd just stay away from Luz, from Xander, from everyone else for a while. Plenty of work to do, and she could take that trip to Seattle, maybe take two or three days there. Tack came back, sat beside her. If she could find a motel that took dogs, she realized, and laid a hand on his head. She hadn't thought she'd wanted him either, she remembered. And now? Now she needed a motel that took dogs if she took a trip. Why don't I mind that? I should mind that. They sat, companionably, for more than an hour. He rose when she did, walked in when she did, followed her as she checked locks. He walked upstairs with her, darted to his bed to get his stuffed cat, and though he settled down with it, he watched her while she checked her email, her accounts. As she worked, she'd glance back, see the dog continuing to watch her. Did he sense her restlessness, she wondered? She got up to put on the fire, hoping that would settle them both. When it didn't, he walked back down with her, waiting, while she turned on the light again. This is a mistake. A terrible, stupid, short-sighted mistake. Still time to change your mind, she thought. But she wouldn't. No, she wouldn't change her mind. So she walked into the kitchen again, this time pouring herself a glass of wine, and went back outside with the dog again, to wait for Xander to knock. He caught the tiny glimmer of light up ahead, and everything inside him unknotted. He told himself he'd accept the dark. The choice would always be hers, but that glimmer lit inside him like a torch. She'd left the light on, just one, but one would do. He parked his bike beside her car, swung off with a guitar case still strapped to his back. He wouldn't leave it out in the air overnight, and he fully intended to stay. He'd heard the dog bark, approved that. Nothing like a dog for an early warning system, and his knock brought out another trio of woofs. When she opened the door, Tag rushed out to wag and lean and wag some more. But Xander kept his eyes on Naomi, with the dark house behind her. I'm coming in. Yeah, she stepped back. You're coming in. When he did, she closed the door behind him, checked the lock. I worked out some things to say if the light was on. Would you have gone home if it wasn't? I can want. You can want. But unless you open the door, I stay out. Until, he corrected. Until you open it. She believed that. Realized she could trust that. He might overwhelm, but he'd never force. Confidence? Or patience? It can be both. I'd go to the wall telling myself I'm not impulsive. But I have this house, this dog, and I left the light on when I swore I wouldn't. You're not impulsive. He unstrapped the guitar case, set it against the wall by the door. You just know how to make a decision. Maybe. All right. I've made a decision. This is just sex. He didn't smile, just kept his gaze, patience, confidence, locked on hers. No, it's not. You know that, too. But I'm more than happy to start with that. Tell me what you want. Tonight, I want you. And if that doesn't... She broke off when he gave her a yank so her body met his. I'm going to give you what you want. She let herself take. If this was a mistake... She'd regret it later. Now, she'd take. She'd consume. She'd let herself gorge on what was offered. Needy, she dragged at his jacket, fighting it off as the smell of leather surrounded her. As it fell to the floor, he backed her toward the steps, pulled her sweater over her head so fast and smooth it might have been air. Tag's tail batted against her legs. He thinks it's a game, she managed. He'll get used to it. Sander pressed her back against the wall on the stairs, turned her blood to lava, molten. This is mine, he said to the dog. Settle down. 
Reaching back, Xander flicked open her bra, flicked the straps off her shoulders. You really need to be naked. Halfway there. Hands, big and rough, took her breasts, calloused thumbs running over her nipples, stealing her breath while his mouth enslaved her. He wanted her just like that, desperate, quivering against the wall. Too quick. Done too quick, he warned himself, and pulled her up the rest of the stairs. The world spun, bursts of light through the dark, heat lightning. Shocked sounds she barely realized came from her. She tore at his shirt. Where was flesh? She needed his flesh. And when she found it, she all but sank her teeth in. They fell on the bed with streams of moonlight slanting like bars, with the unearthly whisper of wind over the water. He smelled of leather and sweat, and of the wind over the water. He felt of hard muscle, roughened hands, and bore her down with his weight. The panic wanted to come, but couldn't carve its way through the needs. Desperate to meet those needs, she found his belt, fought the buckle, and his mouth, rough as his hands, closed over her breast. She arched up, shocked by the bolt of pleasure, the sheer strength of it. Before she could draw the next breath, his hand pressed between her legs. When she came, it was like falling into a hot pool. She couldn't surface, couldn't reach the cool in the air. He only took her deeper, yanking her jeans down her hips, using his hands on her. Hot and wet, slick and smooth. Everything about her drove him mad. Her nails bit into him as she bowed up. In the dark, her eyes were blind and dazed. Her heart, his heart, hammer blows as he fought to free himself. He couldn't have stopped if the world ended. When at last he thrust into her, he thought it had. For an instant, it stopped. Sound, breath, movement. Then it all rushed back, a tidal wave that battered and swept and pounded beyond reason. He lost himself in it, in her, gave himself to it, to her. When it broke in him, she broke with him. She lay limp, still, with her heart still raging. Her body felt bruised and used, and so utterly relaxed. Since no coherent thought would form, she let the attempt go. If she just stayed like this, eyes closed, she wouldn't have to think of what to do next. Then he moved, rolling off her. She felt the bed dip with his weight. She sensed movement, more shifting. Bag off, pal, he muttered. What are you doing? Getting my boots off. Nobody looks good with his pants around his ankles and his boots on. The dog has your bra if you want it. What? She blinked her eyes open. In those slants of moonlight, she could see Xander sitting on the side of the bed, see the dog standing there, tail wagging, something hanging out of his mouth. That's my bra? Yeah, you want it back. Yes, I want it back. Now she rolled over, reached, tagged at his down-in-front, tail-up move, wagged. He thinks you want to play. To settle it, Xander rose, tall, built, naked and plucked the stuffed cat out of the dog bed. Trade you. Tag dropped the bra. Xander picked it up, tossed it on the bed. Is that a naked mermaid? Naomi glanced at the floor lamp. Yes, it doesn't go in here. Why not? And he did what any man would, and stroked a hand over a bronze breast. It's going in the room I'm doing for my uncles. They'll love it. All so casual, Naomi thought. That was good. No intense pillow talk. Then he turned, looked at her. Ridiculous to feel exposed now, she thought, after what they'd just done to each other. But she had to suppress the urge to cover herself. We'll call that the Fast and the Furious. The what? I take it you've missed some movies. He walked back over, obviously not bothered by being naked, and sat on the bed. Still. It would have been faster and more furious without the dog. Being focused on the goal, I'd have banged you against the stairs, but he'd have been all over us. You do that. You tend to miss the finer details. Like how you look, right now, in blue moonlight. I'm not complaining. Glad to hear it. He skimmed a finger over the little tattoo riding low on her left hip. 
like your tat. Lotus blossom, right? Yeah. A symbol of hope, he thought. Endurance. As it was beauty that grew out of mud. What kind of rocker are you? She asked. No tats. I haven't found anything I want that permanent. He cupped the back of her head, leaned in to kiss her. Softly. A surprise. We're going to slow things down some this time. We are? He smiled, eased her back. Definitely. I don't want to miss those fine details this time around. Later, Naomi could attest he hadn't missed a single one. Fourteen. Xander woke with a dog staring at him from the side of the bed, nearly nose to nose. His cloudy brain registered Milo. Before he remembered, his longtime companion was gone. Still, he handled the interruption of sleep in the same way he had with Milo. Go away, he muttered. Instead of hanging his head, a la Milo, and sulking off to lie down again, Tag wagged his tail and pushed his cold, wet nose into Xander's face. Crap. To make his point, Xander nudged the cold, wet nose away, which Tag took as encouragement. The wet, soggy tennis ball plopped on the bed an inch from Xander's face. Even the sleep-clouded brain knew better. If he knocked the ball on the floor, the dog would see it as a game and start all over again. So he closed his eyes, ignored the ball, and the dog. Helpfully, Tag nosed the ball closer, so now the soggy and wet rolled against Xander's chest. Beside him, Naomi stirred, reminding Xander he had much more interesting games he could play at Oh Dark Thirty. He won't stop, Naomi murmured beside him, and sat up before Xander could make his move. And beside the bed, Tag danced in joy. It's morning ritual. It's not morning. Five in the morning, like clockwork. He's actually about ten minutes late. Where are you going? I'm getting up, which is part of the morning ritual. Getting dressed, also part of the ritual. To Xander's severe disappointment, she moved away in the dark, rummaged around. He could see her silhouette pulling on some kind of pants. You get up at five? Every morning? Yes, we do. Even weekends? This is America. Yes, even weekends, in America. The dog and I are in tune there, at least. She crossed over and opened the doors to the deck. Tag happily raced out. Go back to sleep. Why don't you come back to bed, and we can try out a new morning ritual? Tempting, but he'll be back inside of ten minutes, nagging for his breakfast. Sander considered. I can work with ten minutes. He liked her laugh, the smoky morning sound of it. Go back to sleep. I need coffee before he comes back. If he wasn't getting sex, maybe... Is the dog the only one who gets breakfast? She was still just a shadow, a long, slim one, already heading for the door. Not necessarily. When she walked out, Xander lay there for a moment. Normally, he'd get another hour, maybe 70 minutes more on a Saturday. But he wouldn't get a hot breakfast. He picked up the tennis ball, judged the distance to the dog bed, tossed it. So, she was an early riser, he thought, as he got out of bed. He could handle that. She wasn't a snuggler, and that equaled bonus points in his scorebook. He didn't mind staying tangled up for a while after sex, but when it came to sleep, he wanted his space. Apparently, so did she. Not only amazing in bed, but didn't expect him to cuddle her like a teddy bear for hours after. Big bonus points. And she cooked. He found his pants, tugged them up, and when he couldn't find his T-shirt, he turned on the mermaid light. It made him grin. A woman who'd buy a naked mermaid lamp. More points. The room smelled like her, he realized. How did she do that? And she smelled of summer, of storms, and the sultry. He found his T-shirt, pulled it over his head. She still kept some of her clothes in packing boxes. Curious, he crossed over, glanced into them organized, and he appreciated at least a sense of organization. Not a lot to organize in there, to his eye. He studied the opening of what would be a walk-in closet, currently under construction and empty of wardrobe. Jesus, he had more clothes than she did. It struck him as both weird and fascinating. 
He also spotted a boxed toothbrush in what he'd term her bathroom box and figured everyone would be happier if he took it. He crossed over again to use the bathroom, and when he hit the light, found it gutted. The rough plumbing told him where things would go, and she'd have a kick-ass shower from the size of it. He could use a shower. He went out, found another gutted bathroom, found a bedroom half-painted, nice color, and a third gutted bathroom. Just as he decided he'd have to use the great outdoors like a dog, he found one outfitted with baby blue fixtures. Ugly, he decided, but serviceable. And if the fist-sized shower head over the blue tub worked, he'd make use of it later. But now, he really wanted coffee. He wandered down, seeing bits and pieces of Kevin's work. The place would be a showstopper. Not glitzy and fussy, and someone else might have looked for that. But solid and handsome with some serious respect for history, location, style. He paused at the living room. Again, the color worked, and while the gas logs made sense up in the bedroom, he was glad she'd kept the wood-burning original here. She could use some help with the yard, clearing out the overgrown, pruning back, digging up the weeds. Right now, the view from the front was just sad. He worked his way back, wondering what in the hell one person would do with all this space. Then stopped at the library door. For the first time, he felt genuine and deep, deep envy. He'd seen the early stages of the built-ins when he'd dropped by Kevin's shop a couple times, but the finished product beat it all to hell. The natural cherry would glow red gold in the light and simmer like the fire in the evenings and all the space, what he could do with all that book space. He'd get himself a big leather chair, angle it to face the fire, and view out the window. Change the chair to a couch? He could live in this room. The empty shelves and cases stabbed his book lover's heart. They needed to be filled. He took one more step toward the kitchen, and the scent of coffee reached him. She was racking up points like Fast Eddie. He found her sitting on one of the four stools that hadn't been there on his last visit, drinking coffee and looking at her tablet. Help yourself, she told him. He went for one of the big white mugs, rather than the daintier blue cups, poured coffee. Though it was cool, she'd opened those accordion doors. He could hear the dog chowing down on the deck, in the dark that was just starting to thin. I found a toothbrush in one of your boxes. I used it. That's fine. That blue bathroom? Slated for gutting, right? She looked up then just punched him in the gut with those deep, dark green eyes. You don't like the boxer bathroom? Boxer, wait, black and blue, funny. I wasn't sure what to call the pink and black one, but it's gone now, and so is its cabbage rose wallpaper border. She sipped her coffee as she studied him. He looked rough and rugged, jeans zipped but not buttoned, the slate gray t-shirt bringing out the blue of his eyes, his hair must, stubble on his narrow face feet bare. What the hell was he doing drinking coffee in her kitchen before dawn, and making her regret she hadn't taken him up on the offer to come back to bed? He watched her as steadily as she did him. She set the coffee down. So, I'm trying to decide if you get a bowl of cereal, which is my go-to if I go to breakfast, or if I really want to try out my new omelet pan. Do I get a vote? I believe I know your vote, and lucky for you, I really do want to try out the pan. You cook in it, I'll wash it. That seems fair. She rose, went to the refrigerator, began to take out various things, set them on the counter. Eggs, cheese, bacon, a green pepper, those little tomatoes. This looked serious. She chopped, sliced, tore up some leaves she got from a pot on the windowsill, whisked while he drank coffee. What makes that an omelet pan? It's shallow with sloping sides. She poured the eggs over the tomatoes and peppers she'd sautéed, crumbled bacon over that, did the cheese grating thing over that. She slanted him a look as she eased a spatula around the sides of the cooking egg mix. I wonder if I still have what it takes. From where I'm standing, you do. Maybe, maybe not. Watching him still, she tipped the pan gave it a gentle shake. I'm taking the gamble. Before his astonished eyes, she jerked the pan so the egg flew up, flipped over. 
She caught it neatly back in the pan, smiled in satisfaction. I've still got it. Impressive. Could have been a disaster. I haven't made a serious omelet in a couple of years. She used the spatula to fold it. Bread's in that drawer. Pop some in the toaster. She slid the omelet out, set it in the oven she had on warm, and did the whole thing again, including the flip. I officially love this pan. I'm pretty fond of it myself. She sprinkled a little paprika over the plated omelets, added the toast. I still don't have a table. We aren't far off sunrise. My thought, too. Take the plates and I'll bring the coffee. They sat on their glider, the hopeful dog sprawled at their feet, and ate while the stars went out and the sun began its golden burn over the water. I thought the library was the only thing I was going to envy here. But that, red, pink, and pale blue joined the gold. That's another one. It never gets usual. I've taken dozens of pictures of sunrises here, and they're all their own. If this place had been a dirt hut, I'd have bought it, just for this. And this is where you eat your cereal. Or whatever. I probably will even after I get a table. I need to look for one out here, and some chairs. You need books. That library needs books. I haven't seen any around here. I use my reader when I'm traveling. She arched an eyebrow. Do you have something against e-readers? No. Do you have something against actual books? No. I'm sending for mine. I don't have anywhere close to what you do, but I have books, and I have the room now to collect more. It made him think of the book on his wall, the one that told him things about her she didn't want anyone to know. Do you still want pictures of mine? The books? He caught the hesitation, thought it was brief and well-covered. Yeah, I would. It's a statement. What will you do with them? That depends on how they look, if they work the way I see. For the gallery, most likely. And I may do some as note cards for my website. You do note cards? It always surprises me how well they sell. People still use note cards. Plenty of book lovers out there to buy them. The wall of books, some angles on that, and a stack of them beside a lamp, maybe. One open, being read. I could use your hands for that. My hands? You have big hands, big man hands, rough and calloused. That's a good shot, she murmured already seeing it. Rough hands holding an open book. I could do, say, six shots for cards, one big arty one for the gallery. Do you have anything going tomorrow? Why? Always cautious, he thought. You could take the pictures tomorrow, and since you'd have your equipment anyway, you'd be in the mode. I should be able to get the guys together. You could take the shot for the CD. I don't know what you want there. Something that sells CDs. You're the doctor. I'd want to see what you used before. He boosted up a hip, took out his phone. He noted that he had a half a dozen texts to check, then scrolled through for the CD shot. The five men, with instruments on the stage at the bar, done in moody black and white. It's good. She says without enthusiasm. No, it's good. It's just not particularly interesting or creative. Nothing here to set you apart. What would you do? I don't know yet. Where do you practice? The garage, one of the back bays. Well, I'd start there. He wanted, seriously wanted, to see where she'd start, where she'd finish, what she'd do. Is tomorrow too soon? No, I guess not. At least I can get a sense. The black t-shirts are okay, but have everybody bring a couple other choices, and some color. I can do that. That was a hell of an omelet. I'll get things washed up. It wasn't much, and easily done, so he still had time to... Does the shower work up there? She did a little wiggle with her hand. Grudgingly. Okay with you if I grab one before I head to work? You work today? Eight to four, Monday through Saturday. 24-7 emergency towing and road service. When I have a gig, somebody covers until I'm clear. Right. Sure, you can use the shower. Great. He grabbed her, had her back against the refrigerator, plundering with that hungry mouth, those big rough hands. Let's go do that. She planned to get out early, explore on her way to Cecil's, for pictures and maybe a table. 
but his hands were under her shirt, and his thumbs. I could use a shower. Naomi blamed the sexual haze in the shower for her agreeing to have pizza with Xander after the workday. It wasn't a date, she assured herself, and decided to go wild and wear the pewter leggings instead of the black. They were having sex now, so dating was unnecessary. If she hadn't been hazed, she'd have made an excuse, or at the least suggested he pick up the pizza, come to her place. Her turf. Despite the short span of time since she'd moved in, the house was her turf. Then I'm going over there tomorrow, she told the dog. It's work, yes, but that's still three days running. She topped the leggings with a tunic in a ripe peach color she liked, then belted it so it didn't look as if she wore a bag. She grabbed what she needed, wallet, keys, and started downstairs with the dog prancing beside her. She stopped. You can't go. You have to stay here. Until that moment, she hadn't known a dog could actually look shocked. I'm sorry, but you just have to sit in the car the whole time, and that's not fair, right? Besides, you're my excuse for coming back in case he suggests, I don't know, a movie, or going to his place. You're my ace in the hole. I'm only going to be an hour or two. Top's two hours, then I'll be back. You have to stay. He trudged back upstairs. Actually trudged, she thought, while sending her forlorn looks over his shoulder. You'd think I was locking him in a closet and going out dancing, she muttered and felt guilty all the way into town. As he pulled on a fresh shirt, Xander figured he was running right on time. Hitting her up for the pizza had been inspired, especially since she'd been hot and wet and limp in the shower when he'd come up with it. He also figured it was past time they had an actual date. Pizza always served up a good starter. He'd be on call, but those calls, if any, would go to his cell phone. If luck stuck, He'd get her back to her place and into bed without being called back to tow anything or anyone. He opened the door, pulled up short. Chip stood, his big, raw-knuckled hand poised to knock. Or punch. Hey, Chip. Hey, Xander. You're heading out? Yeah, but I got a minute. Do you want to come in? That's okay. I'll walk down with you. Chip started down the steps on his slightly bowed legs. A big guy football star in high school, he tended to lumber unless he stood on the deck of a boat, as he did daily for his family business. There, Xander knew, the man had the grace of a Baryshnikov, and his shy, self-effacing nature worked well for the tourists who wanted to do some fishing or sailing. He'd mooned over Marla as long as Xander had known him, and had finally won her when she'd come back to the cove after two years of college. He'd won her by punching the guy she'd taken up with, who liked punching her. It wasn't the first or the last guy Chip had punched over Marla. Xander really didn't want to be the next guy. But he didn't sense anger, didn't see that hard light in Chip's eyes as they reached the base of the stairs. I wanted to, you know, say I was sorry about how Marla acted last night. I heard about it. It's no big. She still got that thing for you. Xander kept a close watch, in case that hard light came calling. Chip, you know there's nothing there, and hasn't been since high school. I know it. I wanted to say how I know it, so you know. Patty, she's making noises like there was something. But I know better. Plenty of other people know better, too. Okay, then. We're cool? Sure. I want to apologize to the lady. The new lady? It's Naomi, right? But she doesn't know me, so I didn't want to go up there and scare her or anything. You don't have to worry about it, Chip. You don't have to apologize to anybody. I feel bad about it. All of it. Anyway. He put those ham hock hands in his pockets, gazed out at nothing special. You don't know where she is, do you? Naomi? No, not her, not Naomi. Marla. Sorry, no. She's not at her place, the place she has now, and doesn't answer the phone. Patty said she got mad at her last night, because Patty said she was embarrassed and all. She just took off, and she'd been drinking. Was she driving? Seems Patty was, 
but it's not a far walk back to the place she has now. She didn't go to work today at the market either. They're that pissed at her now. Hungover, mortified, mad, probably in bed with the covers over her head. I'm sorry to hear that. If you see her, maybe you can give me a call, so I know she's okay and just in one of her moods. I can do that. I'll let you go. Maybe if you see the lady, Naomi. If you see her, you could tell her I'm sorry about the trouble. I'll do that. You take it easy. It's the best way to take it. Chip smiled a little, then climbed into his truck. Since it was close, and he was running a bit late now, Xander got into his own truck and drove to Ronaldo's. She was already sitting there, sitting in a booth, looking over the menu. He slid in across from her. Sorry, I got into a thing just as I was leaving. That's all right. I was trying to decide if I'd have room for this calamari starter. I'll split it with you. Then you would. Then I would. She set the menu aside. Busy place on Saturday night. Always has been. You look good. Better than I did a few hours ago. You always look good. Hi, Maxie. The waitress, young and fresh, with doe eyes and sunny blonde hair, streaked with a pretty shade of lavender, pulled out a pad. Hi, Xander. Hi, she said to Naomi. Can I get you some drinks? A glass of Chianti, thanks, and some ice water on the side. You got it. Zan? Yingling. How's that hatchback running? It gets me where I'm going and back, thanks to you. I'll be right back with your drinks. I guess you get a lot of people where they're going and back. That's what I do. Listen, if a big lumbering sort of guy comes up to your place... What? What guy? Sander waved a hand. Harmless guy, Chip. He's Marla's ex. He came by just as I was leaving. As she straightened, Naomi's shoulder blades went to iron. If he's mad about last night, he should be mad at who started it. It's not that. He's a nice guy. Too nice, most of the time. He wanted to apologize for her. He said he wanted to apologize to you, too, but he was afraid he'd scare you if he just showed up. Oh, it's not his fault. What's a nice guy who'd apologize for something that's not his fault doing with someone like her? It's impossible to love and be wise. Who said that? Francis Bacon. Anyway, I told him I'd tell you he was sorry. Maxie brought their drinks and took their order. Maybe it wasn't so bad, coming out, Naomi thought. The place was noisy, but in a good, happy way. And the calamari would have met with Harry's approval. I hear you met Lou. I did? At the bar last night, the bartender. Is that Lou? Sharp-looking brunette with sexy magenta streaks. I expected her to be older, sort of businesslike, sitting in some back office with ledgers. Lou likes to keep her hand in. She liked you. She caught a bright peal of laughter, noted that the comfortably built brunette behind the counter let out another as she rang up an order. That's flattering, since we talked over the bar for about two minutes. She knows what she knows, as she likes to say. She mentioned her ex-husband used to be the groundskeeper when my house was a B&B. &B. Right, the stoner. He's long gone. But it reminds me, I could give you a hand with some of the heavy yard work. Kevin said you didn't want to hire a landscaper, at least not yet. But if you decide otherwise, you might talk to Lilo. From the band? His family runs the local nursery. He's actually pretty good at the whole lawn and garden thing. And having a stoner is tradition up there? After a gesture with his beer, he took a drink. A former stoner in Leo's case. You can size him up tomorrow for yourself. Maybe I will. More, maybe she'd just have to. I wanted to deal with it myself, but so far I've managed to hack away the worst, plant a couple of pots and some kitchen herbs. No landscaping in New York? Not like this. We've got a pretty back courtyard garden, simple and easy to maintain, and that's mostly Seth anyway. So maybe I'll think about getting some help with it. We could barter some labor for the photo shoot. Hmm, let's see how the shoot goes. That could work all around. Why don't you come by? Take a look at the garage. I've got to get back for the dog. Ace in the hole, she reminded herself. Ten minutes won't matter. It's basically on the way. You take a look tonight, get that sense you wanted. It would help, she thought. And she still had the dog for her ace in the hole. No matter how tempting, 
She couldn't end up in Xander's bed, not with a dog pining away at home. All right, let's do that. Of course, night had fallen, so she couldn't judge the light, but she could get a sense of the space, a feel for what she'd have to work with if she shot in their practice area. Floodlights popped on as she pulled around back behind Xander. She saw now he had the bays locked and secured with some sort of keypad alarm, as well as the motion lights. I hadn't thought about the security you'd need. A lot of tools, cars, car parts, and sometimes the band equipment. He opened the bay door and hit the lights. A good-sized space, she mused, stepping in. The place smelled of oil, and the concrete floor was stained with it. It held a lift, bright orange. She scanned tools, compressors, grease guns, hydraulic jacks, rolly boards, a couple of enormous tool chests, one black, one red. Yes, she could make this work. Where do you set up? Pretty much like we do on stage. If the weather's good, and we start early enough, we set up outside on the pad. It's nice. Maybe, but she wanted them inside, with those clashing colors, those big bulky tools. I'm going to want your motorcycle in here. For the shoot? Yeah, maybe. I want to try that. And parts, she thought. An old engine would be great. Maybe a broken windshield, all those spider webs, a steering wheel, tires. Yes, she could make this work. She stepped back out, looked at the space, walked back in, studied it. Okay, I want some wardrobe choices. Things you're all comfortable in, but like I said, not just black. Get some ball caps, bandanas, cowboy hat, maybe a duster. Leather, definitely leather. Okay... She heard the doubt in his voice and smiled. Trust me, you're going to like what I do here. But it was a big garage, and maybe there were other possibilities. What's in the next bay? The love of my life. Is that so? It is. Do you want to see her? Absolutely. He went out, left the first bay open in case she wasn't done, opened the next, hit the light. He'd heard her gasp like that before, he realized, when he'd been inside her. This is yours? It is now. You have a 67 GTO convertible in factory red. He stood in reverent silence for ten full seconds. I think you have to marry me now. You're the first woman besides Lou who's seen her and known what she is. I'm pretty sure we're engaged. It's beautiful. She moved closer, skimmed her fingertips lightly over the hood. Absolutely pristine. Did you restore it? maintains more like it. My grandfather bought her right off the showroom floor, treated her like a baby. The mechanic gene skipped my father, so Grandpa showed me the ropes, and when I turned 21, he gave her to me. She reached for the door, glanced at him. Can I? Sure. She opened it, brushed her hand over the seat. It still smells new. That's some detailing. Oh, it has the push-button radio. My dad talked about getting an 8-track put in, in his day. My grandfather nearly disinherited him. Well, it's blasphemy, isn't it? Your grandfather would be pleased at how well you've kept it. He is. Oh, he's alive? And well, and living with my grandmother. Well, step-grandmother, technically. But they've been married close to 40 years. In Florida, Sanibel Island. Gorgeous place. How do you know about classic cars? I only know some. I did a shoot one of my first on my own, a friend of a friend of Harry's and Seth's. She circled the car as she spoke. It really was absolutely perfect, and if Xander maintained it, she imagined it ran just as beautifully. He had classic cars and wanted photos of them, she continued, inside and out. I was so nervous about the shoot, especially since I didn't know anything about cars, especially classic cars. I got a list of the cars he had, studied them, actually had Mason quiz me, and one of them was a 67 GTO. Not the convertible, but factory red, like this. A beauty. Want to take a ride? Oh, I would. She sighed it. I really would, but I have to get back for the dog. He recognized lust and knew how to use it. How about this? We take a ride in it to your place. You leave your car here. I stay there. Tomorrow, we load your equipment in her, Come back, so you can do what you do. She shouldn't. 
She shouldn't. Shouldn't sleep with him two nights in a row. It was the next thing to a commitment. And the car shined under the garage lights, luring her. Xander stood, hip-shot and sexy, finishing her off. I can agree to that, but only if you put the top down. Deal. Fifteen. There had been a time in his life when Xander had been more apt to fall into bed at five in the morning than stumble out of it. He really hoped that time wasn't completely at an end. But when part of the reward for early rising equaled pancakes, and not from a box mix like his mother made, he could see the benefit. The bigger benefit sat beside him on the old glider, smelling of summer while the stars went out. So those are the chairs on the table for out here? They will be. Sanders studied the old spring chairs. Even in the dark, he could see the rust. Why? I'm going for a theme here. And they were a bargain. And because I have vision. I also dropped off a chest of drawers and a coffee table at Jenny's. Cecil's holding a couple more pieces I want her to look at. He must love you, Slim. I'm going to pay for this patio furniture, and more, with the pictures I took over there yesterday. I got one of his barn. God, the light was perfect and the clouds, just a roll of gray. And I talked him into standing in the open barn doors in those bib overalls he wears. He's leaning on a pitchfork. He grumbled about it, but he liked doing it. And he signed the release in exchange for a print. Good deal all around. Then I... Wait! She jumped up, ran inside. Xander exchanged a look with the dog, shrugged, and went back to his pancakes as the first light bloomed at the edge of the world. She ran back with her camera and a bag. Stand over by the rail, she ordered. What? No, I'm eating. It's too dark for pictures anyway. Do I tell you how to overhaul an engine? Come on, be a pal. Stand by the rail, with your coffee mug. Come on, come on. I don't want to miss the light. Isn't any light, he muttered, but rose and went to the rail. Call the dog over. Since otherwise Tag might take too personal an interest in the plate he'd left on the glider, Xander called the dog. Just drink your coffee, watch the sunrise, pay no attention to me. Just look out. No, turn a little more to your right and lose the scowl. It's morning. You've got coffee and a dog. You just rolled out of bed after spending the night with a beautiful woman. Well, that's all true. Feel it a little, that's all, and watch the sun come up. He could do that, he supposed. It was a little strange doing it while she moved around him with a camera. But the dog, apparently used to it, leaned against his leg and looked out over the water with him. It was a hell of a show, those first trickles of light, the promise of them, the slow blur of rose hitting the water, then the shimmer of gold rising up, edging the clouds. Plus, she made damn good coffee in that fancy machine of hers. He'd just enjoy it. Ignored the way she muttered to herself, pawed through her bag for something. Oh, it was perfect. He was perfect. Hardly more than a silhouette. The tall, sleep-rumpled, barefoot, sexy man with a loyal dog at his side, watching the new day whisper over the water. Long legs, long arms, big hands, white coffee mug, dark stubble on a sharp profile at the break of dawn. Great, great. Thanks. Done. He glanced back, and she couldn't resist one more. Now done. Okay. He went back to the glider and his pancakes, and when she joined him, ignoring her own plate to view the shots, he held out a hand. Let's see. She didn't give him the camera, but scooted closer, angled the screen, scrolled through. He didn't know how she got so much out of the light, or the lack of it. How she'd tossed him into relief— managed to make him look moody and content at the same time, or how she'd managed to capture every shade of sunrise. You're good. Yes, I am. I'll print out a release. What are you going to do with them? Still scrolling, she stopped on one, did something that zoomed in on his profile. I need to take a closer look at them on my computer, pick the one I think is best for the sexy, moody gallery print I have in mind, then work on it some. Pick another... Probably the one where you started to turn, look back at me with the sunrise behind you, for a stock print. You're going to end up on a book cover. What? I know what sells there, she said, 
One of these days, you can add yourself to your collection. That's a good and unexpected morning's work. She leaned over, kissed him, something she'd never done before, and stifled his instinct to object. Are you going to start on that this morning? Now she zoomed in on the dog's profile. That and some other work. Okay, I'll get going on the yard. The yard? Distracted, she looked over at him. My yard? No, I thought I'd just drive around until I found one that appealed to me and dig in. Yeah, your yard. You don't have to do that. I'm up, and I like yard work, says the man without a yard. Yeah, that's a downside. To Tag's bitter disappointment, Xander polished off the pancakes. But I give Kevin and Jenny a hand now and then. And Lou. Where are your tools? I have a shovel, a fan rake, and this set of garden tools. You know, little spade, clippers, the fork thing. He sat for a moment. And you expect to deal with that yard? With a shovel? A rake? So far, what else? You need loppers, a wheelbarrow. You can use some of the empty drywall buckets around here. A pickaxe. You need both a fan rake and a garden rake. Shears. I need to make a list. I'll see what I can do with what you've got, and we'll go from there. Since she'd planned on a full morning's work, she settled down at her temporary station. He could play in the yard, she thought, though she imagined he'd get tired and bored with the sheer grunt work of it and come back in, nudge at her to knock off. Have sex, take a ride, do something she didn't have on her morning agenda. That was the problem with having someone around. They so often wanted to do something you didn't have time for. She took care of some basics first, some bread and butter shots. Pleased with the barn studies, she uploaded them before spending time on the one she'd chosen of Cecil. But since the pictures she'd just taken tugged at her, she shuffled back the other work she'd intended to finish and studied them, frame by frame, on the big screen. She started on the last shot, the lucky impulse shot, where he'd been half-turned toward her, with a half-smile, good and cocky on his face. God, he was gorgeous. Not slick and polished, Nothing slick or polished about him. It was all raw and rough, and only more so with that morning stubble, the ungroomed hair. She went to work on the background first, burning in the clouds for a little more drama. Yeah, big drama for the backdrop. Hot, sexy guy, half-turned, looking over his shoulder at a lover. No mistaking the half-cocked smile and smoky look aimed at anyone but a lover. As a stock photo, it would sell, and for years... In the short term, she calculated she'd sell dozens in under a week. For fun and the mystery, she titled it Mr. X. Yes, an excellent morning's work. She fussed with it more, zooming in, refining small details, and then, satisfied, uploaded it to her site. Once that was done, she reviewed the two shots she'd come down to for the gallery. She lost track of time. This work was more exacting, more detailed. She wanted to stress the moment where everything stilled between night and day, just the first hints of light, the drama still below the surface. And the man, hardly more than a shadow, with the dog lightly leaning against him. Bring out his eyes more, she decided, so the blue played hot. She might do a second, she considered, black and white, with color pops. Yes, with his eyes boldly blue and the growing light just as boldly red the white mug. She made a note of the number she wanted for that, went back to the first. She toggled between the two, each time studying the previous work with a critical and fresher eye. They're good. They're really good, she murmured, and sent both to the manager of the gallery for preview. Then she sat back to study them both again. Really good. She rose, rolled her stiff shoulders, circled her head on her stiff neck, and reminded herself she'd vowed to do at least 30 minutes of yoga daily to keep loose. Starting tomorrow. The least she could do was go check on Xander, offer him something cold to drink, make sure the dog had something too, as Tag had opted to hang with Xander instead of sprawling beside her while she worked. She went down, opened the front door. She saw him, stripped to the waist, torso gleaming with sweat, throwing a stick, more like an entire branch, for the wild-eyed dog. More sticks, more debris filled a wheelbarrow. A large swatch of lawn sat patchy, bumpy, and clear of weeds, 
tangling brush, and the thorny vines that seemed to grow a foot every night. She spotted a pile of rocks, a chainsaw, an axe, a pickaxe, those drywall buckets, plastic tarps with piles of leaves and pine needles centered on them. She said, Holy crap, and got Xander's attention. Hey, we got a good start here. A start? Where did all this come from? The yard trash from the trashy yard. The tools? Tag and I rode into town, got the truck, stopped by the garden center and the hardware. I left the bills on the kitchen counter. There's half a cold-cut sub in the fridge if you want it. We got hungry. Slowly, she walked down, stepped on grass. Pathetic grass, but still. I never expected you to do all this. We had some fun with it. If I were you, I'd get rid of those foundation bushes. He pulled a bandana out of his back pocket and swiped the sweat off his face with it. Lilo would rip them out for you, or tell you if they're worth saving. Did I buy a chainsaw? No, that's mine. You shouldn't need one now that things are more under control. Once that dumpster's gone, you can figure out what you want to do over there. As he spoke, he threw the stick for Tag again. I'd sure as hell plant myself a good tree. I... I thought maybe I'd plant one of those weepers, a cherry or... whatever. That'd be good. He pulled off thick work gloves. Xander, how long... What time is it? She dug for her phone to check, realized she didn't have it. He pulled out his own. It's about one. In the afternoon? It ain't morning, baby. Laughing, he kissed her. Where do you go when you work? I just never expected you to... You worked hours. Thank you so much. It's just yard work, but you're welcome. I need to get cleaned up so we can get going. If you still want those book pictures... Yes, I do. And yes, you do. You're all sweaty. Stepping closer, she trained a finger down his chest. And pretty dirty. You look... hot and thirsty. Since the look in her eyes invited it, he hauled her against him. Now you're sweaty and dirty, too. Then I guess we both need a shower. He took her under cool water, running hard, Soap slick hands over her. Eager, avid, her mouth met his, so he swallowed those gasps and moans as he took her higher. When he pinned her against the wall, drove into her, her fingers dived into his hair, clutched there. Her eyes clung to his as, with lips close, their breath tangled. The green of her eyes went opaque as she peeked, as she said his name, as he'd wanted her to say it. But he held back denied himself that quick release, slowed the rhythm until her head lolled back. She could feel nothing but pleasure, all so ripe, so full it should burst. But it only spread, engulfed her like warm, wet velvet. The tiles, cool on her back, his body hot, pressed to her, in her. The air so thick that breathing it in, letting it go, was a moan. She tried to hold on, to give back, but felt as soft and pliable as wax and sunlight. His lips toyed with hers, conquering by torment rather than force. She said his name again as her eyes closed. No, no, look at me. Open your eyes and see me, Naomi. I see you. Yes, God. A little more. A little more until there's nothing left. I'm going to take more. Yes. He took more kept them both swaying on that high wire between need and release until it built beyond the bearing, until he let the wire snap beneath the weight. Because she felt a little drunk, Naomi took great care of packing her equipment. He'd taken her beyond her own boundaries of control, and somehow she'd allowed it. She'd need time and space to decide, to understand what that meant. And now wasn't the time, not when everything in her felt so soft and vulnerable, when she could still feel his hands on her. She packed her tripod, a camera bag, a case, a light stand, diffuser. He walked in, smelling of her soap. All that? Better to have everything than leave behind the one thing you realize you need. She started to swing on a backpack. I've got it. Christ, does everything include bricks? He picked up her tripod case, the light stand, started out. As she picked up the rest, Tag barked as if dragons burned down the gates. 
Car's coming, Xander called back. I've got it. He's got it, she murmured. That's the problem. Why am I mostly okay that he's got it? Easy killer, Xander told the dog and opened the front door. He recognized the official vehicle just pulling up beside his truck and the chief of police behind the wheel. Relax, he's one of the good guys. Xander stepped off the porch, carted the equipment to his truck. Hey, chief. Xander, is that the stray I heard about? Yeah, that's Tag. Hey there, Tag. Chief of Police, Sam Winston. A toughly built man with a smooth face the color of walnuts and a waves cap on his close-cropped hair. The high school football team where his son stood as quarterback. Crouched down. Tag, nervous, crept close enough to sniff. He's a good-looking dog. Now he is. Tag accepted the head scrub, then immediately ran back to Naomi when she came out. Ma'am? Sam tapped the brim of his cap. I'm Sam Winston, chief of police. Is something wrong? I'm not sure about that. I've been meaning to come up, introduce myself. It's good someone's back on the bluff, and from what I hear, and can see for myself, you're giving the old girl a facelift. She needed one. You got Kevin Banner and his crew on it, I hear. Yes. You couldn't do better. Looks like I caught you two on the way out. Naomi's going to take some pictures of the band. Is that so? Sam hooked his thumbs into his thick Sam Brown belt, gave a little nod. I bet they'll be good ones. I don't want to keep you, and it saves me time to find you both here. It's about Marla Roth. If she's trying to push an assault charge, I'll push back. Again, Naomi said. I can't say if she'd go there. We can't seem to find her. Still, Xander put in, turned back from stowing the equipment. Nobody's seen or heard from her, the way it looks, since Friday night. Not long after your scuffle with her, Miss Carson. If she's still pissed about that, she could have taken off for a few days, Xander began. Worn boots planted, Sam gave the bill of his cap a little flick up. Her car's at her house, and she isn't. Chip finally broke in the back door this morning, then came back to see me. She didn't go into work yesterday, isn't answering her phone. She could be in a snit, and it's most likely she is. But Chip's worried sick, and I need to look into it. Now, the story I'm getting is she went at you at Lou's on Friday night. Missing could mean anything, Naomi assured herself. Missing didn't mean an old root cellar in the deep woods. More often, much more often, it just meant a person had gone somewhere no one had looked yet. Ms. Carson, Sam prompted. Sorry, yes, that's right. She knocked into me a couple of times, then shoved me a couple of times. And you clocked her one? No, I didn't hit her. I took her wrist, gave it a twist. Leverage, pressure point. So she went down. So she stopped shoving me. Then what? Then I left. It was annoying and embarrassing, so I left and came home. By yourself? Yes, I came home alone. About what time do you think that was? About 10.30. Just doing his job, Naomi reminded herself, and took a deep breath. I let the dog out, walked around with him for a while. I was angry and upset, and couldn't concentrate on work. And I got here about 12.30. Though Xander leaned negligently back on his truck, irritation edged his voice. The dog got us up just after 5, and I left about 7.30, maybe a little before. Come on, chief. Xander, I've got to ask. Patty's been screeching about Miss Carson attacking Marla. She's the only one with that take, he added, before Xander could speak. And even she's backed off that mark. But the fact is, Marla stormed out of Lou's in a temper about 20 minutes after Miss Carson. And as far as I can determine, that's the last anyone saw her. Sam huffed out a breath, petted the dog, who now apparently found him delightful. Did either of you see her with anybody? 
somebody she might have taken it into her head to go off with. She was sitting with Patty, Xander shrugged. I try not to notice Marla too much. I saw her at her table with her friend earlier in the evening. Tense now, Naomi rubbed her neck. I was sitting with Kevin and Jenny. I really wasn't paying attention to her until Jenny and I got up to dance and she... I don't even know her. I understand that. I do. And I don't want you to worry about this. She probably went off with somebody she met at the bar to lick her wounds and get Chip worked up. Naomi shook her head. A woman who's pissed off and upset? She's going to talk to her girlfriend. They had a bit of a falling out after the incident. Regardless, even if she called this Patty to argue, or at least send her a bitchy text, we'll be looking into it. I'm not going to keep you, but I'd like to come back sometime, see what you're doing inside. Yes, sure. You have a good day. I'll be seeing you around, Xander. Naomi's insides twisted as Sam got back in his cruiser. Will he really look? Yeah, of course. He's the chief. Has anyone else ever gone missing? Not that I know of, and I would. Hey. Xander put a hand on her arm. Marla's the type who looks for trouble, likes to cause it. It's just the way she is. The chief will do his job. Don't worry about this. He was right, of course. Marla was a troublemaker and had very likely hooked up with some guy for the weekend to boost her wounded ego. Not every woman who went off that way ended up raped and murdered. It had never happened here before, Naomi reminded herself. Hadn't she checked into just that after she'd fallen for the house? Low crime rate, even lower violent crime rate, a safe place, a quiet place. Marla would probably show up before nightfall, Pleased she'd worried her ex-husband, her friend, had the police out looking for. She put it out of her mind, as much as she could, as Xander pulled away from the house in the truck, with a dog riding with his head out the window and his ears flying in the breeze. Light and Shadow Where there is a great deal of light, the shadows are deeper. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe 16. When he'd realized she was serious about taking pictures in his place, Xander had considered pulling the Simon Vance book off the shelf. He'd done so long enough to read it again, refresh himself, then had nearly tossed it into the box he kept for donations. He didn't want to see that dull, stricken look on her face again. In the end, he decided pulling it off gave it too much importance. She knew it was there and would wonder why he'd taken it away. Weighing the stress factor, he figured it at 50-50 and opted to leave it alone. She'd tell him when she was ready, or she wouldn't. He helped her haul her equipment up the steps, where she paid more attention to the equipment than what she intended to shoot. She pulled a tripod out of a case, telescoped it, did the same with a light stand. I've still got that wine you like if you want. Thanks, but not when I'm working. I see subscribe to the same rule. He got them both a Coke. She nodded. Ignored it as she pulled out a light meter. Can I have one of those chairs over here for the laptop? I'll get it. She attached a camera to the tripod, eyes narrowed now on the wall of books. That's an impressive camera. Hasselblad, medium format. Larger media, higher resolution. I'm going to shoot digital first. She took a bag from her case, attached it to the camera. When he looked in the case, the bag, the lenses, backs, cables, attachments... He understood why everything was so damn heavy. How the hell did she haul all that stuff around? He didn't ask because he recognized focused work mode. She peered through the viewfinder, used a remote to switch on the light, switch it off. She popped an umbrella out of the bag, screwed it onto the light stand, then shielded that with a screen. She checked everything again, changed the angle of the tripod, walked it back about an inch. If she thought about the book, she didn't show it. He figured it took her a good 30 minutes to set up and take a couple of test shots. Halfway through it, he decided she didn't need him, got a book out of his office, and settled down at the table to read while she worked. Is there a system to the way you shelve the books? He glanced up. Where they fit? Why? You have Jane Austen beside Stephen King. I don't think either one of them would mind, but if you do, you can move books around. No, that's part of the point. 
It's a wall of stories. Take out any one, go anywhere. It's Storyland. She pulled him into watching her again. Shoot, study, adjust, test, shoot. Curious now, he got up to take a look at the laptop screen. The colors bloomed deeper, the light a little dreamy. Somehow she made some of the tattered spines appear interesting rather than worn. Another popped on. He couldn't see the difference, but apparently she could as she squinted at it, said, Yeah, yeah. She took half a dozen more, making minor adjustments, then crouched down to slideshow through all the shots. How come it looks better in the picture than in reality? Magic. This one. Yeah, this is the one, I think. It looks great in reality. Light, shadow, angle. That's just atmosphere. You made art. I captured art, she corrected. I want to take some film. She took the back off the camera and switched it with something out of her bag. That camera does both, digital and film? Yeah, handy. He wanted to ask how, wanted to see how, but she had that in-the-zone look about her again. She went back to work. He went back to reading. She pulled him out of his book when she switched backs again, changed lenses, and took the camera off the tripod. She moved to the side, took a picture of the books from a sharp angle, checked the result, adjusted the light, took a few more. When she lowered the camera, moved to the shelves, he thought for a moment she meant to pull off the book about her father. But she pulled one from a higher shelf, carried it to the table. I want you with the Austin. Can you bookmark what you're reading? I've read it before. I can pick it up where I left off if I want. He felt more than a little foolish. No one would ever term him shy, but the idea of taking pictures of his hands? Weird. You're serious about the hand thing. Deadly. Tough man's hand with a classic novel written by a woman, one a lot of people consider a woman's book. A lot of people are stupid. Either way, it should work. She took out her light meter. And the light's good right here for what I want. Good, natural light through the window. Especially if you just... Scoot your chair to the right, just a couple inches. Once he had, she checked the light meter again. Apparently satisfied, she went back for her laptop, set it on the postage stamp corner of counter. Just hold the book open, the way you would if you were reading it. Not the first page. You've been reading it a while. About a third of the way through. He felt ridiculous, but he did it. He'd give her five minutes to play around. She shot over his shoulder so that sultry summer scent spilled over him. Maybe ten, he considered, while she shifted behind him, leaned in closer. Turn a page. Or start to. Don't turn it all the way. Just stop. Hold it. Good. It's good, but... She straightened, frowned at the laptop image. He had to twist around to check it himself, and what he saw surprised him. I thought you were crazy but it looks like an ad in a high-class magazine or something. It's good, but it's not quite there. It needs... Of course. She pulled open his refrigerator, took out a beer. When she spotted the opener, she popped the top, then, to his shock, poured a good third of it down the sink. What? Why? Tough hands, a beer, and pride and prejudice. She set the beer on the table, framed it, moved it closer to the top right edge of the book. You didn't have to pour it down the sink. It needs to look like you're drinking a beer and reading Austin. I have a mouth and a throat. We could have poured it in there. Sorry, didn't think of that. Left thumb under the page, turning it, right hand on the beer. I need you to cover the label. I'm not looking for product placement. Hand on the beer like you're about to pick it up. Maybe even lift it a half inch off the table. Since there was no use crying over spilled beer, he followed instructions. Picking up the beer, setting it down, turning a page, not turning a page, until she lowered the camera again. Perfect. Just exactly right. He turned to see for himself, saw the beer had been inspired. It gave the shot a cheerful edge and added balance. Real men read books, Naomi said. I'm going to offer poster size. He felt weird all over again. Posters. Brick-and-mortar bookstores, adult learning centers, college dorms, even some libraries. You've given me some damn good work today, Xander. 
I'm going to tell Kevin it's a go on the steam shower. You're putting in a steam shower. I am now. Nodding, nodding. She scrolled through the shots on her computer. Yes, I am now. I talked myself out of it, but when I get this much good work on a Sunday, I'm steaming. He pointed at her. I earned time in that. You definitely did. She didn't resist when he pulled her onto his lap, but did hesitate when he started to take the camera. I'm not going to bounce it off the floor. It's got weight, he commented. Just over nine pounds. I'm mostly going to use the tripod with it, and it's worth the weight. It's tough and reliable, and you can see just how sharp. And this deal on the back makes it shoot digital? Nodding, she removed it. Excellent system. No pins to catch on anything, and it has its own integrated software. It's not something I'm going to take on a hike, but for what I wanted here, and for what you want with the band, it's the machine. He had to admit he'd like to play with it himself, just to see how the mechanics worked. But he didn't see that happening, any more than he'd let her under the hood of his GTO. I use my phone if I take a picture. Very decent cameras on phones today. I've taken some nice shots I've been able to manipulate and sell. And now, I wouldn't mind a half a glass of that wine while I break this down and we set up in the garage. I can take care of that. I've already got most of a beer. Thanks. She hesitated again, then kissed him. Thanks, she repeated. No problem. She rose, went over to carefully replace her camera in its case, and as he rose to get her wine, he saw her gaze shift back to the books. So, it's a classic, therefore a cliched question, but have you read all of these? Everything out here? Yeah. There's some in my office, in the bedroom I haven't gotten to yet. She pulled off casual, he thought, compacting her tripod, sliding it into its soft case. Mostly fiction, right? But you've got some nonfiction mixed in. Biographies, histories, books on cars, surprise, true crime. He could pull off casual, too. Nonfiction, written well, is a story. I tend to only read nonfiction that's work-related. How do you know if something based on true is written true? I guess you don't. Sometimes it must be perception, or a personal agenda, or just enhancing or adjusting for creative effect, like a photograph. I take an image that's real, but I can manipulate it, change tones, enhance or soften or crop out to meet my own agenda. He brought the wine to her. Fifty-fifty, he'd thought. She'd done the work she'd come to do on the first fifty. Now he could see. She'd tied herself up in the second half. I'd say the person in the original image knows what's true and what's manipulated. That's the thing about words and images. She took a slow sip of wine. Once the words are on the page, the image printed, it becomes what's true. She turned away then, set her glass aside to break down her lighting. They're not so different, words and pictures. Both freeze moments. Both stay with you long after the moment's over. Naomi. He didn't have a clear idea what to say, how to say it, and decided it would be nothing, as the sound of an old truck with a rusted-out muffler boomed outside. Uh, that'll be Lilo and his muffler from hell. If he had a friend who was a mechanic, he could get that fixed. I'll have to suggest that, for the millionth time. At least he can help us haul all this down. She liked Lilo, and it generally took her longer to like. And Tag loved him at first sight. Man and dog were all over each other in an instant, like long-lost friends, possibly brothers, thrilled with a reunion. That's a good dog. That's some good dog. Crouched, Lilo rubbed Tag all over and got licked lovingly in the face with every stroke. I heard you found him out of gas on the side of the road. That's right. Not out of gas now, are you, boy? Not out of gas now. Tag rolled over, exposing his belly, his hind leg pumped like a piston in time with the rubbing. Lilo had straggly hair halfway to his shoulders, the color of a Kansas cornfield. He came in about an inch shorter than Naomi, with a skinny build and ropey muscles, set off in a tie-dyed T-shirt and jeans frayed at the knees and the hems. An emerald green fire-breathing dragon rode sinuously up his right forearm. How are you doing up there on the bluff? 
I like it. Naomi set up her lights as she considered ideas and options for the shoot. Needs help with the landscaping, Xander said as he brought in, as ordered, his guitars, both his axe and his old acoustic. Oh, yeah. They sure let that place go. Never did have much what you'd call creativity with the landscaping. And Dykes never gave a shit. Lose X, Xander explained. Stayed stoned most of the time. I should know, since I got stoned with him. I don't do that so much anymore, he said to Naomi. I could take a look up there, if you want. I'll give you some ideas. I could probably use the ideas. No charge for thinking. Here comes Dave and Trilby. Dave, the drummer, Naomi remembered. Broad shoulders, compact build, brown hair worn in a kind of modified Caesar. Jeans, a faded Aerosmith t-shirt, banged up brown hiking boots. Trilby, keyboards, made a striking contrast. Smooth dark skin, wide dark eyes, a head full of dreads. Cargo pants and a red tee on a gym-ripped body. They hauled in their equipment while Xander called out introductions. It helped that everyone had full hands and tasks. She always had a problem meeting so many people at once. Of course, the dog eased any awkwardness, happily roaming from one to another after he'd sniffed enough to reassure himself they were okay. I took a look at your website, Dave said to Naomi as he set up his drums. Slick. I'm in charge of the bands. Not so slick. Tech-wise, rocks. That's what I do, but the look doesn't hit as hard. Since she'd taken the time to view it herself, she couldn't disagree. It's really thorough and easy to navigate. He grinned. Which is saying, yeah, the look blows. I was wondering if we could get some shots today I could use there. Juice it up. I've got some ideas. Good, because in that area, I'm fresh out. My wife said maybe we should go more retro. You're married? Eight years, two kids. She couldn't say why she'd assumed he and the rest of the band would be single. At the serious engine roar, Dave adjusted the angle of his snare. That'll be Kai, lead guitar, Dave added, as she watched the big, black, tricked-out Harley roar up. Tall, dark, and dangerous, she thought. You couldn't say handsome, not with a narrow face, the scruffy goatee, the hawkish nose, and just overly generous mouth. But he made you look. He aimed eyes as dark as his hair at Naomi. Hi there, slugger. Xander glanced up from setting up the speakers. Naomi? Kai. Yeah. I saw you put Marla on her knees the other night. She'd earned it. Nobody's seen her for a couple days, Lilo said. Yeah, I just heard about that. With a kind of practiced shrug, Kai swung his guitar case off his back. Hooked up with somebody at the bar. Wouldn't be the first time. You had a lost weekend with her back when, didn't you, Lilo? I have a weekend, in a weak moment. We all have them. Got beer, Keaton? Cooler, outside the bay. He gave Naomi a lazy smile. Want one, Rocky? No, thanks. Water and soft stuff in there, too. I take a water. She put her hands on her hips, looked around. Yeah, she had ideas. I'm going to take some basics, just to warm everybody up, test the waters. You're set up like you are on stage, so go ahead, play something. She pulled out her Nikon, changed the lens, checked her light meter as they got in position, decided what to play. Dave's got his Aerosmith on, so let's go there, Xander suggested. Don't look at me unless I tell you to, Naomi ordered, and began to shoot. Standard, she thought. Good. Solid but standard. She got some decent headshots, some wide angles, some where she let the motion blur. When the last chord crashed down, she lowered the camera. Okay, now we're not doing any of that. I need to see the wardrobe options. Lilo, I want to stick with what you've got on, but let's see what else there is. Men, she thought, as she pawed through the choices, should learn how to be more creative. I bet you've got more stuff in your trucks, your trunks. Lilo came up with an old, oversized army jacket. She tossed it at Dave. You. Seriously? Trust me. She pulled out a white t-shirt. You've had this a while, right? She asked Xander. Yeah. Okay, then. She took it over to a grease stain, dropped it, rubbed it in with her foot. Better, she decided when she picked it up. Better yet, smear some motor oil on it. 
You want me to smear oil on the shirt? Yeah, like you got some on your hand, swiped your hand over your shirt. She demonstrated. Do that, put it on. Trilby, is that red t-shirt new? Kind of. Then I'm sorry, but I need to rip it. Why? Because you're built, and I want to see some skin and muscle. Lilo let out a hoot. Across the pecs, okay? Xander, I need some chain, not too heavy. Christ, he muttered as he ruined a perfectly good t-shirt. Chains for me? Kai grinned at her. You want to chain me up, Legs? That's what women will wonder when they look at the picture. She gave him a mirror of his cocky grin. Stud. What kind of picture is this? Trilby asked, holding his red shirt. Hot, sexy, rock and roll. If you don't like it, we can go with the basics I already shot, and more along those lines. But let's try this. I want that compressor over here, and that grease gun thing. Uh, I want some old tires piled up, right about there. You wouldn't happen to have a broken windshield. Sander tugged the stained and dirty shirt over his head. I replaced one last week. Haven't taken it to the junkyard yet. Perfect. Bonus round. Haul it in here. I don't get this, Dave muttered, and sniffed at the sleeve of the army jacket. I do. Lilo rubbed tag, grinned at her. Open it up, guys. We're the wreckers, right? We're fucking garage band. We're in a garage. Let's use it. Now you're talking. I want some tools. Lips curved, eyes focused. Naomi nodded. Big, man-sized tools. Sander didn't want to think about how long it would take to put everything back where it belonged. The bay turned into a jumble of car parts, tools, and musical instruments. He thought he had fairly good vision, but it seemed too art house, over the top, and out of the box. And he was sitting on a freaking air compressor, with his beloved Strat in one hand and a cordless drill in the other. Kai wore chains, bandolero style, and Dave looked baffled in Lilo's grandfather's ancient army jacket. She'd had Trilby lay his keyboard against a stack of tires. The only person, besides Naomi, who seemed to think it was a fine idea, was Lilo, sitting cross-legged on the concrete floor with his bass in his lap, a grease gun held like a rifle. She had their own music banging out on playback and the fancy camera on a tripod. She took some shots, shook her head. No one spoke as she pulled a bandana out of the pile of clothes she'd rejected, dipped it into the can of motor oil, then walked to Dave. Come on, really? Sorry, you're just too clean cut. She dabbed and smeared some oil on his cheek. She stepped back, angled her head. Lilo, lose the shoes. Just toss them to the side. Beside you, a little in front. I need a hubcap. I got one in the bed of my truck. When Lilo started to rise, she motioned him down. I'll get it. Dave turned to Xander when she went out. What the hell have you gotten us into? I have no idea. She's hot. Lilo lifted his shoulders. Just saying, if you hadn't seen her first, Zan, I'd make some major moves. I just bought this shirt. Trilby looked down at the tears. I only washed it once. Let her do what she does, Kai suggested. Xander's bound to get lucky and owe us. He already got lucky, Naomi said. You had two. She arranged the hubcaps, stepped back. Tag, those aren't yours. He'd nearly reached the discarded shoes and now slunk back again. For now, everybody looks straight at the camera. Badasses, give me some badass. Come on, let's see you steam up the lens. She should have gotten a few beers in them first, she thought. Still, it worked. The light, the setup, the arrangement worked. She stepped to the side. See me? You're right there, Xander pointed out. So everybody sees me. Hold that thought. She went behind the camera, looked through the lens. Imagine me naked. And there we go. Again, don't lose it. Imagine me imagining you naked. Yeah, that's got you thinking. She came out again, picked up one of the hubcaps, handed it to Dave, went back. Kai, wrap one of the loose ends of chain around your fist. Go with the music. Play. I've got a hubcap, Dave pointed out. And drumsticks. Play the hubcap. Play the tools, play the instrument, whatever strikes. 
play. You're on stage. You know how to interact on stage. She took them from play to war, instruments and tools as weapons. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the dog slinking back, caught him in the frame. Tag, she called out, just as he grabbed one of the shoes. Lilo just laughed, hooked an arm around Tag. Hey, he can be in the band. She took the shot, took two more while the mood held, then stepped back. That's a wrap, gentlemen. That's it? Dave blinked at her. It takes her twice as long, more, Xander corrected, to set things up than to take the pictures. You can see if it was worth it. I'll set the laptop on slideshow. If you like the group shots, I've got time to take individuals. You'd want to change again. It's nice of you to offer, Dave began, but I should probably... Hey, that's a nice shot. She'd started with a basic band shot. Yeah, it's not bad. No, these are really good. Tons better than what we have now. You see this, Trilby? Sweet. In his ruined shirt, he braced a hand on Dave's shoulder, leaned in to study. You got some individuals right here. Nice. Kai unwrapped the chain. We can really use these. Aces, but the others are going to be better. Still barefoot, Lilo squeezed in. Are they coming up? These are with a Nikon. I'll switch cards when they run through. Can you email these to me? Dave asked her. You're not going to want all of them, and the files from the Hassey are huge. I'll send you a sample of the best of them once I go through. She switched cards, waited to see if she'd gone wrong. Told ya! Lilo punched Dave's shoulder when the shots began to slide on screen. These are... We look... Super cool! Lilo punched Dave again. I thought it was crazy, even stupid. Dave glanced up at Naomi. Big apologies. Not necessary. Worth the shirt? She asked Trilby. And then some. These are great, really great. That's talent, and that's vision. Kai nodded at the screen. Shouldn't have doubted you. Xander's got a knack for spotting talent and vision. That one! Gotta have that one, the one with the dog. Milo scrubbed at Tag, who still had the shoe in his mouth. Band mascot. How about that wine now? Xander asked her when the slideshow started again. I could have a glass, one, before I set up for individuals. He took her hand, drew her outside the bay. And after that, stay. Oh, I really should get back. Take a better look at these, start to weed through them. He leaned down, kissed her, warm and long in the quieting spring evening. Stay anyway. I... I don't have my things, or Tag's food, or... She should take a breath, take some room. Then he kissed her again. Come home with me, she said. When we're done, come home with me. He went home with her, and late into the night when whatever dream chasing her made her whimper and stir, he did what he never did. He wrapped her close and held her. While Xander shielded Naomi from the nightmare, Marla lived one. She didn't know where she was, how long she'd been in the dark. He hurt her, whoever he was. And when he did, he whispered how he would hurt her more the next time. And he did. She tried to scream, but he taped her mouth. Sometimes he pushed her rag over her face, and the terrible fumes of it made her sick, then made her go away. She always woke in the dark, woke cold and scared, and wishing with all her heart for Chip to come save her. Then he'd rape her again. He cut her, and he hit her. He cut her, and he hit her even if she didn't fight the rape. Sometimes he choked her until her lungs burned, until she passed out. She couldn't remember what had happened, not exactly. When she tried to think, her head hurt so bad. She remembered walking home, being mad, so mad, but couldn't remember why. And she remembered, or thought she did, having to stop and puke in some bushes. Then the big car with a camper. Was that it? She walked by a camper. And then something hit her. Something hurt her. 
and those awful fumes took her away. She wanted to go home. She needed to go home. She wanted to go back to Chip. Tears leaked out of her swollen eyes. Then he came back. She felt the movement. Were they on a boat? She felt, as she had before, the space tilt and creak. His footsteps. She struggled, tried to scream, though she knew it was useless. Please, please somebody hear me? He gave her one hard slap. Let's see if you've got one more night in you. Something flashed, blinding her, and he laughed. You sure aren't much to look at now, but I can always get it up. He cut her first, so she screamed against the tape. He punched her with a fist cased in a leather glove, then slapped her to bring her round again, so she'd cry when he raped her. It was always better when they cried. Then he used the rope to choke her. This time, he didn't stop when she passed out. This time, he finished it and took her out of the nightmare. When he raped her, when he choked her, he called her Naomi. 17. Soaking, sopping spring rains blew in. They made for muddy boots, wet dog, and some dramatic photos. Naomi worked in the unfinished bedroom with the ugly blue bathroom and learned to block out the scream of tile cutters. She spent the rainy Monday and started the rainy Tuesday refining the weekend's work. She'd added the wreckers to her playlist, used their music while she worked on the band shots. She switched off to blues when refining the shots of Xander on her deck, went random on the book in hand. If she put off working on what she thought of as Storyland, she'd get to it. Inside, she knew she had to get past the upset of seeing that damn book tucked in with all the others on Xander's book wall. And right now, she was experiencing something new and different. She was happy. Not just satisfied, content, or engaged. Happy. In a way that stuck with her right through the day, rainy or not. The house, the progress on it, the work. Because God, she did good work here. Even the dog gave her a sense of happiness. And still, this was more. However it had happened, however it ran contrary to ingrained habit and what she considered good, sensible judgment, she was in a relationship. And in one, she had to admit, with an interesting man. One who engaged her, mind and body, who worked as hard as she did, and enjoyed it as she did. Who could blame her for wanting to hold on to it as long as it lasted? She matted the manipulated shot of him on the deck, toned black and white, his eyes boldly blue, the dog's crystal, bright white mug, and the red gold streak of sun an arrow over the horizon where sky met water. She'd debated between white mat or gray, and saw now she'd been right to go with the gray. It popped the colors out, didn't distract as the white might have. Pewter frame, she decided, not black. Keep those edges soft. She propped the matted print against the wall, stepped back to study it. The start of a good day, she thought, remembering. She only had to eliminate the visit from the chief of police, and it had been the start to a most excellent day. That ended as it began, with Xander in her bed. She hooked her thumbs in her pockets, giving the prints ranged against the wall a critical study, called out a, come in, at the knock on the door. Sorry. It's okay she told Kevin. Perfect time to break. Good, because Lilo's downstairs. He is? Yeah, he wanted to... Wow. He came all the way in, leaving the door open so the sounds of hammers and saws echoed from downstairs, and the tile cutters screamed down the hall. Those are great. That's Cecil's barn. And Cecil. And Xander. Mind? He asked, and crouched down before she answered. Tag padded over to nose under Kevin's arm for a hug. This one? Man, you can smell morning. That minute before it bangs open and it's day. You make me wish you were an art critic. It's how it hits. The black and white with the bits of color. That's dramatic, right? And seriously cool. But this one? It's the quiet and the... Possibilities? Definitely wish you were an art critic.
I'm not. But I've got to say Cecil's barn never looks so good. Where are you going to hang them? I'm not. They're going to the gallery in New York. In fact, I need to do a second print of what seems to be your favorite. The gallery owner wants one for his personal collection. Ha! Visibly tickled, Kevin pushed up to stand. Xander's going to New York. You know, the shop where Jenny works would go nuts for those smaller ones there. The flowers and the barn door, the old tree. She'd matted them for herself, but maybe. The commission, if they sold, could carve nicely into the cost of the old cedar chest she had her eye on at Cecil's. I might take some of the men. See about that. Did you say Lilo's downstairs? Hell, got off track. Yeah, he said he'd look at the yard, work up some ideas. But he's poking around with the guys downstairs, or was when I came up. We talked about him looking at the yard, but it's pouring rain. It's Lilo. Kevin's shrug said it all. If you're going to break for a bit, I've got some things to talk to you about downstairs. The laundry room deal, and up here, the studio. Okay, let me talk to Lilo, then I'll find you. We appreciate you don't breathe down our necks when we're working. I mean that. But you might want to take a look at the work on the master bath before you close off again. All right. Kevin peeled off in the direction of the master, and the dog started down with her. Tag paused on the stairs, sniffed the air. If a single bark could signify utter delight, his did, before he all but flew down the stairs. She heard Lilo laugh. Hey, there he is. How's it going, big guy? She found them, already wrestling over the painter's tarp. Lilo wore a wet cowboy hat and a yellow rain slicker. Hi. Figured it was a good day to look around since we're rained out on this patio job. So you want to slosh around outside here instead? Rain's gotta rain. I didn't want to go poking around without letting you know. Let me get a jacket. I can just make some notes and all if you don't want to get wet. Rain's gotta rain, he grinned. There you go. Meet you out there. Okay if Tag tags with me? I'd have a hard time stopping him. I'll be right out. She grabbed her rain jacket, a ball cap, and took the time to change her sneakers for boots. When she got out front, Lilo wandered in the steady rain, tossed a sodden tennis ball for the delirious dog. Got a good start on the cleanup, he called out. Xander did. I'd barely started on it. He likes the work. My dad's always saying he'd hire Xander in a heartbeat. But then, who'd fix his truck? I want to say right off, I hope you're not in love with those old Arborvites, because they've got to go. I'm not in love. Excellent. Anything you especially want? I thought an ornamental weeper, like a cherry, over there. Uh-huh. He stood, rain dripping off the brim of his hat, studied. That'd work. Have you ever seen a weeping red bud? I don't know. It's not red. It's a lavender. Lavender. Awesome color, and just a little less usual. And it's got heart-shaped leaves. Heart-shaped. You maybe want to look it up. I'm going to. You could maybe do some pavers, you know? Kind of winding, not straight arrow-like, and set off the house with native shrubs and plants. You like birds and butterflies, like that? Sure. You gotta have a mock orange. It smells good, looks pretty, and it'll draw the birds and butterflies. And Juneberry. It's got white, starry flowers, and it fruits. Purple fruit, about this big. He circled his thumb and finger. You'll get the songbirds with that. You can eat it. It's pretty good. And you want some rotos. He walked, gesturing, tossing the ball, rattling off names, descriptions, and painted a picture of something fanciful and lovely. I was going to plug in a tree, a couple of shrubs, do some bedding plants and bulbs. You could do that. It'd look fine. Maybe it would, but now you've got me thinking about plants I've never heard of and trees with heart-shaped leaves. I could draw it up for you, give you a better picture. Okay, let's do that. Can I see around back? We're already wet. As they started around the side, he reached into the pocket of his slicker. Want? She glanced down, saw the classic yellow pack, caught just the drift of that comforting scent as he drew out a stick of juicy fruit. Though she shook her head, deemed herself foolish, the simple pack of gum cemented her initial impression of him. Kind, sweet, loyal. No wonder the dog adored him. 
You get afternoon shade here. Lilo continued as he folded a stick of gum into his mouth. It's a nice spot for a hammock or a bench, some shade lovers. You wind those pavers around, you'll be able to walk clear around the house barefoot. You're killing me, Lilo. They circled to the back, where he set his hands on his skinny hips and looked up the deck steps, out to the narrow ribbon of scrubby lawn to the stone wall. You got a basement, right? A big one, storage and utility. It's not finished. I don't need the room. Might want it when you have kids, and you'd want to build up that wall more when you do. For now, you might want to put some hemlock over there. Naturalize some daffodils, give you a foresty feel on that far side, and some shrubs fronting the wall. Keep them low, because you don't want anything blocking the view. When you decide to finish the basement, you do yourself a walkout, and you've got a nice shady patio area under the decks, then a sunny little backyard. I wanted to put some herbs, some vegetables in. Not a huge space, but enough for a kitchen garden. You could do that. Nodding, he walked up the short steps to the first floor deck. It's a ways from your kitchen, but you could do that. Or you could have yourself a container garden up here. You got the sun. You got the room on a deck this size. Build them out of the same wood as the house. Make them look built in, you know. Do yourself some herbs, some cherry tomatoes, maybe some romas, some peppers, whatever. Containers are easy to maintain. And steps away from the kitchen. More practical, she thought. More efficient. And pretty. You know what you're doing, Lilo. Well, I've been working the business since I was about six. It's a lot of work. Whatever you do, you can do some here, some there, some down the road. But you can draw it up. Give me an estimate. On each section? Sure. And there's this other thing. Am I going to have to sell the family jewels? He grinned, shook his head, and shot out raindrops. Maybe you could take pictures of the work, you know? Before, during, after. We could use them in the business. Like a trade. Bartering again, she thought. The popular commerce of Sunrise Cove. That's a smart idea. I can't claim it. It's my dad's. I haven't seen what all you sent to Dave yesterday. I'm swinging by his place after he gets off work. May be able to mooch dinner, too. But my dad took a look at your website, and he came up with it. She'd want pictures in any case, she thought. She'd been documenting the progress on the house, for herself, for Mason and her uncles and grandparents. We'll work that deal. Solid. They fist bumped on it. I'll get you some drawings and some figures. You're really pretty. Ah, uh, thank you. I'm not hitting on you or anything. Xander's like my brother. It's just, you're really pretty, and I like what you're doing with the house. Like I said, I used to hang up here sometimes with dykes even though I used to think working in the business was bogus, I'd end up planting stuff in my head. Now you'll plant it for real. That's something, isn't it? I should book. Xander's on my ass about my muffler. I guess I'll take it in, let him fix the damn thing. I'll come by when I've got everything worked up. Thanks, Lilo. Sure thing. You be good, he rubbed the wet dog. Later, he said, and jogged down and away. Sanders stood under an aging Camry, replacing brake pads that should have been replaced 10,000 miles earlier. Some people just didn't maintain. It needed an oil change and an all-around tune-up, but its owner, his ninth-grade American history teacher, still didn't believe he knew what he was doing. About any damn thing. And never let him forget he'd been suspended for hooking school. Something that made no sense to him then or now. Suspension for hooking was like a damn reward. Speaking of suspension, her shocks were about shot, but she wouldn't listen there either. She'd wait, drive the car into the ground, until he ended up towing it in. He had a transmission job after this, and had given a clutch replacement to one of his crew, a simple tire rotation to another. He had two cars out in the lot, towed in from a wreck on rain-slick roads the night before, a call that had pulled him out of Naomi's bed at two in the morning. The drivers got off with mostly bumps, bruises, some cuts, though one of them ended up being taken in by the deputy when he didn't pass the breathalyzer. Once the insurance companies finished wrangling, he'd have plenty of bodywork to deal with. But he'd missed waking up with Naomi and the dog, 
having breakfast. He'd gotten used to those sunrises. Funny how fast he'd gotten used to them, and unused to sleeping and waking alone in his own space. Even now, he had a low-grade urge to see her, to hear her voice, to catch a drift of her scent. That wasn't like him. He just wasn't the sort who needed constant contact, calling, texting, checking in, dropping by. But he'd caught himself thinking up excuses to do any of that and had to order himself to knock it off. He had work. And later in the afternoon, a quick meeting with Lou about the bar. He had books to read, sports to watch, friends to hang with, and the paperwork he should have done Sunday night to clear up. Xander shook his head when he heard the unmistakable cough and rattle of Lilo's shitty muffler. Get that thing out of here, Xander shouted. It's bad for business. I'm bringing you business, man, and half a Jumbo Diablo sub. Xander paused long enough to glance over as Lilo, dripping rain, walked in. Diablo? I went by, saw your chick, and she is hot. She is smoking hot. Made me want some hot. You went up to Naomi's? Still think of it as the old Parkerson place. Not for long if she hires us. Trade you the sub for a Mountain Dew. Two minutes. Xander went back to the brake pads. So you went up, took a look at the yard? I've been dreaming about that place since I sat up there smoking dope with dykes. Now I find your smoking hot chicks pretty open and flexible about landscaping. She listens. She's got the vision, man, just like with the photos. Lilo boosted himself up to sit on a workbench, unwrapped the sub. We get a job like that? That place is a landmark. Sad one these last few years, but still. Showing how we can turn it around's got my parents doing the bebopping boogie. Going to try to work a deal for pictures we can use for promotion. Keep her outlay down some. How come you let Denny play that country shit in here? It's all right, and it keeps him happy. Finish, Xander walked over to the soda machine, plugged in coins for a Mountain Dew and a ginger ale. He grabbed paper napkins. Diablos were hot and messy, then joined Lilo on the bench. Is that Mrs. Wobaw's Camry? Yeah, she's driving it into the ground. I had her for American history. Me too. About bored me brainless. Me too. Who said that shit about history repeating itself? There are a lot of people who said that shit, Xander told him. A favorite is history, with all her volumes vast, half but one page. That's Byron. Cool. So why do we have to study it, be bored brainless, if it's got one page? We keep thinking if we do, we'll change the next page. Not so much, Xander decided. But as somebody else said, hope springs. So high school kids get bored brainless. Guess that's it. They ate in the easy, companionable silence of old friends. Saw you got a couple banged up good in the lot. Wreck last night on 119. Driver of the Honda blew a 1.1. DW freaking I. Hurt bad? Busted up some, and the other driver, too. Didn't sound major. Cars have it worse. Cha-ching for you. Should be. As he ate, Xander studied at Lilo's truck. Are you bringing that piece of shit in here for me to fix? Yeah. I can leave it if you can't get to it. Hitch a ride home. I can get to it. I bought the damn muffler a month ago. Figuring you'd come to your senses eventually. I can shuffle you in next. Dude. Gratitude. The chief stopped me this morning on my way out of town, let me off when I told him I was coming back here after some business and you were taking care of it. Unsurprised, Xander washed down fire-hot Diablo with ice-cold ginger ale, an excellent combo. That's one way to come to your senses. I'm going to kind of miss the noise. Only you, Lilo. The chief told me they haven't found Marla. Xander paused, with a can of ginger ale halfway to his mouth. She's not back? Nope, not back. Nobody's seen or heard from her. Since he had me pulled over, he asked if I had, if I had noticed her with anybody Friday night. Saw anybody go out after her. It's gotten serious, Anne. It's like she poofed. People don't poof. They run off. I tried that when I was pissed at my mother over something. Packed up my backpack and set off to walk to my grandparents'. I figured it only took about five minutes to get there, by car, 
and being eight, I didn't calculate the difference on foot so well. I got halfway there when my mother drove up. I figured I was in for it big time, but she got out and cried all over me. He took a hefty bite of his sob. Not the same, though, I guess. We can hope it is. She took off on a mad, and she's sitting somewhere sulking. But the odds of that now, Xander thought, weren't good. It's too long for that. Too damn long for that. People are thinking she got taken by somebody. People? They were talking about it in Ronaldo's when I got the sub. Local cops are talking to everybody now, from what I can see. Seems she hasn't used her credit card since Friday either. And she didn't take her car. Any clothes. They had Chip and Patty look at that, to see if they could tell if she grabbed up some clothes. Everybody there saw her walk out of the bar. And that's it. I can't say I like her. I know I had sex with her a couple times, but Jesus, she has a mean streak. But it's scary, man. Thinking something really happened to her? A lot of people are fucked up, you know? And do fucked up things. I don't like thinking about it. Neither did Xander. But he couldn't put it away. By the time he had Lilo's truck on the lift, and Lilo, with a yen for ice cream, had wandered off to get some, he had a twist in his belly. He got a clear picture of the look she'd tossed him when she'd come out of the bathroom, where Patty had dragged her on Friday night. The look she'd shot him, full of hot fury, before she shot up her middle finger and stormed out. That was his last image of her, a girl he'd known since high school. One he'd had sex with because she was available. One he'd blown off countless times since because, like Lilo, he didn't really like her. She could have walked home in under five minutes, he calculated. And at the pace she'd stormed out, more like three. A dark road, he considered. Even with some street lights, A quiet road that time of night, with nearly anybody out and about in the bar for the music and the company. He tried to see the houses on the route she'd have taken, the shops as she'd cut across Water Street. Shops closed. People would have been awake, or some of them, but those at home, most likely sitting and watching TV, playing on the computer, not looking out the window after 11 at night. Had somebody come along? Offered her a ride? Would she have been stupid enough to get in the car? Three to five minute walk. Why get into a stranger's car? Didn't have to be a stranger, he admitted, which tightened the twist in his belly. And there, she'd have hopped right in, glad to have an ear to vent her temper to. Nearly 2,000 people made their home in the cove, in town and around it, small town by any measure. But no one knew everyone. And a pissed-off drunk woman made an easy target. Had someone followed her out? He hadn't seen anyone. But he'd shrugged and looked away after she'd shot him the look and the finger. He couldn't be sure. Even people you knew had secrets. Hadn't he found black lace panties in the Honda of the very married Rick Graft, whose wife wouldn't have been able to wish herself into panties that small, when he detailed the interior? Graft came off as a happily married father of three, who coached basketball for nine- and ten-year-olds and managed the local hardware store. Xander had tossed the panties, figuring it was better all around that way. But he couldn't toss away the knowledge. Or how Mrs. Ensign had smelled of weed and cheap wine and the mints and spray cologne she'd used to try to mask it when he'd answered the breakdown call and gone out to change her tire. And she a grandmother, for Christ's sake. No, you couldn't know everyone. And even when you did, You didn't. But he knew Marla wouldn't sulk alone for going on four days. He was very much afraid that when they found her, it would be too late. 18. Having a house full of men had some advantages. Xander and Kevin carted out her shipping boxes and the smaller box of prints she'd framed for potential sale locally. It left her free to carry her camera bag. Thanks. I'll get these shipped off this morning. You're heading to New York, Zan. Weird, was his thought on it. Gotta go. He tapped Naomi's camera bag. Going to work, too? I am. I'll take an hour or two before I head to town. Where? When her eyebrows raised, he kept it casual. Just wondering. 
down below the bluff. We'll see if the rain washed in anything interesting. And pretty spring morning. Boats should be out. Good luck with that. He yanked her in for a kiss, gave the dog a quick rub. See you later. She'd be within sight of the house, he thought, as he swung onto his bike. And he'd already had a short, private conversation with Kevin about keeping an eye out. Best he could do. But he wouldn't be altogether easy until they found out what happened to Marla. Naomi considered taking the car. She could drive nearly a half a mile closer, then take a track down through the woods, since she wanted shots there first, make her way down to the shoreline. But quiet area or not, she didn't like the idea of leaving her car on the side of the road with her prints locked inside. She got the leash, which immediately had Tag racing in the opposite direction. Since she had his number, she only shrugged and started down the curve of road. He slunk after her. She stopped took a dog cookie out of her pocket. You want this? You wear this until we're off the road. She held out the leash. Dislike for the leash, lost to greed. He strained against the leash, tugged it, did his best to tangle himself in it. Naomi clipped it to her belt with a carabiner, then stopped to frame in some white wildflowers the rain had teased open like stars on the side of the road. He behaved better in the forest, occupying himself by sniffing the air, nosing the ground. Naomi took carefully angled shots of a nurse log, surrounded by ferns, and blanketed with lichen and moss. Yellows, rusty reds, greens on wood studded with mushrooms that spread like alien creatures. A pair of trees, easily ten feet high, rose from it, the roots wrapped around the decaying log, as if in an embrace. New life, she thought, from the dead and dying. The long rain soaked the green, so it tinted the light, seducing wildflowers to dance in sunbeam and shadow. It scented the air with earth and pine and secrets. After an hour, she nearly headed back, left the shoreline for another day. But she wanted the sparkle of sun on the water after the misty damp of the forest. She wanted the deeper, rougher green of those knuckles of land, the strong gray of rock against the blues. Another hour, she decided and then she'd pack it up, run her errands. Thrilled to be off the leash, Tag raced ahead. She turned onto the bluff trail, one he knew well now. He barked, danced in place whenever she stopped to take other pictures. Don't rush me. But she could smell the water now, too, and quickened her pace. The trail angled down and proved muddy enough from the rains that she had to slow again. Considering the mud, she realized she'd now have to wash the damn dog before running into town. Didn't think of that, did you? She muttered, and used handy branches to support herself on the slick dirt. All worth it. Worth it all in that one moment when the water and pockets of land opened up through the trees. She balanced herself, risked a spill to get shots of the view through low-hanging branches with her fern-like needles. Down below, it would be bright, sparkling, but here, with the angle, the fan of branches, the inlet looked mysterious, like a secret revealed through a magic door. Satisfied, she picked her way down to where the dog barked like a maniac. Leave the birds alone. I want the birds. She scraped her muddy boots on rippling rock, climbed over them, caught the diamond glint she'd hoped for, and happily, just beyond the channel, a boat with red sails. She blocked out the dog barking until she got what she wanted, until the red sails eased into frame. When he raced back to her, she ignored him, took a long shot of the inlet, of the twin forks of water drifting by the floating hump of green. Look, if you're going to tag along, you just have to wait until I'm done before... What have you got? Where did you get that? He stood, tail ticking, and a shoe in his mouth. A woman's shoe, she noted, open-toed, long skinny heel in cotton candy pink. You're not taking that home. You can just forget about that. When he dropped it at her feet, she stepped around it. And I'm not touching it. As she picked her way down, he grabbed up the shoe, raced ahead again. She stepped down onto the coarse sand, the bumpy cobbles of the narrow strip. Tag sent up a fierce spate of barking, a series of high-pitched whines that had her spinning around to snap at him. Cut it out! What's wrong with you this morning? She lowered her camera, with hands gone to ice. The dog stood at the base of the bluff, 
barking at something sprawled on the skinny swatch of sand. She made herself walk closer until her legs began to tremble, until the weight fell on her chest. She went down to her knees, fighting for breath, staring at the body. Marla Roth lay, wrists bound, her hands outstretched as though reaching for something she'd never hold. The bright, sparkling light went gray. The air filled with a roar, a wild, high wave. Then the dog licked her face, whined, tried to nose his head under her limp hand. The weight eased, left a terrible ache in its place. Okay. Okay, stay here. Her hands shook as she unlooped his leash, clipped it on him. Stay with me. God. Oh, God. Just hold on. Can't be sick. Won't be sick. Setting her teeth, she pulled out her phone. She didn't want to stay. She couldn't leave. It didn't matter that the police had told her to stay where she was, to touch nothing. She could have ignored that, but she couldn't leave Marla alone. But she went back to the rocks, climbed up enough to sit so the air could wash over her clammy face. The dog paced, tugged on the leash, barked until she hooked an arm around him, pulled him down to sit beside her. It calmed them both, at least a little. Calmed her enough that she realized she could do the one other thing she wanted. She took out her phone again, called Xander. Hey! His voice pitched over loud music, noisy machines. Xander? It only took one word, the sound in her voice on a single word, to have his stomach nodding. What happened? Are you hurt? Where are you? I'm not hurt. I'm down below the bluff. I... It's Marla. She's... I called the police... I found her. I called the police, and they're coming. I'm on my way. Call Kevin. He can get down there faster. But I'm coming now. It's all right. I'm all right. I can wait. I can hear the sirens. I can already hear them. Ten minutes. Though he hated to, he ended the call, jammed the phone in his pocket, swung a leg over his bike. On the rock. Naomi stared at the phone before remembering to put it away. Not in shock, she thought. She remembered how it felt to go into shock. Just a little dazed, a little out of herself. We have to wait, she told the dog. They have to get down the trail, so we have to wait. Someone hurt her. They hurt her. And they must have raped her. They took her clothes off. Her shoes. She swallowed hard pressed her face against Tag's fur. And they hurt her. You can see her throat, the bruises around her throat. I know what that means. I know what that means. The panic wanted to rear back, but she bore down, forced herself to take careful breaths. Not going to break. The dog smelled of the rain that had dripped from wet trees, of wet ground, of good, wet dog. She used it to keep centered. As long as she had the dog, right here, she could get through it. When she heard them coming, she drew more breaths, then got to her feet. I'm here, she called out. The chief broke through the trees first, followed by a uniformed deputy carrying a case, then another with a camera strapped around his neck. She couldn't see their eyes behind their sunglasses. She's over there. His head turned. She heard him let out a breath of his own before he looked back at her. I need you to wait here. Yes, I can wait here. She sat again. Her legs still weren't altogether steady and looked out to the water, to its sparkling beauty. After a time, Tag relaxed enough to sit down, lean against her. She heard someone coming, too fast for safety on the steep, muddy track. Tag sprang up again, wagged everywhere in happy hello. They want me to wait here, she told Xander. He knelt down beside her, pulled her in. She could have broken then. Oh, it would have been so easy to break. And so weak. He eased back, skimmed a hand over her face. I'm going to take you up to the house. I'm supposed to wait. Fuck that. They can talk to you up at the house. I'd rather do it here. I'd rather not bring this into the house until I have to. 
I shouldn't have called you. Bullshit. I called before I... She trailed off as the chief walked back to them. Xander. I called him after I called you. I was pretty shaky. Understandable. I... I'm sorry, the dog... I didn't see her at first. I was taking pictures, and I didn't see her. He had a shoe. Her shoe, I think. I, I just thought... I'm sorry. I know we weren't supposed to touch anything, but I, I didn't see her at first. Don't you worry about that. You came down to take pictures? Yes, I, I often do. I... We... I mean, the dog and I walked from the house, through the forest. I spent some time in there getting photos, but I wanted to take some here, after the rain. There was a boat with a red sail, and Tag had the shoe, a woman's pink heel. I, I don't know what he did with it. Sam took the water bottle out of her jacket pocket, handed it to her. You have a little water now, honey. All right. You didn't see anybody else? No. He kept barking and whining, but I didn't pay any attention because I wanted the shot. Then I yelled at him and turned, and I saw her. I went a little closer to be sure, and I could see. So I called the police. I called you, and I called Xander. I want to take her up to the house. I want to take her away from here. You do that. Sam gave Naomi's shoulder a light rub. You go on home now. I'm going to check in with you before I go. Xander took her hand, kept it firm in his as they started up the track. She didn't speak until they were in the trees. I hurt her. Naomi. I hurt her on Friday night at the bar. I meant to, and she walked out of there with her wrist aching, her pride ripped up, and her temper leading her. Otherwise, she'd have left with her friend. I looked at you instead of her. You want me to feel guilty about that? To try to work some blame up because it was you, not her? This isn't about you and me, Naomi. It's about the son of a bitch who did this to her. It was the tone as much as the words that snapped her back, the raw impatience with anger bubbling beneath. You're right. Maybe that's why I needed to call you. I wouldn't get endless there theirs and poor Naomi's from you. That sort of thing just makes it all worse. And it's not about me. Finding her is about you. Having to see that's about you. You don't want any poor Naomi's. I'll keep them to myself. But goddamn, I wish you'd gone anywhere else to take pictures this morning. So do I. We sat right out on the deck earlier. And she was down there. She had to have already been there. She took a breath. Does she have family? Her mother lives in town. Her father left, I don't know how many years ago. She has a brother in the Navy, joined up right out of high school, a couple years ahead of me. I didn't know him, really. And she has Chip. This is going to flatten him. They don't care about that. Who? Killers. They don't care about any of that. They don't think about all the other lives they rip apart. He strangled her. I could see the bruising. Her throat. He dumped her clothes near her. I think she was wearing those pink heels on Friday night. I think she was. She must have been with him since then. Since she left the bar. He wanted to pick her up. Just lift her up and carry her back to the house. Instead, he kept a solid grip on her hand. There's no point in telling you not to think about it. So I'll say yeah. It's most likely he took her after she left the bar. We don't know what happened after that. They've got ways to figure out if she was killed there or somewhere else and dumped there. Yes, they have ways. When they came out of the forest, she saw the two patrol cars, Xander's bike. If he didn't kill her there, why take her all that way? Why not dump her body in the forest or bury it there or drop her in the water? I don't know, Naomi. But if you hadn't gone down there this morning, it's likely she wouldn't have been found yet. You wouldn't see her from the house, not as close as she was to the foot of the bluff. And from the water? Maybe, if somebody came close to shore. Maybe. So maybe leaving her there gave him more time to get away. 
As they approached the house, he looked over at her. Do you want me to have Kevin pull the crew off of the day? No. No, for once I think I prefer noise to quiet. I think I'm going to paint. Paint? The second guest room? My uncle's room? I wouldn't be any good at work, and I don't want to go into town. Errands can wait. Okay. I'll give you a hand. Xander, you've got a business to run. I get not wanting a lot of there theirs. He had his arm around her waist now, a step closer to just carrying her, and kept his voice level. I'd suck at giving them anyway, but I'm not going anywhere, so we'll paint. She stopped, turned to him, into him, let herself just hold on. Thank you. Because it soothed him, and hopefully her, he ran his hands up and down her back. I'm a crap painter. Me too. She went upstairs to set up without him. She knew he lingered below to tell Kevin so she wouldn't have to. When he came up, he set down a cooler. Some water, some Cokes. Thirsty work, painting. Especially when you're crap at it. You told Kevin. The chief's going to come up, check on you, so yeah. He'll keep it to himself until then. And the crew will do the same to give the chief time enough to tell her mother. And Chip. Mason says that's the worst part, the notifications. I always wonder, if it's that hard to give, how much harder is it to get? I think it has to be worse not to know, if she hadn't been found, or not for a while longer. It's got to be harder not knowing. She nodded, turned away. Some of the girls her father had killed had been missing for years. Even now, after all this time, the FBI wasn't sure they'd found all the remains. Bose gave them another every few years for some new privilege. And, as Mason had told her so many years ago, for the fresh attention. So, you don't like this piss yellow color? She tried to center herself, studied the walls. I knew it reminded me of something. He didn't fill the silence with small talk while they worked. Something else to be grateful for rolling the primer on the walls, covering something ugly with something clean, soothed. The dog wandered in and out, and finally settled on stretching himself across the doorway for a nap so they couldn't leave the room without alerting him. They'd finished priming two walls and had begun to debate which of them had a lousier hand at cutting in when the dog's head shot up and his tail beat on the floor. Sam stepped up to the doorway. Got yourself a guard here. Naomi clasped her hands together to keep them still. Are you? I'm sorry, there's nowhere to sit down in here. We can go downstairs. I won't be long. I just wanted to see how you were doing. I'm all right. I wanted to keep busy, so... I hear that. First off, if you're nervous about being alone up here, I can have one of the men sit on the house tonight. She won't be alone. As Naomi started to speak... Xander glanced at her. Consider it the fee for the crap paint job. It'd be good to have someone stay with you. I just wanted to get your timeline, if you remember about what time you left the house this morning. Ah, uh, it was maybe a quarter to eight. I don't know exactly how long it took me to walk down to where I caught the track. I took some shots, wildflowers, along the way. I can show you. I'm not doubting your word, Sam assured her just trying to get a sense. I think I was at least an hour in the forest, and I took some shots from where it thins and you can see the channel. And after I went down, I took more from that big flat rock, the first one you come to from the track. That's when Tag ran up with the shoe. I didn't notice the time, but it had to be after nine. Then the dog kept barking and whining, and I turned to tell him to knock it off. And I saw her. Okay. I'm sorry about this, Miss Carson. Naomi. Naomi's fine. I'm sorry about this, Naomi. And I have to say, I'm grateful you walked that way today. It might have been another day or two before anyone found her otherwise. You're going to tell Chip, Xander put in. I know he's not next of kin, but you're going to tell him before he hears somebody talking about it. With a nod, Sam took off his ball cap, scraped fingers through gray-streaked brown hair, set it back on again. I'm going to see him right after I talk to her mother. 
If you think of some other details, Naomi, or if you just need to talk it through, you give me a call. This house is looking better than it ever did. Well, in my lifetime. I'm a phone call away, he added, and gave the dog a quick rub before leaving. She woke herself from the nightmare, ripped herself out of the cellar, under a nurse log in the dark green forest, the cellar where she'd found Marla's body. The fear came with her, and the images of the killing room her father had built, and all the blood and death in it. Her breath wheezed out, wanted to clog up. She fought to hitch it in, shoved it out again. Then hands gripped her shoulders. She'd have screamed if she'd had the air. It's me. It's Xander. Hold on a minute. He turned her, one hand still firm on her shoulder, and switched on the light. One look at her, had his hands taking her face, a hard grip. Slow it down, Naomi. Look at me. Slow it down. You're okay. Just slow it down. You're going to hyperventilate and pass out on me otherwise. Look at me. She pulled air in. God, it burned. Fought to hold it. Slow it before she let it out. She kept her eyes on his, so blue, a deep, bold blue, like water she could sink into and float. Better. You're okay. Slower. Slow it down some more. I'm going to get you some water. She lifted her hands, pressed them to his. She needed those eyes, just that deep blue for another minute. He kept talking to her. She didn't really register the words, just the hands on her face, the blue of his eyes. The burn eased, the weight lifted. Sorry. Sorry. Don't be stupid. Water's right there, on your nightstand. I'm not going anywhere. He reached around her, picked up the bottle, uncapped it. Slow on this, too. She nodded, sipped. I'm all right. Not yet, but close. You're cold. He rubbed those work-rough hands up and down her arms. He looked over her shoulder, said, Ease off now. She glanced over, saw Tag with his front paws on the bed. I woke up the dog, too. At the risk of being stupid on your scale, I am sorry. Nightmare. Not her first, he thought, for the first time he'd seen the full-blown panic. Not surprising, considering. You should get back under the blankets. Warm up. You know, I think I'll get up, try to work a while. Nothing much to take pictures of at 3.20 in the morning. It's not just taking them. I guess not. We should go down, scramble some eggs. Scramble eggs? In the middle of the night? It's not the middle of the night on your time clock. Yeah, eggs. We were up anyway. You don't have to be, she began, but he just rolled out of bed. We're up, he repeated, and walked over to open the doors. Tag bulleted out. Up and out. Waffles, he considered, glancing over to study her as he pulled on pants. I bet you could make waffles. I could, if I had a waffle maker, which I don't. Too bad. Scrambled eggs, then. She sat a moment, bringing her knees up to her chest. He just handled things, she thought. Nightmares, panic attacks, hurt dogs on the side of the road, dead bodies at the foot of the bluff. How did he do it? You're hungry. I'm awake. He picked up the cotton pants and t-shirt he'd gotten off her in the night, tossed them in her direction. Do you like eggs, Benedict? Never had it. You'll like it, Naomi decided, and got out of bed. He was right. The normality of cooking breakfast soothed and calmed. The process of it, the scents, a good hit of coffee, the raw edges of the dream, of memories she wanted locked away, faded off. And she was right. He liked her eggs Benedict. Where has this been all my life? He wondered, as they ate at the kitchen counter. And who's Benedict? She frowned over it, then nearly laughed. I have no idea. Whoever he was, kudos. Best 4 a.m. breakfast I've ever had. I owed you. You came when I called, and you stayed. I wouldn't have asked you to stay. 
You don't like to ask. I don't. That's probably a flaw I like to think of as self-reliance. It can be both. Anyway, you'll get used to it. To asking. And you brought me out of a panic attack. Have you had experience there? No, but it's just common sense. Your sense, she corrected, which also had you distracting me with eggs. Really good eggs. Nothing wrong with self-reliance. I'd be a proponent of that. And nothing wrong with asking either. It's using that crosses the line. We're in a thing, Naomi. A thing? I'm still working out the definition and scope of the thing. How about you? I've avoided being in a thing. Me too. Funny, how it sneaks up on you. In a gesture as easy and intimate as his voice, he danced his fingers down her spine. And here we are, before sunup. Eating these fancy eggs I didn't expect to like, with a dog you didn't expect to want hoping there'll be leftovers. I'm good with that. So I guess I'm good with being in a thing with you. You don't ask questions. I like figuring things out for myself. Maybe that's a flaw or self-reliance, he shrugged. Other times, it strikes me it's fine to wait until somebody gives me the answers. Sometimes they're the wrong answers. It's stupid to ask then if you're not ready for whatever the answers are going to be. I like who you are, right here and right now, so I'm good with it. Things can evolve or devolve. And why couldn't she just let it go and be right here, right now? Yeah, can and do. How long did you say your uncles had been together? Over 20 years. That's a chunk. I bet it hasn't been roses every day of the over 20. No. How long have we been in this thing, do you think? I don't know. I'm not sure when to start the clock. The day of the dog. Let's use that. How long ago was it we found the dog? It's been about a little over a month, I guess. Well, in the time's relative area, that's a chunk. She let out a laugh. World record for me. Look what you've got to work with, he said, gave her that cocky grin. Let's see what month three brings around. For now, when we're done with these really good eggs, we should clean it up, take some coffee up to the deck, wait for sunrise. When she said nothing, he touched her arm lightly, then went back to eating. This is your place, Naomi. Nobody can take it or what it means to away except you. You're right. Coffee on the deck sounds perfect. 19. Brooding, worrying, second-guessing, accomplished nothing. Still, she sat down, wrote a long email to a friend who would understand. Ashley McLean, now Ashley Murdoch, reminded her, always had, always would, that life could go on. She'd nearly called, just wanting to hear Ashley's voice, but the time difference meant she'd wake her friend before Ashley got out of bed with her husband of ten years come June, got her kids fed and off to school, and herself off to work. And emails came easier, gave her time to compose her thoughts, edit things out. All she really needed was that touchstone. It helped, it all helped, making breakfast, watching the sunrise with the man she had an undefined thing with, gearing up for a day of errands while construction noise filled the house. Life had to go on. With the dog as company, and why had she tried to convince either of them she wanted him to stay home, she drove into town. At the post office, she unloaded boxes, carted them in, found herself caught for a full ten minutes in the oddity of small-town conversation. Check one off the list, she told the dog. She drove down Water Street. Busier today, she noted. Full-blown spring didn't just bring out green and the flowers, it brought out the tourists. They wandered the streets, the shops, with go-cups and cameras and shopping bags. As she looked for parking, she saw boats gliding or putting out of slips, and the kayak bike rental, with those colorful boats displayed, doing a bang-up business. She really wanted to try kayaking. 
She found her parking spot, pulled in, turned around to the dog. You have to wait in the car. I warned you. But we can take a walk around after this stop and before the grocery store. Best I can offer. He tried to get out when she opened the back to get the box, and the tussle that ensued to deny him illustrated clearly he'd put on weight and muscle. Gone was the weak, bone-thin dog limping down the shoulder of the road. She got the back closed again, had to lean against it to catch her breath. When she glanced back, he was all but pressed against the rear window, blue eyes devastated. I can't take you into the shop. That's how it goes. She picked up the box she'd had to put down to win the war, started down the sidewalk, looked back. Now he had his muzzle out the partially opened side window. Don't let him win, she muttered, and aimed her eyes forward. She knew Jenny worked that morning as Jenny had called her the night before, had offered sympathy and comfort, had offered to bring food, bring alcohol, bring anything needed. Friendship so easily offered was as unusual for Naomi as ten minutes of small talk in the post office. She opened the door of the shop to a lovely citrus scent, an artistic clutter of pretty things, and the bustle of business. The bustle made her consider coming back during a lull, if she'd known when and if lulls happened. But Jenny, discussing an old wash basin currently filled with soaps and lotions with a customer, spotted her and gave her a cheerful come-ahead signal. So she wondered, saw half a dozen things she wanted to buy, reminded herself she hadn't come to shop, had a house in crazed construction and shouldn't shop, and ended up picking up a set of wrought iron candle stands that absolutely belonged in her library. Let me take that. The minute she could work herself over, Jenny took the box, set it down, and do this first. Smelling lightly of peaches, she wrapped her arms around Naomi, tight, tight. I'm so glad to see you. She loosened the hug enough to tip back, study Naomi's face. Are you okay? I'm okay. Xander stayed with you? He stayed. All right. We're not going to think about it right now. It's all anyone's talking about when they catch a breath, but we're not going to think about it. You're awfully busy. Tour package. Jenny took a satisfied and slightly calculating glance around the shop. We've got two busloads in town for the day. The town planner worked the deal months ago so we're very carefully not mentioning what you and I aren't thinking about in front of tourists, or trying not to mention. She bent down to pick up the box again. I want to show these to Krista. Come with me. She just went in the back, and we're covered out here for a few minutes. You're really busy, Naomi reminded her, but Jenny was already nudging her along. Jenny skirted around tables, displays, all bright chatter, and reminded Naomi of a pretty bird singing as it flitted from branch to branch. She skirted around a counter and through a door into a storeroom office area, where a woman with streaky brown hair bundled up and held in place with a pair of jeweled chopsticks sat at a computer. Track the shipment. It's out for delivery. Praise Jesus. I've got some potential stock and Naomi Carson for you, Krista. Krista swiveled on her chair and slid off a pair of purple cheaters. She had a good face, with wide brown eyes, a long, full mouth, and the glint of a tiny ruby stud on the left side of her nose. I'm so happy to meet you. Pretend there's a seat I can offer you. I really like your work, she added. I've combed your website several times and nagged Jenny to get you in here. I love your shop, which I've avoided because I'm weak. I've already picked out candle stands, and I probably can't leave without that oval wall mirror with the antiqued bronze frame. Jenny's piece. Flea market rehab, Jenny confirmed. Naomi brought us some photos. Jenny set the box on the crowded desk. I resisted pawing through myself. It's good to remember the pecking order around here. Pushing off the chair, Krista opened the box, then put the cheaters back on to take a close look. She'd gone with small prints, wildflower studies, a series of four of the inlet, one of the marina, another set of nurse logs. They're beautifully matted and framed. You do that yourself? Part of the process, yes. I can sell these. She propped a pair against the box, stepped back, nodded. Yes, we can sell these. In fact, with the tour, we can sell some of these as soon as we get them on the floor. She took off the cheaters again, tapped them against her hand, then named her price point. Standard 6040, she added. That works for me. Good, because I really want them. And I can take more, especially of local flora and fauna, 
local water scenes, town scenes. I can sell them as unframed prints, too. We can think about that. I'd love the inlet and marina shots as postcards. I can do postcards. Turning, Krista wrapped an arm around Jenny's shoulders in an easy, unstudied way that told Naomi they were good friends. She can do postcards. Do you know how long I've wanted classy postcards? Jenny grinned, slid her arm around Krista's waist. Since you opened? Since I opened. I'll take two dozen postcards right off, as soon as you can get them to me. No, three. Three dozen. I can sell a dozen to the B&B &B in a flash. A variety of shots? Dealer's choice, Krista confirmed. Jen, get these priced and out on the floor. Pick your spot. She's my right hand, she told Naomi, even if she's planning to leave me in the lurch. Not for months yet. I know just where to put these. Jenny stacked them in the box, hefted it. If you've got a few minutes, Naomi, I'll print out the contract for what we're taking. Sure. Don't leave without seeing me, Jenny said, and went out to work on the display. I'm going to do an order sheet for the postcards while I'm at it. How's work going up on the bluff? Really well, which is why I need those candle stands, the sinuous ones. They need to be in my library. I think the mirror's for the foyer, but it needs to be in there somewhere. And whatever smells so damn good out there. That's mock orange in our diffusers today. I'm told I need those, the plants. I think I need them in the diffusers, too. Tell Jenny you get one, on the house. We're going to make some money together, Naomi. She left with more than she'd taken in, justified the purchases. The house needed things, and Krista was right. They'd make some money together, no question of it, as four of the framed prints sold before Jenny rang her up. We've got work to do, Tag. She clipped the leash on him when he was too distracted with joy to object, loaded her purchases in, got her camera and backpack out. Let's take that walk and make some postcards. By the time she got home, the crew was knocking off, again proving the advantage of men in the house. The tile team carried her groceries in while Kevin grabbed her gift shop finds. I guess you saw Jenny. And it cost me. But I also now have art displayed by her hands and a contract for more. She stopped in the living room, felt the satisfaction of a day well spent kick up another notch. You finish the crown molding. It just makes the room. It's a busy day. Why don't we go up and you can see what else we finished? If you're talking about my bathroom, I may break down in tears. With a grin, he tapped her arm. Grab some tissues. She nearly needed them. You can't walk on it until tomorrow, he warned. It's okay. Actually, going in might bring me to my knees. It's beautiful, Kevin. It's beautiful work. Everything. She'd wanted muted and restful, heading toward Zen, and had it with the stone gray tiles, the soft pearly gray of the walls, the gray veining in the white granite counter. She'd added rustic with a big clawfoot tub, gone indulgent with the oversized glass-walled steam shower. The brushed nickel was the right choice, he said. Chrome would have been too shiny, and the opening shelving's going to work too, because you're a tidy soul from what I've seen. I'm going to bring some blue in, with towels, some bottles. I saw some old blue bottles at Cecil's, and some green with a plant. Maybe one of those bamboo deals. You ought to put some of your pictures on the wall, some of the ones of the channel. Brushed nickel frames, dark gray matting. Good thought. I just love it. Glad to hear it. I didn't know if you wanted your desk back in here and didn't want to move it until you said. Maybe tomorrow, when the room's fully functional. We made some progress on your studio, if you want to see that. She wanted to see everything. They spent the next ten minutes going over her choices, discussing timelines, and she began to buy a clue. Kevin, are you keeping an eye on me? Maybe. I figured Xander might be coming by shortly. And I imagine your wife and kids are home, wondering where you are. I've got time. You know, I wanted to ask you about... You're making time, she interrupted. And I appreciate the thought, but I'm fine. I have a fierce dog. Kevin glanced back to where Tag lay, studying his own thumping tail as if fascinated, while Molly snoozed beside him. Yeah, I see that. And I have a brown belt. I've got a couple of them. In karate. 
I could have gone for black, but brown was enough. And that's on top of the self-defense courses I've taken. Single woman, traveling alone, she added, though that hadn't been the primary motivator. I'll be careful not to get in a fight with you, but I'd feel better if I hung around until Xander gets here. And I did have a couple of questions about the bathroom off the green room. He distracted her with talk of tile borders and shower heads, with plans on demo, the black and blue bath, until Tag's head reared up and he raced off barking. Molly yawned, rolled over, and went back to snooze. Must be Xander. Then you're welcome to stay, have a beer with him, or get out. I wouldn't mind a beer. They walked down while Tag danced and barked at the front door. She wondered if the thing she was in with Xander had progressed to the point of giving him a key and the alarm code. It seemed a very big aspect of the thing, one to think about carefully. But when she opened the door, Tag raced out and rushed lovingly to Lilo. There's that boy. There he is. They adored each other for a moment before Lilo straightened. Hey, Kev. Hi, Naomi. I got these drawings and figures for you. The Naomi who'd bought the house would have said thanks, taken the packet, and said goodbye. The Naomi she was trying to find took a breath. Why don't you bring them in? Kevin's going to have a beer. You can have one with him. I don't say no to beer after the work day. Want a beer? He asked the dog. He's underage, Naomi said, and had Lilo laughing like a loon. She went back to the kitchen, opened two beers, then the accordion doors. I'm going for wine. Those spring chairs out there don't look like much yet, but they're comfortable. She could hear their voices, muted, quiet, as she poured wine. Curious, she opened the packet out on the counter, began to study the drawings. When she stepped out, Lilo and Kevin sat in the rusted spring chairs like a couple of guys on the deck of a boat, studying the horizon. Both dogs sat at the rail, doing the same. Lilo, you're an artist. He snickered, flushed lightly pink. Oh, well, I can draw a little. You can draw a lot. And you've turned the grounds into a garden oasis without compromising the space or the open feel. And the raised beds on the deck? That's inspired. Can I have a look? Kevin took the drawings, paged through, studied. This is nice, Lilo. It's real nice. There's a brochure in there with different pavers, different patterns. We can get you whatever you want in there. She nodded, sat down on the glider to look over the estimates. He'd done it several ways. The entire grounds and deck. Holy shit. And breaking it down section by section. And breaking it down yet again with the bartering factored. My dad did most of the figuring and math there. It's a lot of math and figuring. And would take some of her own, but... I want the raised beds on the deck. Cooking can relax me after I've worked all day. If you ditch Xander, maybe you'd marry me. I can't cook worth shit, Lilo told her. But I sure like to eat. I'll keep you in reserve. I really want the front done, just the way you've drawn it but I'm going to need another 5% off for the photographs. I can text my dad, see what he has to say. I'm thinking he'll go for that. And you can tell him if this turns out the way we all want, I should be able to do the rest in the fall, or next spring. You can't do the whole front until the dumpster's gone, but I'd love to see some of these trees and shrubs in place. Give me a sec. When Lilo pulled out his phone, the dogs leaped up and raced down the deck steps. That must be Xander. Kevin noted. Dogs are good early warning system. The dogs ran back. Molly settled, but Tag ran away, ran back, all but doing cartwheels until Xander caught up with them. Are we having a party? Apparently. Good thing I brought more beer. He came up with a six-pack he carried, setting it down long enough to grab Naomi's face and give her a kiss that went from hello to steamy in a heartbeat. Just letting them know to get their own woman. Do you want me to top that off? She looked down, a little blankly, at her wine. No, it's good. Another round? He asked Kevin. No, one's enough. He glanced at Lilo, who wandered the deck as he talked on the phone and held up his three-quarters full beer. Just me, then. Xander took the six-pack inside, came back out with a cold one. What's all this? My landscape. You didn't tell me Lilo was an artist. He's got a knack. After he sat and blew out a cleansing breath, Xander took the first pull. Long day, 
Naomi asked. And then some. Finish now. Milo wandered back. We can start next week. Next week? My dad's going to want to come take a look for himself. Mostly to meet you, that's the truth. He likes knowing who he's working for. But we can start next week. Probably Tuesday. He's fine with the 5% more. Lilo held out a hand. We have to shake on it. I'd rather kiss you, but Xander'd pitch me over the deck. I'd knock you unconscious first, so it wouldn't hurt so much. That's a friend. Lilo sat again, scrubbed Tag's head, then Molly's. You're going to have to teach him not to dig in your beds or lift his leg on the shrubs. God, I never thought of that. He's a good dog. He'll learn. Naomi sipped her wine. They were subtle about it. They'd known each other so long, these men. But she caught the signals passing back and forth. Like Xander, she let out a breath. Why don't we talk about the elephant on the deck? I'm not the tender sort and don't need to be shielded. I don't like it either. So has there been anything more about Marla's murder? Lilo looked down at the beer he dangled between his legs and said nothing. They did the autopsy, Xander said. And there's some talk leaking out. It could be just talk. What could be just talk? That she'd been raped. Probably multiple times. Choked multiple times. Cut up a little. Beat on more than a little. I don't get how somebody could do that to somebody else, Lilo murmured. I just don't. They're saying she wasn't killed down below here, just dumped here that way. I heard Chip about went crazy. He loved her, Kevin said. He always did. It couldn't have been anybody from the Cove, Lilo put in. We'd know if somebody who could do that lived right here. No, Naomi thought. You don't always know what lives with you. She lost herself in work. She rarely worked on an agenda other than her own and found it interesting to create photos with Krista's specific wants in mind. When she talked to or emailed her family, she said nothing of murder. She didn't give Xander a key, nor did he ask for one, but she thought about it. Though it brought on a massive stress headache, she attended Marla's funeral. She sat through the short service with Xander, with Kevin and Jenny flanking her other side. It seemed to her nearly everyone in town had come, wearing sober faces, paying respects to Marla's mother, to Chip. The church smelled too strongly of lilies, the pink ones draped over the glossy coffin, the pink and white ones rising in sprays from tall baskets. She hadn't been inside a church in more than a decade. They reminded her of her childhood of Sunday dresses stiff with starch, of Wednesday night Bible readings, of her father, standing at a lectern, reciting scripture in his deep voice, so much sincerity on his face as he spoke of God's will, of God's love, of following a righteous path. Being inside one now, the sun streaming through the stained glass, the lilies clogging the air, the reverend reading all too familiar passages, she wished she'd stayed away. She hadn't known Marla, had only had a difficult encounter with her. But she'd found her, so she'd made herself come. Relief came like a sharp wind through musty memories when she stepped outside into the clear, uncolored sunlight, the clean, unscented air. Xander steered her away from where most gathered to talk before the drive to the cemetery. You went pale. It was so close in there, that's all and too many who'd come snuck glances at her, at the woman who'd found the body. I need to go to the cemetery, he told her. You don't. I don't think I will. It feels too much like gawking when I didn't know her. I'll drive you back, drop you off. I should have brought my own car. I wasn't thinking. It's not much of a detour, he began, then turned as Chip walked up. The picture of grief, Naomi thought, Red-rimmed, dazed eyes, pale skin bruised under those dazed eyes from lack of sleep, a big man with a hollow look. Chip. Sorry, man. They exchanged the one-armed hugs men seemed to prefer before Chip looked at Naomi. Miss Carson. Naomi, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You found her. The chief said the way they'd... 
how they'd left her. It might have been a while before anybody did. But you found her, so they could bring her back, take care of her. Tears leaked out of those dazed eyes as he took her hand between his massive ones. Thank you. Habitually, she avoided touching strangers, getting too close, but compassion overwhelmed her. She drew him to her, held him a moment. No. Killers didn't think of this. Or did they? She wondered. Did pain and grief add to the thrill? Did it season it like salt? As he drew back, Chip knuckled tears away. The Reverend said how Marla's gone to a better place. Chip shook his head. But this is a good place. It's a good place. She shouldn't have to go to a better one. He swallowed hard. Are you coming to the gravesite? I am. I'm taking Naomi home. Then I'll be there. Thank you for coming, Naomi. Thank you for finding her. As he walked off, like a man lost, Naomi turned away. Oh, God, Sander. And she wept for a woman she hadn't known. 20. As most of the crew had known Marla, Naomi came home to a relatively quiet house. The noise centered, for now, in what would be her studio, and came in the form of country music and a nail gun. Still, when she tried to work, she couldn't settle. Whatever images she brought onto her screen, she ended up seeing shattered eyes, Instead, she took the dog and her camera out front. She'd get those before pictures for Lilo, as simple and routine a task as she could devise. She'd make copies for herself, she thought, maybe put together a book on the evolution of the house. She could keep it in the library, revisit the process, when it would have the charm of distance. When the dog dropped one of his balls at her feet, she decided to embrace another distraction. She tossed it, watched him joyfully chase after it. The third time he returned... He spat it out, his ears pricked up, and his gaze shifted with a low, warning growl seconds before she heard the sound of a car. Must be the crew coming. Talk about distractions. But she saw the chief of police's cruiser come up the rise. Everything in her tensed, balled up in tight, cold fists. She'd seen him at the funeral. If there'd been any progress on the investigation, the odds were high she'd have heard something there. In any case... Her finding the body didn't mean he'd feel obligated to tell her anything directly. There was only one reason he'd come to see her. To help calm herself, Naomi laid a hand on Tag's head. It's okay. I've been expecting him. They started across the bumpy, patchy grass as Sam got out of the cruiser. The Kobe brothers, he said, nodded toward the truck. Yes, Wade and Bob are upstairs working. The rest of the crew went to the funeral. I just left the cemetery myself. I wanted to have a private word with you before the rest of Kevin's crew got back. All right. Her stomach in knots, she turned toward the house. I don't have a lot of seating yet, but it's nice on the deck, off the kitchen. I heard you hired the Lilos to do some landscaping. They plan to start on Tuesday. You're making real progress, he commented as they stepped inside. She only nodded continued back. Progress, she thought. But for what? She should never have let herself fall in love with the house, with the area. She should never have allowed herself to become so involved with the man. This is a hell of a nice kitchen. Hat tipped back, Sam stood, at ease, looking around. And a view that doesn't quit. When she opened the accordion doors, he shook his head. Doesn't that beat all? Did you come up with this, or did Kevin? Kevin. They fold right back out of the way. Just open it all up. You couldn't have a prettier situation here. She took one of the spring chairs while Tag poked his nose to Sam's knee. I saw you at the service, Sam began. It was good of you to go. I know you didn't know her, and what you did know wasn't especially friendly. I'm sorry for what happened to her. We all are. He shifted, turning from the view so his gaze met hers. I wouldn't be doing my job, Naomi, if I hadn't gotten some background on the person who found her body. No, 
I should have told you myself. I didn't. I wanted to believe you wouldn't look, and no one would know. Is that why you changed your name? It's my mother's maiden name, my uncle's name. He raised us after... They took us in, my mother, my brother, and me, after my father was arrested. You were instrumental in that arrest? Yes. That's about as hard on a young girl as anything could be. I'm not going to ask you about that, Naomi. I know the case, and if I want to know more, it's easy enough. I'm going to ask you if you're in contact with your father. No, I haven't spoken or communicated with him since that night. You never went to see him? No. My mother did, and ended up swallowing a bottle of pills. She loved him, or he had a hold over her. Maybe it's the same thing. Has he tried to contact you? No. For a moment, Sam said nothing. I'm sorry to add to things, but it must have struck you. The similarities, the binding, the wounds, what was done to her, the way she was killed. Yes, but he's in prison, on the other side of the country. And the terrible reality is, others rape and kill and torture. Others do what he did. That's true. But I'm here, and I found her. Like I found Ashley. Only I found Ashley in time. I'm here, and Marla was raped and killed and tortured, the way my father liked to rape and kill and torture. So you have to look at me. Even if I did, I know you didn't take her, or hold her for two days, and do what was done to her. Even if I did, you were with Xander at times you'd have needed to be with her. I've known Xander all his life, and sure as hell don't believe he'd be party to something like this. I don't believe you would either. She should be grateful for that. She should be relieved. Yet she couldn't find the energy for either. But you wondered. When you found out who I was, you had to wonder. Others will, too. And some of them will think, well, blood tells. It's blood that ties us together, makes us who we are. Her father's a psychopath. What does that make her? I won't tell you I didn't wonder. That's part of my job. I wondered for about ten seconds, because I'm small town. That's a fact. But I'm good at my job. I came here to ask you if you're in contact with your father or if he's in contact with you, on the slim possibility what happened here is connected. He didn't even look at me. That morning, in the police station back in West Virginia, when they brought him in, she could still see it, in minute and perfect detail, down to the sun hitting the water in the water fountain, the dust motes in the air. I came out of the room where they had me waiting, I just came out for a minute, and they were bringing him in, in handcuffs. And he looked right through me, like I wasn't there. I think I was never there for him. Not really. You've moved around a lot in the last few years. I made it part of my job. Our uncles shielded us as much as they could, from the press, the talk, the stares the anger. They uprooted their lives for us. But the shield didn't always hold. Every few years, he bargained something, some privilege, something, for the location of another body. It brings it all back. The stories on TV, online, the talk. My brother says it's what he wants, more than whatever privilege he's thought up. And I believe that, too. Moving around means you're not in one place long enough for anyone to notice you. Or not very much. You bought this house. I thought I could get away with it. I just fell for it and convinced myself that I could have this. A real home. A quiet place. And no one would ever know. If I'd walked another way that day. If someone else had found Marla. Maybe. Maybe. But I didn't walk another way. I've got no reason to tell anyone about this. 
When she turned her head to meet his eyes again, Sam gave her hand a pat. It's yours to tell or not. She wanted relief, but couldn't feel it. Couldn't feel. Thank you. It's not a favor. I got background. That was an official act. I don't go around gossiping on people's private business. I needed to ask you the questions I did. Now we can put it away. I... I just want to find out if I can live here. I want time to try. It seems to me you're already living here. And doing it well. I'm going to say something personal now. And then I'm going to go. Get back to town. It's clear to me now you haven't told Xander any of this. Sam pushed to his feet. I'm going to say to you, on a personal level, you're doing him and yourself a disservice. But it's your story to tell. Or not. Take care of yourself, Naomi. He walked down the deck steps, left her sitting there staring out at the water, at the white sails of clouds above it, wondering if she'd ever feel again. Like twin storms, grief and gossip rumbled through the cemetery and left Xander with a low-grade headache. He slipped away as soon as possible, switched the radio off for the drive back to town. He could do with some quiet. He had enough work, including what he'd postponed that morning to keep him fully occupied. He stopped into parts and sales, got a ginger ale from the machine, picked up some parts, then headed over to the garage. After a check of his worksheet, he opted to take the easy first, ease his way into the delayed workday. Before he walked out to drive the Mini Cooper into the bay for its diagnostic, he swung by to see the progress in the body shop. He considered himself better than good at bodywork, but Pete was a freaking artist. The wrecked escort would look showroom fine when Pete finished the job. Back from the funeral? Yeah. Frowning, Pete adjusted his safety goggles. Can't stand funerals. I don't think anybody likes them. Some do. Pete nodded wisely. Some people are fucked up and get off on them. They hunt them up and go, even when they don't know who's dead. It takes all kinds, Xander said, and left Pete to his work. Once he'd finished with the mini, keyed in the worksheet on the shop computer and sent it to sales, he broke long enough to go up to his apartment, make a sandwich with the slim pickings he had available. With the mini in the pickup area, he moved on to the next on his sheet. He put in a solid four hours more, ditched the headache, picked up his stiff neck. Since he told Naomi he'd bring dinner, he called in an order for baked spaghetti before going about the business of closing up. He'd just started to his bike when Maxie from Ronaldo's pulled in with her flat rear tire bumping. Oh, Xander, please. She actually gripped her hands together as if in prayer as she jumped out of the car. I know you're closed, but please, something's wrong with my car. It just started making this noise, and I could hardly steer it. You've got a flat, Maxie. I do? She turned, looked where he pointed. How did that happen? It didn't, like, blow or anything. It just started thumping. I thought it was the engine or something. After raking her hand through her purple-streaked blonde hair, she sent him a sheepish smile. Can you change it? He squatted down. Maxie, this tire's bald as your grandfather. Plus, you trashed it by driving on it. I have to get a new one? Can you change it for now? Put the spare on? You don't have a spare. You've got a donut. Emergency tire. And you can't drive around on that. He circled the compact, shook his head. Your tires lost any excuse for tread about 10,000 miles ago. Her mouth dropped open. Her eyes went to shocked moons. I need four new tires. That's a fact. Crap. Crap, crap. There goes the money I've been saving for a shopping weekend in Seattle with Lisa. And now I'm going to be late for work. She tried a quick flirt. Can you just, you know, patch the flat one just for now and... <sighs> one more crap, she muttered as he just stared her down. You've got my father's look on your face. That stung a little, as he only had about a dozen years on her, but he didn't relent. You could have a blowout, end up wrecked. 
I'll make you the best deal I can, but you've got to replace these. I can have them on for you tomorrow, before noon, and I can run you over to work. I've got a couple of takeouts waiting anyway. Can you get a ride home? Resigned, Maxie blew out of breath. I can just walk over to Lisa's, stay there tonight. Risking being compared to her father again, Xander shook his head. No walking alone after closing. Not right now. Everybody thinks whoever killed Marla is long gone. Just some horrible pervert passing through. I'll make you a deal. You get the tires at my cost, and you make this deal with me. No walking alone after closing. All right, all right. I'll get my dad to pick me up. When Xander narrowed his eyes on her face, she rolled hers. I promise. She swiped a finger over her heart. Okay. He got the spare helmet, handed it to her. You break the deal, I charge you double for the tires. Oh, Xander. But she laughed and got on the bike behind him. A deal's a deal, and at least I get a cool ride to work out of it. By the time he got to the big house, all he wanted was to sit out on the deck with Naomi, maybe have a beer, and let the entire day shed like dead skin. By the time he'd unstrapped the takeout, Tag had raced around from the back of the house to greet him as though he'd been off to war. Appreciating the welcome, he held the food up out of reach with one hand, gave the dog a rub with the other, and when the tennis ball landed at his feet, he gave it a good boot to send Tag joyfully after it. He noted that Naomi's car sat alone and wondered why Kevin hadn't waited. Even with the delay, he'd expected Kevin to hang tight until he got there. He walked around the back, stopping long enough to give the ball another kick. She sat on the deck alone, working on her tablet, with a glass of wine on the little table beside the glider. Got hung up, he said. She only nodded, kept doing whatever she was doing. I'm going to grab a beer, put this in the oven on low. That's fine. He didn't consider himself particularly sensitive to moods. At least, he'd been told by annoyed women he lacked that insight. But he knew when something was off. In his experience, the best way to handle things when something was off, and you didn't know what, was to just keep going until whatever was off popped out. Sometimes, if luck held, it just went away. He came back with his beer, sat beside her, shot out his legs. And Jesus, didn't that feel good? Where's Kev? At home with his wife and kids, I imagine. I figured he'd hang out until I got here. I insisted he go home. I don't need a bodyguard. It didn't take Mr. Sensitivity to recognize a bitchy mood when it snapped its teeth at him. He took a pull on his beer, let it ride. The silence lasted maybe 20 seconds. I don't like the two of you arranging shifts. I'm not an idiot, and I'm not incapable. I never thought of you as either one. Then stop hovering, and stop asking Kevin to hover. It's not only insulting, it's annoying. Looks like you'll have to be insulted and annoyed. You can't decide for me. Marla's body, about 35 feet straight down from where you're sitting, says I can. No one dictates to me, and if you think sleeping with me gives you that right, you're very wrong. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the dog slink down the steps, looking, Xander imagined, for a safe spot out of the line of fire. That's bullshit. It's even weak bullshit. You can either tell me what crawled up your ass since this morning or not, but I know when somebody's looking to pick a fight. I'm not in the mood for one, but that can change. You're crowding me. It's as simple as that. She pushed off the glider, picked up her wine, set down the tablet. I bought this place because I like being alone, and now I never am. She took a long drink from the glass, which he'd bet a week's profits wasn't her first of the evening. Yeah, that could change. If you're trying to give me the boot, then be straight about it. I need some space. And cliches like that are more weak bullshit. You can do better. I shouldn't have started this thing with you. And it's moved too fast, gotten too complicated. Anger, and something he couldn't quite pin down, spiked into her voice. I'm tired of feeling surrounded and boxed in. And it just needs to stop. Just stop. You, the house, the yard. God, the dog, it's all too much. It's all a mistake, and it needs to stop. He wanted to push back, and hard, because, Jesus, she'd hurt him. 
He hadn't expected the punch or just how completely it flattened him. Complicated? She had that right. Complications twisted up inside him he hadn't known existed. But she was shaking, and her breath came just a little too fast. She was working herself up to another panic attack, and he'd damn well know why. You want me gone? I'll go. I'll take the damn dog if that's how you want it. I don't force myself on anyone. But give me the truth. I just did. This is a mistake. All of this. And I need to correct it. By dumping me? The dog? This house? What you've started making here? That's not what you want. You don't know what I want. She hurled the words at him, along with a fear-tinted rage. You don't know me. I damn well do. You don't. That's the bullshit. You don't know me, who I am, or what I am. You know weeks, the weeks I've been here. You don't know anything from before. You don't know me. It struck him then, clear as glass, that unidentified something under it all, the base of the anger and fear. It was grief. Yes, I do. He set the beer aside, rose. I know who you are, where you came from, what you went through and what you're trying to make now, away from it. She shook her head, took a step in retreat. You can't. He saw her lips tremble before she pressed them together, saw tears glitter before she forced them back. Chief Winston told you. Now he had the match on the fuse. No, I haven't talked to him, haven't seen him since the cemetery. But you have. He didn't tell me anything. You did. She crossed her arm over her body, gripped her own shoulder with her hand as if shielding herself. Not from him, he thought. God damn it, not from him. I never told you anything about this. You didn't have to. He pushed down his own anger. He'd let it fly later, but for now, for right now, he spoke matter-of-factly. The day up in my place, that first time, you saw the book on my shelf. The Simon Vance book. You look like somebody kicked you in the gut. It didn't take too much to figure it out from there. There are photos in the book. You were about 11 or 12, I guess. Just a kid. You changed your hair, grown up. But you have the same eyes, the same look about you. And Naomi. It's not an everyday name. You knew. The knuckles of her hand went white as bone. I can wish the book hadn't been there to put that look on your face. But it was. You? You've told Kevin? No. The doubt in her eyes came so clear he waited a beat, kept his gaze level on hers. No, he said again. Womb to tomb doesn't mean I tell him what you don't want told. You haven't told him, she repeated, and her fingers loosened on her shoulder, her hand slid down. You've known all this time. Known since before we... Why haven't you said anything to me? Asked me. I didn't know. So the book was there. But once I knew, I wasn't going to put that look on your face again. And okay, I hoped you'd tell me before I had to shove it in your face like this. But you pushed the buttons. You didn't. Rubbing the heel of her hand between her brows, she turned away. You didn't shove it in my face. Others have, so I know exactly what it feels like. I don't know what this feels like. She set the wine on the rail, pressed her fingers to her eyes. I need a minute. If you need to yell, I can handle it. If you need to cry, I can handle it. Yelling's preferred. I'm not going to yell. Or cry. I think most people would do some of both. You're not most people. I'm aware of that. Shut up. The ripe temper shocked her enough to make her turn back. Just shut the hell up. Now he let some of that anger fly. Are you fucking stupid? Maybe I don't know you, because I pegged you as smart. Really smart. But maybe you're stupid enough to believe, because you share DNA with a psychotic bastard... You're made wrong. He's a monster. He's my father. My father doesn't know a carburetor from a brake pad, owns two sets of golf clubs, and likes easy listening. 
That's not the same at all. Why not? Why the hell not? We have blood ties. He raised me, mostly, and we're as different as they come. He reads like one book a year, as long as it's a bestseller. We baffle each other every time we spend more than an hour together. It's not. What about your brother? He threw her off her stride, just as he'd intended. I... What about Mason? What kind of man is he? He's... Great. He's smart. Actually, he's brilliant. And dedicated. Kind. So he can be what he is, with the same gene pool. But you're what? Tainted? No. No, I know better. Intellectually, I know better. But yes, sometimes it feels that way. Get over it. She stared at him. Get over it. Yeah, get over it. Move on. Your father's as fucked up as it gets. That doesn't mean you have to be. My father is the most notorious serial killer of this century. It's a young century yet, he said with a shrug and had her staring again. God, I don't understand you. Understand this, then. It's insulting and annoying, remember that, for you to think I'd feel differently about you because your father's Thomas David Bowes, that I'd act differently because 17 years ago you saved a life, no doubt saved a lot of lives. And if this whole fucked up bullshit is the reason you're trying to kick me to the curb, you're out of luck. I don't kick that easy. I don't know what to say to you now. If you want me gone, don't use bows as the lever to pry me loose. I need to sit down. She sat on the glider. Obviously deciding she needed it, the dog picked his way back, laid his head on her knee. I didn't mean it, she murmured, and stroked the dog. I didn't mean it about the dog, or the house. I didn't mean it about you. I told myself I should mean it. It would be better all around if I could mean it. It's easier to keep moving than to root, Xander, for someone like me. I don't think so. I think that's something else you've told yourself until you mostly believe it. If you believed it all the way through, you wouldn't have bought this place. You wouldn't bring it back to life. You sure as hell wouldn't have taken on that dog, no matter how I worked you on it. He crossed over sat beside her again. You'd have slept with me. I saw that the first time you came into the bar. Oh, really? Not yet settled, but getting there, he picked up his beer again. I've got a sense about when a woman's going to be willing. But if you believed all that crap all the way through, this wouldn't have turned into a thing. It wasn't supposed to. A lot of good things happen by accident. If Charles Goodyear hadn't been clumsy, we wouldn't have vulcanized rubber. What? Weatherproof rubber. Tires, for instance, as in Goodyear. He was trying to figure out how to make rubber weatherproof, dropped this experiment on a stove by accident, and there you go. He made weatherproof rubber. Baffled, she rubbed her aching temple. I've completely lost the point. Not everything has to be planned to work out. Maybe we both figured we'd bang it out a few times and move on but we didn't. And it's working out all right. The sound of her own laughter surprised her. Wow, Xander, my heart's fluttering from that romantic description. It's like a sonnet. Yeah, he realized. He was settling again. You want romance? I could bring you flowers. I don't have anything to put them in, she sighed. I don't need romance, and I don't know what I'd do with it. I like knowing my feet are solid on the ground, and they haven't been, not consistently, since I saw this house. Today, the funeral. It hit so hard, because it reminded me again of all the people my father hurt. Not just the women he killed, but the people who loved them. I'd have been sorry you found her no matter what. But I was a hell of a lot sorrier, knowing what it would bring back. Have you talked to your brother, your uncles, about it? No. No, why bring it back for them? I wasn't going to talk to anyone about it. Not about what it brought back. It's yours to tell, or not. You'd find good friends in Kevin and Jenny. Not trusting that? It's a disservice to them and to you.
That's what Chief Winston said to me, about telling you. That same word, disservice. Do you want to tell me what else he said? I knew, as soon as he drove up. She closed her eyes, let herself feel the dog at her feet, the man beside her. The world just fell out from under me, just dropped away. I'd expected it. He'd do a background run on me because I found the body. But the world dropped away. He was straightforward, and he was kind. He said he wouldn't tell anyone else, that he hadn't and wouldn't. I've never been around anyone but family who knew, or if it came out, I left before things changed. Left before you knew if they'd change or not? Maybe that's true. But I've been through those changes, and they're awful. They steal everything, she said quietly, and crush you. I'm sitting here having a beer, like I'd hoped to do since I closed the garage. There's a hot meal keeping warm in the oven, a nice sunset right out there. Nothing changed or needs to. You'll get used to it. Nothing needed to change. Could that be true? Was it really possible? Maybe we can just sit here for a while longer, until I get used to it. That works for me. Hours later, when all but the bars shut down for the night, and the streets in town went quiet, with pools of light from street lamps shimmering against the dark, he watched and waited. He'd taken the time to study the routine along the main street, with its shops and restaurants, to study the women who closed up those shops or walked home from their job as line cook or waitress. He had his mind on the pretty young blonde, but he wouldn't be picky. At least three young ones worked the late shift of the pizzeria. He'd take his pick, but the pretty young blonde, she was top choice. He'd left the camper at the campground a good 12 miles away, all legally set up, and if they only knew what he'd done inside that home away from home, just the idea made him want to chuckle. But the excitement grew, a hot ball in the belly, when the rear door of the restaurant opened, the hot little blonde, just as he'd hoped, and all alone. He slipped out of the car, on the dark edge of the lot, with the rag he'd soaked with chloroform held down at his side. He liked using chloroform, going old school. It put them out. No muss, no fuss, even if it tended to make them a little sick. It just added to the process. She walked along, firm young tits bouncing some, tight young ass swaying. He glanced back toward the restaurant, making sure no one else came out, started to make his move. And headlights sliced over the lot, had him jumping back into the shadows. The little blonde waited for the car to turn toward her, then opened the passenger door. Thanks, Dad. No problem, honey. He wanted to kick something, beat something, when his desire drove off, left him yearning and hot. Tears actually gathered in the corners of his eyes. Then the door opened again. Two more came out. He saw them in the light above the door, heard their voices, their laughter as they talked. Then one of the boys came out. He and the younger of the women linked hands, strolled off together. The young girl turned around, walked backward. Have fun tomorrow. Drive safe. The lone woman started across the lot. Not young like the others. Not so pretty. Not blonde like his desire. But she'd do. She'd do well enough. She hummed to herself as she opened her purse to dig out her key. All he had to do, really, all he had to do was step up behind her. He deliberately gave her that instant to feel fear, to have her heart jump as she turned her head. Then he covered her face with a cloth, gripped her around the waist while she struggled, while her muffled screams pushed hot against his hand, as she went so quickly, almost too quickly, limp. He had her in the back of the car, wrists and ankles wrapped in duct tape, more tape over her mouth, a blanket over her, within twenty seconds. He drove out of the lot, through town, careful to keep to the posted speed, to use his turn signals. He didn't even turn on the radio until he passed the town limits. He opened the windows to cool his hot cheeks, flicked a glance in the rear view at the shape under the blanket. We're going to have some fun now. We're going to have one hell of a good time. Focus. 
The spectator oft-times sees more than the gamester. James Howell 21. By the time Sunday morning rolled around, all Xander wanted in this world was to sleep until the sun came up. Three road service calls Friday night had pulled him away from practice for a Saturday night gig and dragged him out of bed, twice. They'd rocked the bar in Union. Good exposure, good times, good pay. But he hadn't flopped into Naomi's bed until two in the morning. He met Tag's 5 a.m. wake-up call with a snarl. I've got it, Naomi told him. With a grunt of assent, Xander dropped back to sleep. Mildly disoriented, he woke, alone, three hours later. He thought, Naomi, and scrubbed his hands over his face. Christ, he needed a shave. Not his favorite sport. Then he remembered it was Sunday and didn't see why anybody had to shave on Sunday. The sun shined through the glass doors. Through them, he could see the blue lines of water, the quiet spread of it beyond the inlet. A couple of boats, early risers, plied the blue. He wasn't a fan of boats any more than he was of shaving, but he appreciated the look of them. But at the moment, he'd appreciate coffee a hell of a lot more. He got up, pulled on his jeans, saw a T-shirt he'd left there at some point neatly folded on the dresser. Grateful he didn't have to wear the shirt he'd sweated through the night before, he pulled it over his head and discovered that whatever she washed stuff in smelled better than whatever he washed stuff in. He'd had to tap Kevin and Jenny for the favor, then persuade Naomi to drive with them to Union for a couple of hours. He'd liked seeing her there, and more, he'd liked knowing Kevin would make sure she got home, got in the house, locked up safe until he made it back. She'd given him a key and the alarm code, though he wasn't sure if it had been for the single night or what. He didn't think she was sure either. The arrangement would be easier if he could leave a few essentials at her place. He wasn't sure of his ground here. Brand new territory. He'd never lived, even half-lived with a woman before. He'd been careful not to. His space might not have been as big as Naomi's, but he liked his space all the same. Yet here he was, getting out of her bed again, wearing a shirt she'd washed, and thinking about hitting her up for coffee. This thing between them had a lot of moving parts, and he'd yet to figure out how they all fit. But he would, he told himself, as he walked out to find her. And coffee. He always figured out how things fit. He heard her voice, pitched low, so he changed directions from the pursuit of coffee and walked to her temporary workspace. She had the windows wide open, and the dog sprawled under her makeshift work table. The sun flooded her hair, turned it into a hundred shades of gold and bronze and caramel as she used a long tool to cut some mat board while she muttered to herself. Nearby, a big slick printer hummed while it slid a poster-sized print into a tray. It took him a minute to realize the poster-sized print was of his hands holding the Austin book. He saw himself again, already framed and matted and tipped against the wall, the shot she'd taken in the early morning with a sunrise at his back and his eyes on her. She had other poster prints, his book wall, his hands again, sunrise over the inlet, clipped to the arms of some sort of stand and a stack of smaller prints in a tray. The dog's tail thumped good morning, and since hope sprang eternal in tag, he uncurled himself and brought Xander a ball. Distracted, Xander laid a hand on the dog's head and just looked at Naomi. Immersed in her work, immersed in sunlight, slim hands competent with her tools, dark green eyes focused on her art, that long, slim body in a pale blue shirt and khaki pants that stopped above her ankles her feet bare. So this was what it was. This was how it fit. How his half fit, anyway, he thought. It fit, all those moving parts, because he was in love with her. Shouldn't the universe have given him a heads up on that? He needed a little time, needed to adjust, regroup, needed to... Then she glanced over, and her eyes met his. It blew through him, that storm of feeling, all but took his breath. For an instant, he wondered how people lived this way, how they could carry so much for someone else inside them. He crossed to her, yanked her up to her toes, and took her mouth like a man starving. This. Her. His life would never be just what it had been, as of that moment, and he would never be only what he'd been. Love changed everything. 
Thrown off balance, she gripped his shoulders. He made her head spin, her heart race, her knees weak. Overcome, she held on, rode the hot, fast wave with him. When he eased back, she laid her hands on his cheeks, let out a long breath. Wow, and good morning. He rested his forehead to hers a moment, while tenderness twined with heat. Are you all right? she asked him. No, he thought. He might not come down to all right again for years. You should always wear sunlight, he told her. It looks good on you. I think you should always sleep in. No one in the actual world considers eight on a Sunday morning sleeping in. To give himself a moment to settle, Xander turned to the prince. You've been busy. I've got orders. The gallery, the internet, Krista. So you were right about the hands. Oh, yeah. Many hits on my website, and a nice bunch of orders for downloads and prints and posters on that and the book wall. I have to order more supplies. He looked around at boxes and stacks. More. More. I can't set up in here as efficiently as I will when they have my studio done. I might break my one rule and nag Kevin on that. But for now, I can make do. You got in late, she added, and took the finished poster print out of the tray. Yeah, I got here around two, I guess. Woke the dog up. I heard him. And you. Sorry. No, it's reassuring that he barks and runs down like he'd rip an intruder to shreds. Though I suspect he'd run the other way if it was someone he didn't know. You all sounded good last night. Yeah, we had it down. She clipped the poster in place, moved over to her tray. What do you think of these? He started to tell her he'd look after coffee, as the need for it reared up strong. But he saw the print of the band, one with the tools, the broken windshield. Taking the stack, he paged through. Jesus, Naomi, these are great. Really great. Dave keeps saying how he can't decide what to use, which for what. On and on until you want to punch him. That's why I printed some out. You've all seen them on the computer, but sometimes prints help the choice. I don't think so. They're all great. You did some black and white. Moody, right? As if checking for herself, she looked over his shoulder. A little dangerous. You should all pick one for yourselves. I'll frame them for you. And you should pick one to go and lose. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, this black and white for Luz, because it fits the atmosphere better. I agree. Dave's going to develop a nervous tick trying to decide. He set the prints back in the tray. I need coffee. Go ahead. I've got a couple things to finish up, then I'll be down. You could let the dog out, she added. It's too nice a day for him to be inside. For anybody. We could take a drive along 101, GTO or bike, your choice. If we did that, took the convertible, I could take some equipment. And the dog. We'll go by my place and pick it up. Even as Xander started out, Tag raced ahead of him. He'd take the day off, from work, from shaving, from thinking about what to do, or not, about being in love. He knew people who fell in and out of love more regularly than they came in for an oil change, but he wasn't one of them. He'd fallen into his share of lust even into serious like. But this ground just shifted under my feet feeling a whole new experience. He just let it all sit for a while, he decided. Make sure it wasn't some sort of momentary aberration. Halfway down the steps, Tag let out a low growl and bulleted the rest of the way to the door. He snapped out two sharp barks, then looked back at Xander as if to say, well, let's take care of this. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Why didn't I go for coffee from the jump? Xander opened the door, saw the black Chevy Suburban pull up beside Naomi's car, and walked out as a tall man with light brown hair stepped out. He wore sunglasses, a dark suit and tie, and a nebulous official air that said cop to Xander. Not a local badge, but some sort of badge. And it pissed him off that Naomi would have her Sunday spoiled by more questions about Marla. The man looked at the dog who stood by Xander's side, then at Xander. Who the hell are you? You're the one who drove up here, Xander countered just as abruptly. So I get to ask you who the hell you are. Special Agent Mason Carson, FBI. Mason took out his credentials, held them up, and wasn't subtle about the hand that flipped back the suit jacket to rest on the butt of his service weapon. Now who the hell are you? 
It's all right. Xander set his own hand on Tag's head. He's okay. Xander Keaton. The sunglasses might have blocked Mason's eyes, but Xander knew they narrowed and assessed. The mechanic. That's right. Naomi's in the house, upstairs finishing up some work. I'd appreciate it if you took your hand off your gun. I haven't had coffee yet, and it's starting to piss me off. Since Tag sidled over to sniff at Mason's FBI shoes, Mason gave his head a rub. Do you usually have coffee here? It's gotten to be a habit. If that pisses you off, it has to wait until after coffee. I wouldn't mind coffee. Tag raced off, raced back, ball in his mouth, dropped it at Mason's feet. And when Mason smiled, Xander saw Naomi. She didn't smile all the way often enough, in his opinion, but when she did, she shared the same slow build to blinding with her brother. She's going to be really glad to see you. Xander waited for Mason, who wasn't so official he couldn't throw a ball for a dog, then started back into the house. If we drive north, Naomi began as she came downstairs, I could get some... Mason. Oh, God, Mason! She flew. Mason caught her, swung her around, then swung her around again. That, Xander thought, was a connection, a bond, a love that went as deep as they ever get. She laughed, and he heard the tears in it, saw them sparkle in the jubilant sunlight that pumped through the open door. What are you doing here? Why didn't you tell me you were coming? You're wearing a suit. You look so... Oh, oh, I missed you. I missed you too. Beaming right back, Mason held her a few inches away. You have a house and a dog. Crazy, isn't it? It's a hell of a house. Great dog. And you've got... A mechanic. Uh, oh, she laughed, gave Mason another squeeze. Xander, this is my brother, Mason. Yeah, we met outside. I'm going for coffee. I'll get it. I'll show you the house, she said to Mason. We'll start with the kitchen. Right now, it's the best part. It's a big house. With plenty of room for you and Seth and Harry to visit. And I've talked Graham and Pop into coming out, at least by the fall. Your rooms aren't finished yet, but we'll figure something out. How long can you stay? Hmm. Have you eaten? Had a bagel on the ferry. We can do better than that. The ferry? Where'd you come from? I thought you were in New York. He made another noncommittal sound, one that put Xander on alert. It didn't bump against Naomi's delight. Not yet. And Xander changed his mind about getting a coffee to go and leaving the siblings to themselves for a while. He'd stick around. I set up a FaceTime with the uncles for later today. They didn't say a thing about you being out here. I had to come to Seattle. Mason stopped, looked over the kitchen space, out to the view. Wow. Gnome, this is amazing. I really love it. Xander, maybe you could take Mason out on the deck. I'll bring coffee. Sure. Sweet, was Mason's opinion when Xander opened the accordion doors. Yeah, this would grab her. The first time she saw the ocean, she fell for it. I always expected her to end up on the East Coast, but, yeah, she'd fall for this. How long have you been sleeping with my sister? That's a conversation you should have with her first. Then we can have one. No problem. The quick one we should have now, before she comes out, is why you're here. Because it's not just a surprise visit to your sister. You've got business here. She doesn't see it, Xander added because she only sees you. I have a meeting with your chief of police in about an hour. If you've come to talk to him about Marla, is that FBI or the brother who's FBI? My supervisor signed off on it. You knew her, Marla Roth? Yeah. Do you know Donna Lanier? A cold blade sliced into Xander's belly. Yeah. What happened to her? I don't know yet, but anything has. I'd appreciate it if you'd let me get to this with Naomi in my own time. She came out with three white mugs on a tray. How about waffles? I bought a waffle iron, she told Xander. We can have an early Sunday brunch and toast the uncles. No champagne, but I've got OJ. Coffee works for now. Relax. Smoothly, Mason put an arm around her shoulder, rubbed the top of her arm. You must have taken a million pictures right from this spot. It might be two million, and the town's a charmer, We'll have to take you through it. We could rent kayaks. I've been dying to. 
Sander, why haven't we rented kayaks? Why would I want to sit in a hole in a boat with a paddle? It's a whole new perspective. I like this one fine. For those who prefer land, there's plenty of hiking. You didn't say how long you can stay. I'm not sure yet. Seth and Harry are coming out. What? When? Today? No, geez, not today. Amused, Mason sipped his coffee. They're probably going to spring it on you when you call later. A couple of weeks, maybe? They're working on it. God, I have to get beds and champagne and serious supplies. If you think I can cook, she said to Xander, wait until Harry makes a meal. Obviously buoyant, she jumped back to Mason. Do you think you can put in for some time off so you can be here too? I'll look into it. Sipping his own coffee, Xander saw it start to get through when some instinct, some tone, maybe some body language, told her something was off. Is something wrong? The moment she asked, she went pale. Oh, God, Harry and Seth, is something wrong? Is one of them sick? No, no, they're both fine. Then what? It's something. You... You didn't tell me you were coming, she said, stepping back to look at him more keenly. You aren't telling me how long you'll be here. You aren't telling me something else. Why don't we sit down? Don't do that. Just be straight with me. Is this about Marla Roth? Are you here about the murder? When someone's murdered near my sister, and my sister finds the body, I take an interest. So you're here to talk to Chief Winston. I'm here to see you, and to talk to Chief Winston. Okay. Though some of the shine dimmed, she nodded. I'm sure he'll appreciate the assistance. You don't have to circle around telling me something like that, Mason. I know what you do. It's not just that. Another woman's missing. Another local woman. What? Who? When did... Did you know about this? She whirled on Xander. No, and simmer down. Missing for how long? Donna Lanier closed Ronaldo's restaurant at approximately 11.45 Friday night. She was the last to leave and was last seen by two other employees who left about the same time. According to statements, she was supposed to drive to Olympia to spend the weekend with her sister and a cousin. Her car's still in the lot, and she never met her sister and cousin or contacted them. She could have changed her mind, Naomi began. Her suitcase is in the back of her car. She'd planned to drive straight there after her shift. She hasn't been seen or heard from since 11.45 on Friday. She hasn't used a credit card, sent a text, made a call. Donna, she's the brunette. Though she'd gone pale, Naomi's voice stayed steady when she turned to Xander. Early 40s, round, cheerful face. Yeah. She and Lou are tight. Go back to high school together. You think whoever killed Marla wasn't passing through? Didn't just grab her up because he saw an opportunity? You think whoever did that has Donna? I think it's a strong possibility. She calls everyone sweetie. Slowly, Naomi lowered to a chair. I noticed that when I first moved here, and I'd go in for takeout. She'd say, I'll get that right out for you, sweetie. Or... How are you doing tonight, sweetie? She has a kid in college. She raised her mostly on her own, divorced, no interest from him and the kid. She has a daughter away at college. I'm sorry. Naomi rose again, went to Xander. You've known her all your life. I'm sorry. I've never known her to hurt anybody. She's nothing like Marla. Don't they go for a type? She's 15 years older, brunette, Settled, steady, and not the sort who'd catch your eye, like Marla. I need to talk to your chief of police, get more information. How do you even know about it? Naomi demanded. I contacted Winston after Marla Roth. Did you think I wouldn't hear about it, Naomi? Christ, I'm a federal agent. I'm going to hear about it when my sister finds a body in her goddamn backyard. It wasn't. And you're taking that tone with me to block me from taking one with you... I didn't tell you because there wasn't a point. I didn't want to worry you or the uncles. Is that why they're coming out here? I haven't said anything to them about this. Yet. Mason let the last word hang a moment. I talked to Winston about Roth, gave him my contact information, asked him to let me know if anything else came up. 
It came up. If you two want to snipe at each other about it, I'll stay out of the way, Xander shrugged. But it's pretty pointless on both sides. I'm getting more coffee. You could have told me you'd called the chief, told me you'd come here to talk to him. You could have told me you found a dead body. Next time I find one, you'll be the first. Don't joke about it, Naomi. Oh, I'm not. She closed her eyes. I'm not. I'm sick of the thought of it. I don't know how you do what you do. I know why. I understand why you chose to do what you do, but I don't know how you face it. Day after day, how you stand being faced with it. I've done everything I could to cut it all out of my life, to put up walls. And you do the opposite. I can be proud of you, and I am, and still wonder how you stand it. Doing this is how I stand it. We can talk about this when we're alone, and when I have more time. Chief Winston knows who we are. He ran me after I found the body. Yeah, I figured as much. Xander knows. I told him. You. Stunned, Mason stared at his sister, then Xander when Xander stepped back out. Is that right? Yes, so you don't have to worry about what you say. I can't say much more of anything, because I need to go meet Winston. I'll be back. Mason took Naomi's shoulders. I'll be back after I meet with him. You can show me the house, what you've been working on. All right. He kissed her forehead, stepped back. I'll be back, he said to Xander. As Mason left, Xander sat on the glider. Can we just sit here for a minute? I should. I need it. I have to hope this isn't happening to her. She's one of the best people I know. And she and Lou? I need to call Lou. She'd have heard. We'd have heard most likely, but we had the out-of-town gig. She'll need to talk to me. But I need to sit for a minute first. Naomi went over, lowered to the glider beside him, took his hand. We'll just sit here. Then you should go see her. It's better if you go see her than call. You're right, but I'm not leaving you here alone. Not until we know what the hell's happening. Not the time to argue, she decided. I'll go with you. I'll text Mason so he knows and go with you.